The World's Best Histories, Norway. By Sigvart Sorensen. Preface. I am preparing this volume it has been my aim to omit as few important events as possible without making the book a mere enumeration of names and dates. Above all, I have tried to be accurate. Among the works which I have used as sources, the first one to be mentioned is the great work of Snor Sturluson, the Heimskringla, or the Sagas of the Norse Kings, and I have used the English translation of the same by Samuel Lang, E.S.Q. Revised edition by Rasmus B. Anderson, Scribner and Welford, New York, 1889. I have also found much assistance in O.A. Overland's Norge's History. Among many other works used as sources or consulted, are, J. E. Sarza's Udsigt over den Norsk History, Jacob Alls, Erindringer, F. Winklehorn's History of the Literature of the Scandinavian North, translated by R. B. Anderson, S. C. Griggs and Co., Chicago, 1895. The Constitution of Norway, the most liberal constitution of Europe, appeared to me to be an appropriate closing chapter in a history of Norway. This interesting document has been translated into English by the Honorable Newt Nelson, United States Senator from Minnesota, to whom I am under obligation for permission to use his translation. S. S. Minneapolis, Minnesota, 1899. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, Share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter 1 The Northmen. Norway, in the Old Norse language Norgr, or Nordvegr, i.e., the North Way, according to archaeological explorations, appears to have been inhabited long before the historical time. The antiquaries maintain that three populations have inhabited the North a Mongolian race and a Celtic race, types of which are to be found in the Finns and the Laplanders in the far north, and, finally, a Caucasian race, which immigrated from the south and drove out the Celtic and Laplandic races, and from which the present inhabitants are descended. The Norwegians, or Northmen, Norsemen, belong to a North Germanic branch of the Indo-European race, their nearest kindred are the Swedes, the Danes, and the Goths. The original home of the race is supposed to have been the mountain region of Balk, in Western Asia, whence from time to time families and tribes migrated in different directions. It is not known when the ancestors of the Scandinavian peoples left the original home in Asia, but it is probable that their earliest settlements in Norway were made in the second century before the Christian era. The first settlers probably knew little of agriculture, but made their living by fishing and hunting. In time, however, they commenced to clear away the timber that covered the land in the valleys and the sides of the mountains and to till the ground. At the earliest times of which the historical tales or sagas tell us anything with regard to the social conditions, the land was divided among the free peasant proprietors, or bond class. Bond, in English translation, is usually called peasant. But this is not an equivalent for with the word peasant we associate the idea of inferior social condition to the landed aristocracy of the country, while these peasants or bonds were themselves the highest class in the country. The land owned by a peasant was called his udal. By udal right the land was kept in the family, and it could not be alienated or forfeited from the kindred who were udal born to it. The free peasants might own many thralls or slaves, who were unfree men. These were mostly prisoners captured by the Vikings on their expeditions to foreign shores. The owners could trade them away, or sell them, or even kill them without paying any fine or manboat to the king, as in the case of the killing of a free man. As a rule, however, the slaves were not badly treated, and they were sometimes made free and given the right to acquire land. In early days Norway consisted of a great number of small states called filkis, each a little kingdom by itself. The free peasants in a filky held general assemblies called things, where laws were made and justice administered. No public acts were undertaken without the deliberation of a thing. The thing was sacred, and a breach of peace at the thing place was considered a great crime. At the thing there was also a hallowed place for the judges, or lagmen, 
who expounded and administered the laws made by the thing. Almost every crime could be expiated by the payment of fines, even if the accused had killed a person. But if a man killed another secretly, he was declared an assassin and an outlaw, was deprived of all his property, and could be killed by anyone who wished to do so. The fine or man boat was heavier, the higher the rank of the person killed. For a thrall or slave no man boat was paid. The thing or Filky's thing was not made up of representatives elected by the people, but was rather a primary assembly of the free Udalborn peasant proprietors of the district. There were leading men in the Filky, and each Filky had one or more chiefs, but they had to plead at the thing like other free men. When there were several chiefs, they usually had the title of hearse. But when the free men had agreed upon one chief, he was called Jarl, Earl, or King. The King was the commander in war, and usually performed judicial functions, but he supported himself from his own estates, and the free peasants paid no tax. The dignity of the king was usually inherited by his son, but if the heir was not to the liking of the peasants or people, they chose another. No man, however clear his right of succession, would think of assuming the title or power of a king except by the vote of a thing. There he was presented to the people by a free peasant, and his right must be confirmed by the thing before he could exert any act of kingly power. The king had a number of free men in his service, who had sworn allegiance to him, and who served him in war and in peace. They were armed men, kept in pay, and were called herd men or court men, because they were members of the king's herd or court. If they were brave and faithful, they were often given high positions of trust. Some were made lendermen, liegemen, or managers of the king's estates. Chapter 2 The Religion of the Northmen the religion of the ancient Norwegians was of the same origin as that of all the other Germanic nations, and its main features will be given in this chapter. In the beginning of time there were two worlds. In the south was Muspelheim, luminous and flaming, with Surt as a ruler. In the north was Nivelheim, cold and dark, with the spring Virgelmer, where the dragon Nidhugger dwells. Between these worlds was the yawning abyss Janungagap. From the spring of Rajelmer ran icy streams into the Janungagap. The hoarfrost from these streams was met by sparks from Muspelheim, and by the power of the heat the vapors were given life in the form of the Jotun or giant Eimer and the cow Od Humbla, on whose milk he lives. From Eimer descends the evil race of Jotuns or frost giants. As the cow licked the briny hoarfrost, the large, handsome and powerful Bure came into being. His son was Burr, who married a daughter of a Jotun and became the father of Odin, Vile, and Ve. Odin became the father of the kind and fair Asir, the gods who rule heaven and earth. Burr's sons killed Eimer, and in his blood the whole race of Jotuns drowned except one couple, from whom new races of Jotuns or giants descended. Burr's sons dragged the body of Eimer into the middle of Janungagap. Out of the trunk of the body they made the earth and of his blood the sea. His bones became the mountains, and of his hair they made trees. From the skull they made the heavens, which they elevated high above the earth and decorated with sparks from Muspelheim. But his brain was scattered in the air and became clouds. Around the earth they let the deep waters flow, and on the distant shores the escaped Jotuns took up their abode in Jotunheim and in Utgard. For protection against them the kind gods made from Eimer's eyebrows the fortification Midgard as a defense for the inner earth. But from heaven to earth they suspended the quivering bridge called Bifrist, or the rainbow. The Jotun woman night, black and dark as her race, met Deling, the dawn, of the Asser race, and with him became the mother of day, who was bright and fair as his father. Odin placed mother and son in the heavens and bid them each in turn ride over the earth. Night rides ahead with her horse Rimfax, from whose foaming bit the earth is every morning covered with dew. Day follows with his horse Skinfax, whose radiant mane spreads light and air over the earth. A great number of maggots were bred in Eimer's body, and they became gnomes or dwarfs, little beings whom the gods gave human sense and appearance. They lived within the mountains and were skillful metal workers, but they could not endure the light of day. For dwarfs, the east, west, north, and south, were placed by the gods to carry the arch of heaven. As yet there were no human beings on earth. 
Then, one day, the three gods, Odin, Honer, and Loder, were walking on the shore of the sea, where they found two trees, and from them they made the first man and the first woman, Ask and Embla, Ash and Elm. Odin gave them life, Honer reason, Loder blood and fair complexion. The gods gave them Midgard for a home, and from them the whole human race is descended. The evergreen ash tree Yggdrasil is the finest of all trees. It shoots up from three roots. One of them is in the well of Rigelmer in Nivelheim, and on this the dragon Nidhugger is gnawing. The other root is in Jotunheim, in the wise Jotun Mimer's fountain. One of Odin's eyes, which he pledged for a drink of the fountain, is kept here. Whoever drinks of this fountain becomes wise. The third root is in heaven, at the Erder well, where the gods hold their thing or court. To this place they ride daily over the bridge Bifrest. Here also the three Norns abide, the maidens Urd, Verdand, and Skuld, past, present, and future. They pour water from the well over the roots of the tree. The Norns distribute life and govern fate, and nothing can change their decision. The dwelling in heaven of the Asir or gods is called Asgard. In its middle was the field of Ida, the gathering place of the gods, with Odin's throne, Lidskjalf, from which he views the whole world. Odin is the highest and the oldest of the gods, and all the others honor him as their father. Odin's hall is Valhalla. The ceiling of this hall is made of spears, it is covered with shields, and its benches are ornamented with coats of mail. To this place Odin invites all who have fallen in battle, and he is therefore called Valfather, i.e., the father of the fallen. The invited fallen heroes are called Einheir. Their sport and pastime is to go out every day and fight and kill each other. But toward evening they awake to life again and ride home as friends to Valhalla, where they feast on pork of the Barrow Serener, and where Odin's maidens, the Valkyrias, fill their horns with mead. These Valkyrias were sent by Odin to all battles on earth, where they selected those who were to be slain and afterward become the honored guests at Valhalla. At Odin's side sit the two wolves, Gear and Freak, and on his shoulders the ravens Hugin and Munin. These ravens fly forth every morning and return with tidings from all parts of the world. Odin's horse is the swift, gray, eight-footed Sleipner. When he rides to battle he wears a golden helmet, a beautiful coat of mail, and carries the spear Gunnar, which never fails. Odin is also the god of wisdom and poesy. In the morning of time he deposited one of his eyes in pledge for a drink of Mimer's fountain of wisdom, and he drank Suttung's mead in order to gain the gift of poesy. He has also taught men the art of writing runes and all secret arts. Thor, the son of Odin, is the strongest of all the gods. His dwelling is called Thrudvang. He rides across the heavens in a cart drawn by two rams. He is always at war with the Jotuns or evil giants, and in battle with them he uses his great hammer, Jalnar, which he hurls at the heads of his enemies. The earth trembles under the wheels of his cart, and men call the noise thunder. Thor's wife is Sif, whose hair is of gold. Baldur is a son of Odin and Frigg. He is so fair that his countenance emits beams of brightness. He is wise and gentle, and is therefore loved by all. His dwelling is Bredablik, where nothing impure exists. Nana is his wife. Njord comes from the race of the wise Vanir. He rules the wind, can calm the sea and stop fire, and he distributes wealth among men. His aid is invoked for success in navigation and fishing. His wife is Skade, daughter of a Jotun, and his dwelling is Noten by the sea. Fry, the son of Njord, rules rain and sunshine and the productiveness of the soil, and his aid is needed to get good crops, peace, and wealth. His dwelling is Alfheim. He sails in the magnificent ship Skibladner, which was built for him by the dwarfs. His wife is the Jotun daughter Gerd but in order to get her he had to give away his good sword, so that he will be unarmed in the coming final battle of the gods. Tyr, Odin's son, is the god of courage and victory, whom brave men call upon in battle. He has only one hand, for the Fenris wolf bit off his right hand. Brag, the long-bearded, is the god of eloquence and poetry. His wife is Iden, 
who has in her keeping the apples of which the gods eat to preserve their eternal youth. Heimdall, the white god with teeth of gold, was in the beginning of time born by nine Jotun maidens, all sisters. He is the watchman of the gods. He is more wakeful than birds. He can see a hundred miles off, and he can hear the grass grow. His dwelling is Himenjorg, which is situated where the Bifrist Bridge reaches heaven. When he blows his Jaller horn it is heard throughout the world. Among the other gods were Had, son of Odin, blind but strong, the silent and strong Vidar, Vale, the archer. Yul, the fast skirunner, and Forseet, the son of Baldur, who settles disputes between gods and men. Among the goddesses, or a Sinir, Frigg, Odin's wife, is the foremost. She knows the fate of everybody and shields many from danger. Her dwelling is Fensel. Next comes Freya, the goddess of love. She is the daughter of Njord and sister of Frey. She is also called Vanadis, or the goddess of the Vanir. She was married to Odd, and by him had a daughter, Nos. But Odd left her, and Freya weeps in her longing for him, and her tears are red gold. When she travels her wagon is drawn by two cats. The name of her dwelling is Folkvang. There were also a number of other goddesses, who were in the service of either Frigg or Freya. Eger, the ruler of the turbulent and stormy sea, is a Jotun, but he is a friend of the gods. When they visit him his hall is lighted with shining gold. His wife is Ran, and their daughters are the waves. In the beginning there was peace among gods and men. But the arrival of the Jotun women in Asgard undermined the happiness of the gods, and in heaven and on earth a struggle commenced which must last until both are destroyed. The Jotuns continually attack the inhabitants of Asgard, and it is only the mighty Thor who can hold them at bay. It is the evil Lok, who is the worst enemy of gods and men. He belongs to the Jotun race, but was early adopted among the gods. He was fair in looks, but wily and evil in spirit. He had three evil children, the Fenris wolf, the Midgard serpent, and Hel. The gods knew that this offspring of Lok would cause great trouble. Therefore they tied the Fenris wolf, threw the serpent into the sea, and hurled Hel down into Nivelheim, where she became the ruler of the dead. All who die from sickness or age are sent to her awful dwelling, Helheim. The greatest sorrow which Lok caused the whole world was that by his deceit he caused the death of the lovely god, Baldur. Then the gods took an awful revenge. They tied him to three stones, and over his head they fastened a venomous serpent, whose poison always was to drip upon his face. Lok's faithful wife, Sijin, placed herself at his side and held a cup under the poisonous drip. But whenever the cup is full and she goes to empty it, the poison drips into Lok's face, and then he writhes in agony so that the whole world trembles. This is the cause of earthquakes. There will come a time when these gods and the world shall perish in Ragnarok, which means the perdition of the gods. They will have many warnings. Corruption and wickedness will be common in the world. For three years there will be winter without sun. The sun and the moon will be swallowed up by the wolves of the Jotuns, and the bright stars will disappear. The earth will tremble, and the mountains will collapse, and all chains and ties are sundered. The Fenris wolf and Lok get loose, and the Midgard serpent leaves the ocean. The ship, Nagelfar, carries the army of the Jotuns across the sea under the leadership of the Jotun Rym, and Lok advances at the head of the hosts from the abode of Hel. The heavens split, and the sons of Muspel come riding ahead, led by their chief Surt. As the hosts are rushing across the Bifrist, the bridge breaks behind them. All are hastening to the great battle place, the plains of Vigrid, which is a hundred miles wide. Now Heimdall arises and blows his Jaller horn, all the gods are assembled, the ash Yggdrasil trembles, and everything in heaven and on earth is filled with terror. Gods and Einheir, the fallen heroes, arm themselves for the battle. In the front rides Odin with his golden helmet and beaming coat of mail and carrying his spear, Gungnir. He meets the Fenris wolf, who swallows him, but Vidar avenges his father and kills the wolf. Thor crushes the head of the Midgard serpent, but is stifled to death by its venom. Frey is felled by Surt, 
and Loke and Heimdall kill each other. Finally Surt hurls his fire over the world, gods and men die, and the shriveling earth sinks into the abyss. But the world shall arise again and the dead come to life. From above comes the all-powerful one, he who rules everything, and whose name no one dares utter. All those who are virtuous and pure of heart will gather in Gimel in everlasting happiness, while the evil ones will go to Nastrand at the well Vergelmer to tie torture by Nidhugger. A new earth, green and beautiful, shall rise from the ocean. The gods awake to new life and join Vidar and Vale, and the sons of Thor, Mode and Magna, who have survived the great destruction and who have been given their father's hammer, because there is to be no more war. All the gods assemble on the field of Ida, where Asgard was located. And from Liv and Livthraser, who hid themselves in Yggdrasil during the burning of the world, a new human race shall descend. Chapter 3 The Viking Age It is but natural that the ancient Norwegians should become warlike and brave men, since their firm religious belief was that those who died of sickness or old age would sink down into the dark abode of Hell, Helheim. And that only the brave men who fell in battle would be invited to the feasts in Odin's Hall. Sometimes the earls or kings would make war on their neighbors, either for conquest or for revenge. But a time came when the countries of the north with their poorly developed resources became overpopulated, and the warriors had to seek better fields abroad. The Viking cruises commenced, and for a long time the Norwegians continued to harry the coasts of Europe. At first the Viking expeditions were nothing but piracy, carried on for a livelihood. The name Viking is supposed to be derived from the word Vik, a cove or inlet on the coast, in which they would harbor with their ships and lie in wait for merchants sailing by. Soon these expeditions assumed a wider range and a wilder character, and historians of the time paint the horrors spread by the Vikings in dark colors. In the English churches they had a day of prayer each week to invoke the aid of heaven against the harrying Northmen. In France the following formula was inserted in the church prayer, a furor norman norum libera nos, o domini. Free us, O Lord, from the fury of the Northmen. Gradually the Viking life assumed a nobler form. There appear to be three stages or periods in the Viking Age. In the first one the Vikings make casual visits with single ships to the shores of England, Ireland, France or Flanders, and when they have plundered a town or a convent they return to their ships and sail away. In the second period their cruises assume a more regular character, and indicate some definite plan, as they take possession of certain points, where they winter, and from where they command the surrounding country. During the third period they no longer confine themselves to seeking booty, but act as real conquerors, take possession of the conquered territory and rule it. In the latter part of the 8th century the Vikings first found their way across the North Sea to the islands north of Scotland. In 787 they landed for the first time on the British coast. In that year it is recorded in the English annals that Norwegians came in three ships and committed great ravages on the coasts of Wessex. Six years later they attacked Northumberland, where they caused even greater ruin. They especially plundered churches and cloisters. Soon they extended their plundering expeditions to the northern coast of France, where the powerful Emperor Charlemagne was then the ruler. They made only small progress as long as he lived, but during the reigns of his weak successors they made havoc along the coasts of France, and also forced the Straits of Gibraltar and made unwelcome visits to the countries on the Mediterranean. Some of the French kings knew no better remedy than to pay the Vikings great sums of money to keep them away from the country. Thus King Charles the Bald-Headed paid in the year 846 a sum of 7,000 pounds of silver, and in 877 a further sum of 5,000 pounds, for this purpose. The Northmen, by their Viking expeditions, early took possession of the Orkneys, the Shetland Islands, the Hebrides and the Faroe Islands. In going westward to these islands they were sometimes driven out of their course, and thus Nadod, who was on his way to the Faroe Islands, was driven far to the north and northwest and found a large uninhabited country, which was afterward called Iceland. The Vikings often came to Ireland, and about the year 837 they succeeded, under the leadership of the chieftain Thorgeisel, in establishing a kingdom at Dublin, which they strongly fortified. 
Thorgeisel appears to have ruled in Ireland until about 846, when he was drowned. A more permanent kingdom was established by Olaf the White, who took possession of Dublin and the surrounding country in 852. The dominion in Dublin of the Norwegians is supposed to have lasted for three and a half centuries. As to the influence of the Northmen on the development of the countries visited by them during the later Viking periods, the eminent English writer Samuel Lang, the translator of the Heimskringla, or the Sagas of the Norse Kings, says, All that men hope for of good government and future improvement in their physical and moral condition, all that civilized men enjoy at this day of civil, religious and political liberty, the British constitution, representative legislation. The trial by jury, security of property, freedom of mind and person, the influence of public opinion over the conduct of public affairs, the reformation, the liberty of the press. The spirit of the age, all that is or has been of value to man in modern times as a member of society, either in Europe or in the New World, may be traced to the spark left burning upon our shores by these northern barbarians. Chapter 4 The Ingling Family, Halfton the Swarthy the authentic history begins with Halfton the Swarthy, or Halfton the Black, who reigned from about the year 821 to about 860. The Icelander Snorr Sturluson, who, in the 12th century, wrote the Heimskringla, or the Sagas of the Norse Kings, gives a long line of preceding kings of the Ingling race, the royal family to which Halfton the Swarthy belonged. But that part of the saga belongs to mythology rather than to history. According to tradition the Ingling family were descendants of Fjölner, the son of the god Frey. One of the surnames of the god was Ingvi, from which the family derived the name Inglings. Their original home is said to have been UPS in Sweden, but they were driven away on account of their cruelty. One of them, whose name was Olaf, emigrated with his followers to Vermland, which he made habitable by cleaning away a great deal of the timber. Hence he was called Olaf the Treefeller, Treitelja. His son, Halfton Whiteleg, Vitbein, conquered Romerike and other Norwegian districts, and Halfton's son also became king of Vestfold, or the country west of the Folden, the bay now called the Christiania Fjord. Vestfold now became the most important part of the country. In the neighborhood of the present town of Lorvik, a famous temple was founded in Skyring Sal, where the kings often resided, and which soon became a popular trading place. Halfton Whiteleg's grandson, Gudrod the hunter, made war on Harold Redbeard, who was king of Agder, the southwestern part of Norway. He killed Harold and his son Gyrd, and took a great booty. He afterward married Harold's daughter, Asa. Gudrod's son, Halfton, surnamed the Swarthy, was only a year old when his father was killed, and his mother Asa then returned with him to Agder, where he grew up and became stout and strong. At the age of eighteen he became king in Agder, and soon afterward went to Vestfold, where he divided that kingdom with his brother Olaf. Halfton increased his possessions, both by marriage and by warfare, until he ruled over the whole country around the Christiania Fjord, though Ten, Land, Hadeland, Romerik and San. King Halfton was a wise man, a lover of truth and justice. He made good laws, which he observed himself and compelled others to observe. He fixed certain mulks, or penalties, for all crimes committed. His code of laws, called the Eidsiva Law, was adopted at a common thing at Eidsvold, where about a thousand years later the present constitution of Norway was adopted. Halfton became the ancestor of the royal race of Norway, his son, Harald the Fair-Haired, being the first king of United Norway. According to tradition, when Queen Ragenhild was with child she dreamed that she was standing in her herb garden, and she took a thorn out of her chemise, and while she was holding it in her hand it grew into a great tree. One end of which struck roots into the earth, while the other raised itself in the air until she could hardly see the top or the end of its widely spread branches. The lower part of the tree was red with blood, but the stem was beautifully green, and the branches white as snow, and they spread over all Norway, and even much more. This dream was years afterward interpreted as having foretold the destiny of Ragenhild's son. One day in the spring of 860, when Halfton the Swarthy was driving home from a feast across the Ransford, he broke through the ice and was drowned. 
He was so popular that when his body was found the leading men in each filka demanded to have him buried with them, believing that it would bring prosperity to the district. They at last agreed to divide the body into four parts, which were buried in four different districts. The trunk of the body was buried in a mound at Stein, Ringerich, where a little hill is still called Halfton's Mound. Chapter 5 Harold the Fair-Haired, 860-930, Norway United Harold was only ten years old when he succeeded his father. Many of the chiefs thought that it would be an easy matter now to divide the country between them, but Guthorm, a brother of Harold's mother, who was at the head of the government and commander of the army, soon subdued them. When Harold had become old enough to marry, he sent his men to a girl named Gaida, a daughter of King Eric of Hordaland, who was brought up as a foster child in the house of a rich bond in Baldur's. Harold had heard of her as a very beautiful though proud girl. When the men delivered their message, she answered that she would not marry a king who had no greater kingdom than a few filkies, districts. And she added that she thought it strange that no king here in Norway will make the whole country subject to him, in the same way as Gorm the Old did in Denmark, or Eric at UPS. When the messengers returned to the king, they advised him to punish her for her haughty words, but Harold said she had spoken well. And he made the solemn vow not to cut or comb his hair until he had subdued the whole of Norway and had become the sole king. Harold immediately gathered an army and went northward over the Davra mountain, and after several battles conquered the whole of Trondelag, the common name of all the districts about the Thrandjum, Drunthim, Fjord. Here he procured ships, sailed southward along the coast and conquered one district after another in the western part of the country. Finally, the remaining kings gathered their men and ships and met Harold in naval battle in Hafrsfjord, a little inlet in Jadron, near the present city of Stavanger. The battle was fierce and long, but Harold finally gained the day. After this battle, which occurred in 872, King Harold met no opposition, and was acknowledged as king of the whole of Norway. Shortly after the battle the king attended a feast given by Ragnvald, the Earl of Mor, Morjarl, and the latter cut the king's hair, which had not been cut or combed for ten years, and gave him the surname, the Fair-Haired. Harold shortly afterward married Gaida. King Harold deprived the peasant proprietors of their allodium or udalrite, and compelled them to pay land dues of their possessions. Over every filky or district he placed an earl, Jarl, who was to administer justice and collect the taxes, of which he retained one-third as salary. In case of war the earl was to serve the king with sixty warriors. Each earl had under him four hearse, each of whom had a royal estate of twenty marks annual income to manage, and was bound to support twenty men-at-arms. Many of the proud peasants objected to the rule of Harold and to the payment of taxes. They wanted to be independent, as before, and left the country. Many of them settled on the Faroe Islands and the Scotch Islands, and in the summer they would make Viking cruises and harry the coasts of Norway to revenge themselves on the king. To stop this Harold sailed westward one summer with a fleet, fought the Vikings and took possession of Shetland and the Orkney Islands, and placed an earl in charge of them. Many of the fleeing Northmen then sailed northward with their goods and men and settled in Iceland, where they established a free state, which existed for nearly four hundred years. Earl Ragnvald, Morjarl, was King Harold's dearest friend, and the king had great regard for him, but he did not allow that to excuse a crime committed by his son. Ragnvald had a son by the name of Rolf, who was so stout and strong that no horse could carry him, and therefore he was called Gandrolf, or Rolf the Walker. He went early on Viking cruises to the shores of the Baltic Sea. One summer, on his return from one of his expeditions, he made Strandhugen Viking. Strandhug was a foray for cattle to provision the Viking ships. Harold had declared this a great crime, and when he heard what Rolf had done, he called an extra session of the thing, and had Rolf declared an outlaw in all Norway. Gange Rolf, however, did not remain in Norway, but sailed westward to the Sudres, the present Hebrides, and afterward joined the army of Vikings, which, in the year 885, went to France and plundered the country around Paris and the province of Bourgogne. The Frenchmen made a compromise with the Vikings, and for some years they spared the French coasts, 
but later Gandrolf returned with a great number of Vikings, and finally compelled the French king, Charles the Simple. By the peace of St. Clair sur Epte to cede to him and his successors a large province, which he peopled with Northmen, and which, therefore, was afterward called Normandy. The French king also promised to let him marry his daughter Gazila if he would adopt Christianity. This Rolf agreed to, and he was baptized in the year 912, being christened Robert. He ruled his new country well, and died in the year 931. From him descended the mighty earls of Normandy, who in time conquered the kingdoms of England and Naples. King Harold had many sons, and as they grew up they created a great deal of disturbance in the country. They had come from such different stock on the maternal side, and had been brought up so far from each other by rich peasants in different parts of the country, that brotherly feelings were little known to them. They became jealous of each other, and also jealous of the many mighty earls. They drove some of the earls from their estates, and even killed some of them. Thus two of the brothers set out one spring with a great force to attack Ragnvald, Earl of Moor, surrounded his house and burned him with sixty of his men. Hoping to avoid further domestic disturbances, Harold called together a thing at the Eidsiva thing place, the present Eidsvold, and summoned to it all the people of the uplands. Here he gave to all his sons the title of king, and proclaimed a law that his descendants in the male line should each succeed to the title and dignity of king, but his descendants by the female side were to become only earls. He divided the country among his sons, but his dearest son, Eric, who was his son by the Danish princess Ragenhild, and thus of royal birth on both sides, was to be acknowledged as their overlord. This the other brothers did not like, and the result was bloody conflicts. Eric first killed Ragnvald Redelbein, the ruler in Hadeland, because he was said to be a sorcerer. Next he attacked his brother Bjorn, who generally lived at the trading place Tunsberg, and who was called Bjorn Farman, or Bjorn the Merchant, because he cared little for war, but more for trading expeditions. As he refused to pay tribute to Eric, the latter attacked and killed him, and plundered his house. King Bjorn lies buried in the Seaman's Mound, Farmanshagen, at Seaheim, in the present Sems Parish, in Jarlsberg. Halfton the Black, who ruled in Thrandjum, resolved to avenge his brother Bjorn's death, and collected a great force of men and ships. Eric sought the aid of his father Harold, who also equipped a fleet and took up a position at Rain Plain on the north side of the Thrandjum Fjord, but now friends of both interceded in order to bring about a reconciliation. In Halfton's army there was a clever man called Guthorm Sindre, who had formerly been in the service of Harold, and was a great friend of both. He was a great skald, poet, and had once composed songs about the father and the son, for which they had then offered him a reward. He would take nothing at the time, but was given the promise that, some day or other, they should grant him any request he should make. He now went before King Harold with words of peace, and made the request that the kings should become reconciled. And the saga adds, so highly did the king esteem him that, in consequence of his request, they were reconciled. When Harold the Fair-Haired was eighty years old, he became very weak and unable to bear the burden of the government. Then he brought his son Eric to his royal high seat and gave him the power and the command over the whole land, 930. Three years later King Harold died of old age. He was buried under a mound at Hoge, near Hagesund in Ryfilk. The gravestone is still to be seen. At the grave a large monument in memory of Harold was erected in 1872, 1000 years after the Battle of Hafrsfjord. Chapter 6 Birth of Hawken the Good, Eric Blood Axe, 930-935 When Harold the Fair-Haired was nearly seventy years old, he begot a son by Thora Master Stang, Masterpole. She was so called because she was tall, and her family came from the island of Master. She was very handsome, and was descended from good people, but was called the king's servant girl, for at that time, as the saga says, many were subject to service to the king who were of good birth, both men and women. Sigurd Laidjarl, or Earl of Laid, near Thrandjum, was a friend of Thora's family, and when she was about to be confined he brought her in his ship from Master northward to Seaheim, where King Harold was then living. They spent the night at the shore south of the Alve Island, and here Thora bore her child, 
on a stone near the ship's gangway. It was a male child, and Earl Sigurd baptized him in heathen fashion, and called him Hawken after his own father. The boy soon grew handsome, large in size, and very like his father King Harold. When the king felt that he was not going to live much longer, he sent Hawken over to England to be brought up by the English king, Athelstan, the grandson of Alfred the Great. King Athelstan had Hawken baptized and brought up in the Christian faith, and in good habits and all sorts of exercises, and it is said he loved Hawken above all his relations. He gave him a sword, of which the hilt and handle were gold. But the blade was still better, for with it Hawken cut a millstone to the center eye. The sword was thereafter called Kvernbite, millstone cutter, and Hawken carried it to his dying day. As stated, Eric was proclaimed king by his father in 930. Eric had early gone out on Viking expeditions, and his daring enterprises had given him the surname Bloodaxe. He was handsome and manly looking, but morally weak. He was hated during his father's lifetime, because he had killed his brother Bjorn the merchant, but still more hated was his cruel and treacherous queen, Gunhild. She enticed him into killing several of his brothers, and it began to be the common belief that Gunhild and Eric were going to remove all his brothers, in order to secure the whole of the kingdom for themselves and their children. This plan, however, was frustrated by Hawken, the youngest son of Harold. When Hawken, Athelstan's foster son, heard of his father's death, he immediately prepared to leave England, and was given men and ships by King Athelstan. He sailed north to Trondelagen, where he found the mighty Sigurd, Earl of Laid, who had been his mother's friend and his guardian in early childhood. Sigurd received him well, and Hawken promised him great power if he became king. They assembled a great meeting of the peasants, where Earl Sigurd made a speech and advised the people to make Hawken their king. Thereupon Hawken arose and made a speech, which greatly pleased the peasants. They said to each other that it looked as if Harold the Fair-Haired had come back and had become young again. Hawken promised, in case they would make him their king, to give them back the Udalrite, Elodium, which Harold had taken from them. His speech was so well received that the people cheered wildly, and with great enthusiasm they proclaimed him their king. He immediately started southward, and the other districts followed the example of Trondelagen and swore allegiance to Hawken. Eric made a desperate attempt to raise an army, but not succeeding, he had to leave the country with his wife Gunhild, his children, and a few followers, 935. For some time he harried the coasts of Scotland and England as a Viking, until finally he accepted a portion of Northumberland from King Athelstan on the condition that he was to defend the country against Norwegian and Danish Vikings. Eric remained in England under shifting conditions, until he was killed in a battle in 954. After his death Queen Gunhild had a poem written in his honour, the so-called Eriksmal, of which a beautiful fragment still exists. Shortly after Eric's death Queen Gunhild went to Denmark with her sons, and was well received by the Danish king, Harald Bluetooth, Blaytand, the son of Gorm the Old. The children of Eric Bloodaxe and Gunhild were, Gamla, Guthorm, Harald, Ragnfred, Ragnhild, Erling, Gudrod, and Sigurd Sleva. All the boys were handsome and of manly appearance, but in character they resembled their mother. Chapter 7 Hawken the Good, 935-961 Hawken did a great deal to improve the internal conditions of the country. He regulated the judicial districts, and gave the Gulathings law for the western district, with common thing place at Gula, in Eidersan, and the Frostathings law for the northern district. With common thing place at Frossen, peninsula in Throngemsfjord. Much was done for the defense of the country against enemies. The whole coast was divided into skybreeds, or ship districts, each of which was to build, equip, man, and provision a ship for use in case of war. In order to inform the inhabitants of the approach of an enemy, King Hawken built varder, or signal fires, on the highest mountains at proper distances from each other. By the successive lighting of these signal fires the news of war could be carried from the southernmost signal place to the northern end of Halagaland in seven days. Warning was also to be sent around from house to house by budstick as a signal for the people to assemble. The budstick was a stick of wood like a very heavy cane, 
with a spike at the end of it. If the bearer of the message found nobody at home, he would stick the cane on the side of the door, and the owner of the house would, on his arrival home, immediately dispatch it to the next house. King Haakon, who had been brought up in the Christian faith, resolved to introduce Christianity in Norway, but when he took the preliminary steps he found no support from his otherwise faithful friend, Earl Sigurd of Laid, who was an ardent adherent of the Asa faith. Fearing to offend the Earl, Haakon postponed his effort for a time, until he thought he had gained sufficient popularity in the country. He then sent to England for a bishop and other teachers, and announced that it was his intention to have the whole people embrace the Christian religion. When he made this announcement to the assembled peasants at Thrangem, they declined to commit themselves, and asked to have this very important matter referred to the Frostathing, where it could be legally settled. At the Frostathing, where a great number of people were assembled, King Haakon made an earnest speech, in which he said that it was his command in his prayer to all, rich and poor, young and all, that they should forsake the old heathen gods. Be baptized, and believe in the one living God, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Virgin Mary, abstain from work every seventh day, Sunday, and fast every Friday. A great murmur ran through the crowd of peasants, who complained that the king wanted to deprive them of their work and their old faith, and the mighty peasant, Asbjorn of Metalhus, arose and made a speech to the king. In which he said that they had had great faith in him when they chose him for their king, but now they had made up their minds to part with him and choose another if they were not left free to retain the religion they believed in. And the king was told that he must accept one of these conditions before the meeting was concluded. The king felt that there was no escape but to yield to the peasants, and Earl Sigurd of Laid, who had all the time been near the king, arose and said, King Hawken is willing to acquiesce in your wishes, peasants. Never will he give up your friendship. Encouraged by this the peasants afterward made the king participate in their heathen sacrifices, and the king was obliged to give up the attempt to introduce Christianity in Norway. King Haakon soon afterward had to meet other demands upon him, when the southern parts of the country were attacked by the sons of his brother Eric, who, after their mother, were called the Gunhild sons. Several times Haakon defeated the invaders, and after one great battle they stayed away for six years. Finally, in the twenty-sixth year of Haakon's reign, while he and his men were enjoying a feast at Fitch on the island stored in Hordaland, the enemy appeared again with a great naval force. Although greatly outnumbered by the enemy, Haakon's men won the battle, and the aggressors were obliged to flee to their ships. But when Haakon pursued them without his coat of mail, he was hit in the armpit by a deadly arrow and received a wound from which he died, after being brought, shortly after the battle, to Haakon's Rock, where he had been born. Before he died he requested his friends to send a ship after the sons of Gunhild, with the message asking them to return and assume the government, giving due respect to his adherents. He himself had no sons, and his daughter Thora could not, according to the law, succeed to the throne. Haakon was deeply mourned by friends and foes, and all said that Norway would never again get such a good king. The poet Ivan Skaldaspiller composed a poem in his honor, the Haken Armel, in which he praised his virtues and described his reception in Odin's Valhalla. Chapter 8 Harold Greyfell and his brothers, 961-970 The Gunhild sons, or Eric's sons, immediately returned to Norway when they received the message that Haakon the Good had named them as heirs to the throne. The oldest one, Harold Greyfell, Graffold, so named after having once worn a grey fur robe, was considered as chief king, but their mother Gunhild was in fact the chief ruler. They were penurious and cruel, and soon became widely hated. There were many chiefs in the country at that time. Trig of Olofsson, a grandson of Harold the Fair-Haired, ruled in Viken, or the country around the Christiania Fjord. His cousin Gudrod, son of Bjorn the Merchant, was chief in Westfold, and Earl Sigurd of Laid ruled the country around Thrangem. Gunhild's sons at first resided mostly in the middle of the country, but soon laid plans to obtain more power. By great promises they bribed Gryatgard, a brother of Earl Sigurd, to send them word when there might be a favorable opportunity to attack and kill the Earl. This plan succeeded. 
having been notified by Gryatgard that Earl Sigurd was at a feast at Oglo in Sturadal and had but few men with him, King Harold Greyfell and his brother Erling surrounded the house at night, set fire to the building. And burned the Earl and all his men. When the people heard of Earl Sigurd's death, there was a great uprising. They gathered a large fleet, and, after having proclaimed Sigurd's son, Hawken, as their Earl and Commander-in-Chief, they steered out of the Throngem Fjord, intent upon taking vengeance. When Gunhild's sons heard of this, they fled southward to Romsdal and South Moor. Some time afterward the Gunhild sons attacked and murdered Trig of Olofsson, king in Viking, and Gudrod Bjornsson, king in Westfold. Harold Greyfell hastened to Trig of Olofsson's home, hoping to be able to exterminate the whole race, but Trigov's widow, Astrid, had fled with her foster father, Thorolf Luzerskeg. Gunhild's sons collected a great army in Viken and sailed northward, collecting men and ships on the way from every district for the purpose of fighting Earl Hawken. When Earl Hawken heard of this, he also collected men and fitted out ships, but when he ascertained the size of the approaching fleet, he sailed with a few men south to Denmark, where he was well received by King Harold Bluetooth, 964. Gunhild's sons brought their army north to Thrandjum, and subdued the country and collected taxes, of which they had received none while Earl Hawken was there. In Denmark Earl Hawken laid some deep plans to obtain power again. A nephew of King Harold Bluetooth, called Gold Harold, had returned home and demanded half of the kingdom. As the king had no desire to yield to his demand, but still feared Gold Harold's influence with the people, Earl Hawken advised him to get Norway for his nephew instead. He was to invite the Norwegian king, Harald Greyfell, on a friendly visit to Denmark, and then have Gold Harald kill him. Afterward it would be easy to take Norway on account of the very hard times prevailing there, and the great unpopularity of the Gunhild sons. The plan was followed. But when Gold Harald had killed Harald Greyfell, he was in turn attacked and killed by Earl Hawken. Soon after King Harald Bluetooth sailed for Norway with 720 ships. He had with him Earl Hawken, Harald Grensk, a son of King Gudrod, and many other great men who had fled from their Udal estates in Norway on account of Gunhild's sons. They won the country without resistance, and King Harald installed Hawken as Earl of the northern and western parts of the country. The Earl was to pay certain taxes to the King and help him with armed men in case of war. The King retained for himself the country around Viking, and left Harald Grensk there as his representative. The two surviving brothers, Gudrod and Ragnfred, fled with their mother, Gunhild, to the Orkneys. Chapter 9 Earl Hawken, 970-995 Earl Hawken subdued all those parts of the country belonging to his dominion, and remained all winter, 970, in Thrandjum. As he proceeded along the coast he ordered that in all his dominions the heathen temples and sacrifices should be restored, and continued as of old. The people thought they soon had proof that the gods were pleased with Hawken's action, for, according to the saga, the first winter that Hawken ruled over Norway the herring set in everywhere through the fjords to the land. And the seasons ripened to a good crop all that had been sown, while for several years previously dearth and hard times had prevailed. Earl Hawken waited for an opportunity to repudiate his obligations to the Danish king, and it came in time. In 973, when Otto II became emperor of Germany, King Harald Bluetooth prepared himself for war in order to resist the emperor's claim to sovereignty over Denmark, and in 975 he ordered Earl Hawken to come to his aid with all the forces it was possible to raise. Hawken complied with the request, and for a time successfully fought the Germans. But when he had boarded his ships and prepared to sail homeward, the emperor returned for a second attack, and soon compelled the Danish king to make peace. King Harald Bluetooth agreed to introduce Christianity both in Denmark and in Norway. He sent for Earl Hawken and made him accept baptism and promised to introduce Christianity in Norway. Priests were sent with him to help him with this work. Hawken set sail with the priests on board, but no sooner did he get a favorable wind than he put the priests ashore, and sailed away. From now on he considered himself the sworn enemy of the Danes. He steered through the sound, and harried the coasts on both sides. 
At the coast of East Gotland he made a great heathen sacrifice. Thereupon he burned his ships and marched through the country with his men. He defeated Earl Otter, the ruler in Gotland, and continued his march through Småland and West Gotland to Norway. He again took up his residence in Thrandjum. King Harold Bluetooth was greatly incensed at Earl Hawkins's action, and decided to take an awful revenge. He collected a great fleet, which he brought to Norway. He burned and destroyed the settlements and killed a great number of people wherever he came. In Lerdal and San, it is said that only five dwellings were left unburned. The inhabitants fled to the woods with such movable goods as they could save. As soon, however, as it was reported that Earl Hawken was coming southward with a fleet, King Harold lost his courage, set sail, and returned to Denmark. When Harold Bluetooth died, 985, his son Sven, who afterward was given the surname Jugaskeg, Fort Beard, became king of Denmark. He instigated the Joms Vikings to make war on Earl Hawken. These Vikings were Danes who lived at Jomsborg, Pomerania, on the island Valin or Jom, at the mouth of the river Oder. They were very powerful and warlike, and had very strict laws. No one could join their company who was older than fifty or younger than eighteen years, and no woman was permitted to enter their burg. They considered it a disgrace to show fear or to complain of pain. Earl Sigvald, Sigvald Jarl, a son of King Strutherald of Scania, Skane, in the southern part of Sweden, was chief of the Joms Vikings at this time. King Sven of Denmark invited these Vikings to a great feast in memory of his father, and as Earl Sigvald's father had fallen about the same time, he suggested that they should also drink his funeral ale. The Joms Vikings came to the festival with their bravest men, forty ships of them from Vendland, Pomerania, and twenty ships from Scania. All the guests drank a great deal, and there was great gaiety in the hall. According to old custom on such occasions they made solemn vows, in emptying the drinking horns. King Sven, in drinking to his father's memory, made the solemn vow, that before three winters were passed he would go with his army to England and conquer King Ethelred. The guests also drank Christ's health, and a bowl to the memory of St. Michael. Thereafter Earl Sigvald drank to his father's memory, and made a vow, that before three winters came to an end he would go to Norway and either kill Earl Hawken or chase him out of the country. And the other Joms Vikings vowed that they would go with Earl Sigvald to Norway and share in the fight. The next morning, when they had slept off their drink, they thought they had promised rather much, and, in order to find Earl Hawken unprepared, they sailed away on their expedition at once. When Earl Eric, the son of Hawken, who was then in Romerik, heard of the festival and of the vows of the Joms Vikings, he immediately gathered his men, and went to the uplands, and thence over the mountains to Thrandjum, and joined his father. Earl Hawken. They immediately sent warnings around, and sent messages to North Moor and South Moor, and to Romsdal, and also north to Namdal and Halagaland, summoning all the country to furnish men and ships. Earl Hawken went with an army to South Moor, and Eric was to follow with what army he could collect from the north. Meanwhile, the Joms Vikings sailed slowly northward, plundering the coasts. Christmas night they were at Jadaran. At Hjorengavag, on the island Harriadland in South Moor, they met Earl Hawken and his sons Eric, Sven, Sigurd and Erling. The Earl had 180 ships and boats, fully manned and equipped, and the Joms Vikings had 60 ships. A bloody and fierce battle followed, probably the greatest that had ever taken place in Norway. At first the advantage was on the side of the Joms Vikings, and Earl Hawken was hardly pressed. So many spears were thrown against him that his armor was split asunder, and he threw it off. It is said that Earl Hawken then sacrificed his young son Erling to the gods in order to gain victory. A great hailstorm arose, and the Joms Vikings were defeated, but only after a most desperate fight. Earl Sigvald turned and fled with some of his ships, but many of his men preferred to fall in battle. Havard the Hewer, Huggand, stood on his knees and fought, after both his feet had been cut off. One of the champions, Boo the Thick, Diger, received a terrible cut that took away his underlip and chin, and, seeing that resistance was in vain, he took a chest full of gold in each hand and shouted, Overboard, all Boo's men! 
and jumped into the sea. After the battle the dead were ransacked by Hawkins' men, and the booty brought together to be divided, and there were twenty-five ships of the Joms Vikings in the booty. While Earl Hawken ruled over Norway there were good crops in the land and peace internally among the peasants. The Earl, for a long time, was therefore well liked, but later he became proud and much given to debauchery. According to the saga, he would go so far as to have the daughters of people of high station brought home to him, and after keeping them a week or two send them home in shame. The people therefore began to murmur loudly, and finally they rose against him. Early in the year 995 Earl Hawken was at a feast at Metalhus in Galdal. There was a mighty peasant in the neighborhood, by name O.R.M. Lurgja, who had a wife called Gudrun, a daughter of Bert Thor of Lundar. She was called the Lundar son, because she was so beautiful. The Earl sent his slaves to O.R.M., with the errand that they were to bring Gudrun to the Earl. O.R.M. first invited the slaves to take supper, and while they were eating and drinking he sent word around to all his neighbors, and soon had so many gathered at his house that he could refuse to let his wife be taken away. The slaves departed with many threats, but O.R.M. sent out messages to all the neighboring country, and soon a large body of armed men were marching toward Metalhus where Hawken was. With a single thrall, slave, called Kark, who had been with him since boyhood, Earl Hawken fled across the Gala River, rode his horse into a hole, and left his cloak behind on the ice, in order to make his pursuers believe that he had been drowned. Then he went to the estate of Rimmel, where one of the Earl's mistresses, Thora, lived, and asked her to hide him for a few days until the army of the peasants had dispersed. They went to a swine sty, where Kark dug a deep hole and covered it with boards. The Earl and Kark went into the hole, and Thora covered it, and threw earth and manure over it, and drove the swine upon the top of it. Olaf Tryggvason had just then arrived in the country, and when the peasants heard he was of the family of Harold the Fair-Haired, they flocked around him and hailed him as their king. Then they all set about hunting for Earl Hawken. At Rimmel they looked everywhere for him without finding him. Then Olaf held a house thing or council out in the yard, and stood upon a great stone which lay beside the swine sty, and made a speech to the people, in which he promised rewards and honors to the man who should kill the earl. This speech was heard by the earl and the thrall Kark. Why art thou so pale, asked the earl, and now again black as earth? Thou hast not the intention to betray me? By no means, replied Kark. We were both born on the same night, said the earl, and the time will be short between our deaths. King Olaf went away in the evening. When night came the earl kept himself awake, but Kark slept, and was disturbed in his sleep. The earl woke him, and asked him what he had been dreaming. Kark answered, I was at Laid, and Olaf Tryggvason was laying a golden ring about my neck. The earl then said, It will be a bloody ring Olaf will lay about thy neck if he catches thee. Take care of that. From me thou shalt enjoy all that is good, therefore betray me not. Then they both kept awake, evidently mistrusting each other. But toward morning the earl dropped asleep. Then Kark killed him, and cut off his head, and hastened to Olaf Tryggvason with it, but Olaf had the faithless thrall decapitated. Earl Hawken was fifty-eight years old at his death, in February, 995. Chapter 10 The Youth of Olaf Tryggvason When the Gunhild sons had killed Trigg of Olofsson, King in Viking, the grandson of Harold the Fair Haired, in 963, Trigov's widow Astrid fled with her foster father, Thorolf Luzerskeg. Astrid was pregnant with a child of King Trigov, and she went to a lake and concealed herself on a small island with a few followers. Here she gave birth to a boy, and she called him Olaf, after his grandfather. She remained there all summer, but when the nights became dark, and the days began to shorten and the weather to be cold, she travelled further with Thorolf and a few others until she reached Ofrestad, where her father, Eric Biodaskal, lived. And they remained there during the winter. But in the spring spies were sent out by Gunhild to find the boy, and Astrid had to flee again with her son. She proceeded eastward, and at last came to her father's friend, Hawken the Old, in Sweden, where she and her son remained a long time and were well treated. 
When Gunhild heard that Astrid and her son Olaf were in Sweden, she sent ambassadors to the king of Sweden with the request that the king assist them in getting hold of Olaf Tryggvason, to bring him back to Norway, where Gunhild would bring him up. Astrid then determined to go with her son to Gardereich, or Russia, where she had a brother, Sigurd Eriksson, who held a high position there. Olaf was then three years old. As they sailed out into the Baltic, however, they were captured by Vikings from Estonia, who made booty both of the people and their goods, killing some, and taking others as slaves. Thorolf, whom they considered too old for a slave, was killed. Olaf was separated from his mother, and an Estonian took him and a son of Thorolf as his share of the booty. The boys were sold for a stout and good ram, and a third man, called Rees, afterward bought Olaf for a good cloak. Olaf remained with Rees in Estonia for six years, 967 to 972, was treated well, and was much beloved by the people. Sigurd Eriksson, the brother of Astrid, happened to come to Estonia to collect taxes for King Valdemar, or Vladimir, king in Novgorod, Russia. In the marketplace he saw a very handsome boy, and as he could see that he was a foreigner, he asked him his name and family. The boy answered that his name was Olaf, that he was a son of Trig of Olofsson, and that Astrid, a daughter of Eric Biodaskal, was his mother. Sigurd thus discovered that the boy was his sister's son, and he bought him, and took him with him to Novgorod, he at first said nothing to the boy about their relationship, but treated him well. Olaf was then nine years old. One day Olaf was in the marketplace, where a great many people were assembled. There he saw and recognized Clerken, who had killed his foster father, Thorolf Luzerskeg, on the journey from Sweden. Olaf had a little axe in his hand, and with it he clothed Clerken's skull, and then he ran home and told his uncle Sigurd what he had done. Sigurd immediately took Olaf to Queen Elogia, told her what had happened, and begged her to protect the boy. The queen took a liking to the boy, paid the fine for the manslaughter he had committed, and induced King Valdemar to admit him to his court, where he was brought up as a king's son. Olaf remained with King Valdemar nine years, 973 to 981. At the age of eighteen Olaf was given ships by King Valdemar and set out on Viking cruises. After a plundering visit to the island of Bornholm he came to Vendland, Pomerania, where he married Queen Gyra, the daughter of King Burislav, and subdued the countries which had formerly belonged to her dominions. But had lately failed to pay her taxes. Every summer he made Viking cruises, and in the winter he stayed with Queen Gyra. Olaf had been three years in Venland and Gyra was taken sick and died. His grief was so great that he could not afterward stay in Venland. He then provided himself with warships and made Viking cruises to Denmark, England, Northumberland, Scotland, the Hebrides, the Isle of Man, and western France. On returning from France he was driven by a storm to the Scilly Isles, where he and all his men were baptized in the Christian faith. Afterward Olaf came to England, and married Princess Gaida, a daughter of the Irish King Olaf Kveren. The English annals contain many references to Olaf Tryggvason, and name him as chief of a fleet of nearly 400 ships which, in the year 991, harried the east coast of England and won a great battle. After which the Englishmen were compelled to pay him ten thousand pounds in silver. Three years later he again attacked the coast of England, and the English king, Ethelred, had to beg for peace and promised to pay him sixteen thousand pounds in silver. Olaf and his army went into winter quarters in Southampton. Soon afterward King Ethelred invited him to his home, Olaf accepted the invitation, and the two became good friends. During his stay with the king, Olaf was confirmed, and King Ethelred himself became his sponsor and gave him many precious gifts. Olaf, for his part, made a solemn vow that he would never again attack the coasts of England, a promise which he appears to have kept. Early in the year 995 Olaf proceeded to Norway, and arrived at Thrandjum just when the peasants had risen against Earl Haakon. They made him their chief, and when the Earl was dead, and his sons had fled, Olaf Tryggvason became king of Norway. Chapter 11 Olaf Tryggvason, 995-1000 Olaf Tryggvason was 27 years old when he came to Norway. 
At a general thing at Thrandjum the people elected him king of all Norway, as Harald the Fair-Haired had been, and in return he promised to enforce law and justice. The following spring and summer Olaf travelled through the whole country, to the southernmost part of Viken, and everywhere he was hailed as king, even by the chiefs in the uplands and in Viken, who, during the reign of Earl Haakon, had at least nominally acknowledged the suzerainty of the Danish king. In the uplands the petty kings, who were descendants of Harald the Fair-Haired, were allowed to retain their possessions on the old conditions. Olaf had decided, before he left England, to introduce Christianity in Norway, and he found it advisable to commence this work in Viken, where he had many of his relatives and warmest friends. Here was the rich and influential Loden, who, some time before, had married Olaf's mother Astrid. His mother's brothers and two brothers-in-law of Olaf were also mighty people in that part of the country. Another reason for starting the work here was that a good many had already adopted the Christian faith under the influence of missionaries from Germany and Denmark. During his stay in Viken, Olaf called his relatives together and informed them of his intention to convert the whole of Norway to the Christian faith. He would accomplish that, he said, or die in the attempt. But he promised to make his relatives great and mighty men if they would support him with all their power. This they agreed to do, and as the most powerful men among the people had now acceded to King Olaf's request, the others followed their example, and all the inhabitants of the east part of Viken allowed themselves to be baptized. Greater opposition was met in the north part of Viken, around Folden, where Christianity had not had so many former adherents. But Olaf would tolerate no opposition. Those who opposed him he punished severely, killing some, mutilating others, and driving some into banishment. During that summer, 996, and the following winter all Viken was made Christian. The next spring King Olaf Christianized Agder. He met no opposition until he came to Hordaland, where there were many mighty men. They met him fully armed at a public assembly, ready to resist. But after he had made his speech entreating them to accept Christianity, but adding that those who would not submit must expect punishment, their courage failed them, and all the people present were baptized before the assembly was dissolved. King Olaf then went with his men to the Gula Thing, where one of the chieftains asked of the king, as a sign of goodwill, that he give his sister Astrid in marriage to their relation, Erling Skielksen of Sol, whom they looked upon as one of the most hopeful men in the country. This the king readily acceded to, since Erling was a man of good birth and fine appearance. Erling Skielksen and Astrid were married in the summer, and the king, who was present at the wedding, at his departure invested Erling with all the land north of the Sohn Fjord and east to the Ladandisans. On the same terms as Harald the Fair-Haired had given land to his sons. After having Christianized the people of San, South Moor, Romsdal and North Moor, King Olaf, after a year's absence, returned to Thrandjum. At late he had the great heathen temple raised to the ground, took all the ornaments, and burned the temple with all the images. When the people heard of this they sent out war tokens and collected a great force, with which they intended to attack the king. In the meantime Olaf sailed with his men out of the fjord along the coast northward, intending to proceed to Halagaland and baptize there. But when he came out to Bjarnor, Bjornar, he heard from Halagaland that a force was assembled there to defend the country against the king. The chiefs of this force were Herek of Theata, Thora Hired from Vagar, and Ivan Kinrifa. At the same time he learned that the peasants in Thrandjum had now dispersed. He therefore turned about and sailed in through the Thrandjum fjord again. In the fall King Olaf laid the foundation of the future city of Nidaros at the mouth of the river Nid. He built his royal residence at Skippacrock, the ship's creek, built a church further up, and laid out building lots for the people. The work was pushed forward with energy, so that Olaf could take up his residence there in the winter, and by Christmas the church was also ready. At the beginning of the winter Olaf summoned the peasants to a thing at Frosta, and they came in great numbers, but also well armed. When the thing was called to order, the king began in a mild manner to preach Christianity. But the peasants soon objected, and the mighty Jernskeg, Ironbeard, who was their spokesman, said that the will of the people was now, as formerly, that the king should not break the laws. 
they wanted the king to offer sacrifice, as other kings before him had done. If he did not do as they wanted, they would kill him or banish him from the country. Seeing that the people were in earnest, and had a superior force present, King Olaf talked to them in a more conciliatory manner, promised to be present at their midwinter sacrifices, and said that they could then further discuss the proposed change of faith. This speech was well received, and the assembly dispersed. When Yuletide came, Olaf invited all the mighty peasants from Strinden, Galardal, and Orkadal to a feast at Laid. They came, were entertained in the best possible manner the first evening, and toward morning became quite drunk. The next day he called a house thing, where his men were present in much greater number than the peasants. He made a speech, in which he said that at Frosta he had offered them Christianity, but instead of accepting it they had demanded that he should offer sacrifice to their gods, as other kings had done. Now, he continued, if I shall turn again to making sacrifice, then will I make the greatest of sacrifices that are in use, and I will sacrifice men. But I will not select slaves or malefactors for this, but will take the greatest men only to be offered to the gods. Thereupon he selected eleven of the principal men, and all these, he said, he would offer in sacrifice to the gods for peace and a fruitful season, and ordered them to be laid hold of immediately. As the peasants saw that resistance was useless, they all submitted to the king's demands. He spared their lives on the condition that they should be baptized, take an oath to support the true faith, and renounce all sacrifices to the heathen gods. They were then baptized, and had to send their sons, brothers or other near relations as hostages. Later on, King Olaf came with his men to Marin, where the people were assembled. He promised to go into their temple to look at their ceremonies. But while there, he and his men knocked down and demolished the images of the gods, while the chief of the peasants, Jernskeg, was killed outside of the temple by one of the king's men. When the king came outside, he demanded that the peasants be baptized, or fight with him on the spot, and as their chief was dead, and there was a superior force against them, they yielded, were baptized, and gave hostages for their perseverance in the faith. In this and similar ways King Olaf succeeded in Christianizing, in name at least, practically the whole of Norway. Christianity was also introduced in Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and the Orkneys. Queen Sigrid the Haughty, Storad, widow of King Eric of Sweden, resided on her large estates in Gotland and wielded a great influence. Her son, Olaf the Swede, besides being king of Sweden, also ruled over Denmark, when Sven Tjugeskeg had been expelled. Many were her wooers, but she had so far rejected all, and she even caused two of them, her foster brother Harald Grensk and the Russian king Sevalot, to be killed, by being burned in their lodgings, in order, as she said, to make petty kings quit courting her. Olaf Tryggvason evidently thought that it would strengthen him if he could marry Sigrid, and sent messengers to her with a request for her hand. They were well received, and it was agreed that Olaf and Sigrid should meet at Konungahela, at the boundary line between Norway and Sweden, early in the spring. King Olaf sent Queen Sigrid as a gift the great gold ring he had taken from the heathen temple at Laid. She was greatly pleased with this ring, and had it passed around in her hall to be admired. When it came to her two goldsmiths they shook their heads, and upon being pressed, pronounced the ring false. The queen ordered the ring to be broken into pieces, and it was found to be copper inside. Sigrid became very angry, and said that Olaf would probably deceive her in more ways than this one. Early in the spring Olaf met Queen Sigrid at the appointed place, and it seemed that they were coming to an agreement. But when Olaf insisted that Sigrid should become a Christian and be baptized, she answered, I must not part from the faith which I have held, and my forefathers before me. But, on the other hand, I shall make no objection to your believing in the God that pleases you best. Then King Olaf became angry and struck her in the face with his glove, saying, Why should I care to have thee, an old faded woman, and a heathen jade? Greatly enraged Sigrid cried, This may some day be thy death. Thus they parted. The king set off to Viking, and the queen returned to Gotland. King Olaf unexpectedly met a new bride. The Danish king, 
Sven Jugaskeg, had compelled his sister Thyra to marry King Burisleif of Vendland. One but Thyra had been with this heathen and dissolute husband only a week when she fled back to Denmark, and afterward, in order to avoid her brother, went to Norway, where she met King Olaf. Thyra was a well-spoken woman, says the saga, and the king had pleasure in her conversation. He also saw that she was a handsome woman, although she cannot have been very young at that time, and the result was that they were married, much against the wish of Sven Jugaskeg. Shortly after this Sigrid the haughty married Sven Jugaskeg, who, by this relationship with King Olaf the Swede, recovered back his kingdom, Denmark. Their family connections also included the two sons of the late Earl Hawken, Eric, who married Sven Jugaskeg's daughter Gaida, and Sven, who married Holmfred, a sister of Olaf the Swede. Thus the chain was formed, which for a long time was to have influence on the destiny of Norway. Olaf Tryggvason and his wife, Thyra, spent the winter after their marriage at Nidaros, Thrandjum. Queen Thyra often complained, and wept bitterly over it, that she, who had great possessions in Vendland, had no property here suitable for a queen, and she entreated the king to go to Vendland and have her property there restored to her. But all King Olaf's friends advised him not to undertake such an expedition. It is told that on Palm Sunday the king was walking in the street, and met a man with a number of fine angelica roots, remarkably large for that early season. The king bought one, and brought it home to Queen Thyra, whom he found crying. He said to her, See here, queen, is a great angelica stock, which I give thee. But she threw it away and said, A greater present my father, Harold Gormson, gave to my mother, and he was not afraid to go out of the country and take what was his. But thou darest not go across the Danish dominions for that brother of mine, King Sven. Then King Olaf sprang up, and answered with a loud oath, Never did I fear thy brother, King Sven, and if we meet he shall give way before me. Shortly after Easter the king convoked a thing in the town, and proclaimed to the people that in the summer he would go upon an expedition abroad, and announced how many ships and men he wanted from each district. The king had then just finished a ship which was larger and more magnificent than any other ship in the country. This ship was called the Long Serpent, Orman Lang. The crew was made up of picked men of great strength and courage, none of them more than sixty or less than twenty years of age. The only exception was Einar Thambeskelfer, who was only eighteen years old. Einar was unusually strong, and was considered the most skillful archer. He had a bow called Tham, which he was wont to make quake, hence his name, Thambeskelfer, i.e., Than Quaker. The king himself commanded the Long Serpent. His half-brother, Thorkel Nephia, commanded the Short Serpent, and his mother's brothers, Thorkel Dydril and Jostian, had the Crane, Trainen, and both these ships were well manned. King Olaf had sixty ships when he left Norway, and sailed southward through the Sound to Vendland. With him, on board the Long Serpent, were Queen Thyra, his sister Ingebjorg, Bishop Sigurd, and several priests. Many of his friends had joined him on the journey south along the Norwegian coast, among them his brother-in-law, Erling Skielksen of Sol, who had a large and well-equipped ship. When King Olaf arrived in Vendland, he was well received by King Burisleif, his claims to Queen Thyra's estates were peaceably settled, and he remained there a portion of the summer. Sigrid the Haughty was Olaf Tryggvason's bitterest enemy after their meeting at Konungahela, when he struck her in the face with his glove. She urged King Sven much to fight King Olaf, saying that he had the more reason to do so, as Olaf had married his sister Thyra without his leave. King Sven finally resolved to attack King Olaf. He sent messengers to his brother-in-law, King Olaf the Swede, and to Earl Eric, inviting them to join him with an army, so that they all together might attack King Olaf Tryggvason. He also sent Earl Sigvald to Venland to spy out Olaf Tryggvason's movements, and by pretending friendship gain his confidence and lead him into a trap. Between the island of Rugen and the mainland of the present Prussian province of Pomerania lies a little island called Greifswalter Oi, or Svolder, as it was called at that time. Here lay on the 9th of September, in the year 1000, a fleet of eighty ships. Sixty of them belonged to the Danish king Sven Jugaskeg, fifteen to the Swedish king Olaf, and five to Earl Eric. 
They lay there waiting for King Olaf to pass by on his return home from Vendland. With a light but favorable breeze the Norwegian fleet sailed out of the harbor, where it had been lying during the stay in Vendland. All the small vessels, which sailed faster, got out to sea before the others. Earl Sigvald with his ships remained near the king for a while, and then sailed ahead telling the king to sail in his keel tracks, as he knew best where the water was deepest. The earl, who was informed of the presence of the Danish fleet, sailed close under the island of Svolder, and Olaf Tryggvason with his remaining eleven large ships followed. Meanwhile, the Danish king Sven, the Swedish king Olaf, and Earl Eric, gathered their forces and made ready for battle. When Olaf Tryggvason sailed in toward the island, the whole fleet of the enemy came out against him. When his chieftains saw this superior force they begged the king to proceed on his way, and not risk a battle against such odds. But the king, standing high on the quarter-deck of the long serpent, replied, Strike the sails. Never shall men of mine think of flight. I never fled from battle. Let God dispose of my life, but flight I shall never take. King Olaf ordered the ships to close up to each other. The long serpent lay in the middle of the line. On one side lay the little serpent, and on the other the crane. King Olaf stood on the quarter-deck of the serpent, high over the others. He had a gilt shield, and a golden helmet, and over his armor he had a short red jacket, so that he was easily distinguished from the others. When he saw the enemy's ships drawing up for battle, he asked, Who is the chief of the force right ahead of us? The answer came that it was King Sven with the Danish army. The king said, We are not afraid of these soft Danes, for there is no courage in them. But who are those on the right? He was answered, that it was King Olaf with the Swedish forces. Better it were, said King Olaf, for these Swedes to stay at home licking their sacrificial vessels too than to come under our weapons. But who owns the large ships on the other side of the Danes? That is Earl Eric, the son of Hawken, said his men. Then the king said, He, methinks, has good reason for meeting us, and from these men we may expect the sharpest conflict, for they are Northmen like ourselves. The battle commenced and became very severe, and many people were slain. King Sven made a violent attack on the long serpent, but was soon compelled to retreat. Then Olaf the Swede came up with his fifteen ships, but he fared no better, and the king himself had a narrow escape from death. When Earl Eric came up with his ships the fight became most severe, and a great number of people fell. The men from the smaller ships soon began to seek refuge on board the Long Serpent, and at last all King Olaf Tryggvason's ships were cleared of men except the Long Serpent. Then Earl Eric brought his ship up to the side of the Serpent, and the fight went on with battle-axe and sword. Einar Thambuskelfer stood at the mast of the Serpent and sent deadly arrows from his bow. He sent an arrow at Earl Eric, which hit the tiller end just above the Earl's head so hard that it entered the wood up to the arrow shaft. The Earl had hardly time to ask whose shot it was, when another arrow flew between his arm and his side, and clear through a board behind him. Again Einar drew his bow, when it was hit by an arrow from the enemy and broke in two. What was it that broke with such a noise, cried King Olaf. Norway, King, from thy hands, answered Einar. Not so, said the king, take my bow and shoot, and the king threw his own bow to Einar. Einar took the bow, and drew it over the head of the arrow. Too weak, too weak, said he, is the bow of the king, and, throwing it aside, he took sword and shield, and fought desperately. Finally, after a terrible combat, the earl's men boarded the serpent, and the few men who were left were killed or leaped overboard. King Olaf held his shield over his head when he threw himself in the water, and was drowned. Among the last men to leave the ship were Einar Thambuskelfer, who was captured in the water, and Thorkel Nefia, who swam ashore. King Olaf Tryggvason was thirty-six years old when he fell at Svolder. His widow, Queen Thyra, died shortly afterward from grief. Chapter 12 The Discovery of America during the reign of Earl Hawken a man from Jadaran, called Eric the Red, being obliged to leave Norway because he had killed a man, 
proceeded to the western part of Iceland. Here he committed a similar offence and was condemned at Thorsten's thing to banishment. He had heard that a man called Gunbiron, son of Ulf Krage, had some time ago been driven by the storm far westward and had seen a great country. Eric the Red fitted out a vessel and told his friends that he intended to find the country Gunbiron had seen. He took with him a man by the name of Hiriolf Bardson. They found the country, 984, and on a visit later to Iceland Eric the Red gave such a fine description of the new country that it was called Greenland. A number of colonists returned with him to the new country, and the foundation of several settlements were laid. In the summer of 999 Leif Eriksson, a son of Eric the Red, made a visit to Norway, and as he met King Olaf Tryggvason he adopted Christianity, and passed the winter with the king. In the following spring King Olaf sent Leif Eriksson, together with a priest and other teachers, to Greenland to proclaim Christianity there. Flourishing colonies, with churches, monasteries, and bishoprics, are known to have been maintained in Greenland until the end of the 14th century. Bjarne Hiriolfsson, a son of the above-named Hiriolf Bard son, while sailing westward from Iceland in search of his father, met with stormy weather, northerly winds and fogs, and was driven out of his course. As he came to different shores, which, from the description he had received, could not be those of Greenland, he turned around, and, sailing in a northeasterly direction, finally arrived at his father's home in Greenland. When telling of his discovery he was much ridiculed for not having landed and examined the new countries. Leif Eriksson bought Bayern's ship, and with a crew of thirty-five men set out, in the year 1000, to look for these lands. He came first to a land on his right as he sailed southward. It had great icy mountains in the interior and a shore of flat stones. He therefore named the country Helioland, from the Norse Hela, a flat stone. He continued his course southward, and came to another country, which was level and covered with woods and had a low coast. He called this country Markland, Outfield or Woodland. The antiquaries consider Helioland to have been Newfoundland, and Markland some part of Nova Scotia. Leif and his party put to sea again with a northeast wind, and after two days sailing made land, and came to an island lying on the north side of the mainland. They entered the channel between the island and a point projecting northeast from the mainland, and at last landed at a place where a river which came from a lake fell into the sea. They found the country very agreeable, and, resolving to winter there, erected some houses. Leif divided his people into two parties, to be employed in turns in exploring the country and working about the houses. One evening it happened that one of the exploring party, a German by birth, named Turker, was missing. They went out to search for him, and when they met him he told them he had been up the country, and had discovered vines and grapes, a fruit with which he was acquainted from his native country. They now occupied themselves in gathering grapes and cutting vines, and felling timber with which they loaded the vessel. Leif called the country Vinland. Toward spring they made ready and sailed away, and returned to Greenland. In the year 1002 Leif Eriksson's brother, Thorvald, fitted out a ship and sailed southward with thirty men, after consulting with Leif. They came to Vinland, to the houses put up by Leif, where they remained quietly all winter, and lived by fishing. In the spring Thorvald sent a party in the long boat to explore the country to the south. They found the country beautiful and well wooded, but with little space between the woods and the sea, and the strand full of white sand. There were also many islands, and shallow water. They came back in the autumn to Leif's houses. The following spring Thorvald sailed with his vessel eastward, then northward along the land. Outside of a cape they met bad weather and were driven ashore and broke their keel. They remained there a long time to repair their vessel. Thorvald said to his men, We will stick up the keel here upon the ness and call the place Keelness. Three then they sailed eastward along the country and landed on a headland, which Thorvald liked so well that he said he would like to make his home there. On going on board they saw three little hills on the sandy shore. They went up to them and found they were three canoes, made of skin, with three natives, or scralings, as the Northmen called them, under each canoe. They killed eight of them, while one made his escape in his canoe. 
Afterward a great number of the natives attacked Thorvald's party. They were repulsed, but Thorvald was wounded by an arrow and died. He was buried on the headland which he had said he liked so well. His men remained there during the winter, and in the spring returned to Greenland. In the summer of 1006, an Icelander by the name of Thorfinn Karlsefn came to Greenland, and, in the winter, married Gudrid, the widow of Thorstein, third brother of Leif Erikson. By her advice he resolved to undertake an expedition to Vinland and establish a colony there. In the spring, 1007, they set out with three ships, 160 men, and all kinds of livestock, and sailed to Vinland. Some time after their arrival there Gudrid bore a son, who was named Snor. The colonists occasionally traded with the Skraelings, giving them pieces of cloth and dairy products for their skins. But when they refused to sell them weapons, the Skraelings became hostile to the settlers and attacked them repeatedly. These constant hostilities so disheartened the settlers that they resolved to leave the country, and, after three years' sojourn in Vinland, Thorfinn Karlsefn and his party returned to Greenland. Another expedition to Vinland was undertaken, shortly after their return, by Frydis, the illegitimate daughter of Eric the Red, her husband Thorvald, and two Norwegians named Helga and Finboge. This party quarreled among themselves, and Frydis, who is described as a very bad woman, caused a great number of them to be murdered. The survivors returned to Greenland in the spring of 1013. The next summer, Thorfinn Karlsefn went to Norway with his Vinland cargo and sold it to great advantage. He returned to Iceland and bought land there, and, according to the saga, many men of distinction are descended from him and his son Snor, who was born in Vinland.4. Chapter 13 The Earls Eric and Sven, sons of Hawken, 1000-1015 After the Battle of Svolder, the three allied princes divided the kingdom of Norway between them. King Olaf the Swede got four districts in the Throngem country, and the districts of North Moor and South Moor and Romsdal, and in the eastern part of the country he got Ranreich from the Gott River to Svinesund. Earl Eric got four districts in the Throngem country, and Halagaland, Namudal, the Fjord districts, San, Hordaland, Rogaland, and North Agder, all the way to the Nays, Lindesnes, the southernmost point in Norway. The Danish king, Sven Jugeskeg, retained Viken, which he had held before, and Romerike and Hedmarken. After the division, the Swedish king gave his Norwegian possessions into the hands of his brother-in-law Sven, the brother of Earl Eric, on the same conditions as the sub-kings or earls held such possessions formerly from the chief king. At the same time the Danish king gave most of his possessions in Norway in fief to Earl Eric. Thus the two brothers together ruled over a larger territory than their father, Earl Hawken, had held, but they were not able to wield the same power. During his whole time, Earl Eric received no taxes from Rogaland, which Erling Skielksen ruled over with unlimited authority. The earls Eric and Sven were baptized, and adopted the Christian faith. But as long as they ruled in Norway they allowed everyone to do as he pleased as to the manner of observing his Christianity. On the other hand, they upheld the old laws, and all the old rites and customs of the country. They were popular men and good rulers. Of the two brothers Earl Eric had most to say in all public matters. The earls tried to gain the friendship of Olaf Tryggvason's old friends, and in many cases they succeeded. The brave young Einar Thambeskelfer was won over by their giving him great fiefs in Orkadal, so that he became one of the most powerful and esteemed men in all the Throngem country. They also gave him their proud sister Bergliot in marriage. One mighty man, however, they tried in vain to conciliate. That was Erling Skielksen, the brother-in-law of Olaf Tryggvason. He could not forgive Earl Eric for having joined the Swedes and Danes in an unexpected attack on Olaf Tryggvason and causing his death. He managed to maintain a firm hold on the dominions his brother-in-law had given him. If the earls visited a neighborhood where they knew that Erling was staying, they always took with them a large armed force, and they never thought of visiting Erling on his estate, so. He had with him never less than ninety free men. If it was reported that the earls were in the neighborhood, he had two hundred men or more. He never went by water from one place to another except in a fully manned ship of twenty benches of rowers. 
In the summer he used to make Viking cruises in order to procure means with which to support his many men. Erling was a good master. At home, on his estate, he always had thirty slaves besides the many servants engaged in work outside. He gave each of them a certain day's work, when one of them was through with that, he had the balance of the day at his own disposal. Each one received a piece of land to cultivate, and what grain he produced he could sell and use the proceeds toward buying himself free. The amount needed for this purpose was fixed by the earl, and it was so low that many bought their freedom at the end of a year, while all who were at all industrious could make themselves free within three years. He also assisted his men after they had become free. Some of them were given land to clear and cultivate, while others were shown how to conduct the herring fisheries. After the death, in England, of the Danish king, Sven Jugeskeg, his son, Canute, Canute, the mighty, sent word to Earl Eric in Norway, his brother-in-law, to come over and help him to conquer England. The Earl immediately called together the mightiest peasants, and in their presence divided the country between his brother Sven and his son Hawken. As the latter was only seventeen years old, the Earl appointed his brother-in-law, Einar Thambeskelfer, guardian for him. Thereupon Earl Eric set sail for England. He met King Canute there, and was with him when he captured London. He was given Northumberland to govern, and remained there until his death. From the short joint reign of Earl Sven and Earl Hawken in Norway only one event of importance is known. As soon as Earl Eric had left the country, they effected a reconciliation with the mighty Erling Skielksen at Seoul, who had never been able to forgive Earl Eric for the assault on Olaf Tryggvason, but readily made peace with Sven and Hawken. And the new friendship was further cemented by a slack, Erling's son, marrying Earl Sven's daughter Gunhild, or Sigrid, as the name is given in another place. One good reason why the earls sought to strengthen their power by an alliance with the powerful chieftain, Erling Skielksen, was no doubt the unexpected appearance of a most threatening enemy, the young pretender to the throne, Olaf. Son of Harald Grensk Chapter 14 The Youth of Olaf Haraldson Olaf Haraldson, after his death called Olaf the Saint, was the son of Harald Grensk and Asta. Harald Grensk, who, as we have seen, at one time governed Viking under the suzerainty of the Danish king, was the grandson of Bjorn the Merchant, who was killed by Eric Bloodaxe, and a great-grandson of Harald the Fair-Haired. Olaf was born shortly after the death of his father. His mother Asta was then staying at the home of her father, Gudbrand Kula, a mighty man in the uplands. Soon afterward, Asta was married again to Sigurd Seer, who was king in Ringerike and a descendant of Harald the Fair-Haired, and in his house Olaf was brought up. When King Olaf Tryggvason came to Ringerike to spread Christianity, he induced Sigurd Seer and his whole family to be baptized, and he acted as godfather at the baptism of little Olaf. One day, when Olaf was ten years old, King Sigurd wanted to ride out, and, as there was nobody else about the house, he told his stepson Olaf to go and saddle his horse. Olaf did not refuse, but he went to the goat's pen, and put the king's saddle on the largest he-goat, led him up to the door, and went in and told King Sigurd that his horse was saddled. When King Sigurd came out and saw what Olaf had done, he said, Easy it is to see that thou wilt little regard my orders, and thy mother will think it right that I do not order thee to do anything against thy own inclination. I see well enough that thou art far more proud than I am. Olaf answered little, but went his way laughing. When Olaf grew up he became of medium height, but very stout and strong. He had light brown hair, and a broad face which was white and red. He had particularly fine eyes, which were beautiful, but piercing, so that one was afraid to look him in the face when he was angry. Olaf was very expert in all bodily exercises, understood well how to handle his bow, and was especially an expert in throwing his spear. He was well liked by his friends and acquaintances, was ambitious in his sports, and always strove to be the first. Olaf was twelve years old when, for the first time, he went on board a ship of war, 1007. His mother, Asta, got Rain, who was called foster father of kings, to command the ship and take Olaf under his charge. The men on board, however, gave Olaf the title of king. 
With two ships, Olaf first steered to Denmark and then to Sweden, where he harried the coasts and fought with Vikings. Afterward he made cruises to Finland, Russia, and Gotland. Later he turned westward to Friesland and England, where he took part in the fights between the Danes and the Anglo-Saxons. From the poems of the Skalds it appears that he took part in the Battle of Hringmara, 1010, and in the Storming of Canterbury, 1012. In company with Thorkel the Tall, a brother of Earl Sigvald, he entered the English King Ethelred's service, took part in his battles against the Danish Vikings, and accompanied Ethelred on his flight to Normandy. From here he thought of making a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, but on the way he had, according to tradition, a remarkable dream. He thought he saw a tall and handsome man, who told him to return to Norway and take his Udal, adding, For thou shalt be king over thy country forever. Chapter 15 Olaf the Saint, 1015-1028 Leaving his long ships, battleships, behind him at Northumberland, Olaf sailed, in the fall of 1015, with two merchant ships and 120 well-armed men, across the North Sea to Norway. After a stormy voyage he landed on the west coast of Norway, near a small island called Sela. King Olaf thought this was a good omen, because that word means luck. He sailed southward to Ulfasund, where he heard that Earl Hawken was south in San, and was expected north with a single ship as soon as the wind was favorable. King Olaf then sailed further south, and when he came to Sadungsund he laid one of his vessels on each side of the sound, with a thick cable between them. Soon after Earl Hawken came rowing into the sound with a manned ship. They saw Olaf's ships, but thought they were only two merchant vessels, and rowed in between them. When the ship was over the cable, Olaf's men on each side wounded up with the windlass, so that Hawken's ship upset, and all his men plunged into the water. Most of them, however, were picked up and taken on board Olaf's ship. Only a few were drowned. Among those saved was Earl Hawken. He was a very handsome boy of eighteen years, with fair, silken hair, bound about his head with a gold ornament. When Olaf saw him, he said, True it is what has been said of your family, you are handsome people, but now your luck has deserted you. Hawken replied, It is always so, that sometimes one is victorious, and sometimes another. I am little beyond childhood in years, besides, we did not expect any attack. It may turn out better with me another time. But dost thou not fear that thou art now in such a condition that, hereafter, there will be neither victory nor defeat for thee, asked the king. That all depends upon thee, said the earl. Olaf then asked what he would give if he were allowed to go unhurt. The earl asked what he demanded. Nothing, said the king, except that thou shalt leave the country and take an oath that thou shalt never go into battle against me. Earl Hawken agreed to this, took the oath, and rode away with his men. As soon as possible he sailed over to England, to his mother's brother, King Canute, who received him well. His father, Earl Eric, whom he afterward joined, considered his son's oath binding upon him also, and he therefore made no attempt to win back the lost kingdom, but remained in Northumberland until his death, 1024. King Olaf now went southward along the coast, holding things with the peasants in many places. Many went willingly with him, while others, who were Earl Sven's relations or friends, refused him allegiance. He therefore decided first to apply to his relations, the kings in the uplands, and see what support he could gain from them for his cause. He sailed east to Viken, set his ships on land, and proceeded with 120 men up the country to Ringerike, to meet his stepfather, Sigurd Seer. The story of his reception at his mother's home, as detailed in Snor Sturluson's Heimskringla, is very interesting, and gives a vivid picture of the life and customs at the home of a rich and mighty Norwegian in those days. The main portion of the description is here given. As Olaf was approaching Sigurd Seer's home some of the servants ran ahead to the house. Olaf's mother, Asta, was sitting in the room, and around her some of her girls. When the servants told her that King Olaf was coming, and that he might soon be expected, Asta immediately got up, and ordered men and girls to put everything in the best order. She ordered four girls to bring out all that belonged to the decoration of the room, and put it in order with hangings and benches. 
Two men brought straw for the floor, two brought forward four-corner tables and the drinking jugs, two bore out victuals and placed the meat on the table, two she sent away from the house to procure in the greatest haste all that was needed. And two carried in the ale. And all the other serving men and girls went outside of the house. Messengers went to seek King Sigurd wherever he might be, and brought to him his dress clothes, and his horse with gilt saddle, and his bridle which was gilt and set with precious stones. For men she sent off in different directions to invite all the great people to a feast, which she was preparing as a rejoicing for her son's return. She made all who were in the house dress themselves with the best they had, and lent clothes to those who had none suitable. King Sigurd Seer was in the field superintending the harvest work when the messengers came to him with the news, and told him all that Asta was doing at the house. He had many people with him working in the field. He probably did not like the interruption of the work caused by his wife's message, but he dressed himself in the fine clothes sent him, mounted his horse, and rode home together with thirty well-dressed men whom he had sent for. As they rode up to the house, Olaf, under his banner, was seen coming up from the other side with one hundred and twenty men all well equipped. People were also gathered all around. King Sigurd saluted his stepson, and invited him and his men to come and drink with him. But Asta went up and kissed her son, and invited him to stay with them, saying that all the land and people she could furnish would be at his service. King Olaf thanked her kindly for her invitation. Then she took him by the hand, and led him into the room to the high seat, while King Sigurd got men to take care of their clothes, and see that the horses were cared for. Then Sigurd went in, and a great feast was had. King Olaf had not been at the place many days before he called his stepfather, King Sigurd, his mother Asta, and his foster father Rain to a conference and consultation. He informed them that it was his intention to win back from the Danes and the Swedes the land of his forefathers or die in the attempt. He asked Sigurd to help him, and give him the best possible advice in the matter. King Sigurd thought the plan was very risky, but knew from experience that it would be useless to try to dissuade Olaf from it. He would, therefore, help him with goods and money. But he would not bind himself to anything more, before he knew the views and intentions of the other upland kings. In the uplands there lived at that time many descendants from Harald the Fair-Haired. They all bore the title of king, although their possessions were small. After the death of Olaf Tryggvason they had acknowledged the suzerainty of the Danish king. One of them ruled over Romerike, Hadeland and though ten, another over Valders. In Gudbrandsdal there was a king named Gudrod, and in Hedmarken two brothers, Rorek and Ring, were the rulers. With these district king Sigurd Seer had a meeting in Hadeland which King Olaf also attended. Here Sigurd announced his stepson Olaf's purpose, and asked their aid to accomplish the plan. He also told of the many brave deeds which Olaf had performed on his war expeditions. King Rorek then made a speech against the proposed change. The people, he said, had had many experiences. When King Hawken, Athelstan's foster son, was king, all were content. But when Gunhild's sons ruled over the country, they became so hated for their tyranny that the people would rather have foreign kings, who usually left the people to themselves if only the taxes were paid. When Earl Hawken had succeeded in establishing himself firmly as a ruler with the help of the people, he became so hard and overbearing toward them that they could no longer tolerate him. They killed him, and raised to the kingly power Olaf Tryggvason, who was Udalborn to the kingdom, and in every way well qualified to be a chief. The whole country's wish was to make him supreme king, and raise again the kingdom which Harald the Fair-Haired had established. But when King Olaf had become secure in his power, no man could manage his own affairs for him. With the small kings he was very hard, and collected even greater tribute than Harald the Fair-Haired had done. A man was not even allowed to believe in what God he pleased. After Olaf Tryggvason had been taken away, they had kept friendly with the Danish king, and had received great help from him in everything, they had been allowed to rule themselves, and had experienced no oppression. Rorek was, therefore, inclined to let well enough alone, and declined to take any part in the proposed plan. His brother Ring was of a different opinion. 
He said that even if he only could keep the same power and property that he held now, he would prefer to see one of his own race as supreme king rather than a foreign chief. And if Olaf succeeded in making himself supreme king, those of them would fare best who had best deserved his friendship. He believed Olaf to be an honorable man, and if they gave him aid now he would certainly show his gratitude afterward. He was in favor of giving Olaf all possible friendship and support. The others, one after the other, expressed the same opinion, and the result was that the most of them entered into a league with King Olaf. This league was confirmed by oath. Thereafter the king summoned a thing, and here Olaf explained in a long speech what claims he had to the throne of Harald the Fair-Haired. He requested the peasants to elect him king, and he promised them to uphold the old laws, and to defend the country. His speech was very well received. Then the different kings spoke in support of his request, and the result was that King Olaf was proclaimed king over the whole country according to the laws of the uplands. The king thereupon proceeded through the uplands accompanied by 360 men, and from all directions the people flocked to him and hailed him as their king. From the uplands King Olaf hastened over the Davra mountain to the Thrandjum country. It was of importance to come there before the reports of his proceedings reached Earl Sven, who was about to celebrate Christmas at Steinkir. At Metaldal, in Orkidal, he summoned the peasants to a thing, where he requested them to accept him as king. They were without a leader and did not have sufficient strength to offer opposition to the king. So the result was that they took the oath of allegiance. At Gryatar he met an army of about 800 men, which had been collected by Einar Thambaskelfer, but had been left without a leader while Einar went to Galdal to get more men. Olaf offered the men peace and law, the same as King Olaf Tryggvason offered before me, and then presented them with two conditions, either to enter his service or fight him. The result was that they hailed him as their king. When Earl Sven heard of this, he fled from Steinkier with a long ship and proceeded to Frosta. After having reached Steinkier, Olaf again summoned a thing, and compelled the people to recognize him as their king. He thereupon sailed to Nidaros, where he made preparations to celebrate Christmas. Earl Sven and Einar Thambaskelfer meanwhile gathered an army of 2,400 men, with which they suddenly descended upon Nidaros. Olaf and his men barely escaped, and fled southward to the uplands by the same way they had come. Earl Sven took the Christmas provisions which Olaf's party had been obliged to leave and then burned the town of Nidaros. Olaf spent the winter in the uplands, and in the spring gathered an army with which he intended to meet Earl Sven. The kings in Hedmarken furnished him with many armed men, and his stepfather, Sigurd Seer, joined him with a great force. During the winter he had built a ship, which was named, Karl Shoved, Karl's Head, possibly intended to represent the head of Charlemagne, whose name was held in great veneration. On the bow of the ship was a crowned head, which the king himself had carved. With a fine and well-equipped fleet Olaf set out from Viken, going first to Tunsberg. Earl Sven in the meanwhile collected a great force in the north. Many of the chiefs were his relatives and friends, and were able to give him great assistance. His brother-in-law, Einar Thambaskelfer, was on his side, and with him many other lendermen, a sort of local governors. And among them were many who had taken oath of allegiance to King Olaf the winter before. Earl Sven sailed south along the coast, drawing men from every district. When they came to Rogaland, Erling Skielgsen of Seoul joined them with a considerable force. Sven's fleet is said to have consisted of 45 ships, with probably upward of 2,500 men. Olaf hardly had half the number of ships, but his ships were considerably larger, so that the number of men was probably about the same. Toward the end of Easter he entered Viken with his fleet and put in at Nizir, Nesh, a headland on the east side of the bay, near Fredericksvern. On Palm Sunday, March 25, 1016, the two fleets met in battle. Before opening the battle Olaf had his ships tied together, his own ship, Karl Shoved, occupying a place in the center. On this ship were 120 men armed in coats of mail, French helmets, and white shields, on which was a gilt or painted cross. Olaf had a white banner on which the figure of a serpent was sewed. The king instructed his men to defend themselves with the shields in the beginning, 
and take care of their lances and arrows, so that they were not thrown away to no purpose. This advice was followed with good results. When the conflict had become exceedingly sharp, and the missiles began to be scarce on the Earl's side, Olaf's men were well supplied, and their attack was very severe. Men fell in great numbers on both sides, but mostly on the Earl's ships. King Olaf with the Karl shoved engaged Earl Sven's ship, and his men were soon preparing to enter it. The Earl, seeing his defeat, ordered his ship cut loose from the others, and at the last moment his brother-in-law, Einar Thambeskelfer, succeeded in pulling the ship out of the line of battle from behind, using his own vessel as a towboat. When the Earl's ship was gone, the flight became general. Some of the Earl's men fled up the country, others surrendered on the king's mercy, but Earl Sven and his followers escaped out through the bay. Sven proceeded to Sweden to seek the aid of the Swedish king, while Erling Skielksen and some other chiefs sailed westward and returned to their homes. Earl Sven was well received by King Olaf the Swede, and it was agreed that next winter they should proceed with an armed force overland through Helsingland and Gentiland and down to the Thrandjum country. For the Earl depended upon the faithful help of the people there. The summer was to be spent in Viking expeditions in the Baltic. Sven made a cruise to Russia and plundered the coasts, in the fall he was taken sick there and died, 1016. King Olaf went north after the Battle of Nesh, and settled down in Nidaros, where he rebuilt the royal residence and the church, and helped the merchants to rebuild the town. After the death of Earl Sven he was readily recognized by all the people in that part of the country as the rightful king. The Swedish king became very angry when he heard that he had lost the possessions in Norway which he had won by the Battle of Svolder, and he threatened to take great revenge upon Olaf the Big. A nickname which he had given his Norwegian opponent on account of his stoutness. He sent tax collectors into Norway, and when these were harshly treated, some of them even being killed, Olaf the Swede was highly enraged, and war between the two kings was threatened. King Olaf made preparations for an emergency, although he much preferred peace, and even wished to marry the Swedish king's daughter. He built fortifications on a headland in the river Glamen, near the falls of Sarpen, and around these fortifications he laid the foundation of the town of Borg or Sarpsborg. The people on both sides of the boundary were very much displeased with the feud between the kings, and on both sides the kings were urged to make peace. The Norwegian king was willing enough, and sent conciliatory messages to Olaf the Swede, but the latter rejected all overtures. Finally the matter was brought to a crisis at a general thing assembled at the Swedish city of UPS. Here the king at first also refused to hear the propositions for peace, when Thorgny Lagman, lawman, a kind of judge at the thing, rose. And made the following speech, the disposition of Swedish kings is different now from what I hear it was formerly. My grandfather, Thorgny, could well remember the UPS king Erik Imundsen, and used to tell of him that when he was in his best years he went out every summer on expeditions, and conquered Finland and Carolin. Estonia and Kurland and many parts of the eastern country. Even at the present day the earth bulwarks and other great works which he made are to be seen. And yet, he was not so proud that he would not listen to those who had something to say to him. Thorgny, my father, was a long time with King Bjorn, and well knew his ways and manners. At that time the kingdom was in great power and suffered no losses. He, too, was sociable with his men. I also remember Eric the Victorious, and was with him on many a war expedition. He enlarged the Swedish dominion and bravely defended it, and with him also it was easy to talk about public affairs. But the king we now have allows no one to talk with him of anything but what he himself desires to hear. He wants to have Norway laid under him, which no Swedish king before him ever desired, and thereby causes many men to be alarmed. But now it is the will expressed by us peasants that thou, King Olaf, make peace with the king of Norway, and give him thy daughter Ingigerd in marriage. If thou wilt reconquer the countries on the Baltic which thy relations and ancestors had there, we will all go with thee. But if thou wilt not now consent to what we demand, we will no longer suffer law and peace to be disturbed, but will attack thee and kill thee. So our forefathers did when, at the Mora thing, 
they drowned five kings in a morass because they were filled with the same insupportable pride thou hast shown toward us. Now tell us, in all haste, which of these two conditions thou wilt choose. The whole public approved, with clash of arms and shouts, the speech of Thordney Lagman. Then the king rose and said he would do as the people desired. All Swedish kings, he said, have done so, and have allowed the peasants to rule in all according to their will. The murmur among the people then came to an end, and it was decided that the terms of peace offered by the Norwegian king were to be accepted, and that Ingegerd, the king's daughter, was to be married to King Olaf of Norway. In the meanwhile King Olaf travelled through the country, and carefully investigated the manner in which Christianity was observed. Where he found the people lacking in Christian knowledge, he taught them and furnished them with Christian teachers. If he met with obstinate opposition, he acted with severity and cruelty. If any there were, says the saga, who would not renounce heathen ways, he took the matter so zealously that he drove some out of the country, mutilated others on hands or feet, or stung their eyes out, hanged some, slew some with the sword. But let none go unpunished who would not serve God. In this way he proceeded through the country, accompanied by 360 armed men. King Olaf soon found that Christianity was thriving less the further he proceeded into the interior. In the uplands five small kings came together at Ringsacre, and under the leadership of King Rorek conspired to kill King Olaf. But it happened here, says the saga, as it usually does, that every one has some friend even among his enemies. Kettle Calf of Ringens, who was present at the meeting of the conspirators, went down after supper to the lake, Myasen, and boarded a little vessel which King Olaf had made him a present of after the battle at Nesh. He had forty well-armed men with him, and rode in all haste down the lake. He arrived early in the morning at Ede, Eidsvold, where he found the king and told him of the intention of the small kings of Upland. King Olaf immediately gathered his men, sailed north to Ringsacre, surprised the conspirators, and captured them. King Olaf now availed himself of the opportunity that chance had given him, to rid himself of royal rivals who, as descendants of Harold the Fair-Haired, claimed under the law to have as much right to their possessions as any supreme king, and who had always been in the way of a national unity. King Olaf now, by one decisive act, secured the unity and independence of the country, and prepared the way for the victorious entrance of Christianity. King Ring and two other kings were banished from Norway, under oath never to return. Rorek was a treacherous man and could not be depended upon, so the king ordered both his eyes put out, and afterward took him with him in that condition wherever he went. He ordered Gudrod Valley King's tongue to be cut out, and of the lendermen and peasants who were implicated in the conspiracy some he banished from the country, some he mutilated, and with others he made peace. King Olaf took possession of the land that these kings had possessed. His stepfather, Sigurd Seer, who had had nothing to do with the conspiracy of the other small kings, died during the winter, 1018, and now Olaf alone bore the title of king in Norway. Shortly after his stepfather Sigurd Seer's death, Olaf went to visit his mother, Asta, and on this occasion it is told that she took her boys, half-brothers of Olaf, to show them to the king. King Olaf took Guthorm on one knee and his brother Halfdan on the other. He made a wry face at the boys, and pretended to be angry, and they became frightened and ran away. Then Asta brought in her youngest son, Harald, who was then three years old. The king made a wry face at him also, but the boy only stared back at him. The king then took hold of the boy's hair as if to pull it, but the boy in return pulled the king's whiskers. Thou wilt probably be revengeful some day, my friend, said the king. The following day Olaf and Asta were watching the boys at play down by the lake, at the Tirifjord. Guthorm and Halfdan had built houses and barns and had little figures representing cattle and sheep. Little Harold was down by the water, where he had little chips of wood floating. The king asked him what they were, and Harold answered that they were warships. The king laughed, and said, the time may come, kinsman, when thou wilt command ships. Then the king called Guthorm and Halfdan up to him, and asked them what they would like to have above all. Fields, answered Guthorm. And how large, asked the king. 
I would have that headland yonder sown with corn every summer, answered the boy. The headland included ten farms. There would be a great deal of corn there, said the king. Turning to Halfton, he asked what he would like best to have. Cows, said Halfton. And how many, asked the king. So many that when they came to the lake to drink they would stand close together around the whole lake, was the answer. You both take after your father in wanting a great husbandry, said the king. But what wouldst thou have, he asked Harold. Men, replied the boy. And how many? So many that in a single meal they would eat all of Halfton's cows, was the answer. The king laughed, and said to Asta, Here, mother, thou art bringing up a king. And more is not related of them on this occasion, says the saga. But the prophecy was fulfilled, for Harold, Sigurd's son, in time became king of Norway. The Swedish king broke the promises he had given at the UPS thing, and did not send his daughter Ingigerd to the appointed meeting place on the boundary, when King Olaf of Norway came to fetch his bride. Shortly afterward the Swedes revolted, and the Swedish king again had to make concessions, and promised to make peace with the king of Norway. The latter had, in the meanwhile, against the wishes of her father, married Astrid, a younger half-sister of Ingigerd. At the peace of Konungahela, where the kings finally met, this marriage was approved by the Swedish king, the boundary lines between the two countries were finally agreed upon, and friendly relations were established. After the peace of Konungahela, King Olaf was able to pay more attention to the domestic affairs of the country. He went north, and in the fall came to Nidaros, where he prepared to take up his winter residence. He made careful inquiries as to the condition of Christianity, and learned to his regret that it was not observed at all up north, in Halagaland, and was not observed as it should be in Nondal and the interior of the Thrandjum country. In the spring Olaf started on an expedition north to Nondal, where he summoned the peasants to meet him, and at everything he was accepted as king. He had the laws read to the people, and threatened them with loss of life, limbs, and property, if they would not subject themselves to Christian law. They all promised to obey, and the rich men made great feasts for the king. Thus he proceeded north to Halagaland, where Herek of Theata, a mighty man of the family of Harold the Fair-Haired, after having made a feast for the king, was made lenderman, and was given the same privileges he had enjoyed under former rulers. The king remained most of the summer in Halagaland, went to all the things, and baptized all the people. Thor Hund, who lived on the island Byarki and was one of the most powerful men in that northern country, also became one of Olaf's lendermen. Toward the end of the summer King Olaf sailed back to Thrandjum. During his stay at Nidaros the king ascertained that the people of the interior of the Thrandjum country were still offering sacrifices to the heathen gods for peace and a good season, and that Ulver of Egja, a mighty man in that neighborhood, presided over these sacrifice feasts, although he had twice assured the king that the people were loyal Christians. Learning that they were preparing such a feast at Marin, the king proceeded to that place one night with three hundred and sixty armed men, captured Olver of Egja, and had him killed together with many others. And severely punished all the peasants who had taken a leading part in the sacrifices. In this way he brought the people back to the Christian faith, gave them teachers, and built and consecrated churches. The widow of Olver of Egja, who was young and handsome, of good family, and rich, was given by the king in marriage to Calf Arneson, a young favorite among the king's men. The king also gave him an office, and Calf thus became a great chief. In the summer of 1021 King Olaf proceeded to Moor and Romsdal. In the fall he left his ships in Romsdal and proceeded to Gudbrandsdal. The mightiest man there was Dale Gudbrand, who ruled over the valley districts there with the authority of a king, although he did not bear the title. When he heard that Olaf was approaching, he summoned all the men in the valley to a thing, where they decided to resist the attempt to force Christianity upon them. A force of eight hundred men, under the leadership of Alf, the son of Gudbrand, was sent against Olaf, but a battle had scarcely begun when the peasants fled, and Alf was captured. Then the king was invited to hold a thing with the peasants, so they could discuss the proposed change of faith. To the request of the king that the people should believe in the true God and be baptized, Dale Gudbrand replied, We do not understand of whom thou art speaking. 
Dost thou call him God whom neither thou nor any one else can see? But we have a God who can be seen every day, although he is not out today, because the weather is wet. I expect that fear will mix with your very blood when he comes into the thing. Now, since thy God is so great, let him make it so that tomorrow we have a cloudy day but without rain, and then let us meet again. The next day when the thing had assembled, the weather was such as Gudbrand had desired. Bishop Sigurd stood up in full vestments, with mitre on his head and crozier in his hand, and spoke to the peasants of the true faith, and of the many miracles that God had performed. On the third day the peasants came to the assembly carrying between them a great image of the god Thor, which they placed on the green. Dale Gudbrand then said, Where now, king, is thy god? I think he will now carry his head lower. And neither thou nor thy bishop are so bold today as on former days, for now our God, who rules over all, has come, and looks on you with an angry eye. And now I see well enough that you are terrified. The king instructed one of his men, Colby and Sturk, Colby and the Strong, to strike the image with his club with all his might, if in the course of the king's speech it should happen that all the people looked in another direction. Then the king spoke to the people, saying, Much hast thou talked to us this morning, and greatly hast thou wondered that thou canst not see our God. But I expect that he will soon come to us. Thou wouldst frighten us with thy God, who is both blind and deaf, and can neither save himself nor others, and cannot even move without being carried, but now I expect that he will soon come to grief. For turn your eyes toward the east. Behold our God advancing in great light. The sun was just rising, and all turned to look. Immediately Colby struck the idol with his club, so that it burst into many pieces, and out of it ran rats as big as cats, snakes, and lizards, which had fattened on the good things that had daily been given to the god. At this the peasants became greatly terrified and fled. But the king ordered them together again, and urged them to abandon their worthless heathen gods, and finally he gave them the choice between accepting Christianity and fighting. Dale Gudbrand then arose and said, that since their own God would not help them, they would have to believe in the king's God and serve him. Then Olaf caused all the people in the valley to be baptized, and gave them teachers. Gudbrand himself and his son were baptized by the bishop. Gudbrand built a church on his estate, and he and Olaf parted as friends. With the same firm hand King Olaf established Christianity in Hedmarken and Romerike. During his stay in Romerike he assembled a great thing at Eidsvold and proclaimed the Eidsiva law for all the uplands. King Olaf succeeded in having Christianity established by law throughout the whole of Norway. He built many churches and gave property to them, so that there was at least one priest in each filki. With the assistance of Bishop Grimkjell he had a church law adopted. He also improved the civil laws, and had a fourth law thing established for Viking, the Borga thing, which had its own law, and was held at the city of Borg, now Sarpsborg. However, by his cruel way of introducing Christianity, and his relentless way of enforcing all laws, Olaf gradually made many enemies. He severely punished all who broke the laws, whether they were high or low, and one after the other among the chiefs became unfriendly to him. Among the most dangerous of these enemies were Erling Skielksen of Sol, Thor Hund of Bayarki and Herek of Theata. At this time Knut, Knut, the Great, called by some Knut the Old, a son of the Danish king, Sven Jugaskeg, was king of England in Denmark. Knut claimed the hereditary right to all Norway, and his sister's son, Earl Haakon, who had held a part of it, appeared to him to have lost it in disgrace. Many of the discontented Norwegians went over to England, pretending various errands, and visited Canute the Great and Earl Haakon, who was staying with Canute. Everyone who thus came was most hospitably received, and were given costly presents. The young Earl listened with pleasure to the complaints of the discontented about King Olaf's tyranny, and to their appeals for a return of the former state of affairs. Haakon forgot the oath he had given to King Olaf, and begged his uncle Canute to try if King Olaf would not voluntarily surrender the kingdom or at least a part of it. King Canute then sent magnificently equipped messengers to Norway, bearing his letter and seal. King Olaf had come down from the uplands in the spring, 1025, 
and was sojourning in Tunsberg, when the messengers of Canute the Great arrived and made known their errand. King Canute considers all Norway as his property, they said, his forefathers before him having possessed the kingdom, but as he offers peace to all countries, he will not invade Norway with an army if it can be avoided. But if King Olaf Haraldsson wishes to remain king of Norway, he must come to King Canute, and receive the kingdom in fee from him, become his vassal, and pay the tribute which the earls before him have paid. To this King Olaf replied, I have heard that the Danish King Gorm was considered a good and popular king, although he ruled over Denmark alone, but the kings who succeeded him were not satisfied with this. It has now come so far that King Canute rules over Denmark and England, and has also conquered a great part of Scotland. And still he lays claim to the kingdom I have inherited. I think he ought to be satisfied with what he has. Does he wish to rule over all the countries of the north? Will he eat up all the cabbage in England? He will have to do so before I show him any kind of vassalage. Bring him this answer, I will defend Norway with battle axe and sword as long as life is given me, and will pay tribute to no man for my kingdom. Later in the summer the discontented Norwegians in England were reinforced by Aslak and Skilk, the sons of Erling Skilkson of Seoul, who, no doubt with their father's knowledge and consent, went over to England and were received by King Canute with open arms. King Olaf understood the danger that was threatening him and took measures to protect himself. He had spies out to keep an eye on the movements of Canute, and in the fall he sent messengers eastward to Sweden to his brother-in-law, King Anun Jacob, who had succeeded his father, Olaf the Swede, as King of Sweden. And let him know King Canute's demands upon Norway, adding that, in his opinion, if Canute subdued Norway, King Anun would not long enjoy the Swedish dominions in peace. He therefore thought they ought to unite for their defence. King Anund received this message favorably, and promised to arrange a personal meeting with King Olaf in the near future. In the autumn King Canute the Great came from England to Denmark, and remained there all winter with a large army. Believing that an offensive and defensive alliance between Norway and Sweden would be fraught with danger to his Danish kingdom, he sent messengers to the Swedish king, in order to win his friendship or at least secure his neutrality. But, although the messengers brought many costly presents for King Anund, they were very coolly received, and returned to King Canute with the information that he could not depend much upon the friendship of King Anund. King Olaf spent the winter at Sarpsborg. Early in the spring he and King Anund met at Konungahela, on the Gott River, where their alliance was concluded. King Olaf set out with his men and raised a levy over the whole country. All the lendermen in the north followed him except Einar Thambuskelfer, who remained quietly on his great estate. Olaf sailed with his fleet south around Stott, and many people from the districts around joined him. At Hordaland he heard that Erling Skielksen had left the country with a great force and several ships, and had sailed westward to England to Canute the Great. King Olaf proceeded eastward and then south to Denmark, where he first ravaged the coast of Sealand, and afterward met King Anun Jacob of Sweden, and with him harried the coast of Skane, Scania, then a part of Denmark, now belonging to Sweden. They proclaimed to the people that they intended to conquer Denmark, and asked the support of the people for this purpose. Many men entered the service of the kings, and agreed to submit to them. When King Canute heard in England that King Olaf had gone to Denmark with a plundering army, he collected a great force and a large fleet with which he proceeded to Denmark. Earl Hawken was second in command. King Olaf and King Anund now sailed eastward, and put up in Helgea, a short but wide river forming the outlet of a number of lakes near what was then the boundary between Sweden and Denmark. When they heard that King Canute was coming after them with his great force, they made preparations to receive him. They dammed up the lake at the head of the river, so that the water rose to a considerable height in the lake, while the river was quite low. Then the allies made their ships ready for battle. When Canute arrived it was too late in the evening to begin the battle, and seeing the harbour empty, he entered it with as many ships as possible. Early in the morning the dam was broken, and the water rushed with great force down upon Canute's fleet. A good many people were drowned, and the ships were scattered, some of them in a considerably damaged condition. 
However, when the fleet had again been collected, the allied kings perceived that it was of too formidable strength to be attacked, and so they withdrew. King Canute, after having vainly lain in wait for Olaf, and having no special desire for a war between Denmark and Sweden, sailed away and returned to England. King Olaf returned overland through Sweden to Norway. In the following year, 1028, Canute the Great returned with a large fleet to Norway. By a policy of general bribery he had won the friendship of a great many of the discontented chiefs. The saga says that every man who came to him, and who he thought had the spirit of a man and would like his favor, got his hands full of gifts and money. He first landed in Agder, where he summoned a thing and received the oath of allegiance from the peasants. King Olaf was then in Tunsberg. Canute sailed northward along the coast, and everywhere he was hailed as king. In Eckersund Erling Skielgsen came to him with many people, and King Canute and Erling renewed their league of friendship. Canute then continued his journey until he came to Thrandjum, and landed at Nidaros. Here a thing was summoned, at which King Canute was proclaimed king of all Norway. Thor Hund and Herek of Theata were present, and the king divided Halagaland between them. The king made Earl Hawken governor-in-chief of all the land he had taken on this expedition. At the same time he appointed his son Hardenat king of Denmark. He gave Einar Thambuskel for great gifts, and restored to him the fiefs he had formerly held. When King Olaf heard that King Canute had gone south to Denmark he sailed with a few ships, and as many men as would follow him, up along the coast. When he came north to Ikundasund, Eckersund, he heard that Erling Skielgsen was ready to meet him with a great force. On the 21st of December the king sailed out of the harbour, and the wind being strong and favourable, he sailed past the place where Erling was with his fleet. Erling soon pursued him, but was separated from his main force, and when he overtook King Olaf he was met by the whole of the latter's force. A severe fight began, and many men fell on both sides. But finally Erling was the only man left on his ship. King Olaf who, with his men, had entered the ship, called out to him from the foredeck, Thou hast turned thy face straight against us today, Erling. Face to face shall eagles fight, said Erling. The old man's courage and manly defense had awakened Olaf's sympathy, and the king asked him if he would enter his service. That I will, said Erling. He took off his helmet, laid down his sword and shield, and went forward to the foredeck. King Olaf, who half regretted his kindly feelings toward the conquered man, gently scratched his cheek with the edge of his battle axe, saying, The traitor to the king must be marked. Immediately one of the king's men, a slack fittier skull, rushed up, and cleft Erling's skull with his axe, saying, Thus we mark the traitor to the king. When the king saw the old chieftain lying dead at his feet he deeply regretted the ill-considered scorn he had uttered, and said to a slack, Ill luck was that stroke, for thou hast struck Norway out of my hands. Erling Skielgsen was sixty-two years old at the time of his death, and the saga says that he was the greatest and worthiest man in Norway of all those who had no higher title. Olaf continued his journey northward, but was soon pursued by Erling's sons, who had raised a great army. When he heard that Earl Hawken was also coming against him with an army from Thrandjum, he found himself compelled to flee from the country. He landed at Valdal and crossed the mountains to Gudbrandsdal and thence to Sweden, where he left his wife Astrid and his daughter Ulfhild. Olaf, with his son Magnus and a few faithful friends, traveled to Russia, where he was well received by his brother-in-law, King Yaroslav, who had married Ingigerd, the sister of the Swedish king, Anun Jacob. Chapter 16 The Battle of Stikelstad, 1030 I end the summer of 1029 Earl Hawken went to England to fetch his bride, Gunhild, a daughter of Canute's sister. Everything was satisfactorily arranged, but on his return voyage his vessel foundered, and all on board were lost. One of King Olaf's best friends, Bjorn Stalar, five believing that Olaf would not return to Norway, had been induced by great gifts and promises to give allegiance to Earl Hawken and King Canute. But when he heard that the Earl had perished, so that the country was again without a chief, he greatly regretted that he had failed to be true to King Olaf. And it seemed to him that there was now some hope that Olaf might again become king if he came back to Norway. 
He therefore immediately journeyed east to Russia to Olaf, and told him of Earl Hawkins' death, and brought him other news from Norway. When the king asked him how his friends had kept their fidelity toward him, Bjorn answered that it had been different with different people. Then he fell at the king's feet, and said, All is in your power, sire, and in God's. I have taken money from King Canute's men, and sworn them allegiance, but now I will follow thee, and not part from thee so long as we both live. The king answered, Arise, Bjorn, thou shalt be reconciled with me. But reconcile thy perjury with God. I must know that but few men in Norway have adhered to their fealty to me, when such a man as thou art could be false to me. Bjorn named those who had principally bound themselves to be his enemies. Among them were Erling's sons, Einar Thambuskelfer, Kaf Arnesen, Thor Hund and Herek of Theata. Olaf now made preparations for his return to Norway, and shortly after Christmas started with 240 men. His young son, Magnus, was left behind with King Yaroslav in Russia. In Sweden, King Anund received his brother-in-law well, and gave him 480 picked warriors to go with him. When it was reported in Norway that King Olaf had come from the east to Sweden, his friends gathered aid for him in Norway. The most distinguished man in this party was Harald Sigurdsson, Olaf's half-brother, who was then quite young, but very stout and manly of growth. Many other brave men were there also. And they were in all 720 men, when they proceeded eastward through the Ede forest and Vermland, and met Olaf in Sweden. Olaf's kinsman, Dag Ringson, collected an army of about 1,400 men, with which he joined King Olaf. When King Olaf had crossed the mountain and was descending on the west side, where it declines toward the sea, and he could see the country for many miles, he became sad and rode by himself in silence for quite a while. Finally, Bishop Sigurd rode up to him, and asked him why he was so silent, and what he was thinking of. The king answered, Strange things came into my mind a while ago. As I looked down the valley, it appeared to me that I was looking over all Norway. It then came into my mind how many happy days I have had in this country. My vision went further, until I looked over the whole wide world, both land and sea. I recognized places where I have been before, but I also saw places of which I had never heard, both inhabited and uninhabited, as far as the world goes. Then the bishop dismounted from his horse, kissed the king's foot, and said, It is a holy man whom we are now following. When King Olaf came down into Vertolin, he mustered his force, and he then had over three thousand six hundred men. Among them were about six hundred who were heathens, and who refused to be baptized. These men were sent back, as Olaf would not have any heathens among his warriors. In the evening Olaf's whole forces took up their night quarter in one place, and lay down under their shields, the king lay long awake in prayer to God, and slept but little. Toward morning he slumbered for a while, and when he awoke, day was breaking. The king thought it too early to awaken the army, and asked her the bard Thormod Kalbrunarskald was. Thormod was nearby, and asked what the king desired. The king said, Sing us a song. Thormod arose and sang, so loud that the whole army could hear him, the old Byarchimale point six. then the troops awoke, and, when the song was ended, the people thanked him for it, and the king gave him a fine gold ring. The king now led his army further down the valley until he came to Steichelstad, where he placed his army in battle array against the peasants' army. The lendermen and peasants had collected a vast army, it is said to have numbered 14,400 men. When the armies were near together, Thor Hund went forward in front of the banner with his troop, and called out, Forward, forward, bond men. The peasants repeated this war cry and shot their arrows and spears. The king's men now raised their battle cry, and encouraged each other to advance, shouting, Forward, forward, Christ men. Cross men. King's men. King Olaf's army rushed down the hill upon the peasant army with a fierce assault, and for a moment drove it from its original position, but the chiefs urged their men forward, and forced them to advance again. The peasant army pushed forward from all quarters, and the battle became very severe. Those who stood in front hewed down with their swords. 
those who stood next thrust with their spears, while those in the rear shot arrows, cast spears, or threw stones, hand axes, or pieces of timber. Many fell on both sides. When the ranks in front of the king's banner began to be thinned, he ordered the banner moved forward, and the king himself followed with a party of chosen men, and placed himself in the front rank. King Olaf fought most desperately. He hewed at Thor Hund, and struck him across the shoulders, but the sword would not cut, and it was as if dust flew from Thor's reindeer skin coat. Then the king said to Bjorn Stalar, Do thou kill the dog on whom steel will not bite. Thor's surname Hund means dog. Bjorn turned the axe in his hand, and gave Thor such a blow with the hammer of it on the shoulder that he staggered. But the next moment Thor ran his spear through the body of Bjorn, and killed him, saying, Thus we hunt bears north in Finnmark. Bjorn means bear. Thorstein Narrarsmid, one of Thor Hun's followers, struck at King Olaf with his axe, and the blow hit his left leg above the knee. Finn Arneson immediately felled Thorstein. But the king, badly wounded, staggered toward a stone, threw down his sword and shield, and prayed God to help him. Then Thor Hunt struck at him with his spear, and the stroke went in under his mail coat and into his abdomen. Still another wound was given the king on the left side of the neck, and these three wounds caused the death of King Olaf. He was then thirty-five years old. The battle had lasted an hour and a half, and was now virtually ended. Dag Ringson and his men still fought desperately for a while, but they were soon overwhelmed by numbers and fatigue, and were obliged to retire. There was a valley through which many fled, and men lay scattered on both sides. Many were severely wounded, and many so fatigued that they were unable to move. The peasants pursued them only a short way, for their leaders soon returned to the battlefield, where they had friends and relatives to care for. It is said that Thor Hund went to where King Olaf's body lay, laid it out on the ground, and spread a cloak over it. He told afterward that when he wiped the blood from the face it was very beautiful, and the cheeks were red. Some of the king's blood came on Thor's wounded hand, and it healed so speedily that he did not need to dress it. This was told by Thor himself when King Olaf's holiness came to be generally reported among the people. And Thor Hund was among the first of the king's powerful opponents who endeavored to spread abroad the belief in Olaf's sanctity. Harold Sigurdsson, King Olaf's half-brother, was severely wounded at Steichelstad. But one of Olaf's men brought him to a peasant's house the night after the battle, and the peasant cared for Harold, and healed his wound in secret, and afterward gave him his son to attend him. Some time after the battle, two young men were one day riding across the mountain to Gentiland in order to reach Sweden. One of them was a peasant's son from Verdalen, the other a young warrior, the last one of King Olaf's men who fled from the country. As they were passing over the ridge, the young man turned to his companion, and sang. The wounds were bleeding as I rode. And down below the peasant strode. Killing the wounded with the sword. The followers of their rightful lord. From wood to wood I crept along. Unnoticed by the peasant throng. Who knows, I thought, a day may come. My name will yet be great at home. It was Olaf's brother, Harold, who was setting out to try his luck in foreign countries, whence he was to return one day, rich in honors and goods. Chapter 17 King Sven Alfifjusen, 1030-1035 When King Canute the Great heard that Earl Haakon had been lost in a shipwreck on his way to Norway, he concluded to put his natural son Sven on the throne of Norway. Sven's mother was Elfjifa, a daughter of an English chieftain in Northampton, but the Norwegians called her Alfifa and her son Sven Alfifjusen. Sven had, a couple of years before, been appointed by King Canute to govern Jomsborg in Vendland. But after Earl Hawkins' death King Canute sent word to him to proceed to Denmark and from there to Norway, to take that kingdom in charge and assume the title of King of Norway. With a number of men from Denmark, Sven proceeded to Norway together with his mother, Alfifa, and he was hailed as king at everything. He had come as far as Viking at the time the battle was fought at Steichelstad, where King Olaf fell. He continued his journey northward until, in the autumn, he came to the Thrandjum country, 
and there, as elsewhere, he was received as king. Sven was very young and inexperienced, and it was his mother who had most to say in governmental affairs. Together with Bishop Sigurd and some Danes, whom she had brought with her from Denmark, she commenced to rule the country in a very arbitrary manner, and the people soon became greatly discontented. For a time the disaffection smoldered beneath the surface. But when the foreign rulers proceeded to introduce a new system of laws, fashioned in accordance with the development of the feudal system in the rest of Europe, there was a general uprising throughout the country. Among the laws introduced in King Sven's name were the following, no man must leave the country without the king's permission, or if he did, his property fell to the king. Whoever killed a man should forfeit his land and movable property. At Christmas every man had to give the king a certain portion of the products of his farm. The peasants were obliged to build all the houses the king required on his farms. For every seven males over the age of five years one man was to be furnished for the service of war. Every ship that went out of the country should have storage reserved for the king in the middle of the ship. Several heavy taxes were provided. And to all this was added a provision that the testimony of one Dane should invalidate that of ten Norwegians. When these laws were announced at the thing in Thrandjum, loud murmurs were heard among the people. Those who had not taken part in the uprising against King Olaf said, Now take your reward and friendship from Canute and his race, ye men of the interior of Thrandjum who fought against King Olaf, and deprived him of his kingdom. Ye were promised peace and justice, and now ye have got oppression and slavery for your great treachery. This was true, and the chiefs felt it well enough. But they were afraid of making open rebellion, as many of them had given King Canute their sons or other near relatives as hostages. At this time the people began to talk much of King Olaf's sanctity. There were many rumors of miracles in connection with the dead king, and it gradually became the general opinion that a great mistake or rather a crime had been committed by the rebellion against King Olaf. People began to severely reproach those who had excited opposition to the king, and among those especially accused was Bishop Sigurd. He got so many enemies that he found it most advisable to leave the country, and proceeded to England to King Canute. When Bishop Sigurd had left, the people of Thrandjum sent word to Bishop Grimkel, desiring him to come to Thrandjum. King Olaf had sent Bishop Grimkel back to Norway when he went east to Russia, and since that time Grimkel had been in the uplands. He now came north and visited Einar Thambeskelfer, who received him with open arms. Einar congratulated himself upon not having taken part in the strife against King Olaf, and was now one of the mighty men who looked upon the dead king as a saint. Einar and the bishop obtained King Sven's leave to exhume the body of Olaf. It is said that they found that the coffin had raised itself almost entirely to the surface of the earth, and when the coffin was opened they found that the king's face was red as if he had merely fallen asleep. And his hair and nails had grown as if he had lived all the time. Grimkel now declared that King Olaf was truly a holy man, and with the approbation of the king and the decision of the thing Olaf was declared the saint of the nation. His body was transported into Clement's church, where a place was made for it near the high altar. The coffin was covered with costly cloth, and stood under a gold-embroidered tent. People soon began to make pilgrimages to the shrine of St. Olaf, and gradually a great number of churches were built and dedicated to him, not only in Norway, but also in other countries. When King Sven had been three years in Norway, a young man, who called himself Trigev, and professed to be a son of Olaf Trygvesson and Queen Gaida of England, came from the west with an armed force, intending to claim the throne of Norway. Sven called upon his chiefs to furnish him with men and ships in defense of the country, and an army was soon ready, but Einar Thambeskelfer, and Kaf Arnesen, and some others refused to give aid. King Sven sailed south and met Trigev in battle in Sonsund. In this battle Trigev fell, and many of his men with him, but some fled, and others received quarter. After the battle in Sonsund King Sven returned to Thrandjum. But his stay there was not of long duration. He met the people at a thing, and heard their complaints, but no understanding could be reached. Shortly afterward the situation became so strained that King Sven and his mother found it necessary to remove to the southern part of the country to spend the winter. 
During this winter Einar Thambeskelfer and Kaf Arnesen had many consultations in Nidaros with the other chiefs, and the result was that in the spring a deputation of prominent chiefs, including Einar Thambeskelfer and Kaf Arnesen, proceeded east to King Yaroslav in Russia to offer the throne of Norway to Magnus, the son of Olaf the Saint, who had been raised at King Yaroslav's court. They asked and received full forgiveness for having fought against Magnus' father at Stikelstad. They thereupon swore allegiance to Magnus, who, on the other hand, promised them under oath that he would be true and faithful to them all when he got the dominions and kingdom of Norway. Einar and Kaf were to act as his foster fathers and counselors. Magnus returned with them to Norway and was welcomed with great joy. At Orthing he was proclaimed king over the whole land. When King Sven heard this news he tried to raise an army, but nobody would listen to him, and he and his mother were obliged to flee to Denmark. Here Sven died in the year 1036, his father Canute dying a short time before him. Chapter 18 Magnus the Good, 1035-1047 Magnus was a natural child of Olaf the Saint, his mother being a girl by the name of Alfhild, who was usually called the king's slave woman, although she was of good descent. She was a very handsome girl and lived in King Olaf's court. It is said that when Magnus was born she was very sick, and it was some time after the birth before it could be discovered whether the boy was alive. A priest, who was present, requested Sigvat the Skald, poet, to hasten to the king and tell him of the event, but Sigvat refused, as the king had strictly forbidden anybody to awaken him in the middle of the night. As the child was very weak, however, they decided to baptize it, and Sigvat the Skald named the boy Magnus. The next morning the king demanded to know why they had named the boy Magnus, since there was no such name in his family. Sigvat said, I called him after King Karl Magnus, Emperor Charlemagne, who, I knew, had been the best man in the world. This satisfied the king. Magnus was only eleven years old when he was proclaimed king at the Orthing. In the beginning he allowed Kaf Arnesen and Einar Thambeskelfer to take care of all government matters in his name, but he soon developed into a clever, intelligent young man with a great deal of independence. Hardenat, who was then king of Denmark, was inclined to press his claims to Norway, which he had inherited from his father, Canute the Great, and collected an army. King Magnus also armed himself, and they were about to meet in battle at the Gott River. However, the chiefs on both sides, who very much desired to avoid war, made overtures for peace, and the result was a friendly meeting between the kings at the Bren Islands at the mouth of the Gott River. They arranged for a brotherly union, under oath, to keep the peace with each other to the end of their lives, and if one of them should die without leaving a son, the survivor should succeed to both countries. Twelve of the principal men in each kingdom swore to the kings that this treaty should be observed. After the conciliation at the Bren Islands Magnus was in undisputed possession of his father's throne. During his stay in the southern part of the country he had come in contact with his father's former friends and faithful adherents, who had a great deal to say about the actions of the Thrangem people toward King Olaf. Magnus listened with great eagerness to this talk, and, before he really understood it, he had become possessed of a bitter feeling against those men who had been his father's opponents. He especially began to dislike Kaf Arnesen, who, according to common belief, had dealt King Olaf the last deadly blow at Stikelstad. One day the king was at a feast at the Haug estate in Verdalen. At the table he said to Einar Thambeskelfer, Let us ride today over to Stikelstad. I wish to see the different reminders of the battle. Einar replied, Well, I know little about how matters went there. But take Kaf with thee, he can give the information about all that took place. When the tables were removed, the king made himself ready, and said to Kaf, Thou must go with me to Stikelstad. After repeating this command the king went out. Kaf put on his riding clothes in all haste, and said to his footboy, Ride immediately to Egja, and order my house servants to have all my property on board my ship before sunset. The king and Kaf now rode over to Stikelstad. They alighted from their horses, and went to the place where the battle had been. Where did the king fall? asked Magnus. Kaf pointed with his spear, and said, There he lay when he fell. The king further asked, And where wast thou then, 
Calf. Here, where I am now standing, answered Calf. The king turned red as blood in the face, and said, Then thy axe could well have reached him. Calf replied, My axe did not come near him. Then he immediately went to his horse, and rode away with all his men, while the king returned to Haug. When Calf reached home he found his ship ready, and immediately sailed for the Orkneys. The king confiscated the Egja estate and other possessions which Calf left behind him. Magnus commenced to severely punish many of those who had borne arms against St. Olaf. He drove some of them out of the country, took large sums of money from others, and had the cattle of others slaughtered for his use. Thorer Hund had escaped punishment by making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem shortly after Olaf's fall, and it is said that he never came back. Herek of Theata was killed with the king's consent by Asmund Grankelson, whose father had been killed by Herek. The people soon began to murmur, and the discontent spread throughout the country. In San the people even gathered an armed force, and were determined to fight, if Magnus came into their district. When the young impetuous king heard of this, and made up his mind to punish the rebellious Sonnings, his friends, who knew that the disaffection was widely spread through the country, decided to warn him of his danger. Twelve of his friends came together, and determined, by casting lots, which one of them should inform the king of the discontent of the people, and the lot fell upon Sigvat the Skald. Sigvat then composed a poem, which he called, The Free-Speaking Song, Berso Glisvizier, in which he reminded the king of the promises he made when he was proclaimed king, and advised him to be guided by that respect for the laws and the rights of the people which his predecessors had shown. He blamed him for his severity, and warned him of the danger threatening him and his country. Sigvat's song made a deep impression on the young king, and from now on he was an entirely changed man. He consulted the most prudent men, and revised the laws, repealing such of Sven Alfifiusen's laws as were most obnoxious to the people. He codified the laws in a written book called The Grey Goose, Greygossen. 7. It was only a short time before King Magnus became very popular, and was beloved by all the country people, who now called him Magnus the Good. The Danish king, Hardenat, who was also king of England, died of apoplexy at a wedding feast at Lambeth, England, in June, 1042. This was the end of Danish rule in England. After the death of Hardenat, his half-brother, Edward the Good, a son of the English King Ethelred and Queen Emma, was chosen King of England. When King Magnus heard of Hardenat's death, he immediately sent word to Denmark that he intended to claim the Danish throne in accordance with the agreement made between himself and Hardenat at their meeting at the Gott River. Shortly afterward King Magnus proceeded to Denmark with a fine fleet of seventy ships. He was well received, and at a thing assembled at Viborg, Jutland, where the Danes always elected their king, he was proclaimed king of all the Danish dominions. He remained in Denmark during the summer, 1042, and wherever he came he was received with enthusiasm. He divided the country into districts and appointed administrative officers, gave fiefs to influential men, and took all steps to secure himself in power. In the autumn he returned to Norway. Among the Danes who swore allegiance to King Magnus was Sven, commonly called Sven Estridsen, a son of Earl Ulf. His mother was Estrid, Astrid, a daughter of King Sven Jugaskeg. She was a sister of Canute the Great by the father's side, and of the Swedish King Olaf by the mother's side, her mother being Queen Sigrid the Haughty. One day, as King Magnus was sitting in his high seat with a large number of men around him, and with Sven Estridsen sitting on a footstool before him, the king made a speech in which he said that he had promised the Danes a chief who could defend and rule the country in the absence of the king. And, he continued, I know no better man fitted, in all respects, for this than Sven. I will therefore make him my earl, and give him the government of my Danish dominions while I am in Norway, just as King Canute the Great said his father, Earl Ulf, over Denmark while he was in England. Einar Thambeskelfer, who was with the king, was very ill-pleased with this appointment, as he put no faith in Sven, and said to the king, Too great an earl, too great an earl, my foster son. King Magnus had an early opportunity to regret his choice, for, the same winter in which Sven was given the administration of the government of Denmark as earl, he successfully courted the friendship of the most influential men. 
and assumed the title of King of Denmark. King Magnus heard this news, and at the same time that the people of Venland had a large army with which they plundered in Denmark. He then gathered a large force, with which he sailed to Denmark. There he summoned the people to come to him, and drew together a great army in Jutland. Ordulf, the Duke of Brunswick, who the year before had married Ulfhild, the daughter of King Olaf the Saint, and the half-sister of King Magnus VIII also came to his aid with a great force. King Magnus met the Vens in battle at Lurskog Heath in Schleswig and gained a great victory. It was generally reported in the army that King Magnus had a vision the night before the battle, in which Olaf the Saint had appeared and had given the king advice. It is the common saying, says the saga, that there never was so great a slaughter of men in the northern lands, since the time of Christianity, as took place among the Venland people on Lurskog Heath. This was on the 28th of September, 1043. King Magnus followed up his victory, and sailed to Venland, attacked and captured the fortress of Jomsborg. A great many of the people of Venland submitted to King Magnus, while others fled the country. After this King Magnus turned his attention to Earl Sven. A battle was fought, and Sven had to flee to his relatives in Sweden. But as soon as Magnus went to Norway, Sven would return to Denmark and strengthen himself with the Danes, and Magnus had continual wars with his earl. Among the principal battles were those at Eros, now Aarhus, and Helganes. When King Magnus came back to Norway in the autumn of 1045, after one of his battles with Sven, he heard that his relative, Harald Sigurdsson, had come to Sweden on his way to Norway, and that Harald and Sven had come to an understanding and intended to endeavour to subdue both Denmark and Norway. King Magnus then ordered a general levy over all Norway, and he soon collected a great army with which to meet the intruder. The relatives and friends of both Harold and Magnus, however, said that it would be a great misfortune if there should be war between them, and the result was a friendly meeting, where Magnus gave Harold half of his kingdom. They were to rule together on equal terms, but whenever they were together in one place King Magnus was to be, the first man in seat, service and salutation. King Magnus died the following year, 1047, on one of his expeditions to Denmark. Before his death King Magnus declared that Sven Estridsen was to have Denmark, while Harald should rule over Norway. Chapter 19 Harald Hardrade, 1047-1066 Harald, the son of Sigurd Seer and Astrid, now became the sole king of Norway. As we have seen, Harald fled from the country after the Battle of Stikelstad, 1030. He went to Russia to the court of King Yaroslav, who received him with kindness and made him a commander in the army. Harald remained in the service of King Yaroslav for three years, and then went with a body of men to Constantinople, called by the Northman Miklagard where he soon became the captain or chief of the Vairings. The Vairings were the bodyguard of the emperors, and the guard was composed mostly of Northmen. With them he went on many expeditions, and always gained victories and a great deal of booty. He conducted expeditions against the Saracens in Africa, which the Vairings called Sirkland, where he gathered great wealth in gold, jewels, and other precious things. He also served in Sicily, where he won several battles. After having spent several years in these campaigns he returned to Constantinople, and then went to Jerusalem, and bathed in the river Jordan, according to the custom of other pilgrims. Thereafter he returned to Russia and was received in the most friendly way by King Yaroslav. He married the latter's daughter, Elizabeth, or Elisif, as the Northmen called her. When King Magnus died, Harald, as already stated, became sole king of Norway. But he also wanted Denmark, and called his men-at-arms together, and told them that he intended to go with an army to Vyberg Thing and there proclaim himself King of Denmark, to which, he said, he had the hereditary right, as well as to Norway. The friends of the late King Magnus, however, did not like this, and Einar Thambeskelfer said that he considered it a greater duty to bring his foster son King Magnus' corpse to the grave, and lay it beside his father King Olaf's north in Thrandjum, than to be fighting abroad, and taking another king's dominions and property. He ended his speech with saying that he would rather follow King Magnus dead than any other king alive. The result was that King Harald returned to Norway with his army. 
For many years thereafter King Harold was at war with Sven Estridsen, or Ulfsson, but did not succeed in driving him away from Denmark. Einar Thambeskelfer was the most powerful man in the Thrandjum country. There was but little friendship between him and King Harold, although Einar retained all the fiefs he had held under King Magnus. Einar had many large estates, and was married to Bergliot, a daughter of Earl Hawken. Their son Eindride was married to Sigrid, a daughter of Kettle Calf and Gunhild, King Harold's sister's daughter. Einar was well versed in law, and often acted as spokesman for the peasants at the things, when the king demanded more of the people than was his right. This happened more than once, for Harold's rule was quite severe. Therefore he was called Harold Hardraid, or Hard Ruler. Einar did not lack the boldness to assert his opinions at the things, even in the presence of the king. And for this reason he was held in high esteem by the people, while the king came to hate him more after every such dispute. Einar, therefore, began to keep a number of men around him whenever the king was in the neighborhood. One day he came to the town, Nidaros, with eight or nine ships and nearly six hundred men. When Harold, who was standing in the doorway of his house, saw Einar going ashore, he exclaimed in verse, Here I see Einar Thambeskelfer land with quite a force. In his haughtiness he probably expects even to fill the royal chair. For often has even an earl a smaller force of men with him. This Einar will some day deprive me of my kingdom, unless he himself has to kiss the thin lips of the axe. One day there was a meeting, at which the king himself was present. A thief had been caught and was brought before the thing. The man had been in the service of Einar, who had liked him very well. Einar well knew that the king would not let the man off, especially as Einar took an interest in him. He therefore let his men arm themselves, went to the thing, and took the man away by force. The mutual friends of the king and Einar then intervened and tried to bring about a reconciliation, and they succeeded so far that a day was appointed for a meeting between them at the king's house at the river Nid. The king had the shutters for the smoke hole in the roof closed so as to exclude the light. When Einar came into the yard with his people, he told his son Eindride to remain outside with the men, for there is no danger here for me. Eindride remained standing outside the door. When Einar came into the room, he said, Dark it is in the king's thing room. At this some men fell upon him with spears and swords. Sharp are now the bites of the king's dogs, said Einar, and rushed toward the king, but was felled to the floor by the king's men. When Eindride heard the noise he drew his sword and rushed into the room. But he was instantly killed along with his father. The king then went with all his men to his ships, and rowed down the river, the peasants not having the courage to pursue him after having lost their leader. Einar's wife Bergliot, who came up from her home, and in vain urged the peasants to pursue the murderers, said, Now we miss my kinsman, Hawken Ivar's son, Einar's slayer would not be rowing out of the river if Ivar stood here on the river bank. Bergliot sent word to Hawken Ivar's son, a son of Ivar the White, nephew of Earl Hawken the Great, who was a mighty man in the uplands, and requested him to avenge the death of Einar and Eindride. Meanwhile King Harold proceeded to his kinsman by marriage, Finn Arneson, who lived at Ostrad in Erger, and persuaded him to first go to Nidaros and bring about a reconciliation with the peasants. And thereafter to proceed to the uplands and reach an understanding with Hawken Ivar's son, so that he would not oppose the king. In return for this the king promised to recall to the country Finn's brother Calf, and restore to him the estates and dignities of which King Magnus had deprived him. To Hawken Ivar's son, Finn was to offer any favor he might wish short of the kingdom. Finn successfully accomplished both of the missions entrusted to him. Hawken Ivar's son said, As to the conditions of peace, I will be reconciled with King Harold if he will give me in marriage his relation Ragenhild, King Magnus Olofsson's daughter, with such dower as is suitable to her and she will be content with. And Finn agreed to this on behalf of the king. The next Christmas Hawken went to King Harold to ask the fulfillment of the pledges given him. The king said that he, for his part, would adhere to the whole agreement, but as for Ragenhild it would be necessary for Hawken to ask her consent himself. When Hawken came to Ragenhild, and paid his addresses to her, she answered, I have no fault to find with thee, for thou art a handsome man, expert in all exercises. 
but thou must remember I am a king's daughter, while thou art only a lenderman. Had my father, King Magnus, lived he would have found that no man less than a king was suitable for me, so it is not to be expected that I will marry one who has no princely rank. Hawken then went to the king and demanded that he be made an earl under the agreement made with Finn Arneson. This the king refused to do, saying that it had been the custom since the time of St. Olaf to have only one earl in the country, and he could not take the title from O.R.M., who now held it. Hawken now understood that there was nothing to obtain from the king, and left in disgust. Finn Arneson became very angry, and told the king that he had broken his word. Hawken shortly afterward left the country with a well-manned ship, and went to King Sven of Denmark, who received him well and made him commander of his coast defense against the Vikings from Vendland, Kurland and other eastern countries. It was not a long time before Finn Arneson fell out with the king. His brother Calf, who had been on a Viking cruise to the Western, British, countries ever since he had left Norway, was recalled by the king and given back his estates according to agreement. But shortly afterward, during an expedition to Denmark, the king sent Calf ashore on the island Fyen with a small force of men, and commanded him to attack a much stronger Danish force. Promising that he would soon make a landing with the others and come to their assistance. Calf obeyed, and was attacked by a great force of the enemy, and he and many of his men were killed. A long while afterward, when the Danes had withdrawn, Harold landed and made a plundering expedition into the country. Later he composed some verses, in which he boasted of having caused the death of thirteen men, and Finn rightly supposed that his brother was one of them. Finn took this matter so much to heart that he left Norway and went to King Sven of Denmark, who gave him a friendly reception. He swore allegiance to King Sven, and was made Earl of Halland, now a province of Sweden, where he remained for a long time and defended the country against the Northmen. Hawken Ivarsson showed great zeal in his position as commander of the Danish coast defence, being out with his warships both winter and summer, and was in high favour with King Sven, until he attacked and killed the king's nephew, Asmund. An ungovernable young man, who had been killing and plundering everywhere, both abroad and at home, and whom Hawken thought the king much desired to get rid of. The king sent Hawken a message that he had better leave the country. Tell him, he said, that I will do him no harm, but I cannot answer for all our relations. Hawken then proceeded north to his estates in Norway. During his stay in Denmark his relative, Earl O.R.M., had died. His many friends therefore gave themselves much trouble to bring about a reconciliation between him and King Harold, and in this they succeeded. Hawken was given the title of Earl, with the same power that Earl O.R.M. had had, and was married to Ragenhild, King Magnus' daughter. He swore to King Harold an oath of fidelity and pledged himself to render all the service he was liable to. In the winter of 1061-62, King Harold resided at Nidaros, where he commenced building a large warship. He sent a message south to Denmark to King Sven, and challenged him to meet him in the spring at the Gott River and fight, with the understanding that the one who gained the victory should have both kingdoms. King Sven accepted the challenge, but did not keep the appointment. King Harold, who had arrived at the place agreed upon, heard that Sven's forces lay in the south, partly at Fyen and partly about Sealand. Harold then sailed southward along Halland with 180 of his ships, and brought up his fleet at the NSAA, NIS River. Shortly afterward King Sven came upon them with a Danish fleet consisting of 360 ships. King Harold held a war council, and many said that it would be better to fly than to fight with a fleet twice the size of their own. The king replied, Sooner shall we all fall and lie dead one upon another than fly. King Harold drew up his ships in battle array, laying his great dragon ship in the middle. At his side lay Ulf Stalera, and on the other wing lay the ships of Earl Hawken Ivarsson from the uplands. At the extremity of the other side lay the Throngem chiefs. It was late in the day when the battle began, and it continued the whole night. The battle was very severe, and toward morning the greater part of the Danish fleet broke into flight. While Harold pursued some of the Danes, King Sven made his escape with the aid of Earl Hawken Ivarsson, who, during the battle, had contributed more than anyone else to the victory of the Norwegians. 
King Harold sailed north to Viken with all the conquered ships after the Battle of Nis River, and spent the winter at Oslo. Earl Hawken went to the uplands and remained in his dominions there during the winter. In the spring, however, he gathered all his loose property and fled eastward, for he heard that King Harold had again become his enemy, mainly because Hawken had allowed King Sven to escape after the Battle of Nis River. Hawken proceeded to King Steinkel of Sweden, who gave him the province of Vermland to govern. When Hawken heard that King Harold had gone north to Thrandjum, he made a hurried expedition back to the uplands and collected the taxes due him. The next summer King Harold in vain tried to collect taxes in the same places. Then King Harold gathered an army, with which he invaded Sweden, and defeated Hawken. Upon his return he severely punished the people of the uplands for having been disloyal. He maimed some, killed others, and robbed many of all their property. Year after year King Harold had made war on Denmark without coming nearer to King Sven's throne. It appears that finally the people in both counties became tired of this continual and wasteful warfare, and during the same winter that Earl Hawken had settled down in Vermland, Sweden. There were many negotiations between leading men of both countries who wanted peace and demanded that their kings should come to an agreement. The result was a meeting of the two kings at the Gott River, where peace was agreed upon. Harold was to have Norway, and Sven Denmark. The war should cease as it now stood, each retaining what he had got, and this peace should endure as long as they were kings. This peace was confirmed by oath, and the kings parted, having given each other hostages, 1064. In the year 1066, Earl Toast came from England and asked King Harold to aid him in an attempt to conquer England from his brother Harold Godwin's son, who had been proclaimed King of England. Earl Toast had already been on a similar mission to Denmark, but King Sven Estritsen had declared that he would be content if he could keep his own kingdom and defend that against the Northmen. King Harald Sigurdsson looked upon the plan with more favour, and promised his help. He collected an army and sailed for England with a large fleet. Before he left Thrandjum he gave the reins of the government to his son Magnus, whom he had proclaimed king at the Orthing. He took with him his younger son Olaf, the queen, and two daughters. At first King Harald was very successful against the Englishmen, and after a great victory the citizens of York surrendered the city to him. In the evening he returned to his ships to spend the night. Later in the same evening, however, King Harald Godwin's son arrived with a numerous army, and rode into the city with the goodwill and consent of the people of the castle. All the gates and walls were beset so that the Northmen could receive no report of their arrival, and the army remained all night in the town. In the morning King Harald Sigurdsson landed with a portion of his army, leaving the remainder behind with the ships. As they came across Stanford Bridge, they discovered a numerous army approaching. Earl Toast advised a speedy return to the ships to get more men and arms. But Harald Sigurdsson did not wish to appear cowardly, and elected instead to send three messengers with their fastest horses back to the ships with an order to the men there to immediately come to their assistance. Harold then arranged his men in a line of battle, long but not deep. Then he turned both wings backward until they met together, so that the army formed a wide ring of the men standing shield to shield. Thus he would defend himself against the enemy's horsemen, from whom he expected a violent attack. Those in the first rank were ordered to set the spear shaft on the ground, and the spear point against the horseman's breast. Those in the next rank were to direct the spear point against the horse's breast. Inside the ring, the bowmen were to stand, and here he also selected a place for himself and Earl Toast, and a body of chosen men. Now the English king approached with his army, which was twice as large as that of the Northmen. While Harold was yet arranging his army, riding around on his black horse, twenty horsemen came riding up from the English army, and asked if Earl Toast was there. The Earl himself answered, Here you can find him. One of the horsemen, speaking for the English king, then offered the Earl peace and a third of the kingdom if he would be reconciled with his brother. The Earl said, But if I accept this offer, what will he give King Harald Sigurdsson for his trouble? The horseman replied, He will give him seven feet of English ground, or as much more as he may be taller than other men. Then, said the Earl, return and tell King Harald to get ready for battle. 
Never shall the Northmen have a chance to say that Earl Toast left King Harold Sigurdsson to join his enemy. Then the horsemen returned to the English army. King Harold Sigurdsson said to Earl Toast, Who was the man who spoke so well? That was my brother, King Harold Godwin's son, said the Earl. Too late I learned that, said the King. For he had come so near to our army that he never should have been able to report the felling of our men. Now the battle began, the English horsemen advancing against the Northmen. But as long as the Northmen remained standing in a ring, shield to shield, and with the spears pointing out, the enemy could do nothing against them. But when the Northmen thought the enemy was retiring, they were imprudent enough to pursue the Englishmen, and thus break their own invincible ring. Then the Englishmen rode up from all sides, and made a terrible attack. Many people fell on both sides. King Harold Sigurdsson was hit by an arrow in the throat and fell dead to the ground, and most of his men fell around him. Harold was fifty-one years old when he died, 1066. The town of Oslo, now a suburb of Christiania, was founded during the reign of King Harold Sigurdsson. A church was built there and dedicated to the Virgin Mary. The shrine of the Holy Halvard, lately discovered and acknowledged as a national saint, was placed in this church. Chapter 20 Olaf Kier, The Quiet, 1066-1093 The English king permitted King Harald Sigurdsson's son Olaf to leave the country with the men he had left. Olaf proceeded to the Orkney Isles, where he remained during the winter, 1066-67. The next summer he returned to Norway, where he was proclaimed king along with his brother, Magnus taking the northern and Olaf the eastern part of the country. Shortly after the two brothers had assumed the government, the Danish king, Sven Estridsen, gave notice that the peace between the Northmen and the Danes was at an end. The brothers hurriedly collected armies to defend the country, and Sven set out from the south with a Danish force. He met King Olaf on the coast of Halland, where an indecisive battle was fought. Soon afterward Magnus arrived with reinforcements from the north, but then negotiations were opened, and peace was concluded on the old conditions at Konungahela. The agreement here made was confirmed by Olaf taking King Sven's daughter Ingerid in marriage. The following year King Magnus died at Nidaros, April 28, 1069, after being ill for some time. His son, Hawken, who was fostered by Thorer of Stieg in Gudbrandstel, being only an infant child, Olaf now became sole king of Norway. After the short conflict with Denmark, Olaf had no wars. A long period of peace was something new in the history of the country, and the people therefore gave King Olaf the surname Kyr, i.e., the Quiet. He preserved law and order with firmness, and did a great deal to promote commerce and the prosperity of the towns. Before his time there were three towns in Viken, Tunsberg, Oslo, and Sarpsborg, and one in Thrandjum, Nidaros. King Olaf founded the merchant town of Bergen, then Jorgen, where many wealthy people settled down, and the place was soon regularly frequented by merchants from foreign countries. The other towns also made good progress. In King Olaf's time there were held a greater number of general entertainments and hand-in-hand -hand feasts than formerly. Already, during the heathen time, the Northmen used to arrange feasts by clubbing together. After the introduction of Christianity they were continued, but naturally changed their character. These feasts, which from the time of Olaf Kyr were called guilds, had a partly religious character, and appear to have been regular meetings of fraternities, whose members were pledged to defend and help each other. The members were called guild brethren and guild sisters, and each guild was under the protection of a saint. The members were governed by strict laws, and in order to ensure good and peaceful behavior, men of dignity, both clergymen and laymen, were present at the meetings. King Olaf built several guild halls in different parts of the country, among them the Great Guild Hall in Nidaros. The Guild Brethren built Margaret's Church in Nidaros. There are many stories of King Olaf's good works. Once when he sat in the Great Guild Hall in Nidaros, one of his men said to him, it pleases us, King, to see you so happy. He answered, Why should I not be happy when I see my subjects sitting happy and free in a guild consecrated to my uncle, the sainted King Olaf? 
In the days of my father these people were subjected to much terror and fear. The most of them concealed their gold and their precious things, but now I see glittering on his person what each one owns, and your freedom is my gladness. At the things, King Olaf did not speak much, preferring to let others speak for him. One who was often entrusted with this duty was his foster brother Skjol, who was a son of Earl Toast, and was usually called the king's foster son. Skjol, who had come over with him from England, was made commander of King Olaf's court men and was given the king's cousin Gudrun in marriage. He was a dear friend of the king, who gave him fine estates near Konungahela, Oslo, and Nidaros. The principal one of these estates was Rain in Risen, which became the seat of this afterward powerful family. Skjol was the ancestor of King Inga Bardsson and Duke Skjol. King Olaf made several changes in the rooms on the king's estates. The king had formerly had his high seat on the middle of one of two long benches at the long walls of the house, but Olaf had the high seat removed to a cross bench at the short wall facing the entrance. Formerly the fire was in the middle of the floor between the long benches, but Olaf had the fireplace removed to one corner of the room, where he had a kind of a chimney place built. He had the floors, which had formerly been without covering, covered with stone and strewed with juniper tops. He introduced table cups instead of the deer horns out of which they formerly used to drink. Much unusual splendor and foreign fashions in the cut of clothes were also introduced. King Olaf doubled the number of attendants, so that he had 120 courtmen at arms, herd men, 60 guests, 9 and 60 house servants. He used the fashion, which was introduced from the courts of foreign kings, of letting his grand butler stand at the end of the table, and fill the cups for himself and the other distinguished guests who sat at the table. He had also torch-bearers, who held as many torches at the table as there were guests of distinction present. King Olaf Kier was a devout Christian. A better order was introduced in the affairs of the church, and the country was divided into three bishoprics. Many churches were built, among the largest of which were the Christ Church in Bergen and the Christ Church in Nidaros. King Olaf died on his estate, Hawkby, in Ranreich, September 22, 1098. His body was brought north to Nidaros and buried in Christ Church. The saga says of King Olaf, he was the most amiable king of his time, and Norway was much improved in riches and cultivation during his reign. Chapter 21 Magnus Barefoot, 1093-1103 Immediately after the death of Olaf Kyr, his son Magnus was proclaimed at Viking king of all Norway, but the upland people chose his cousin Hakon, the foster son of Thor of Stieg, as king. Hakon and Thor went north to Thrandjum and summoned the Orthing at Nidaros, and the people there proclaimed Hakon king of half of Norway, as his father had been. In order to win the goodwill of the Thrandjum people, Hakon relieved them of all harbor duties, did away with the Christmas gifts to the king, and gave them many other privileges. Thereafter he returned to the uplands, where he gave the people the same privileges. In the meanwhile King Magnus proceeded north to Nidaros, took possession of the king's house built by Harald Hardrade, and remained there the first part of the winter. When Hakon heard of this he also came up to Nidaros, and negotiations were open for a settlement between the rival kings, Hakon offering to accept half the kingdom and let Magnus retain the other half. Magnus refused to acknowledge any rights of Hakon, and a conflict seemed imminent. However, one day, after having made quite a demonstration with his force, Magnus sailed southward, and Hakon also decided to go south, taking the inland route. While he was crossing the Davra mountain, he pursued a ptarmigan, which flew up beside him, and during this chase he was taken violently ill, and died on the mountain. His body was brought back to Nidaros, and all the people went to meet the body, as the saga says, sorrowing, and the most of them weeping, for all the people loved him with sincere affection. Hawken, who was twenty-five years old at his death, was laid at rest in Christ Church, February, 1094. Magnus Olofsson was now sole king of Norway. A rebellion was started by some of the adherents of the late King Hakon, under the leadership of Thor of Stieg and the late Hakon's near friend, Sven, who aspired to become king. Sven was a Dane by birth, said to be of high family and a brave warrior. His father was one Harald Flett, 
of whom nothing is known. Several chiefs took part in this movement, among them the rich and powerful man, Skeel Gerlingson from Jadaran, and Egilus Laxan of Orland. The force proceeded from Gudbrandsdal down to Romsdal, and afterward north to Thrandjum. King Magnus' liegeman and devoted friend, Sigurd Ulstrang, collected a force and met Thor and Sven in battle, but suffered a bad defeat. He fled to King Magnus, who then collected an army, and proceeded north to Thrandjum. Magnus scattered the rebels, and captured Thor of Stieg and Egilus Laxun, and hanged them. Sven, Harald Flett's son, fled out to sea first, and then sailed to Denmark and remained there. King Magnus punished severely all who had been guilty of treason toward him, killing some and burning the houses of others. King Magnus now had undisputed control of Norway, and devoted himself to the care of his country and his people. By his vigorous rule he maintained peace and order, and rooted out all Vikings and lawless men. With his restless and ambitious disposition, however, he yearned for greater deeds and for fame in war. Wishing to retake the western countries, which had been dependencies of Norway under his ancestors, he set out with a great fleet, and first came to the Orkney Islands. There he took the two earls, Paul and Erland, prisoners, and sent them to Norway, and placed his eight-year-old son Sigurd as chief of the islands, leaving some wise men with him as counsellors. Then King Magnus proceeded to the southern Hebrides, where he harried the coasts and plundered wherever he came. Afterward he sailed to Wales and won a battle at Anglesey Sound, and took the Anglesey Isle. After this battle he returned north with his fleet, and came first to Scotland. He made a peace with the Scotch king, by which all the islands lying west of Scotland should belong to the King of Norway. King Magnus remained all the winter in the Southern Isles, and the next summer he returned with his fleet to Norway, 1099. During their long stay in the western countries King Magnus and his men had adopted some of the habits and fashions of clothing of those countries. They wore short jackets and kilts without breeches. On account of this the king was called Magnus Barefoot or Bareleg. A short time after his return to Norway, King Magnus became involved in war with the Swedish king, Inga Steinkelsen. Magnus insisted that the Gott River and Lake Vanern should be considered the boundary between the countries, so that the Swedish district of Dalsland would belong to Norway. This war lasted for two years, and was generally unsuccessful for King Magnus. In the spring of 1100 there was a battle at Foxern, at the Gott River, between Kongself and Wenersborg, in which the Norwegians were overwhelmed by numbers, driven to flight, and many of them killed by the pursuing Swedes. King Magnus was easily known, for he was a stout man, had a red cloak over him, and bright yellow hair that fell over his shoulders. Ogmund Skoptesen, who was also a tall and handsome man, rode at the side of the king. He saved the king by putting on the king's cloak. He started off in a little different direction, and the Swedes, supposing him to be the king, rode after him, while the king proceeded to his ships. Ogmund escaped with great difficulty, but succeeded at last in reaching the ships. King Magnus then sailed down the river and proceeded north to Viken. The next summer a meeting of the kings was agreed upon at Konghel on the Gott River. The Danish king, Eric Igod, desired to have an archbishopric established for the northern countries, and it was important to have the other kings with him to execute this plan. By his mediation the meeting of the three kings was arranged, and they soon came to an understanding. Each should possess the dominions his forefathers had held before him, and each should make good to his own men the loss and manslaughter suffered by them. King Inga agreed to give King Magnus his daughter Margaret in marriage. This agreement was proclaimed to the people, and thus, within a short hour, the greatest enemies were made the best of friends. Shortly afterward Margaret, King Inga's daughter, came to Norway with an honorable retinue, and her wedding with King Magnus was celebrated with great festivities. The Norwegians liked their new queen, whom they considered as a pledge of the peace with Sweden, and they therefore called her Fridkala, i.e., the peace girl. When Magnus had been nine years king of Norway, he again sailed westward with a great force. He first conquered the Isle of Man, and afterward proceeded to Ireland and conquered a great part of that country. He lay at Ulster, and was about ready to return to Norway, 
when he was suddenly attacked by an Irish army. King Magnus had a helmet on his head, a red shield on which there was a golden lion, and was girt with his costly sword, Legbit. In his hand he had a short spear, and over his shirt a red silk cloak. King Magnus received a wound, being pierced by a spear through both thighs above the knees. The king took hold of the shaft between his legs, broke the spear in two, and said, This way we break spear's halves, boys, let us go briskly on, nothing ails me. A little later King Magnus was hit in the neck with an Irish axe, and this was his death wound. Then those who were behind fled. Vidkin Johnson, from Byarchy, a great-grandson of Thor Hund, instantly killed the man who had given the king his death wound, and fled, after having received three wounds, but he brought the king's banner and the sword legbit to the ships. Vidkin Johnson was the last man who fled. The Northmen who escaped sailed away immediately. King Magnus was thirty years old when he fell. Chapter 22 Sigurd the Crusader 1103-1130, and his brothers, Eistian and Olaf. I and the autumn the remnants of King Magnus' army and fleet left the island of Man, and with his thirteen-year-old son, Sigurd, returned to Norway. On their arrival in Norway, Sigurd and his two brothers, Eistian and Olaf, were proclaimed kings. Eistian, who was fourteen years old, was to have the northern, and Sigurd the southern, part of the country. Olaf was then four or five years old, and his third part of the country remained under the control of his two brothers. When the three sons of Magnus Barefoot had been chosen kings of Norway, several of those who had been away taking part in the Crusades returned home. They had made themselves renowned, and had many things to relate. Some had been to Jerusalem and some to Constantinople, and it was said that those who would enter the military service at Constantinople had the best of opportunities to earn great money. By these extraordinary tidings many of the Northmen were seized by a desire to make similar expeditions, and they asked of the two kings that one of them should place himself at the head of such an expedition. The kings agreed to this, and had the preparations made at their common expense. Many of the great men in the country took part in this enterprise, and when all was ready it was decided that Sigurd was to go with the crusade, while Eistian was to stay at home and govern the country for their joint account. For years after the fall of King Magnus, 1107, King Sigurd sailed from Norway with sixty ships. He first visited the King of England, Henry I, and remained with him during the winter. In the spring he sailed with his fleet to Valland, the west of France, and in the fall came to Galicia, Spain, where he stayed the second winter. Along the coast he had several battles with the heathens. At the Straits of Gibraltar he defeated a large Viking force and on the island of Formentera, east of Spain, he exterminated a band of Moorish brigands and took a great booty. After similar victories on the islands of Ivica and Menorca, he came to Sicily, where he was very well received by Duke Roger. It is stated in the saga that King Sigurd, during his stay in Sicily, conferred upon Duke Roger the title of king, though with what right he did so does not appear, nor is it mentioned by contemporary historians. In the summer King Sigurd sailed to Palestine, and at Acre met Baldwin, king of Palestine, who received him particularly well, accompanied him to Jerusalem and showed him the Holy Sepulchre and other sacred places. They also rode to the river Jordan and bathed in it, and then returned to Jerusalem. King Baldwin and the Patriarch of Jerusalem presented Sigurd with a splinter of the Holy Cross, with the condition that he, and twelve other men with him, should swear to promote Christianity with all their power and erect an archbishop's seat in Norway if possible, and the splinter was to be kept where the holy King Olaf reposed. Thereupon King Sigurd with his fleet assisted King Baldwin in capturing the town of Sidon, Syria, and received his share of a great booty. He then proceeded to Constantinople, and was received in the grandest style by Emperor Alexius. After having stayed here for some time and enjoyed the great festivities given in his honor, King Sigurd made preparations for his return home. He gave the emperor all his ships, and the valuable dragon head which had adorned his own ship was set up in the Sophia church. The emperor gave him horses and guides to conduct him through his dominions. Leaving quite a number of his men, who went into the service of the emperor, King Sigurd started homeward on horseback through Bulgaria, Hungary and Germany. 
When in the midsummer of 1111 he came to Schleswig in Denmark, Earl Eilif gave him a magnificent reception. Here he also met the Danish King Nils, who had married his stepmother, Margaret Fritkala. King Nils accompanied him north to Jutland, and gave him a ship provided with everything needful. He then returned to Norway, where he was joyfully received by his people. He had been absent three years and a half, and all agreed that no one had ever made a more honourable expedition from Norway. From this day he was given the surname Jorsalfar, i.e., the Crusader. While King Sigurd was attaining fame on his journeys far away from his country, King Eistian was occupied with peaceful achievements at home. A great deal was done for the real benefit of the country, and under his wise government Norway made progress in the same way that it had done in the time of his grandfather Olaf Kyr. He improved the laws, built churches and monasteries, made harbours, and established beacon lights. On the mountain of Davra he built cabins, where travellers could find shelter. In Bergen he built the monastery at Norden's, Michael's Church, the Church of the Apostles, and the Great King's Hall. In Nidaros he built the Church of St. Nicholas. He also built a church at Thrandines in Halagaland. King Eistian also extended the limits of the country, not by warfare and bloodshed, but by peaceful negotiations. Thus he gained the allegiance of the inhabitants of the Swedish province Gentiland, which was formerly a Norwegian province, but was taken by Sweden after the fall of Olaf Tryggvason. King Olaf was taken sick and died before he reached manhood, and it seems to have been only in name that he had any share in the government. The relation between Eistian and Sigurd was not always the most cordial, and Sigurd was usually to blame for it. The winter of 1112-13 King Eistian spent most of the time at Sarpsborg. There lived at that time at Michael Dal in Amrud a rich and influential man called Olaf of Dal. He spent a good part of the winter at Sarpsborg with his daughter Borghild, a very handsome and accomplished girl. Borghild and King Eistian often met, and the king found great pleasure in conversing with her. The people began to talk about this friendship, and King Sigurd, who was then at Konghel, also heard of the girl that his brother had taken a liking to. When Borghild heard it whispered that people talked ill of her intimacy with King Eistian, she took it much to heart. When Eistian had gone north she went to Sarpsborg, and, after suitable fasts, carried red-hot irons to prove her innocence, endured the test, and thus cleared herself from all offence. Sigurd then rode over to her home, where he remained all night, made Borghild his concubine and took her away with him. They had a son, who was called Magnus, and was immediately sent to Halagaland to be fostered by Vidkin Johnson of Byarchy. The relation between the brothers remained strained as long as they both were kings, but it never came to a breach of peace. Occasionally they even peacefully met as each other's guests. On one of these occasions, when the two kings were feasting together at one of Eistian's estates, they had what was called a man measuring or comparison of merits. The saga says that in the evening, when the people began to drink, the ale was not good, so that the guests were very quiet and still. Then said King Eistian, Why are the people so silent? It is more proper in parties that people are merry, so let us find some jest over our ale that will amuse us, for surely, brother Sigurd, all will like to see us happy. Sigurd replied, rather bluntly, Do you talk as much as you please, but give me leave to be silent. Eistian said, It is a common custom over the ale table for one person to compare himself with another, and now let us do so. Sigurd did not answer. I see, said Eistian, that I will have to begin this amusement, and I will take thee, brother, to compare myself with, we are both kings, have equal property, and there is no difference in our birth. Sigurd then said, Dost thou remember that I could always throw thee when we wrestled, although thou art a year older? Eistian, but I remember also that I was better at the games which require limberness. Sigurd, but how was it when we were swimming? I could duck thee whenever I wanted to. Eistian, but I could swim as far as thou, and could dive as well. And I could run on ice, legs ten so well that nobody could beat me, while thou couldst no more do it than a cow. Sigurd, I consider it a more useful and suitable accomplishment for a chief to be an expert at his bow. But I think thou couldst hardly draw my bow, even with the help of the foot. 
Eistian, I am not as strong at the bow as thou art, but my aim is as good. And I can run on skis eleven much better than thou, and that is usually held a great accomplishment. Sigurd, it is much better for a chief who is to be the superior of other men that he is conspicuous in a crowd, and strong and powerful in weapons above other men. Eistian, it is just as well to be handsome, so as to be easily known from others on that account, and this behooves a chief, as a fair face and fine clothes go well together. I am also better versed in law than thou, and can speak better. Sigurd, it may be that thou hast learned more lockworks than I, for I have had something else to do, neither will any one deny thee a smooth tongue. But many say that thy words are not to be trusted. That thy promises are not kept, and that thou talkest according to what those who are about thee say, which is not kingly. Eistian, often I promise what people ask of me, as I like to have all be joyful about me, and it happens that conflicting interests afterward appear, which must be considered. But thou mostly promisest people what is evil, and no one is pleased because thy promises are kept. Sigurd, all say that the expedition I made out of the country was a princely expedition, while thou wert sitting at home like thy father's daughter. Eistian, now thou hast touched the tender spot, and I would not have brought up this conversation if I had not known what to reply on this point. I think I equipped thee from home for this expedition like a sister. Sigurd, thou must have heard that I was in many battles in the Saracen's land, and gained victory in all. I brought to this country many valuables, the like of which had never been seen here before. I became acquainted with great men, and was respected by them. I went to the Saviour's grave, and saw thee not there. I went to the river Jordan, in which the Lord was baptized, and I swam across, but I saw thee not there. On the edge of the river there is a bush of willows, and there I twisted a knot of willows, and said that this knot thou shouldst untie, brother, or take the curse thereto attached. Then King Eistian said, I have heard that thou hast had some battles abroad, but it was more useful for the country what I was doing here at home. North in Vagin, Lofoden, I put up booths, so that the poor fishermen could find shelter. I also had a church built there, appointed a priest, and gave land for the support of the church, before that, they were nearly all heathens there. These people will remember that Eistian was king in Norway. Across the Davra mountain lay the road from Thrandjum. Formerly many froze to death, and all suffered hardships on the journey, but I built a mountain inn and endowed it with property. Those who hereafter travel there will remember that Eistian was king in Norway. Off Agdanes there were breakers and shoals and no harbour, so that many ships were wrecked. Now there is a good harbour and good anchorage for the ships, and a church has also been built there. I had war signals erected on the highest mountains, which is of benefit to all who live in the interior. I built the royal hall in Bergen and the Apostles' Church and a covered passage between them. The kings who succeed us will remember my name. I built St. Michael's Church at Nordens, in Bergen, and the monastery Munkaliv at the same place. I improved the laws, brother, so that everybody could deal justly with his neighbor, and if the laws are upheld the government will be better. More by gentle words and wise dealings than by violence and breach of peace did I succeed in making the inhabitants of gentle and subjects of this kingdom. All these things may be considered small matters, but they will benefit the people of the country more than the fact that thou hast butchered blue men in Circland for the devil and hurled them into hell. And if thou didst tie a knot for me, I will not untie it. But I think that if I had been inclined to tie a knot for thee, I could have tied such a knot that thou wouldst not have been king of Norway on thy return to this country with but a single ship. This was the end of the man measuring. There was silence in the hall, and both kings were very angry. Several other incidents are recorded, which show the jealousy that existed between the kings. However, peace was preserved between them as long as they lived. Six years after his brother Olaf's death, King Eistian was taken suddenly sick and died at the age of 33, August 29, 1122. He was buried in Christ Church in Nidaros, and it is said that so many mourners had never stood over any man's grave in Norway since the death of King Magnus the Good. Sigurd was now sole king of Norway and free from the restraint which the pacific disposition of the popular Eistian had placed upon him.
Shortly after the death of Eistian, King Sigurd entered into an agreement with the Danish king Nils Sveinsson, who had married his stepmother, Margaret Fridkala. They agreed upon a joint invasion of Sweden. The real motive was probably to secure this kingdom, which was at the time torn by internal strifes, for Margaret's son Magnus Nilsson. But the avowed purpose was to Christianize the inhabitants of the Swedish province of Småland, where paganism still lingered. The two kings were to meet with their armies at Orsund. King Sigurd collected a fleet of about 360 ships and proceeded to the meeting place, but through some mistake the Danish army had already returned home. King Sigurd held a council with his men, at which they spoke of King Nils' breach of faith and determined to take revenge by plundering his country. They first plundered the town of Tumertorp, and then sailed east to the merchant town Kalmar, which they attacked. They plundered in the province of Småland, compelled the people to accept Christianity, and imposed on the country a tribute of 1,800 cattle. After this King Sigurd returned to Norway with a great booty. This expedition was called the Kalmar Levy, and was the only levy Sigurd carried out while he was sole king. During the later years of his reign, King Sigurd was often violent and showed unmistakable signs of insanity. One Whit Sunday he sat in his high seat with Queen Malmfred at his side, and in his hand he held the holy book, written in gilded letters, which he had brought with him from Constantinople. On the benches were seated many friends and guests. Then the king suddenly got one of his attacks. He rolled his eyes and looked all around him, and then said, Many are the changes which may take place during a man's lifetime. Two things were dearer to me than anything else, namely, this book and the queen, and now it is quite different. The queen does not know herself how hideous she is, for a goat's horn is standing out of her head. And this book is good for nothing. Thereupon he threw the book on the fire which was burning on the floor, and gave the queen a blow with his fist between the eyes. Before the king stood the young taper-bearer, Otter Birding, who was on duty that day. He was of small stature, but of agreeable appearance, lively and bold. His surname Birding had been given him on account of his black hair and dark complexion. He sprang forward and snatched the book from the fire, held it out, and said, Yes, sire, different were the days when you came with great state and splendor to Norway, and all your friends hastened to welcome you. Now days of sorrow have come over us, for to this holy festival many of your friends have come, and cannot be cheerful on account of your sad condition. Now, good king, follow my advice. Make peace first with the queen, whom you have so highly affronted, and then gladden by gentleness all your chiefs, friends, and servants. What? cried King Sigurd. Dost thou dare to give me advice, thou black churl, thou great lump of a houseman's lad? And he sprang up, drew his sword, and swung it, as if going to cut him down. But Otter stood quiet and upright, and looked the king straight in his face. The king turned round the sword blade, and gently touched Otter on the shoulder with it. Then he sat down in silence on his high seat. All were silent, for nobody dared to utter a word. In a little while the king had quieted down. He then rebuked his liegemen for not having stopped his insane acts, and thanked Otter for what he had done. He concluded his speech by making Otter a liegeman, and said, Go thou now and sit among the lender men, and be a servant no longer. Otter Birding became in later years one of the most celebrated men in Norway. A few years before his death King Sigurd, in spite of the strong protest of Bishop Magna, discarded Queen Malmfred, and married a beautiful and high-born woman, named Cecilia. The last winter of his life King Sigurd spent in Oslo. In the spring he was taken violently sick. His friends saw in this the punishment of heaven for his improper marriage, and urged him to dissolve it, but he loved Cecilia too dearly to acquiesce in this. At last, she herself suggested a separation. I did not know that thou, too, wouldst leave me like the others, said the king sadly. He grew gradually worse after this, and on March 26, 1130, he died, forty years old. His body was deposited in a vault in St. Halvard's church. According to the saga, the time of his reign was good for the country, for there was peace, and crops were good. Chapter 23 
Magnus the Blind and Harold Giel, 1130-1136. The year before King Sigurd's death a young man named Harold Giel, or Gilichrist, i.e. dedicated to Christ, came to Norway from Ireland with his mother, and declared that he was a son of King Magnus Barefoot. It is known that Magnus Barefoot had had a mistress in Ireland, and composed a verse once, in which he said he loved his Irish girl above all others. When the young man and his mother came to King Sigurd and told their story, the king told Harold that he would not deny him the opportunity to prove his birth by submitting to the ordeal by fire, but on condition that if he should prove his descent, he should not claim the kingdom in the lifetime of King Sigurd, or of his son Magnus, and to this Harold Giel bound himself by oath. Harold agreed to the ordeal fixed by Sigurd, and walked over nine glowing plowshares with bare feet, attended by two bishops. Three days after the iron trial his feet were examined, and were found unburned. This ordeal was considered a divine judgment, and King Sigurd acknowledged Harold as his brother. It became a source of danger to the country that Harold was acknowledged as a son of Magnus Barefoot. For at that time the law of royal inheritance was that every son of a king, the illegitimate as well as the legitimate, had a right to the kingdom. This encouraged many to proclaim themselves rightful heirs to the throne and to prove their rights by the ordeal of fire. The priests had the charge of such ordeals, and they probably had the result in their power. Sigurd's son, Magnus, conceived a great hatred of Harold, and in this he had the sympathy of many of the leading men. Immediately after the death of Sigurd, his son Magnus summoned a thing at Oslo, and was there proclaimed king of all Norway, according to an oath which the people had formerly sworn to King Sigurd. Harald Giel was in Tunsberg when he heard of Sigurd's death. He broke his promise to the late king, summoned a thing, and had his followers proclaim him king of half the country. Negotiations were opened with King Magnus, and, as the latter found he had fewer people, he was obliged to divide the kingdom with Harold. For about three years the two kings kept the peace, although there was little friendship between them. They both passed the fourth winter at Nidaros, and invited each other as guests, but their people were always ready for a fight. In the spring King Magnus sailed southward with his fleet, and collected men from all districts, telling the people that he wanted to take the kingly dignity from Harold and give him such a part of the country as might be suitable. Harold proceeded from Thrandjum overland to the uplands and Viking, and, when he heard what Magnus was doing, he also collected an army. At Firalief in Viking a battle was fought, and Magnus, who had a much superior force, won a decisive battle. Harold's army was put to flight, and he himself barely escaped to his ships. He sailed south to Denmark, and was well received by the Danish king, Erik Emyun, who gave him the province of Halland in fief. After the Battle of Firalief, August 10, 1134, King Magnus proclaimed himself sole king of Norway. He showed great lenience toward Harald's men, and had the wounded taken care of equally with his own men. His leading men advised him to keep his army together in Viking, and remain there, in case Harald should return from the south. But he thought this was not necessary, allowed the men to return to their homes, and proceeded with his court men to Bergen. It was not long before King Magnus had cause to regret that he had disregarded the advice of his friends. Harald had soon gathered a sufficient force to invade Norway, and, while he proceeded along the coast, a good many people joined him. He came to Bergen, where he met only nominal resistance, and King Magnus was taken prisoner. King Harald held a meeting with his counselors, and here it was decided that Magnus should be deprived of his dominions and should no longer be called king. He was then delivered to the king's thralls, who put out both his eyes, cut off one foot, and otherwise mutilated him. Magnus, who after this was given the surname, The Blind, was brought north to Nidaros and entered the Niederholm cloister. When Harald Giel had been six years king of Norway, Sigurd Slemb came to the country, and claimed that he too was a son of Magnus Barefoot. Sigurd was in his childhood kept at his book, became a clergyman, and was consecrated a deacon. He showed early traces of a haughty, ungovernable spirit, and was therefore called Slembejakn, i.e., the bad deacon. When he heard that he was the son of Magnus Barefoot, he laid aside all clerical matters and set out on trading expeditions. 
In Denmark he claimed to have established his parentage by the iron ordeal in the presence of five bishops, and when he arrived in Bergen he requested Harold Gilles to acknowledge him as his brother. King Harold, however, accused him of being an accomplice in a murder case, and attempted to capture him. Sigurd escaped and afterward arranged a conspiracy, in which many of Harold's court men took part. Honesty Lucia's night, December 13, 1136, they came to the house where Harold was sleeping with his mistress, Thora, Guthorm's daughter, killed the guardsmen outside, broke into the house, and killed the king in bed. Sigurd and his men then took a boat and rowed out in front of the king's house. It was then just beginning to be daylight. Standing in his boat Sigurd spoke to the men on the king's pier, avowed the killing of Harold, and requested them to choose him as chief according to his birth. But all replied with one voice, that they would never give obedience to a man who had murdered his own brother. And if thou art not his brother, thou hast no claim by descent to be king. Thereupon they outlawed Sigurd and all his men. Sigurd and his men saw it was best for them to get away, and fled northward to North Hordaland. King Harald Gil was thirty-two years old when he was slain. He was buried in the old Christ Church in Bergen. It was a few months before his death that pirates from Vendland, under their king, Redeber, pillaged and burned the town of Konungahela, Konghel. The town was afterward rebuilt, but never rose to the importance it had had before. Chapter 24 Sigurd Mund, Eistian, and Inga Krokrig, the sons of Harald Gil, 1136-1161 Queen Ingerid, the widow of Harald Gil, immediately after her husband's death held a consultation with the liegemen and courtmen. And they decided to send a fast sailing vessel to Thrandjum to request the people there to take Harald's son, with Thora, Guthorm's daughter, Sigurd, for king. Sigurd, who was then in his fourth year, was being fostered by Gyrd Bartson. The people of Thrandjum assembled at a thing and proclaimed Sigurd king. Queen Ingerid herself proceeded to Viken, where her son with Harald, the one-year-old Inga, was fostered by a Munjurd son. A Borger thing, thing at Borg or Sarpsborg, was called, at which Inga was chosen king. Thus, it is related in the saga, almost the whole nation submitted to the brothers, and principally because their father was considered holy. And the country took the oath to them, that the kingly power should not go to any other man as long as any of King Harold's sons were alive. It was agreed that the chief liegemen should rule in the name of the brothers while they were in their infancy. Sigurd Slemth proceeded north to Nidaros, and took Magnus the Blind out of the cloister in the hope that, by making common cause with him, he could secure a better following. In this he succeeded to some extent, many of King Magnus' old friends joining him. With quite a force they went south to the mouth of Romsdalfjord. Here Sigurd and Magnus divided their forces, Sigurd sailing westward to the Orkneys to seek aid. Magnus proceeded with his force through Romsdal over to the uplands, where he remained during the winter and collected an army. When it was rumored in Viken that Magnus the Blind had come to the uplands, Thyestolf Aelsen and the other chiefs who were with King Inga gathered a great army and proceeded up to Lake Myosen, and met the forces of Magnus at Min, 1137. A great battle was fought, and Magnus was defeated. It is related that Thyestolf Aelsen carried the child king, Inga, in his tucked-up cloak during the battle. But Thyestolf was hard-pressed by fighting, and it was said that King Inga suffered an injury there, which he retained as long as he lived. His back was knotted into a hump, and one leg was shorter than the other. Hence he was afterward called Inga Krokrig, i.e., Inga the Hunchback. Magnus fled eastward to Gotland, where he received aid from the Swedes, but being again defeated at Krokoskog he fled to Denmark. Magnus the Blind was well received by the Danish king, Erik Emyn, who collected a force and sailed north to Norway with 240 ships. Attacks were made at different places, and the town of Oslo was burned, including St. Halvard's church, but King Erik soon returned to Denmark after having suffered great losses, and the expedition was pronounced a total failure. Sigurd Slem about this time returned from the west, and made cruises against the pirates in Vendland, and occasionally harried the coasts of Norway. 
In the fall of 1139 Sigurd Slem ben Magnus the Blind came up to Norway from Denmark with thirty ships manned by Danes and Northmen. They met the fleet of King Sigurd and Inga at Holmengra, the Grey Home, where a battle was fought. After the first assault, the Danes fled home to Denmark with eighteen ships, and thus Sigurd had to fight against a greatly superior force. One after another of his ships was cleared. The blind and crippled Magnus lay in his bed and could do nothing to defend himself. When his ship was almost entirely bare of men, his old and faithful court man, Ryda Gryatgardson, took King Magnus in his arms and tried to leap over to another ship with him. But just then he was struck between his shoulders by a spear, which went through him and also killed King Magnus. Ryda fell backward on the deck and Magnus upon him. Everybody afterward spoke of how honorably he had followed his master and rightful sovereign. Happy are they who are given such praise after death, adds the writer of the saga. Sigurd Slemb leaped overboard and would probably have escaped, if he had not been betrayed by one of his own men. He was captured and put to death with the most horrible tortures. The men who took upon themselves to kill him, and who had personal grievances to avenge, broke his shin bones and arms with an axe hammer. Then they stripped him and flogged him, broke his back, and finally hanged him. He bore the tortures with great fortitude. He never moved and never altered his voice, but spoke in a natural tone until he gave up the ghost, occasionally singing hymns. Sigurd's friends afterward came from Denmark for his body, took it with them and interred it in Mary Church in Aalborg. When Sigurd was dead, it was acknowledged by all, both enemies and friends, that he was the most remarkable and most gifted man that had lived in Norway within memory of anybody living, but in some respects he was an unlucky man, says the saga. Magnus the Blind was twenty-five years old when he fell. Thyestolf Ailsen transported his body to Oslo and buried it in St. Halvard's Church, beside King Sigurd, his father. Norway now had peace for some years. About six years after Sigurd and Inga had been proclaimed kings, a third son of Harald Giel, named Eistian, came from Scotland accompanied by his mother, Biadoc, and by three men of high standing. They immediately proceeded to Thrandjum, and at the Orthing Eistian was chosen king and given a third of the country with his brothers, Sigurd and Inga. King Harald himself had spoken to his men about this son, so that Eistian did not have to resort to the ordeal of iron in order to prove his right. A fourth son of Harald Giel, Magnus, who was being fostered by the great chief Kerpingo Arem at Studla, was also given the title of king, so that for a short time there were nominally four kings. But Magnus was deformed, lived but a short time, and died in his bed. Shortly after the death of Harald Giel, his widow, Queen Ingerid, had married the liegeman, Otter Birding of Thrandjum, who thus became King Inga's stepfather and guardian, and who strengthened King Inga's government much during his childhood. King Sigurd was not very friendly to Otter Birding, because, as he thought, Otter always took King Inga's part. One evening Otter was assassinated in Nidaros as he was going to the evening service. His relatives and friends accused King Sigurd of having instigated this deed and were much enraged against him. A peasant army under the leadership of King Eistian came to Nidaros and a conflict seemed inevitable. But King Sigurd then offered to clear himself by the ordeal of iron, and peace was made. King Sigurd hastened to the southern part of the country, and the ordeal was never heard of again. Many other things contributed to make Sigurd unpopular. As he grew up he became a very ungovernable and restless man. He was a stout and strong man, of a brisk appearance. He had light brown hair and quite a handsome face except that he had an ugly mouth. For that reason he was called Sigurd Mund, Mouth. His great immorality gave general offense to the people. He was not married, but had several illegitimate children. In 1153 King Eistian made a cruise to the Orkneys. Some time after his return there was a quarrel between him and King Sigurd, because the latter had killed two of Eistian's court men. A conference to settle this affair was arranged in the winter, 1154-55, in the uplands. They not only settled their difficulty, but privately arranged for a meeting of the three kings in Bergen next summer. 
It was said that their plan was to depose King Inga and give him two or three estates and a certain income, as he had not health to be a king. Their plan might possibly have succeeded if it had not been for King Inga's faithful man, Gregorius Dagson, who was then Inga's guardian and advisor. He made preparations for the meeting, and when Sigurd arrived in Bergen, King Inga had a superior force. After some hostile acts, King Sigurd was attacked in his lodgings by Gregorius Dagson and slain, June 10, 1155. Two or three days after King Eistian arrived from the east with thirty ships. He had along with him his brother's seven-year-old son Hawken, a son of King Sigurd. When he heard what had happened in Bergen, Eistian did not come up to the town, but anchored at Florvag, while a reconciliation between the brothers was attempted. The result was that King Eistian returned to Viken and King Inga to Thrandjum, and they were in a way reconciled, but they did not meet each other. About a year later, after several quarrels and provoking incidents, the two brothers met with hostile fleets at Furs, Ranreich, and made ready for battle. So many of King Eistian's ships left him, however, and joined King Inga that Eistian had no choice but flight. He was captured by his brother-in-law, Simon Scalp, who murdered him after having allowed him to hear Mass, August 21, 1157. King Eistian was buried in Furs Church. Inga was now sole king, but it was only a short time that he was in undisputed possession of the country. The adherents of the late kings, Eistian and Sigurd, chose the latter's son as their chief and gave him the title of king. He was then ten years old. He was afterward given the surname Hurtebred, i.e., the broad-shouldered. Hawken and his adherents were outlawed by King Inga, who took possession of all their estates, after they had sought refuge in Sweden. Gregorius Dagson was then in Konungahela, where the danger was greatest, and had with him a strong and fine body of men, with which he defended the country. He defeated Hawken's force in a decisive battle at Konungahela, 1159. Later Hawken, who had strengthened his forces with a number of robbers and adventurers, harried the frontier districts in Viken. One day he came to the estate of Halder Brynjolfsson, a brother-in-law of Gregorius Dagson, set fire to the house and burned it. Halder came out, but was instantly cut down together with his housemen, in all about twenty men were killed. Halder's wife, Sigrid, Gregorius Dagson's sister, escaped to the forest in her nightdress, but the five-year-old Amund son, a nephew of Gregorius, was carried away by Hawkins' men. When Gregorius Dagson heard of this he took it much to heart, and set out to avenge the outrage. On January 7, 1161, Gregorius caught sight of Hawkins' force. There was a river, called Bifia, between them, and in trying to cross it on the unsafe ice Gregorius fell through, and, while struggling to get ashore, was killed by an arrow shot by one of Hawkins' men. When King Inga, who was then in Oslo, heard of Gregorius Dagson's death, he cried like a child, and, after having recovered himself, swore to attack Hawken, and either avenge his friend's death or die in the attempt. On the 3d of February, 1161, King Inga's spies brought him word that Hawken was coming toward the town, Oslo. The king ordered his men called together, and when they were drawn up in line they numbered nearly 4,800. When the night was well advanced, the spies came and informed the king that Hawken and his army were coming over the ice, which lay all the way from the town to the Hovet Isle. King Inga then led his army out on the ice, and drew it up in order of battle. The king and his brother Orm took their places under the banner in the center. On the right wing, toward the nunnery, was Gudrod, the exiled king of the South Hebrides, and John Sveinsen, a grandson of Bergthor Buk. On the left wing, toward Thraleberg, stood the chief Simon Scalp and Gudbrand Skafhugsen, who was married to King Eistian Magnusson's daughter Maria. When Hawken and his army came near to King Inga's array, both sides raised a war shout. But then it appeared that there were traitors in Inga's army. Gudrod and John gave the enemy a signal, and when Hawken's men in consequence turned that way, Gudrod immediately fled with 1,800 men. And John, and a great body of men with him, ran over to Hawken's army and assisted them in the fight. When this news was told to King Inga, he said, Such is the difference between my friends. 
never would Gregorius have done so in his life. Some of Inga's men now advised him to mount a horse and ride up to Romerike, where he could get help. But he refused to do so. I have heard you often say, and I think truly, that it was of little use to my brother Eistian that he took to flight. And yet he was in many ways an abler man than I. I was in the second year of my age when I was chosen king of Norway, and I am now twenty-six. I have had misfortune and sorrow under my kingly dignity, rather than pleasure and peaceful days. I have had many battles, and it is my greatest luck that I have never fled, even when fighting against a superior force. God will dispose of my life, but I shall never betake myself to flight. As a result of the traitor's work Hawken gained a complete victory. When daylight came, King Inga was among the fallen. His brother Orm tried to continue the battle, but at last had to take flight. On the following day Orm was to have married Ragna, a daughter of Nicholas Mays and widow of King Eistian, but after the battle Orm fled to Svithiad, Sweden, where his brother Magnus was then king. Hawken and his men took possession of the town, and feasted on what had been prepared for the wedding. Those of Inga's friends who survived the battle fled in all directions. Only Christina, Sigurd the Crusader's daughter, remained in town, for she had a promise to the late king to fulfill. She found King Inga's body, and had it laid in the stone wall of Halvard's church, on the south side below the choir. Chapter 25 The Church From the time of Olaf Kyr, the quiet, there were three bishops in Norway, one in Nidaros, one in Bergen, and one in Oslo. During the reign of kings Eistian and Sigurd the Crusader a bishopric was also established in Stavanger. The bishops were chosen by the king, and the bishops appointed the priests. For the last half-century the Norwegian church, as well as the Swedish, had been under the Danish archbishop at Lund. This arrangement appeared very unsatisfactory, as the Norwegian church covered extended territory which called for special supervision. Since the time of Sigurd the Crusader there had been a constant desire to obtain an independent Norwegian archbishopric. Finally, during the reign of Harold Gilles' sons, the Pope sent Cardinal Nicholas Breakspear of Alba from Rome to Norway, 1152. Cardinal Nicholas, who was an Englishman by birth and a very able and conscientious man, arrived in Nidaros, and seems to have immediately understood the situation. The saga says that he had taken offence at the brothers Sigurd and Eistian. The reason is not stated, but it was perhaps on account of their immoral life. They were obliged to come to a reconciliation with him, on the other hand, he stood on the most affectionate terms with King Inga, whom he called his son. When an understanding had been arranged with the kings, the cardinal had John Bergerson consecrated Archbishop of Thrandjum and gave him the consecrated vestment called Pallium. He further settled that the archbishop's seat should be in Nidaros, in Christ Church, where King Olaf the Saint reposed. At the same time a new bishopric was established at Hamar, on Lake Myosen. Under the jurisdiction of the archbishopric at Nidaros were included the four other bishoprics of Norway, Oslo, Hamar, Stavanger, and Bergen, and those of the dependencies, Iceland, the Orkneys, the Faroes, Greenland and the Hebrides with the Isle of Man. The establishment of the archbishopric at Nidaros was probably the most important result of the mission of Cardinal Nicholas, but he also left other traces of his work. He changed the manner of choosing bishops, so that instead of being appointed by the king they were now to be elected by the canonical communities established at the cathedrals. The bishops after this exercised much greater authority than they had done before. The saga says of Cardinal Nicholas that he improved many of the customs of the Northmen while he was in the country. There never came a foreigner to Norway whom all men respected so highly, or who could govern the people so well as he did. After some time he returned to the south with many friendly presents, and declared ever afterward that he was the greatest friend of the people of Norway. Cardinal Nicholas was, shortly after his return to Rome, elected pope and consecrated under the name of Adrian IV. There were also several cloisters for monks in Norway at this time. They were generally quite wealthy, as many people would give all they had to the cloisters. There were at Thrandjum two cloisters, the Niederholm and Elgesiter. In Bergen, Munkeliv, and a little further south Lys Cloister, 
and near Oslo the Hoved Isle. At Gimso near Shein there was a convent for nuns. Chapter 26 Hawken Hurtebred, 1161-1162, Erling Skak After the fall of King Inga in the battle at Oslo, Hawken Hurtebred, the broad-shouldered, took possession of the whole country. He distributed all the offices, in the towns and in the country, among his own friends. As he was only about fourteen years old, he could not, of course, be expected to attend personally to the affairs of the government. But his liegemen governed in his name. Many of the adherents of the late King Inga refused to acknowledge King Hawken. Among them was the powerful and wily chieftain Erling Skak. He was of a distinguished family, which resided on the Studla estate in Sundhordland. In his youth he had made a crusade to the Holy Land. On his way back through the Mediterranean he had a fight with pirates and was wounded in the neck, which compelled him afterward to carry his head on one side, hence his surname, Skak, Rai. By the assistance of King Inga he obtained in marriage Christina, a daughter of King Sigurd the Crusader and Queen Malmfred. A year after their marriage she bore him a son, who was named Magnus. Erling Skak called together in Bergen all the chiefs who had been attached to King Inga, and all his court men, and the housemen of the late Gregorius Dagson. When they met they discussed the situation, and resolved to keep up their party and to elect a king in opposition to Hawken. Erling proposed to make the boy Nicholas, a son of Simon Scalp and Harold Giel's daughter Maria, king. But the others objected to this, and, after some discussion, Erling was persuaded to do what had probably been his intention from the beginning, namely, to let his own son, Magnus, be proclaimed king. Although this was against the law of the country, the boy not being of royal birth on his father's side. A thing was held in the town, and here Magnus Erlingson, then five years old, was proclaimed king of the whole country. Erling did not consider himself strong enough to immediately take up the fight with King Hawken. He therefore proceeded to Denmark, accompanied by his son and a large party. The Danish king, Valdemar the Great, received them hospitably and promised to furnish the necessary help to win and retain Norway, on condition that King Valdemar was to get that part of Norway which his ancestors, Harold Gormson and Sven Jugaskeg, had possessed. With the help obtained in Denmark, Berling crossed over from Jutland to Agder, and then sailed northward to Bergen, where he punished those who had given allegiance to Hawken. Then he returned along the coast, and attacked and defeated Hawken at Tunsberg. Hawken proceeded to Thrandjum, where he had most of his friends, and Erling returned to Bergen, after having reduced the whole of Viken in obedience to King Magnus. In the spring King Hawken started southward with quite a fleet. By a stratagem Erling succeeded in surprising him, when his forces were divided, at second, in Romsdal, where a battle was fought. Hawken was defeated, and the young king himself was killed, 1162. Hawkins' body was buried in Romsdal, but afterward his brother, King Svera, had the body removed to Nidaros and laid in the stone wall in Christ Church south of the choir. Chapter 27 Magnus Erlingsen, 1162-1184, The Birch Legs After the Battle of Sekin, Erling Skak proceeded with King Magnus and the whole army up to Nidaros, where the thing was convened, and Magnus was proclaimed king of all Norway. They remained there but a short time, however, for Erling did not put great faith in the Thrandjum people. Erling returned with his son to Bergen, and later in the fall went to Tunsberg, where he intended to stay during the winter. Some of the late King Hawkins' chiefs, who had not been present at the battle, among them Earl Sigurd of Rare, refused to acknowledge King Magnus. They left their ships in Romsdal and went over to Uplands, where they found many adherents. They chose for their king a young son of King Sigurd Mund, named Sigurd Marcus Foster, i.e., foster son of Marcus, who had been brought up by Marcus of Skog, a friend and relative of Earl Sigurd. Quite an army was collected, but as the territory they held was small, their foraging became burdensome to the people, and there was considerable dissatisfaction. Erling Skak took advantage of this, and when finally a battle was fought at Rhee, near Tunsberg, he easily defeated Sigurd's adherents. Earl Sigurd fell in the battle, February, 1163. 
Sigurd Marcus Foster and his foster father were captured and killed in the fall of the same year. The archbishop in Nidaros was at that time Eistian, a son of Erland Himald, who descended from a very influential family in the Thrandjum district. In the summer of 1164 Erling Skak had a conference with Archbishop Eistian in Bergen, where all the bishops of the country were then assembled, together with the legate from Rome, Stephanus. The result of the conference was that Magnus was to be anointed and crowned as king by the archbishop, while on the other hand it was agreed that in the future the church, represented by the archbishop and the other bishops, together with twelve leading men from each bishopric selected by the bishop, was to decide at the death of a king which one of his heirs was to succeed him. And if the king left no heirs of whom the magnates approved, they were to elect a successor to the throne. In the presence of the papal legate, the bishops, and a great many other clergymen, King Magnus, who was then eight years old, was anointed and crowned by the archbishop. Magnus, Erling's son, was the first crowned king in Norway. By this solemn act Erling Skak believed he had secured his son's dynasty on the throne, and he could now with greater safety turn his whole attention to internal and foreign enemies. As he felt convinced that the greater part of the people would rally around the anointed king. When King Valdemar of Denmark heard that Erling Skak had defeated Haakon Hertebred and Sigurd Marcus Foster, and that his son Magnus had been crowned king of the whole country, he sent a message to Erling and reminded him of the agreement by which Viking was to be ceded to the Danish king, if Magnus became king of Norway. Erling and his advisers showed no inclination to adhere to the agreement, and the messenger returned to Denmark without having accomplished anything. In the spring of 1165 King Valdemar sailed with a fleet north to Viking in order to take possession of the province. He tried peaceful proceedings. But he was so coolly received by the people of Viking that he returned to Denmark, preferring, as he said to his men, to use his army against the heathens of Vendland. The hostility between Norway and Denmark, however, lasted some time. Erling made a cruise to Jutland and defeated the Danes in a battle at Dursa, and returned to Norway with a great booty. A second expedition of King Valdemar to Viking in the spring of 1168 became as indecisive as the first, so far as establishing any authority there. But he dealt the inhabitants of Viking a hurtful blow by forbidding them to trade with Denmark, at the same time forbidding the Danes to export grain to Norway. While Erling Skak was absent on an expedition to Denmark, a band of rebels was organized under the leadership of a new pretender, Olaf, a son of King Eistian Magnusson's daughter Maria, in her marriage with the chief Gudbrand Skafhoxen, who fell with King Inga in the battle at Oslo. Olaf was brought up by an influential man named Sigurd A. G. N. Hat. Probably from the latter's surname the adherents of Olaf were called Hatswains, Hattisvainer. The Hatswains proclaimed Olaf king, and went through the uplands, and sometimes down to Viken, or east to the forest settlements. At Ridjokal, near Lake Oyern, they surprised Erling Skak and his men early one morning, and in the fight that followed killed several of Erling's men and drove the remainder down to their ships. Because Olaf did not succeed in capturing Erling, although the odds were all in his favor, he was afterward called Olaf the Unlucky, Yugiva. The following spring the Hatswains met Erling in battle at Stanger, in the eastern part of Viken, where Erling won a decisive victory. Sigurd Agn Hat and many others of Olaf's men fell here. Olaf escaped by flight, went south to Denmark, and spent the winter in Alborg, where he died of sickness the following spring. 1169. The interruption of the navigation between Norway and Denmark under the decree of King Valdemar worked great hardship to the Norwegians, especially the inhabitants of Viken, and Erling Skak was finally induced to open negotiations for peace. He spent a winter in Denmark, and in the following spring peace was finally concluded, the terms being that Viken should be under the sovereignty of the Danish king, but Erling was to hold it in fief as King Valdemar's vassal with the title of Earl. Erling returned to Norway, and the peace with Denmark was afterward well preserved. Erling Skak considered it a policy of necessity to remove any person who by reason of royal birth might become rivals of his son to the throne. King Sigurd Mund had left a daughter named Cecilia. As soon as she became old enough, 
he sent her to Vermland and made her the mistress of Folkvid the lawman, knowing that the children from such a connection could not become dangerous rivals. About the same time one of the king's men discovered and brought to Erling a young man named Harold, who in all secrecy had been brought up in the uplands. He was the son of Erling's own wife Christina, and his father was the late King Sigurd Mund. An illicit intimacy between such near relatives as Christina and Sigurd was, under the church laws of the time, considered one of the greatest sins, and everything had therefore been done to keep the matter secret. And Christina had heretofore succeeded in concealing her guilt. When Erling saw the illegitimate son of his wife before him, he said very little, and those present understood that the young man was doomed. King Magnus, who had taken a liking to Harold, interceded in his favor. But his father answered, Thou wouldst govern this kingdom but a short time in peace and safety, if thou wert to follow the counsels of the heart only. Earl Erling ordered Harold to be taken to Nordens, where he was beheaded. Erling Skak, however, did not succeed in removing all pretenders. In the year 1174 there appeared on the scene a young man called Eistian, who claimed to be a son of King Eistian Haraldson. He was small of stature, and had a fine, soft face, and he was therefore generally called Eistian Mela, Little Maiden. He first went on a visit to Gotland to Earl Berger Brosa, who was married to Eistian's aunt, Brigida, a daughter of Harald Gil. They received him well, and furnished him some assistance in men and money. Eistian then proceeded to Norway, and when he came to Viking many people flocked to him. His followers proclaimed him king, and he remained in Viking during the winter. His means of subsistence being soon exhausted, they commenced to rob and steal wherever there was an opportunity. They were not strong enough to remain long in any one place, but roamed about in mountains and forests. They suffered great hardships. Their clothes being worn out, they wound the bark of the birch tree about their legs, and therefore the people called them birkbeiner, i.e., birch legs. During the two years which the birch legs spent in and about Viken, 1174-76, they had three battles in regular array with the peasants, and were victorious in them all. But at Krokoskog they came near meeting a disaster in encountering a superior force, and they only saved themselves by a hasty flight. In the third summer, 1176, when Magnus had been king for thirteen years, the Birchlegs started on a more serious expedition. They procured ships and sailed along the coast gathering goods and men. After having passed out of Viken they proceeded with great speed northward to Nidaros, and no news preceded them until they reached the Thrangem Fjord. Erling and his son Magnus, who were in Bergen, did not hear of their having sailed by. The Birchlegs easily overcame the opposition in Nidaros, and Eistian was proclaimed king by the Thrangem people, who had never liked King Magnus. The Birchlegs afterward proceeded to Orkadal, where, upon reviewing the troops, they found that they had about 2,400 men. They then went to the uplands, and on to Thoten and Hadeland, and from there to Ringerijk, subduing the country wherever they came. Earl Erling and King Magnus had remained in Bergen while the Birchlegs were in the north. Then they agreed that Erling should remain with a strong force in Bergen, in case the enemy should come down along the coast, while King Magnus, who was now twenty years old, was to go to Viken and take up his residence in Tunsberg. In order to protect that part of the country from possible enemies. King Magnus went to Tunsberg, where he and O.R.M., King's brother, had their Christmas festivities. In January, 1177, King Magnus with his army met the Birchlegs at Rhee, and won a decisive victory over them. The whole body of the Birchlegs was scattered far and wide. Eistian fled into a peasant's house, and begged for his life, but the peasant killed him and brought his body to King Magnus at the ram's farm. All the Birchlegs took flight, as they had no hope of mercy from Erling Skak or King Magnus. Some went to Thelemark, where they had their families, and others proceeded east across the frontier to Sweden. King Magnus' men pursued the fugitives for a time, and killed as many as they could overtake. King Magnus then returned to Tunsberg, and gained great renown by this victory. It had heretofore been said by all that Erling, his father, was his best shield and support. But after gaining a victory over so strong and numerous a force with fewer men, 
King Magnus had shown that he could stand alone, and it was predicted that he would become a warrior as much greater than his father, Earl Erling, as he was younger. 12. The defeated Birchlegs, who fled across the Swedish frontier, met in Vermland a man who was especially qualified to take the leadership of this headless band. His name was Svera, and he claimed to be a son of King Sigurd Mund. He was at present staying with his sister Cecilia, who was the mistress of Folkvid Lawman. During the latter part of the reign of Harald Giel's sons a comb-maker in Bergen by the name of Unas married a girl by the name of Gunhild. Unas was probably a Faroe Islander by birth, his brother Ro became bishop of the Faroe Islands in 1157. Gunhild belonged to a distinguished family in western Norway. Shortly after their marriage Gunhild bore a son, who was named Svera, and everybody supposed that Unas was his father. Svera remained in Bergen until he was five years old, when he was sent over to the Faroe Islands, to be brought up by Unas's brother Ro. He was educated for the priesthood and was in time ordained as deacon. When he was twenty-four years old, his mother disclosed to him the fact that Unas, who had died a short time ago, was not his father, but that he was the son of King Sigurd Mund. From that day Svera became very thoughtful. It appeared to him to be too great a task to make war on King Magnus and Earl Erling, but, on the other hand, it did not seem manful to sit quietly as a poor peasant's son when he was the son of a king. He therefore gave up his clerical position and embarked for Norway. Here he was informed that his kinsman, Eystein Mela, had accepted the title of king from the Birchlegs, but he did not consider it wise to enter into any dealings with him. Without making himself known, he spent some time in different parts of Norway, investigating the sentiment of the people. He made the acquaintance of Earl Erling and King Magnus, and often talked with them and their court men, who found the young clergyman from the Faroe Islands a pleasant and entertaining companion. And by his cunning he learned from them many things which they would not have talked about if they had known who he was, or what plans he was nourishing. The next winter he went to Sweden, first to Earl Berger and then to his sister Cecilia in Vermland, where he met the remnants of the Birchleg band. The Birchlegs told him of the fall of Eystein Mela and urged him to become their chief. Svera for a long time declined, as the whole band consisted of only seventy men, who were all in great poverty, some of them wounded and without clothes, and all almost unarmed. All his objections, however, were of no avail, and they finally compelled him to become their chief. In the spring of 1177 Svera set out with his seventy men to fight for the crown of Norway. He first went south toward Viking, and on the way he was joined by so many that, when he came to Sorbo, he had four hundred and twenty men. He held a thing, and against his protest they proclaimed him king. Svera soon discovered that a good many of his followers were but thieves and rascals, who were very much dissatisfied when he forbade them to rob and plunder the peasants. He started back toward Vermland, and when he arrived at Eidskog and mustered his force, he found that it had again shrunk to seventy men. As he heard that the peasants of Thelemark, some of whom had served in the Birchleg bands under Eystein Mela, were unfriendly to Earl Erling and King Magnus, he sent messages to them and promised to redress their grievances if they would join him. They were requested to meet him up north, where he was now going. Svera well understood that, with his small force, he could not reach the Thrandjum country through the eastern, well-populated district. So he decided to proceed by unknown and almost impassable roads and make an unexpected invasion into the country. He passed through dense forests and wildernesses, through Dalarn and Gentiland, where he and his men underwent untold hardships. At times they had nothing to eat but sap, bark, and berries, dug up from under the snow. Finally, after many struggles, Svera reached his destination early in June, 1177. His band had received some additions on his way through Gentiland, and he was now joined by eighty peasants from Thelemark, so that he had a force of about two hundred men. Outside of Nidaros he defeated and dispersed an army that was sent against him, and then marched into the town, where he met practically no opposition. He showed himself as a generous victor, and gave quarter to all who asked for it. After a few successful expeditions in the neighborhood he summoned the Orthing, where he was proclaimed King of Norway, 1177. 
When King Magnus and Earl Erling heard what had been going on in Thrandjum, they gathered a large fleet and sailed northward along the coast. Sverre's force was so small that he did not dare to await their arrival, but left Nidaros with his men and proceeded across the mountains toward the southern part of the country. For two years he and his men now led a life of want and suffering, wandering from district to district, living most of the time in the forests and mountains. And subsisting on what they could obtain on their foraging expeditions into the settlements. They were pursued from time to time by King Magnus' men, and had many small battles with them. It was only by Svera's great cunning, wisdom and perseverance that they got through some of the greatest dangers. At last, in June, 1179, Svera considered himself strong enough to meet Erling and Magnus, and in a battle at Kalvaskindit, near Nidaros, he defeated their forces. Earl Erling fell in the battle, and King Magnus saved himself by flight. In the battle King Magnus suffered a considerable loss. Several of his prominent liegemen and sixty court men were slain. Svera captured most of the enemy's ships, among them the Olaf Sudden, which King Magnus himself had commanded. Erling Skak was buried outside the Christ Church, and Svera, who seldom lost an opportunity to make a speech, held a funeral sermon over him. The battle at Kalvaskindit and the fall of Earl Erling brought a great change in the fortunes of Svera and the Birchlags. Svera's power and influence grew rapidly, and in a short time the greater part of the people outside of King Magnus' immediate surroundings were willing to acknowledge him as king. Heretofore the name Birchlegs had been a contemptuous nickname. But now it became an honorable appellation, which everybody was proud to carry. King Magnus and Svera seemed to have exchanged roles. Magnus, the anointed and crowned king, was now considered the usurper, while Svera was considered the rightful king. Magnus' courtmen and men-at-arms were soon looked upon as a band of adventurers, and they were called Hecklungs, because it was told of them that they had once robbed a beggar woman, who had her few coins wrapped up in her cloak, Heckle. After the battle at Kalvaskindit, King Svera's men received pay for their services, and he distributed among them the honors and dignities which he had promised them. He appointed district officers throughout the whole of the Thrandjum country. Many prominent and high-born men of this part of the country soon came to him and offered their allegiance, and he therefore declared that Thrandjum should hereafter be considered his real home, and he called the people there his dearest subjects. Remembering what loyalty they had always shown his father and his family. King Magnus spent the year following his defeat mostly in Bergen, where he had many strong friends, among them Archbishop Eistian and O.R.M. King's brother, a half-brother of Harold Giel's sons. Afterward he went to Viken, where he spent the winter and gathered an army for a new expedition against his rival. After a short stay at Nidaros, King Svera made a levy throughout Thrandjum, and proceeded with a fleet south to Bergen. But when he arrived there Magnus had already gone to Viken. He therefore returned to Nidaros, but on his way north he installed officers in all the districts he passed. The winter of 1179-80 he spent in Nidaros. In the spring King Magnus appeared outside of Nidaros with a force much more numerous than the one Svera had been able to muster, and a bloody battle was fought on the plains of the Illavolds. The battle resulted in a complete victory for Svera. King Magnus and some of his chiefs saved themselves by flight and sailed south with a few ships. King Magnus went first to Bergen, but soon after proceeded south to his kinsman, King Valdemar of Denmark, by whom he was well received. But O.R.M. King's brother went to Viken, and Archbishop Eistian sailed over to England, where he remained for three years. From here he had Svera declared under the ban of the church, but Svera does not seem to have paid any attention to this step. About a month after the battle at the Illavolds, King Svera appeared with his fleet outside of Bergen. Resistance was useless, and the inhabitants gave him a good reception. He remained in Bergen all winter, 1180-81, and early in the spring quelled an uprising of peasants under the leadership of John Katiza. Svera promptly punished the rebels, and the peasants had to pay heavy fines. Later in the spring King Magnus and O.R.M. King's brother came north with a strong fleet, and a battle was fought at Nordens, near Bergen. A good many men fell on both sides, 
but Magnus was again defeated and compelled to save himself by flight. The birch legs captured eighteen of Magnus' ships and brought them into the town. They also took other rich booty, for Magnus was at that time well supplied with money and goods. Magnus went to Stavanger, and it was but a short time before he was again ready to attack Svera at Bergen. This time, however, Svera wished to avoid a battle, and sailed with his ships north to Nidaros, where he proceeded to improve the fortifications of the town. Meanwhile Magnus remained in Bergen. During Svera's stay in Nidaros there came to him a young man named Eric, who claimed to be a son of King Sigurd Mund. He had been in many foreign lands, had been in the service of the emperor at Constantinople, and on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, where he had bathed in the River Jordan. He now asked leave to prove his royal descent by the Iron Ordeal. After a consultation with his friends and chiefs, Svera permitted him to undergo the ordeal upon the condition that he must not aspire to the crown. Svera prescribed the oath to be taken by the young man in submitting to the ordeal to prove that he was the son of Sigurd Mund, and the brother of Svera. In this way Svera meant to obtain incidentally a confirmation of his own title. But Eric refused to undertake to establish the descent of anybody but himself, and omitted the additional words. He successfully underwent the ordeal, and King Svera acknowledged him as his brother, and gave him a command in his royal guard. The conflict between Svera and Magnus continued for three years more. In 1181 King Svera opened negotiations for a cessation of hostilities, offering first to share the kingdom with Magnus, and afterward proposing that they should reign alternately for three years each. Magnus, however, declined all offers, and the war was continued. During the years 1181 and 1182, King Magnus made three attacks on the Birchlegs at Nidaros with varying success. In the summer of 1183 Svera sailed with a fleet down to Bergen, where he surprised and defeated the Hecklungs, and compelled Magnus to flee east to Viking. The Birchlegs did not pursue the enemy very far, but returned to Bergen, and took possession of Magnus' whole fleet and a rich booty. Magnus' crown, scepter and whole coronation outfit fell into Svera's hands. Many men, who had heretofore been attached to Magnus, now joined King Svera and swore him allegiance. Archbishop Eistian, who had just returned to the country after a three years sojourn in England, was reconciled to King Svera, and returned to his archbishopric in Nidaros. After a short stay in Bergen, and having installed district officers in San, Hordaland, and Rogaland, Svera returned with his whole army to Nidaros. Magnus again proceeded to Denmark, where the previous year King Canute VI had succeeded his father, Valdemar the Great, on the throne. Magnus made a final attempt to defeat Svera in the summer of 1184, when he came up from Denmark with a large fleet. King Svera had sailed into the Norofjord, a narrow arm of the Sonofjord, in order to punish the inhabitants of San for having killed his prefect, Ivar Dar, and some other officers. Magnus sailed in after him with his greatly superior force, and a fierce battle was fought at Fimriite, June 15, 1184. The Birchlegs fought with great heroism, and a large number of men fell. The battle commenced in the afternoon. At sundown the first Hecklungs turned to flee, and at midnight the battle was finished. The Hecklungs had been completely routed. Two thousand men had fallen, among them King Magnus himself and the most prominent chieftains, the flower of the aristocracy of Gulathingslag and Viking. Among the slain were Harold, the son of King Inga, O.R.M. King's brother and his son, Ivar Stieg. Osbiern Johnson of Thyern, Ragnvald, the son of John Hockelson, Eindride Torv, John Katiza's son, and many other prominent men. King Magnus was twenty-eight years old at the time of his death, having borne the title of king for twenty-three years. His body was found two days after the battle, and was brought to Bergen, where it was buried with great ceremony. Chapter 28 Svera Sigurdsson, 1184-1202 After the fall of Magnus Erlingsson, King Svera brought the whole country under his control, and no one dared to refuse him obedience. The same sagacity that he had shown in his struggles to gain the power, he also used in his efforts to maintain and strengthen it. He knew that he could expect nothing from the magnates of the powerful families, 
who resided on the largest estates throughout the country, and who looked with contempt upon the poor and lowly people that had constituted his following and helped him into power. He had to try to weaken the influence of this higher class and to look to the common people for his main support. The changes which King Svera introduced in the domestic conditions of the country were in close coherence with the development of the country since the time of Harold the Fair-Haired and Olaf the Saint. The kingdom of his predecessor had been upheld by the clergy and the aristocracy, the latter endeavouring to strengthen its power and dignity by united action. While the clergy tried to enforce the hierarchical principles of the time in the Church of Norway. King Svera, on the other hand, depended upon the masses of the people, with their traditions and customs. For their benefit King Svera appointed a new class of officers, who were called lawmen. They were to be learned in the law, and their duty was to see that the law was justly administered at the things, and to aid the peasants in all legal matters. There had been a similar class of officers before, bearing the same title, but they had been elected at the things, while from now on they were appointed by the king, especially for the benefit of the poorer classes, who themselves had little knowledge of the law, and often needed protection against the rich and powerful. Another class of officers whose functions were changed in such a manner as to greatly strengthen the king's power were the prefects, Sisselmen, whom the king appointed throughout the country. These prefects did not have the inherited dignity of the liegemen, lendermen, who were royal vassals and exercised independent authority, but were servants of the king and the representatives of his power. They supplanted the liegemen in their executive and judicial functions, and gradually transferred to the crown a great part of the power of the aristocracy. Svera was too shrewd to break entirely or too suddenly with the old influences, and where they had been loyal, he selected men from the high old families for his officers. This was especially the case in the Thrandjum country, where his party was strongest. But he found positions enough with which to reward the faithful men who had followed him through his struggles. Some were made chiefs in the army, and some were appointed prefects, some were given landed estates, and others were helped to rich marriages. Bard Guthrum son of Rain was married to the king's own sister, Cecilia, after her marriage with Folkvid Lawman had been declared void. King Svera himself married Margreta, a sister of the Swedish king, Knut Eriksson. Before this marriage King Svera had four children, namely, two sons, Sigurd, called Laverd, and Hawken, and two daughters, Cecilia and Ingeborg. With Queen Margreta he had only a daughter, Christina. The peace was not of long duration. The remnants of the Hecklung party, which had been broken up by the battle in Norifjord, with several leading men, only waited for a favourable opportunity to start a revolt, and the opportunity soon offered itself. A monk, who called himself John and claimed to be a son of King Inga the Hunchback, left the cloister on the island near Oslo, and soon gathered about him a numerous band. He first went to Tunsberg, where, in September, 1185, he attacked and killed one of Svera's prefects together with thirty men, and then summoned a thing and was proclaimed king. The Birchlegs called this new party the Kuvlungs or Kaumann, because their leader had worn a monk's hood or cowl. The Kuvlungs continued the rebellion for three years with varying success. They made several attacks on Bergen and Nidaros, and at times their strength was quite formidable. Finally their band was destroyed in Bergen, in December, 1188, and their leader was killed. After his death it appears to have been satisfactorily proven that John Kuvlung was not the son of King Inga the Hunchback, as he had claimed. The rebellious spirit had become quite general, and King Svera had many of these revolts to suppress. After the Kuvlung party had been broken up, a new band, called the Varbelks, Wolfskins, was organized by the chief, Simon Karrison, who had brought from Denmark, as a pretender to the throne, a boy named Vikar said to be a son of King Magnus Erlingsson. This party was badly defeated in a battle near Tunsberg, where Simon Karrison and the little Vicar were both killed. Another band, under the leadership of Thorleif Braidskeg, who claimed to be a son of King Eistian Haraldsson, was next destroyed in Viking, 1191. The next party that made war on King Svera were the Oiskegs, the islanders, so called because they received considerable aid from the Orkney Islands, where Earl Harold favoured them. Their leaders were Hockel Johnson, 
who was married to King Magnus Erlingson's sister Ragenhild, and Olaf, a brother-in-law of Earl Harold of the Orkneys. They chose Sigurd, a son of King Magnus, as their king. The Oiskegs developed a considerable strength in Viking, and from there made piratical expeditions to the Danish waters and the Baltic, and therefore boastingly called themselves the Goldlegs, Gobiner. One of the men, whom King Svera sent against them, Sigurd Jarlson, Earl's son, an illegitimate son of Erling Skak, turned traitor, and became one of the leaders of Svera's enemies. In the fall of 1193 the Oiskegs captured Bergen without much resistance, King Svera being then in Thrandjum. In the spring King Svera came south with a fleet, and a bloody battle was fought at Florvag, near Bergen, April 3, 1194. The Oiskegs were finally defeated, a great number of them, including Hockel Johnson, Olaf, Earl Harold's brother-in-law, and Sigurd Magnusson, the pretender, being slain. King Svera had thus gained a victory, but at great cost, for many of his best men had fallen, or died from the wounds they had received in the battle. Among the latter was Bard Guthrum son of Rain. While King Svera was almost constantly engaged in quelling rebellion, he was also carrying on a hard struggle with the hierarchy. Archbishop Eistian had been obliged to make peace with King Svera. But when Eistian died, 1188, Bishop Eric of Stavanger, a man with strong hierarchical tendencies, became his successor. Archbishop Eric named as his own successor to the bishopric of Stavanger one of Svera's bitter enemies, Nicholas Arneson, a half-brother of King Inga the Hunchback. King Svera refused to recognize this selection, because he had not been consulted, and named another in his place. Finally, through the mediation of Queen Margreta, who was a relative of Nicholas Arneson, the matter was compromised, and Svera consented to Nicholas being installed as bishop in Oslo. The fight between the king and the hierarchy was, however, continued in other matters. Archbishop Eric was constantly trying to extend the prerogatives of his office. He claimed the exclusive right to the control of all church property. He wanted the tribute to the church paid according to actual weight in silver instead of in current coin, whereby he would about double the tax, and, finally, he wanted to surround himself with a court and keep ninety men-at-arms in his service. While the law allowed only thirty men altogether, and only twelve of them armed. During his stay in Nidaros, in 1191-92, King Svera summoned a thing to have these matters settled. The law was read, and the case was decided in favor of the king. Archbishop Eric now found the surroundings too uncomfortable, and hurried away from the town, taking with him all the goods he could collect. He proceeded to Denmark, where he was cordially received by Archbishop Absalon. Shortly after his arrival in Denmark he prepared a letter to the Pope, in which he complained of King Svera's infringements on the rights of the Church. In response to this letter, Pope Celestinus III, on the 15th of June, 1194, declared King Svera in the ban of the Church. Before the papal bull reached Norway, however, King Svera had compelled the bishops to crown him at Bergen, June 29, 1194. For some time King Svera treated the papal bull with contempt, and even intimated that it was an invention of the bishops in Denmark. But later he sent ambassadors, under the leadership of Bishop Thor of Hamar, with a message to the Pope, in which he put matters in a different light from that given them by Archbishop Eric. The fate of these ambassadors is enveloped in mystery. They remained in Rome till the end of 1196, and then started for home. During their homeward journey they were suddenly taken sick in Denmark and died, having probably been poisoned. Some time afterward some Danes came to King Svera with letters bearing the seal of the Pope, and which, they said, had been pawned with them by the ambassadors for a certain amount of money. Svera redeemed the documents, which purported to revoke the ban against the king, and had them publicly read in the churches. Whether King Svera knew that these documents were not genuine does not appear. By the united efforts of King Svera's enemies among the clergy and the aristocracy a rebellious band was organized in 1196, which was to become more dangerous than all the enemies he had heretofore had to fight. The principal leader of this movement was Bishop Nicholas Arneson, who was prepared to do anything to overthrow King Svera. A favorable opportunity offered itself. 
The Byzantine emperor, Alexios Komnenos, had sent a Norwegian named Rida the messenger, Sindemand, to Norway to ask King Svera to send him 1,200 good mercenaries for the service of the emperor. King Svera replied that he had no troops to spare. But he was persuaded to allow Rida to enlist such sons of peasants and traders as might wish to enter the service of the emperor. After Rida had collected a considerable force, he was induced by Bishop Nicholas to enter into a league with him against King Svera. At a fair in Halland he met Bishop Nicholas and Archbishop Eric, who had with them a large body of Norwegians, mostly from Viking. With them was also a young man named Inga, said to be a son of King Magnus Erlingsson. The two armies united and proclaimed Inga king, and then made an invasion in Viking, where they were soon joined by Sigurd Jarlsson, the former Oiskeg chief, and many other prominent men. The new rebel army was called Baglers, from the word Bagal, a bishop's crozier, to signify that Bishop Nicholas was considered the real founder and chief leader of the party. During the last six years of his life King Svera had a continual war with the Baglers. His first encounter with them was in Salto Sound, in Viking. After an indecisive battle there he returned with his ships to Bergen and proceeded to Nidaros, where he spent the winter 1196-97. The Baglers meanwhile summoned the Borger thing, where Inga was proclaimed king. The next year King Svera gathered a strong force and proceeded to Viken, and defeated the Baglers at Oslo, July 26, 1197. After the battle Bishop Nicholas sent a messenger to King Svera that he was willing to make peace. But Svera, who knew how little Bishop Nicholas was to be depended upon, sent word back that he would only treat with him if he would come in person. Bishop Nicholas did not go to meet the king, but instead hastened with the chiefs and the remaining force of the Baglers overland to Nidaros, where the wooden citadel, blockhouse, Zion, fell into their hands by the treason of its commander. Thorstein Kugad. They destroyed some of the fortifications and burned a number of Svera's ships and took possession of the remainder. A part of the Bagler force went aboard the captured ships, and sailed southward under the leadership of Sigurd Jarlsson. The others returned to Viken the same way they had come. King Svera spent the following winter in Bergen, and in the spring, 1198, sailed north and met the Baglers in battle at Thorsberg, near the mouth of the Throngem Fjord. After a hard fight the Birchlegs were defeated with great loss. The king then hastened back to Bergen, which had in the meantime been occupied by the Bagler chief Sigurd Jarlsson. The latter, however, having, by a clever trick of one of the birch legs, been led to believe that King Svera was approaching with a much superior force, left the town before Svera arrived. During the summer of 1198, which for a long time afterward was called the Bergen Summer, there was continual skirmishing in and about Bergen. On the night after August 10 the Baglers, led by Bishop Nicholas, rode up to the landings with two ships full of wood. At the bishop's command they set fire to the town in three different places, and soon the greater part of it, including six churches, was laid in ashes. The birch legs had all they could do to save the wooden citadel, Svera's Borg. The inhabitants of Bergen could never afterward forgive Bishop Nicholas and his party for the loss they suffered by this fire, but as heartily as they had heretofore hated the birch legs they now hated the Baglers. Svera found his position untenable after the town had been burned, and proceeded with his men overland to Thrandjum. Meanwhile the Baglers, who had many ships, were masters on the coasts. Many deserted the king and supported the Baglers. But there were also some of their men who went over to Svera. Among the latter was Thorstein Kugad, who had surrendered his garrison in Nidaros, and who now returned to Svera and begged his pardon. This was given, and Thorstein became one of Svera's useful men. King Svera spent the winter 1198-99 in Nidaros. His position was a desperate one. Outside of the Thrangem country he had very little power, and the Baglers were masters at sea. Then, furthermore, a terrible blow was dealt Svera, as Pope Innocent III. In October, 1198, issued his bull declaring Svera to be in the ban of the church, and laying the whole country under interdict, closing all churches and forbidding the administration of the sacraments wherever the people acknowledged King Svera. 
it is easily understood what horror such a papal bull would create at that time. Svera did not lose courage, however, but called the Thrangem people together and asked them to help him. They showed their usual loyalty, and with their help he set to work to build a new, strong fleet and to improve the fortifications of the town. In the spring the Baglers appeared in the Thrangem fjord with a strong fleet, and, after some skirmishing, the two fleets met in battle at Strinso, June 18, 1199. It was a desperate fight, where no quarter was given. The result was a victory for King Svera and the Birchlegs, who returned to town with most of the enemy's ships. The prisoners taken on this occasion were nearly all slain. Bishop Nicholas, who watched the beginning of the battle from a safe distance, fled with his ship when he saw that the Baglers were losing, and Sigurd Jarlson and Ryder the messenger followed his example. The Baglers who escaped from the Battle of Strinso proceeded to Denmark. Svera, with his fleet, pursued them a part of the way, but gave up the chase and proceeded to Oslo, where he intended to go into winter quarters. In January, 1200, the Baglers came up from Denmark with a number of small ships under the leadership of Ryder the messenger and Inga Bagler king. Some of them landed near Oslo and killed Svera's kinsman, Earl Philip. Not feeling strong enough, however, to attack King Svera's forces they withdrew during the night and sailed to Bergen. Afterward they made a sudden but unsuccessful attack on Nidaros, which was defended by an army of 1,800 peasants. During the winter King Svera attempted to make a levy of troops in Viken, intending to send home some of his Thrangem people. But the inhabitants, who had never been greatly attached to King Svera, murmured at this, and the result was a great uprising of the peasants in Viken and the uplands. On the day secretly appointed, March 1st, Svera's prefects at Tunsberg and several other places were killed, and a few days later a force many times as large as Svera's marched against him from three different directions. On this occasion Svera displayed a masterly leadership, and his men fought like heroes. During the day there were eight desperate encounters, and, in spite of the seemingly overwhelming force of the rebels, Svera won the day. He afterward punished the peasants by exacting large fines in money and provisions. Svera had a few indecisive battles with the Baglers the same year, and spent the following winter in Bergen. In the spring of 1201 he called a new levy from the north, and, during the summer, sailed to Viking. Ryder the messenger, with several chiefs and 240 men, had fortified himself on the Slotsburg, Castle Mountain, at Tunsberg, and defied any attack. King Svera organized a regular siege, determined not to abandon it until he had conquered this dangerous enemy. Finally, when the Baglers were nearly starved to death, Ryda and his little band surrendered to Svera, who not only spared their lives, but gave them the best of treatment. He advised them not to eat much in the beginning. But several of them disregarded this advice and died. This remarkable siege had lasted for twenty weeks, or from the first week in September, 1201, to the fourth week in January, 1202. At last King Svera's physical strength succumbed to the hardships and cares which night and day he had had to endure. During his stay in Tunsberg he had been ailing, but, at first, his illness did not seem to be serious. When he left Tunsberg, however, he was obliged to keep his bed. He had his bed placed on the raised deck in the stern of his ship, and here also stood the bed of the Bagler chief, Ryda. During the journey the king found much pleasure in talking with the intelligent old chief, who could tell him of his crusades and other journeys in distant countries. They arrived in Bergen toward the end of February, and the king was carried to the royal residence, where his bed was placed in the large hall. When he understood that death was near, he called the priests and his trusted friends to him. He first let them read and seal a letter which he had prepared, to his son Hawken in Thrangem, about the management of the affairs of the government after his death. Then he solemnly declared that he had only one son living, namely Hawken, his other son, Sigurd Lavard, having died the year before, so that if any one else should claim after his death to be his son he would be an impostor. Then he desired to be lifted into his high seat, and seated there he received the last ointment. Afterward he said, I have had more strife, disturbance, and adversity than quiet and peaceful days during my reign, 
and, so far as I can judge, many have been my maligners only from enmity toward me. God forgive them all, and judge between them and me in my whole cause. Soon after, on Saturday, March 9, 1202, King Svera expired. His body was buried in the Christ Church, and on his tombstone was engraved the following epitaph, Here lies one who was the ornament of kings, the support, picture and paragon of faith, honor and bravery, his country's defense. The vindication of justice, the delight of all his men. After his death even those who had been his enemies said that such a man as Svera had not lived in Norway in their time. Chapter 29 Håkon Sverreson, 1202-1204, Guthorm Sigurdsson, 1204, and Inga Bardsson, 1204-1217. After Sverre's death his only son, Håkon, who was then twenty-eight or thirty years old, was proclaimed King of Norway. In the letter which Svera wrote to his son on his deathbed, he advised him to make peace with the church, and Håkon lost no time in calling the archbishop back to the country and in reconciling himself with the bishops. The clergy seemed to be very eager for peace, and each bishop returned to his bishopric, while the archbishop revoked the ban and the interdict without even taking time to obtain the consent of the pope. For this haste in making peace with the king the archbishop was afterward sharply reprimanded by the pope. But in the meanwhile the good relations between king and clergy had strengthened Hawkins' position, and the people in general readily acknowledged him. The Bagler party gradually lost most of its support, and after their so-called king, Inga Magnusson, had been killed by one of his own men on an island in Lake Myasen, 1202, the party was, for the time being, broken up. Some went to King Hawken and begged for mercy, the remainder fled either to Sweden or Denmark, and there was again peace in the country. The peace, however, did not last very long, this time probably on account of strained relations between the king and his stepmother, the Queen Dowager Margreta. During the festivities in Bergen at Christmas, 1203, King Hawken was taken suddenly ill, and on January 1, 1204, he died, with all the symptoms of having been poisoned. It was the general opinion that Queen Margreta was the cause of his death. She was obliged to leave the country, and return to her old home in Sweden. The death of King Hawken caused great sorrow, for he had been very popular, besides, it was generally supposed that he left no issue. Two days after Hawken's death, a council was held by Bishop Martin and the chiefs of the Birchlegs, and it was decided to elect Hawken's nearest heir, his nephew, Guthorm Sigurdsson, a son of Sigurd Lavard, as his successor. Although he was only four years old. Hawken Galen, a son of Sverre's sister Cecilia and Folkvid Lawman, was to conduct the government under the title of Earl. When this hasty election of a king was reported throughout the country, the Bagler party reorganized themselves under the leadership of Erling Steinweg, Stonewall, who claimed to be a son of King Magnus Erlingsson. This new pretender soon had a large following also obtained substantial support from the Danish king, Valdemar II. Bishop Nicholas at first opposed him, as he wanted his own nephew, Philip, a grandson of Harold Giel's queen, Ingerid, elected king, but they finally came to an agreement, Erling promising to make Philip Earl and to otherwise favor the bishop. With the aid of the bishop, Erling then proved his right to the throne by the ordeal of fire, the event taking place with great ceremony in Tunsberg in the presence of the Danish king in a large assemblage of people. King Valdemar made Erling a present of thirty-five fully equipped ships. The following day a thing was summoned, and Erling was proclaimed king. He immediately appointed Philip as his earl. Both solemnly acknowledged the Danish king as their overlord and gave him hostages. The whole of Viking had soon acknowledged Erling as king, and the few birchlegs who were there fled to the northern or western part of the country. The child king, Guthorm Sigurdsson, died suddenly in Nidaros, August 11, 1204, and there was a strong suspicion that he had been poisoned by Christina, the mistress of Hawken Galen. The thing was immediately convened, and the people elected Inga Bardson of Rain as king. Inga was a younger half-brother of Hawken Galen, being a son of King Svera's sister, Cecilia, and her husband, Bard of Rain. For some time there was again continual warfare between the Baglers and the Birchlegs. In the summer of 1205, 
King Inga and Earl Hawken made a cruise to Viking and had some encounters with the Baglers, and in the fall King Inga returned to Nidaros, while Earl Hawken went into winter quarters in Bergen. Shortly after Christmas it was reported in Nidaros that a body of warriors had come across the mountain from the south, and that they had the son of a king with them. It was feared that a new band of rebels was coming, and King Inga called all his men to arms. Two of his court men, who were sent out to ascertain the object of the coming warriors, were met by some messengers, who had been sent ahead to inform King Inga of their errand. It was quite true that they had the son of a king with them, but he was as yet only a babe. It was learned that the approaching warriors were a number of good birch legs, and that the prince who was with them was the infant son of their late beloved master, King Hawkins Sverison. During his visit in Sarpsborg, in 1203, King Hawkins Sverison had become enamored of a handsome girl of high birth, Inga of Vardiak. She reciprocated his affection, and the intimacy that grew up between them was no secret to the king's friends. Soon after the king's death, Inga, who was then at the parsonage Folkesburg, in the present Eidsburg parish, gave birth to a son. The priest, Thrond, who well knew who the father was, baptized the boy and named him Hawken, after his father. Thrond kept the child at his home, but did all he could to keep the matter secret. Later he took Erland of Husby, a distant relative of King Hawken, into his confidence, and it was decided to get the child away from Viking, on account of the constant danger from the Baglers. Toward Christmas, 1205, when the boy was about a year and a half old, his mother, Inga of Vardiak, the priest Thrond, and Erland of Husby started out on the dangerous journey. They arrived at Hamar Christmas Eve, but were afraid to stay there long, and therefore continued their journey as soon as possible. They first came to Lilyhammer, where a number of birch legs joined them, and then proceeded across the mountain to Esterdalen, and thence north to Nidaros. During the journey across the mountain they suffered untold hardships on account of snow and cold, being often obliged to spend the night in the wilderness. Once the storm had become so severe that they did not know where they were. The royal child was then given to the two best skirunners in the party, Thorstein Skevla and Skirvold Skrucka, who started ahead of the others in order to find shelter if possible. They did not succeed in reaching any settlement that night, but struck a mountain hay shed, where they made fire and prepared a couch for the child. The remainder of the party reached the place later in the night. In the morning the snow was so deep that it was only with the greatest difficulty that they could proceed. When they reached the settlements, however, they were well received, and many birch legs joined them on their journey northward. When King Inga and his men heard of the journey of the royal child and of the hardships which the party had suffered, they all thanked God for having saved the child. The king and his whole court set out to meet the party at the blockhouse, and, on their arrival, he took the little boy in his arms and kissed him. The boy and his mother were given the best of care in Nidaros. The child became very popular with the old birchlegs who had served under his father and his grandfather. They came often to see how he was getting along, and would sometimes playfully take him between them and stretch his arms and legs in order, as they said, to make him grow faster. In the spring of 1206 Erling Steinweg collected a fleet and proceeded north to Thrandjum, in order to attack King Inga in his stronghold in Nidaros. On Saturday, April 22, there were great festivities in Nidaros, for King Inga was celebrating the wedding of his sister Sigrid, daughter of Bard of Rain, to the liegeman, Thorgrim of Ljanes. All the prominent men in the surrounding country had come to the wedding. There was much drinking during the night, and the king, as well as his chiefs and warriors, went to bed intoxicated. Toward morning the Baglers suddenly attacked the sleeping town and effected a general massacre. Many of the prominent Birchlegs, who had been with King Svera in many of his battles, were killed by the Baglers on this occasion. King Inga, who was not at the royal residence, but was sleeping in the house of his mistress, was with some difficulty awakened by the latter's servants. He escaped to a neighboring roof, where he lay until the Baglers had passed the house. Then he ran down to the docks and threw himself in the icy river in order to swim across. The strong current made this a very difficult task. Out in the stream he caught hold of the anchor cable of a ship, to which he clung for a while, but a man, who was keeping guard on board, 
pushed him off with a pole, and he was obliged to swim further. He finally reached the other shore, but was then so exhausted from cold and exertion that he would probably have succumbed, if one of his faithful men, Ridolf Bard's brother, had not happened to come to his assistance. Ridolf took off his cloak and wrapped the king in it, and carried him on his back to Skyas, where they obtained a horse and sled and escaped to Klebu. In the meanwhile the Baglers continued their dreadful work in Nidaros. They searched all the churches and killed those who had taken refuge there, and committed numerous acts of plunder and depredation. King Inga's half-brother, the seventeen-year-old Skjul Bartson, escaped as by a miracle. He crept along the house walls and reached the river, where the chief, John Ussel, and forty birch legs were just going across in some boats they had secured. They crossed in safety, and later proceeded to Klebu, where Skjul found the king with a hundred birch legs and peasants, who had gathered about him. King Inga was greatly changed after the experiences of that awful night. The light-hearted and social young man became gloomy and melancholy. He never felt really at ease except on board his ship and in the solitude of his room. He was averse to seeing new faces, and only his nearest and dearest men were admitted to his presence. King Inga soon returned to Nidaros with a force of birch legs, while the Baglers withdrew to Bergen with their large booty. Here they were soon afterward overtaken by Earl Hawken and the Birchlegs, who defeated them and took back the greater part of the spoil. Thus the two parties, from time to time, continued to surprise and attack each other with no other result than that the country suffered. Early in the year 1207 the Bagler king, Berling Steinweg, died, and Bishop Nicholas at last succeeded in having his nephew, Philip, chosen as the third king of the Baglers. In the summer of 1208 negotiations for peace were commenced. The manner in which the war had lately been conducted indicates that the strength of both parties was practically exhausted. The whole warfare was only a sort of hide and seek play, or a continual cruising back and forth between Bergen and Viken, in which they do not even seem to have tried to meet in decisive battle, but only to forestall each other. Attack singly some one of the hostile party, and otherwise do as much damage as possible by plunder and depredation. Everybody began to realize that the resources of the country were thus being wasted, and that, whichever party finally won, there would only be an impoverished land and people to rule over. Bishop Nicholas saw this as well as any one, and consulted the Archbishop in Nidaros. The result was a meeting of the chiefs of both parties at Hvitings Island, Hvitingso, near Stavanger, where the king of the Baglers, Philip, swore allegiance to King Inga, and was, in return, made Earl of Viking and the Uplands. And was given Christina, the daughter of Svera, in marriage. The war between the Baglers and the Birchlegs was thus ended, and comparative peace was restored. One of the disturbing elements that remained was the jealousy of Earl Hawken Galen and his ambitious wife. As the nephew of King Svera, he thought he had been as much entitled to the throne as his half-brother, Inga. An open revolt was avoided. But, probably by the intervention of Archbishop Thor, a compact was made between the Earl and the King, 1212, by which it was decided that illegitimate children were to be excluded from the succession to the throne. This agreement was especially aimed against the young Hawken Hakenson and Inga's own illegitimate child, Guthorm, and gave the succession to Hawken Galen's own offspring. This agreement, however, was not approved by the old warriors among the Birchlegs, who were greatly attached to King Svera's direct descendant, the young Hawken. In the evening, after the agreement had been made, the boy came home from school to the court of Earl Hawken, by whom he was being raised, and he hurried to the old veteran, Helga Hvass, who was especially fond of the boy, and used to give a great deal of attention to him. This time, however, he turned away and would not speak to the child. Why are you angry with me? asked the boy. Begone, said Helga. I will have nothing to do with you. You were disinherited today. How did that happen, and who did it? asked little Hawken. It was done at Orthing, said Helga, and it was done by the two brothers, King Inga and Earl Hawken. Be not angry with me, my own Helga, said the boy, and do not care anything about this. For this decision cannot possibly be valid. My representatives were not present to answer in my behalf. 
And who are your representatives? asked Helga. My representatives are God, the Holy Virgin, and Saint Olaf, answered Hawken. In their hands have I left my case, and they will guard my interests in the best possible way, as you will see, both as to the division of the country and in my other welfare. Deeply moved, the old birch leg took the boy in his arms and kissed him, and said. That was better said than unsaid, my prince, and I thank you for those words. What this boy of eight years had said was soon reported among the birch legs, who all greatly admired him. The story also soon reached Earl Hawken and his wife Christina. The Earl did not say much. But Christina got very angry, and from that day treated the boy more harshly than she had done before. Earl Hawken was taken sick and died in Bergen in January, 1214, and his wife, Christina, who understood that she had made herself very unpopular, hastened to leave the country with her young son, Canute, and returned to Sweden. Young Hawken Hakenson was transferred to King Inga's court. He and Guthorm, King Inga's son, were sent to school together, and they were in every way treated alike. In the winter of 1216-17 King Inga was taken sick, and when he could no longer attend to the public affairs he appointed his half-brother, Skjöl Bardsson, as regent with the title of Earl. King Inga died April 23, 1217, and Earl Skjöl had him buried with great ceremony in Christ Church in Nidaros. Chapter 30 Hawken Hakenson the Old, 1217-1263 after the death of King Inga, the discord which had been fermenting began to show itself. The ambitious Earl Skjöl, while pretending to favor King Inga's young son, Guthorm, really considered himself the successor to the throne, while a few, who had been special friends of the late Earl Hawken Galen, favored the latter's son Canute, who was with his mother in Sweden. Earl Skjöl had the aid and sympathy of Archbishop Guthorm and the other dignitaries of the cathedral at Nidaros, and advocated a postponement of the election of a king, until the archbishop, who was absent on a journey, should return. In spite of all intriguing, however, the Birchlegs summoned the Orthing and proclaimed Hawken Hakenson king of Norway, and he swore fidelity to the laws of the country, although he could not, according to usage, do so on the shrine of St. Olaf, because the canons of the cathedral refused to allow the shrine to be taken out of the church and carried to the thing. The next day all the court men and the delegates present took the oath of allegiance to Hawken as king and to Skjöl as earl. The king and the earl now proceeded to Bergen, where the Gula thing was summoned, in order that Hawken might also be proclaimed king there. The day before the thing a meeting was held by the king and the earl and their advisers. The king's advisers suggested that Earl Skjöl should swear an oath of allegiance to King Hawken, but this the earl bluntly refused to do, unless he was given in fief one-third of the kingdom and of its dependencies. As it was learned that the earl had been negotiating with the so-called Bagler king, Philip, in Viking, and the king's party was hardly strong enough to fight a combination of that kind. It was thought that there was nothing to do but to acquiesce in the earl's demands. The next day, at the thing, King Hawken made his oath to uphold the laws, but the wily earl had made use of his position as the king's guardian to insert in the oath a pledge to keep the agreement already made between the king and the earl. Shortly after this, news was received that the Bagler king, Philip, was dead. King Hawken and Earl Skjöl immediately proceeded to Viking, where, at the suggestion of Bishop Nicholas, negotiations were opened with the Baglers. It was finally decided that the Bagler should retain, during the coming winter, one half of the fiefs which Philip had held as earl, and that both parties should send men north to the archbishop to request him, next summer, to arrange a permanent peace. The other half of Viking was given up to King Hawken and Earl Skjöl, who appointed prefects there. Thereupon they summoned the Haga thing, where Hawken was acknowledged as the rightful king. King Hawken had several enemies to contend with, and the most dangerous among them were by no means those who were in open rebellion. A new band of rebels was organized under the leadership of a chaplain by the name of Benedict, or Bene Skinniv, Skin Knife, as the peasants called him, who claimed to be a son of King Magnus Erlingsson. His followers were originally mostly thieves and bandits, who only sought an opportunity for robbery and plunder. On account of their ragged appearance they were called the Slidungs, Vagabonds or Tramps. 
After a short campaign against the Slidungs, the king and the earl returned northward. When they arrived in Nidaros, the earl was received with the utmost courtesy by the archbishop, but the latter refused to show the proper honor to the king. And the reason being given that there was some doubt as to whether Hawken was really the son of Hawken Sverison, it was agreed that his mother, Inga of Vardiak, was to submit to the ordeal of fire. This was done in Bergen in the presence of the king, the earl, the archbishop, and other bishops and chiefs. The result was in every way satisfactory. The church declared that King Hawken had proved his paternity, and Earl Skule was for the time being apparently reconciled with the king. The strained relations between Earl Skule and the king soon came to the surface again, however, and there were frequent conflicts between the Earl's men and the king's men. The friends of both finally came to the conclusion that something ought to be done to bind them together by common interests, and as the best means to this end they proposed a marriage between King Hawken and the Earl's daughter, Margreta. The plan was accepted by both parties, and the betrothal took place in September, 1219. The actual marriage was preliminarily postponed on account of the tender age of both parties, the king being then about fourteen years and the bride scarcely more than nine years old. During the next winter a new band of rebels was organized in Viken by Goodolf of Blackestad, a former prefect, who had been discharged from office on account of his harsh treatment of the peasants. The Slidungs joined the new party, which was commonly called the Ribungs, robbers. They chose as their leader and candidate for the throne a young man by the name of Sigurd, who claimed to be the son of the former Bagler king, Erling Steinweg. They seemed to have had the secret support of Bishop Nicholas, in spite of the fact that the latter had professed friendship for King Hawken. After having fought this party for about two years and defeated it several times, Earl Skjul induced Bishop Nicholas to assist in ending the struggle. In the spring of 1223, Sigurd Ribung made overtures for peace, but had the audacity to demand as a condition for laying down his arms one-third of the kingdom and the Earl's daughter in marriage. The Earl answered that he would not give his daughter away to live in the woods, and as for the third of the kingdom he would have to apply to King Hawken. But he promised Sigurd and his men amnesty and safe conduct, in case Sigurd wished to apply personally to the king. Although these conditions were more severe than expected, Sigurd Ribung surrendered. The earl was greatly praised for having gained this victory without a battle, in having induced such a mighty force to lay down their arms, and thus secured peace throughout the country. This peace, however, was not as complete as it was thought. For the earl was at this time cherishing more far-reaching plans than ever before. It appears that he had made a levy of troops and taxes outside of his own fiefs, and had been reprimanded for this in a letter from King Hawken. After having made peace with the Ribungs, he immediately sailed for Denmark, it being no doubt his intention to renounce his allegiance to King Hawken, and, with the aid of the Danish king, take possession of the country and hold it in fee from him. Upon arriving in Copenhagen he learned that King Valdemar, the victorious, had been taken prisoner by Count Henry of Schwerin and brought to Mecklenburg. Earl Skjul, therefore, was obliged to return and continue to feign friendship for King Hawken. At a state meeting in Bergen in the fall of 1223, where the archbishop, the bishops, and other leading men of the country were present, Hawken's right to the throne was reaffirmed. And Earl Skjul agreed to take the northern third of the country in fief instead of the southern part, which he had held before. By the agreement at the state meeting in Bergen, Norway was divided into two domains, of which that of the king included Viken, the Uplands, and the Gullathingslag, except Sandmore. While that of the earl included everything north of the king's domain, and this division remained in force for over fifteen years. The earl made his headquarters in Nidaros, while the king took up his residence in Oslo. Sigurd Ribung remained with the earl, who had promised to watch him, but escaped during the summer of 1224, and again organized a band of rebels who resumed their old guerrilla warfare. Whenever they were met by a superior force, they would make their escape across the frontier into the Swedish province of Vermland, where they had many adherents. At last King Hawken found it necessary to invade Vermland with an army of 2,400 men, early in 1225, in order to punish the inhabitants. He burned a great number of houses, 
but did not succeed in meeting the Ribungs in any decisive battle. In April, King Hawken proceeded to Bergen, in order to celebrate his marriage with Earl Skjul's daughter, Margreta. The Earl received him apparently with great cordiality, and grand preparations were made for the wedding, which took place May 25, 1225. This marriage had been dictated by political considerations. But Earl Skjul derived no direct benefits from it, for during all the later struggles Margreta stood faithfully by her husband, in spite of the fact that the principal opponent was her own father. The Ribungs continued their guerrilla warfare, secretly aided by Bishop Nicholas. The latter died in Oslo, November 7, 1225, after having asked and obtained the king's forgiveness for all his treachery. He was between seventy and eighty years old at the time of his death. During the winter Earl Skjul and the Archbishop at Nidaros attempted to negotiate peace between the Ribungs and the king, but without any success. In the spring of 1226 Sigurd Ribung was taken sick and died, and Squire Canute, the son of Hawken Galen and Christina, was induced to become the chief of the Ribungs. The Ribungs suffered several reverses, and in the following year Squire Canute disbanded his army and submitted to King Hawken, whose devoted friend he ever remained. Earl Skjul continued his intriguing for the ultimate overthrow of the king, and, while strengthening himself at home, negotiated with the king of Denmark for aid from that quarter. Meanwhile King Hawken did everything to retain the earl's allegiance. In 1233 a meeting was held in Bergen, where a new compact was made, only to be broken shortly afterward by the earl. When the king discovered that the earl had tried to involve him in a conflict with the church, and had sent damaging reports about him to Rome, he again summoned him to a meeting in Bergen. This time Earl Skjul did not see fit to come to the meeting, but proceeded with an army across the mountains to the uplands, thus entering the reserved territory of the king. Through the mediation of the archbishop peace was patched up for the coming winter, on the condition that the earl was to have one-third of all the prefectures. The following year a new agreement was made, by which Skjul was to retain the privileges thus obtained in the southern part of the country, besides which he was raised to the rank of duke, a title which no one so far had held in Norway. Nothing, however, seemed to satisfy Skjul short of the dignity of king. He prepared himself in every way for an open conflict, built and equipped ships, and steadily increased his force of warriors. His followers were called the Vivarbelgs, the same name that a rebellious party during the reign of King Svera had carried. In November, 1239, Duke Skjul convened the Orthing, where he had his friends proclaim him King of Norway, whereupon he made the usual oath of fidelity to the laws, with his hand upon St. Olaf's shrine, which had been forcibly taken from the cathedral and carried to the thing. There was now open war between Duke Skjul and King Hawken. The duke proceeded south to the uplands with an army of six hundred men. At Laka, Romerike, he met and defeated the king's forces under Squire Canute, who had been appointed earl in Skjul's place. After this victory he proceeded to Oslo, but here he was soon afterward attacked by King Hawken and was badly defeated. A great many of the Varbelgs fell in the battle, while others surrendered to the king and were pardoned. Duke Skjul with a few men escaped and fled north to Nidaros. Shortly afterward the town was suddenly attacked by the Birchlegs, who, after the Battle of Oslo, had been sent north by King Hawken with a fleet under the command of Asulf of Ostrot, one of Skjul's bitter enemies. Duke Skjul, awoke by the alarm, armed himself and sent his messengers around in the town to call the Varbelgs together, but they would not obey orders, and his men took refuge in the churches. Skjul himself crossed the Nid River and hid himself with a few men in a forest nearby. Two days later the monks at Elgesitor Cloister sent them cloaks, and thus disguised they reached the cloister. The birch legs, however, discovered the duke's whereabout, and, proceeding to the cloister, demanded that he be delivered up. This being refused they set fire to the building. Skjul then came out with his men, and they were all slain, May 24, 1240. After the fall of Skjul the rebellion of the Varbelgs died out completely, the power of King Hawken was undisputed, and the country could at last enjoy peace and order. On St. Olaf's Day, July 29, 1247, King Hawken was crowned with grand ceremonies in Christ Church in Bergen by Cardinal William of Sabina, 
whom the Pope had sent north for that purpose. At the grand feast that followed there were so many people present that there was not room enough in the king's mansion, and the king therefore had a huge boathouse temporarily fitted out as a festival hall. The walls being covered with colored cloth, and the hall furnished with costly benches with gold-embroidered silk cushions. This feast lasted for three days, and after that the king gave a party, lasting five days, in the royal home for the cardinal and the most prominent men. When the cardinal departed from Norway, the king sent with him fifteen thousand mark sterling as a gift to the pope, and also gave the cardinal personally fine presents. The reign of King Hawken, after peace had been restored, was very beneficial to the country. He improved the laws, and, among other changes, abolished the ordeal of fire. This was done after consultation with the visiting cardinal, who declared that it was not proper for Christians to challenge God to give his verdict in human affairs. It was decided that at the death of a king the oldest legitimate son was to succeed to the throne, and the kingdom was not to be divided between two or more princes. In architecture great progress was made, and a great deal of money was spent for the erection of monasteries, churches and royal mansions. A wall was built around the royal mansion in Bergen. This wall was the beginning of the fort afterward called Bergenhus. King Hawken also built the Grand Royal Hall in Bergen and a hospital for lepers. In Tunsberg he built a monastery, and the strong wall of the fort is still to be seen. He began to Christianize the Finns and built churches for them. The church which he built at Tromso was the northernmost Christian church in the world. King Hawken gained a high reputation in foreign countries. The Russian Grand Duke, Vasilich, asked for the hand of his daughter Christina, and the Spanish king, Alfonso X, of Castile, wooed her for one of his brothers. The latter suit was accepted, and Christina was married to the Spanish prince, Don Philip, in 1257. The Pope wanted Hawken for Emperor of Germany, and the French king, Louis IX, urged him to take the command of a crusade. During the reign of King Hawken, in 1261, Greenland was made a dependency of Norway, and the next year Iceland acknowledged the supremacy of Norway. The Icelanders agreed to pay the King of Norway a tribute. But they were to retain their own laws and their own officers. In the summer of 1263 King Hawken sailed with a strong fleet and a large army westward to make war on Alexander III. Of Scotland, who had tried to annex the Norwegian possessions west and north of Scotland. King Hawken proceeded to the Sudra Islands, the Hebrides, where he met with terrible storms, during which his fleet suffered considerable loss. In a battle at Largs, near the entrance to the Firth of Clyde, some of Hawken's best men fell. Scotch and Norwegian accounts differ as to which side was really defeated. But even from Scotch sources it appears that there was for some time afterward a great dread of the reappearance of the Black Fleet of Norway. A contemporary Scotch poet and soothsayer, Thomas of Ursuldown, wrote. It will be seen upon a day. Between the base and bay. Cragen and Fitteray. The Black Fleet of Norway. Tuhan the Black Fleet is come and gain. Then may they big their burg of lime and stain. Quilk they bigot of straw and hay. That will stand till doomsday. Shortly after the battle at Largs, King Hawken retired to the Orkneys, intending to winter there and to renew the attack in the spring. In the town of Kirkavag, Orkneys, he was taken seriously ill, dying December 15, 1263. During his illness he had his men read aloud to him portions of the Bible and several books in Latin. Afterward he had Norwegian books read to him, first the stories of holy men, legends, and afterward the sagas of his ancestors, from Halfdan the Black down to his grandfather, King Svera. During the reading of Svera's saga he sank rapidly, and toward midnight, when King Svera's saga was finished, he expired. King Hawken was fifty-nine years old when he died. He had been king of Norway forty-six years. His body was temporarily entombed in Kirkevag, and, in the following spring, was brought back to Norway and buried in the Christ Church in Bergen. Chapter 31 Snor Sturluson During the reign of Hakon Hakenson lived the renowned author of sagas, Snor Sturluson. 
He was born in the year 1178 at Vam, or Kvam, in the western province of Iceland. His family traced their lineage from the old Norse kings. In his third year Snor was sent to the rich and learned John Lofsson to be fostered. John Lofsson's grandfather was Simon Frode, the contemporary of R, who first committed the historical sagas to writing, John's mother, Thora, was an illegitimate daughter of King Magnus Barefoot. In such a family, says Mr. Lang, we may presume the literature of the country would be cultivated, and the sagas of the historical events in Norway, and of the transactions of her race of kings, would be studied with great interest. John Lofsson died when Snor was nineteen years of age, but he continued to live with his foster brothers a couple of years after that. He was quite poor, his mother having wasted his patrimony. But marrying Herdis, the daughter of a wealthy priest, he obtained with her a considerable fortune, which he afterward greatly increased. We are told that he owned six large farms and had so many men under him that he could appear at the things with an armed body of six hundred or eight hundred men. He fortified his main residence at Reykholt, and also constructed there a bathing house of cut stone, into which the water was led from a neighboring geyser. This bathhouse was called Snorlog, Snor's Bath, and ruins of it are still to be seen. Snor Sturluson held some important offices in Iceland. On a visit to Norway he won the friendship of Duke Skjöll and King Haakon, and the latter even appointed him a king's chamberlain. He is said to have promised the king to induce the people of Iceland to submit to the supremacy of the king of Norway. But if this promise was given he seems to have forgotten it. When afterward, during the conflict between Duke Skjöll and King Haakon, Snor was said to be a friend or adherent of Duke Skjöll, the king declared him to be a traitor, and, in a letter, requested Snor's son-in-law and bitterest enemy, Gieser Torvaldsen, to bring Snor to Norway, dead or alive. On this authority Gieser, and other relatives of Snor, who were his enemies on account of differences about the division of property, came on the night of September 22, 1241, with seventy armed men to Snor's residence at Reykholt and murdered him in the sixty-third year of his age. It was the same party which, two years afterward, brought Iceland under subjection to the crown of Norway. Snor Sturluson's famous work, The Sagas, Chronicles, of the Kings of Norway, reaches from the earliest times to the fall of Eistian Mela, in the battle at Rhee, in 1177. The book is also called the Heimskringla, the World Circle, from the first word of the manuscript. It is written in the Old Norse language. Snor also wrote a book called the Theta, 13 which treats of the Old Norse mythology and contains rules for the writing of poetry. Snor's nephew, his brother's son, Stella Thordson, afterward wrote the saga of King Haakon Hakenson. During the reign of King Haakon, another remarkable book was written, The King's Mirror. In the form of a dialogue between a father and his son, it contains information about the seas and the countries that Norway had communication with, especially Ireland, Iceland and Greenland. It also gives the rules of life and conduct for traders and for men at the royal court. Chapter 32 Magnus Lawmender, 1263-1280 Hawkins' son Magnus now became king of Norway. He had been crowned six years before his father's death, and there was no one to dispute his right, King Hawken having declared on his deathbed that he left no other son. Magnus was twenty-five years old when he assumed the government in his own name. He was a wise and peaceable ruler, and soon made up his mind that it was not for the benefit of Norway to continue the war with Scotland about the islands which were so distant and had been of so little value to the country. He opened negotiations with Alexander III, and on July 2, 1266, peace was finally concluded. The Norwegian king ceded the Isle of Man and the Hebrides to Scotland, although retaining the rights belonging to the Nidaros archbishopric. On the other hand, the Scotch king agreed to pay the Norwegian king 4,000 marks sterling, besides a permanent annual tribute of 100 marks. When King Magnus had succeeded in ending the conflict with Scotland, he turned his whole attention to the improvement of the domestic affairs of the country. He undertook a thorough revision of the laws, and, on account of his efforts in this direction, was given the surname Lagaboder, i.e., Lawmender. He had a common code of laws compiled for the whole country, 
while formerly there had been four different laws administered respectively at the four things, viz. The Frosta thing for the Thrangem country, the Gula thing for the western coast, the Eidsiva thing for the uplands, and the Borger thing for the country around Viking. The new general law, as codified by King Magnus, remained in force for nearly 400 years, and some of it is law even yet. Among the new provisions was the one that, in the future, changes in the laws were to be made only by the king and his good men at a state meeting or state council. Thus the things were deprived of the privilege to make laws. Magnus also compiled a law for the cities and towns, and a new court law, Herdskra, for his vassals and courtiers. This court law prescribed rules for the proclamation of kings and described the duties and rights of the courtiers, liegemen, etc. Among new offices created were those of ensign, bearer of the colors, the chancellor, who kept the royal seal, and the master of ceremonies. Toward the bishops King Magnus was very submissive. At a meeting in Tunsberg, in 1277, he made a number of humiliating concessions to the ambitious Archbishop John the Red. Thus the king agreed to abstain from all interference in the selection of bishops, and surrendered to the latter the right of filling all clerical offices. King Magnus granted the city of Lübeck and other North German cities, the Hanseatic League, a number of commercial privileges in Norway, and from that time a great part of the commerce of Norway gradually came to be controlled by the Hansa towns. In his legislation, King Magnus showed a disposition to abandon former democratic characteristics of the institutions. He was fond of pomp and ceremony, and adopted foreign, especially English, court customs. In 1277 he ordained that the liegemen were to be called barons, and the court officials, knights and squires. They were given a partial immunity from taxes, but were to render additional services to the king in case of war. The knights and their families soon began to adopt coats of arms, and a kind of nobility was gradually formed. King Magnus died May 9, 1280, at the age of 42 years. Chapter 33 Eric Priest Hader, 1280-1299 At the death of King Magnus only two of his children were alive, Eric, who had already been proclaimed king, and Hawken, who had been made duke at the same time. Eric was twelve, and Hawken ten years old. The royal counselors, among whom were the barons Hawkel Agmundsen, Auden Hugleikson, and Bayarn Erlingsen of Bayarko and Gisk thought that King Magnus had made two great concessions to the church and attempted to curtail the power of the bishops. On account of their activity against the clergy they were put in the ban of the church, but they did not seem to pay much attention to this. And, as a result of the struggle, Archbishop John the Red and two other bishops were outlawed and compelled to leave the country, 1282. The epithet, Priest Hater, which, after this, was given King Eric, does not seem to have been well deserved for he always sought to mediate in the conflicts with the archbishop, and he himself had no ill feeling toward the bishops, but rather seemed to be too kindly disposed toward them. King Eric was only a very young man when he commenced a war with Denmark, which lasted for twenty years, and was not terminated until in the time of his successor. His mother, the Queen Dowager Ingeborg, was the daughter of the Danish king, Eric Plowpenny, and as her inheritance, consisting of landed estates, had not been turned over to the Norwegian king according to agreement. She induced her son to make war on Denmark. The war was principally a naval war. One who especially distinguished himself was the Norwegian baron, Alf Erlingsen of Tornberg, now Tanberg, Ringerike, a great favorite of the Queen Dowager. He captured a number of the enemy's ships, and preyed upon the commerce in Danish waters. But the principal sufferers by this warfare were the Hanseatic League, whose members, by the concessions of King Magnus Lawmander, had practically a monopoly of the foreign trade of Norway. Many ditties were composed about Alf Erlingsen, and one verse reads thus. Sailing Germans are northward bound. Carrying malt and meal. But Alf is lying in oar sound. And robs them of all their wheel. The conflict with the Hanseatic towns came to an end, through the arbitration of the Swedish king, by the Peace of Kalmar, 1285, by which the privileges of the Hansa towns were considerably extended. The hostilities with Denmark were continued, 
and the Queen Dowager was so well pleased with Alf Erlingson's piratical conduct of the war that she had him created an earl, and induced the king to send him as special ambassador to England. In 1286 a conspiracy was formed in Denmark against King Eric Glipping, and he was murdered during a hunting trip by Marshal Stig, Count Jacob of Halland and others. The murderers, who were outlawed in Denmark, were well received by the Norwegian king, and afterward accompanied him on his campaigns against Denmark. By the death of Queen Ingeborg, 1287, Earl Alf Erlingsson lost his special protector, and when he had committed extraordinary outrages in Viking and murdered the commander of Oslo Castle, Baron Håkel Munson. He was sentenced as an outlaw and compelled to flee to Sweden, where, for some time, he took refuge in a cloister. Later he attempted piracy on his own account in Danish waters, but was captured, and, by the command of Queen Agnes, executed on the rack, 1290. King Eric made several successful cruises to Denmark, and that country might have fared badly if his attention had not been drawn in other directions. At an early age he had been married to Margaret of Scotland, a daughter of his grandfather's enemy, King Alexander III. This young queen died a year after the marriage, after having given birth to a daughter, who was christened Margaret. When Alexander III died in 1286, without leaving any sons, the Scotch leaders acknowledged King Eric's young daughter, Margaret, as the rightful heir to the throne. In 1290 she was proclaimed Queen of Scotland, and the young princess, the Maid from Norway, as she was called, accompanied by the bishops of Bergen and other prominent persons, sailed for Scotland. She was taken sick on the voyage, however, and died at the Orkneys. King Eric afterward claimed the crown of Scotland as the heir of his daughter, but was compelled to abandon the claim upon the armed intervention of King Edward I, of England. King Eric died July 13, 1299, at the age of 31 years. Chapter 34 Hawken v. Magnusson, 1299-1319 At the death of King Eric the throne of Norway was inherited by his brother Hawken, who had, during his brother's reign, under the title of Duke, ruled his part of the country with royal authority. Shortly after his succession to the throne, the knight, Auden Huglikes and Hestacorn of Hegrains, who during the reign of King Eric had been highly esteemed and had conducted negotiations with foreign powers was imprisoned in Bergen and tried for high treason, and, after three years of imprisonment, was executed. The real nature of this man's crime is not known. By some it was thought that he had insulted the king's bride, but the actual crime was probably some frauds in connection with the negotiation of a treaty with France. Apparently without any reason, rumor has connected his case with another affair, which transpired about the same time. In 1300 a woman arrived from Lübeck and created a great deal of excitement by claiming to be the Princess Margaret, the maid from Norway, who had died at the Orkneys when on her journey to Scotland to assume the Scotch throne. She was proven to be an impostor, and was condemned and burned at the stake in 1301, and her husband, who accompanied her, was beheaded. During Hawkins' reign the war with Denmark, which had lasted for 28 years, was finally ended by the Peace of Copenhagen, 1309, by which Hawken obtained the province of northern Halland in settlement of his maternal inheritance. His rule was also in other respects firm and prudent. He curtailed some of the privileges of the Hansa towns and reduced the power of the bishops. He abolished the positions of earls and liegemen, and adopted stricter regulations for other officers, holding them to a faithful compliance with the laws. He built the fortress of Akershus, near Oslo, where he resided much of the time. King Hawken had no sons, but only a daughter, Ingeborg. In 1302 he therefore proclaimed a new law of succession extending the right of inheritance to the female line. By the same law a council of twelve men were to conduct the government during the minority of an heir to the throne. The king's daughter, Ingeborg, was afterward married to Duke Eric of Sweden, and, in the year 1316, she bore a son, who was christened Magnus. This caused great joy in Norway, and the king on this occasion conferred knighthood on twenty-five men. But the joy was of short duration. Duke Eric and his brother, Duke Valdemar, had been quarreling with their brother, King Berger of Sweden. 
The latter pretended to desire a reconciliation and invited them to a feast at the castle of Nykoping. During the night the sleeping room of the dukes was entered, and they were thrown into prison, where soon afterward they died. Rumor said that they were starved to death. The tidings of this tragedy so affected King Hawken that it hastened his death. He died at Tunsberg, May 8, 1319, and with him the male line of the royal house of Harold the Fairhaired became extinct. Chapter 35 Magnus Eriksson, Smek, 1319-1374, Hawken Vi. Magnusson, 1355-1380 Magnus, the son of King Hawken vs daughter Ingeborg and Duke Eric of Sweden, was only three years old at the death of his mother's father. While he was in his minority the affairs of the government were managed by a regency, the members of which had been selected by King Hawken. In Sweden King Berger, who had become generally hated on account of his treatment of his brothers, was deposed, and Magnus was proclaimed King of Sweden. Thus, for the first time, Norway and Sweden were united under one king. Both countries retained their own government and laws, and the king was to divide his time equally between the two countries. The Norwegians soon became dissatisfied with the government, which was conducted mainly by the king's mother, Duchess Ingeborg, who caused great scandal by her recklessness and wasted much of the revenue on her lover, Knut Pors, Duke of Halland, whom she afterward married. At a general thing, in Oslo, February 20, 1323, the regency was abrogated, and the knight Erling Vidkunsen of Bayarko and Gisk was appointed regent. When King Magnus, who, by the Swedes, was surnamed Smek, the Fondling, reached his majority, in 1332, he himself assumed the government in both countries. He was a good and kind man, but too weak to govern two countries. Sweden took up most of his time, and he did not come to Norway as often as he was expected to, and made no proper arrangement for the government during his absence. This caused general discontent, and a virtual separation of the countries was finally arranged. At a great meeting in Varberg, August 15, 1343, King Magnus' oldest son, Eric, was declared heir apparent and co-regent in Sweden, and his other son, Hawken, in Norway. On the same day the Norwegian state councillors acknowledged Hawken, who had been educated in Norway, as their king, with the understanding that King Magnus was to conduct the government until his son became of age. The separation of the countries was further confirmed in 1350 in Bergen, where King Magnus placed Hawken in the royal seat and arranged a separate court for him. According to public documents, however, Hawken's reign dates only from 1355, when probably he had reached his majority. The Swedes were no more satisfied with King Magnus than the Norwegians were. He succeeded in annexing the provinces of Scania, Halland and Bleking, which he bought for 34,000 mark silver from Duke John of Holstein, who held them as a pledge. But the taxes he had to levy, in order to raise this sum, caused great dissatisfaction. The king's recklessness and the great influence wielded by his vain and malicious queen, Blanca of Namur, and his favorite, the young Swedish knight, Bengt Algotson, increased the dissatisfaction to such a degree that Prince Eric took up arms and declared Bengt to be a public enemy. Eric died shortly afterward, but quiet was not restored. King Magnus' ambiguous and pusillanimous action in allowing the wily King Valdemar at Turdag of Denmark to seize the dearly bought provinces of Scania, Halland, and Bleking, created great discontent, which was increased when his son, Hawken, married King Valdemar's eleven-year-old daughter Margaret, although the Swedes, who expected Hawken to become their future king, had decided upon another bride for him. When, after an uprising, King Magnus banished forty of the most turbulent magnates, the latter offered the crown to Albrecht of Mecklenburg, a nephew of King Magnus, and returned with him to Sweden. Where Magnus was deposed and Albrecht elected King of Sweden, 1363. Hawken, who shortly before that had been elected King of Sweden, did not intend to give up the kingdom without a fight, especially as he had several fortresses and provinces in his possession. Both sides armed themselves, and a battle was fought at Encoping, March 3, 1365. Magnus was taken prisoner and brought to Stockholm, and Hawken, severely wounded, had to flee to Norway. 
The war was continued with varying success until the Hanseatic League interfered in the struggle, because Hawken had attempted to expel the Germans from the country. The German merchants had obtained great power in the country and shamefully abused it, they refused to receive the king's coin, monopolized all trade, and defied the laws. Hawken finally made peace with them, but only after granting them some new privileges. After that he collected a great army and invaded Sweden, even marching against Stockholm. An agreement was reached in 1371 with King Albrecht, by which Hawken was to pay 12,000 marks and surrender the Swedish fortresses for the liberation of his father. The latter had to give up all claim to the Swedish throne, but was to have for his support Skara Stift, West Gotland, and Vermland. Hawken afterward inherited these provinces. Magnus was drowned three years later in the Hardinge Fjord at the age of 58 years. His son survived him only six years. He died at Oslo in June, 1380, about 42 years old, after having had the pleasure to see his only son Olaf chosen king of Denmark. Great calamities befell the country during the reigns of Magnus and Hawken. On April 4, 1328, the great cathedral in Thrandjum, the Christ Church, was destroyed by fire. In 1344 the Gala River suddenly changed its course, owing to a mountain slide, flooded the Gala Valley, and caused great destruction. Forty-eight farms and some churches were destroyed, and 250 people and a great number of cattle were drowned. Iceland suffered from earthquakes, and in 1341 the sixth eruption of the volcano Hecla spread alarm and desolation. In 1323 and 1346 the winters were so severe that a great number of people froze to death. But the greatest calamity occurred in 1349, when the Black Death, a terrible pestilence, after having ravaged southern Europe, was brought to Bergen by a merchant vessel from England. Before the cargo of the vessel had been discharged, the whole crew died, and immediately the pestilence spread with great rapidity over the whole country. In a single day ninety persons were buried from a church in Bergen, including fourteen priests and six deacons. In Thrandjum, Archbishop Arne and the whole chapter, with the exception of a single canon, died. Only one bishop in Norway, Salmon in Oslo, survived the plague. In many districts the entire population was swept away. The cattle died from hunger. For want of horses and laborers the farmers were unable to cultivate their farms, and famine and distress resulted. Many districts which had been fertile and populous were laid waste, and were in time covered by a new growth of forests. Industries, trade and commerce stagnated, and Norway sank into a state of debility from which it took her centuries to recover. Chapter 36 Olaf Hakenson the Young, 1381-1387 Olaf, the only son of King Haakon Magnusson and the Danish Margaret, was, at the death of his maternal grandfather, Valdemar Turdag, 1376, proclaimed King of Denmark under the guardianship of his parents. And at the death of his father four years later, when he was ten years old, he inherited the throne of Norway. His mother proceeded to Oslo, where a meeting of the Norwegian chiefs was held early in January, 1381. Here it was arranged that Queen Margaret was to be the guardian of her son and conduct the government in his name, when she was in the country, but in her absence the administration should be conducted by the chieftain Ogman Finsson. As leader of the state council, Olaf was crowned in Nidaros on St. Olaf's Day, July 29, 1381. Thus commenced the union between Norway and Denmark, which lasted for over 400 years and proved so unfortunate for Norway. To the great sorrow of the Norwegians, King Olaf, when scarcely 17 years old, was taken suddenly sick at Falsterbro Castle, Scania, and died August 3, 1387. Fifteen years after Olaf's death an adventurer appeared who claimed to be King Olaf, and the rumor soon spread that Olaf had escaped from his mother shortly before the time of his alleged death. It was proven, however, that the pretender was a German, and that some merchants, who had noticed the great likeness he bore to Olaf, had induced him to make the claim. The impostor was condemned to death and burned. Chapter 37 Margaret, 1387-1389, Eric of Pomerania, 1389-1442, the Kalmar Union, 
1397. A.S. young Olaf left no offspring, it was quite generally supposed in Norway that the kingdom would be given to his nearest relative, Haakon Johnson. A grandson of King Haakon V. S. illegitimate daughter Agneta. But the wily Queen Margaret, who had already been acknowledged as reigning Queen of Denmark, induced Archbishop Vinald and the majority of the clergy to take her part, and, at the State Council in Oslo, February 2, 1388, she was. As Hawkins' widow and Olaf's mother, declared to be the rightful ruler of Norway and its dependencies. According to law, however, the Norwegians were to be ruled by a king, and could not long be satisfied with having the government conducted in the name of a woman. She therefore induced the council to choose her grandnephew, Eric of Pomerania, as king of Norway, 1389, she to continue the regency during his minority. King Albrecht of Mecklenburg, who was at this time reigning in Sweden, had caused a great deal of discontent among the Swedish nobility, because he had surrounded himself with Germans, whom he had given places of influence and honor. The ambitious Queen Margaret, who hated Albrecht deeply, because he had laid claim to the Danish throne, made overtures to the Swedish magnates, with the result that they chose her as the mistress and rightful ruler of Sweden, and transferred several fortified places to her, while she promised to reunite West Gotland and Vermland with Sweden. Albrecht proceeded to Germany to collect an army, and swore that he would not put his hood on before he had conquered Norway and Denmark. He sent Margaret several insulting messages, called her Queen Breechless, and sent her a whetstone on which to sharpen her scissors and needles, saying that the good woman ought to remain quietly at her spinning wheel. The Queen's chiefs, Ivar Leakey and Henrik Perrow, invaded Sweden with an army, and won a battle at Fokoping in West Gotland. Albrecht was taken prisoner and was brought before the queen, who reminded him of his insults. She gave him a long fool's cap to wear instead of the crown of Denmark, and sent him to prison in the castle of Lindholm in Scania, where he remained six years. Queen Margaret soon won the whole of Sweden except Stockholm, where the German merchants and the Hood brothers made a determined resistance. They received aid from the North German cities Rostock and Wismar, whose rulers proclaimed that anyone who would harry the coasts of the Scandinavian countries could find refuge in their harbours. And the result was a number of pirates, the so-called Vitalialia Brethren, made the northern waters unsafe for several years, and plundered many of the coast towns. Thus they twice attacked and plundered Bergen. In order to gain his liberty, Albrecht, in 1395, made an agreement that within three years he would either pay 60,000 marks silver or release Stockholm. He could not pay the money, and Stockholm's gates were open to Queen Margaret. In 1397 Queen Margaret's 16-year-old grandnephew, Eric of Pomerania, was crowned in Kalmar as King of Sweden, Denmark and Norway, in the presence of prominent men from the three countries. A document was drafted containing the provisions regarding the Triple Union, and it was signed on Margaret's Day, July 20, 1397. It could scarcely be considered binding upon the three countries, as it was signed by only seventeen of the gentlemen present, and they had not been given power to act for their countrymen. The main stipulations of the agreement were the following. 1. The three countries were always hereafter to have the same king. 2. One king was to be elected by authorized delegates from the three countries. 3. The countries were to help each other against foreign foes. 4. Each country was to be governed by its own laws. Queen Margaret died at Flensborg, October 27, 1412, aged 59 years, leaving the government in the weak hands of King Eric. In the Union Denmark soon assumed the position of the chief country. In Sweden and Norway the people complained that the revenues of the countries went to pay the expenses of the war with the Counts of Holstein about Schleswig, although this war, which lasted for 26 years, concerned only Denmark. The Counts received aid from the Hansa towns, which hated King Eric, because he encouraged the Dutch trade with the northern countries. In 1427 he defeated the Hanseatic fleet in Oer Sound, and in 1428, when they tried to attack Copenhagen, the city was saved by his brave queen, Philippa of England. She armed the citizens and the peasants, and the Germans were obliged to withdraw. The final outcome of the war was, however, 
that King Eric had to cede Schleswig to Count Adolf of Holstein by the peace at Vordingborg, 1435. Norway had occasion to feel the effects of King Eric's weakness. The inhabitants of Finnmark and Halagaland were attacked by Russians and other enemies from the northeast, who did great damage and abducted men and women. And the town of Bergen was left defenseless against the attacks of the daring Vitalialia brethren. Thus in 1428 the pirate from Vismar, Bartholomew V.O.T., came to Bergen with 600 men, just as the English traders were waiting there for the vessels from northern Norway to bring herring, stockfish and other goods. The Englishmen, believing that the whole fighting force of the Hansa towns was coming, hastened aboard their ships and took flight. The Bishop of Bergen, who was seized with a similar fear, left everything behind for the enemy and fled with the Englishmen. The robbers then went ashore and plundered the town. At the bishopric they forced the iron doors to the book room and took away all the books, besides many other valuables. As the traders from the north arrived with their full cargoes, the booty of the pirates became so much larger, as they took possession of their fish, furs and other goods. This success encouraged the robbers to renew their attack on Bergen next year, when they again plundered the bishopric, and then laid a great part of the town in ashes. In all three countries the people were dissatisfied with King Eric. He coined bad money, levied new taxes, and appointed foreigners, especially Germans, to the chief offices. In Sweden the first uprising started. The peasants in Dalarn twice sent the gallant Engelbrecht Engelbrechtsen to Denmark to complain of the cruel prefects, but he could obtain no redress. On his return he placed himself at the head of a rebellion, which spread itself to the whole country. Engelbrecht was murdered, 1435, but in his place Karl Knutzen Bond became the leader of the rebellion and regent. In Norway the people followed the example of the Swedes. The peasants in Viking revolted under Amund Sigurdsson Bolt, captured Oslo, and drove some of the Danish and other foreign officers out of the country. In a proclamation issued, after this uprising, by the Norwegian Council of State, calling upon the people to be loyal to King Eric, 1436. The council promised to request the king in the future not to appoint foreigners to the high offices unless they had married into Norwegian families. In Denmark also the people complained of the heavy taxes and the many Germans who were imported and given high positions. Wearied of all these complaints, and taking with him his mistress, Cecilia, the money left in the treasury, and a number of important documents, King Eric left the country and took up his residence on the island of Gotland. Where he had a fortified castle, 1438. Shortly after this he was formally deposed in Denmark and in Sweden, while in Norway they still, for a time, remained loyal to him. As regent in Norway, during his absence, the king appointed the influential Norwegian, Sigurd Jonsson. The latter descended from a powerful old family, he had inherited by Arco, Gisk and other estates, and was the richest man in the country. For ten years King Eric lived in his castle in Gotland, supporting himself by piracy, but was finally driven away by the Swedes. He returned to his native country, Pomerania, where he ended his long but inglorious life in 1459. Chapter 38 Christopher of Bavaria, 1442-1448 According to the provisions of the Kalmar Union, a new king was to be elected by the authorized delegates of the three countries. But, instead of that, the Danish Council of State summoned Eric's nephew, sister's son, Christopher of Bavaria, who was first elected regent and shortly afterward, 1440, proclaimed king. In Sweden, Karl Knutzen Bond endeavored to prevent a renewal of the union, but, with the aid of the clergy, the rights of Christopher were acknowledged, and he was proclaimed king of Sweden at Morassen, September 14, 1441. In Norway, King Eric had many adherents, and his favorite, Bishop Thorleif, did all in his power to retain Eric, or his cousin, Bugislav, as king. But when it appeared that neither of them was coming to assert his claim, the Norwegians finally also acknowledged Christopher, and he was hailed as king of Norway, in Oslo, in 1442. He had thus succeeded in reuniting the three countries, although he was crowned separately in each of them. Christopher was a good-natured and jolly man, who wished everybody well. In Sweden, 
there was naturally objection to the piracy committed by his uncle from the island of Gotland. But when the Swedes complained of this to the king, he answered merrily, Our uncle is sitting on a rock, and he, too, must have something to live off. In Norway, the administration of public affairs was fairly good. There were no complaints against the king, and the country's own people had their share in the government. The king made an effort to restrict the Hanseatic League, which, together with the Vitaliaalia brethren, caused so much damage to Norway. For this purpose he tried to give them commercial rivals by giving the citizens of Amsterdam trading privileges in Norway. In 1444 he gave the town of Bergen new privileges and announced several restrictions of the privileges of the Hansa towns. The power and influence of the latter was shown by the fact that this ordinance was repealed the next year, and the king was obliged to confirm their old and just privileges. King Christopher, however, did not abandon his purpose. But, just as he was about to bring new plans into execution, death overtook him, January 6, 1448, when he was about 32 years old. Chapter 39 The Union with Denmark, Christian I. 1450 1481 After the death of King Christopher, the Swedes elected Karl Knutzen Bond King of Sweden, while the Danes elected Count Christian of Oldenborg, at the age of 22, because he was heir to Schleswig and Holstein. And it was generally desired to have Schleswig reunited with Denmark. In the Norwegian Council of State there was dissension. The regent, Sigurd Johnson, the commander at Bergen, Olaf Nielsen, and the commander at Akershus, Hartvig Krumdijk, who was from the Duchy of Holstein, wanted to elect the Danish king, Christian, who was remotely related to the Old Norse kings. While another more popular party, led by the archbishop, a slack bolt, preferred the Swedish king, Karl Knutzen. The council finally elected Christian, at Oslo, in the spring of 1449. But, after his return to Nidaros, the archbishop declared the election void, not having been voluntary, and joined the people of the Thrandjum country and the uplands in inviting King Karl to come to Norway. With a mounted force of 500 men, King Karl proceeded through Vermland and Salver to Hamar, where he was proclaimed King of Norway, October 25, 1449, and a month later he was crowned in Thrandjum by the archbishop. Early in 1450, however, when King Karl attempted to capture Oslo, he was defeated, and an armistice was arranged. The archbishop died shortly afterward, and, at a meeting in Holmstad, in May, 1450, between Swedish and Danish magnates, the Swedish delegates, in the name of King Karl, relinquished all claims to Norway. Thus, when Christian came to Norway in the summer, he was acknowledged by everybody, and was crowned in Thrandjum on St. Olaf's Day, July 29, 1450. He then went to Bergen, where, on the 29th of August, 1450, a closer union between Norway and Denmark was concluded. The main provisions of the agreement were, 1. That both countries were hereafter to be united in brotherly love, neither country being the superior of the other, 2. That each country should be governed by native-born officials, and enjoy their own laws, liberties and privileges, 3. That both countries should henceforth remain under one lord and king forever, 4. When the king died the councils of both kingdoms were to meet at Holmstad and elect a new king from among the late king's legitimate heirs. Thus the House of Oldenborg acquired the throne of Norway and continued to rule the country for 364 years. For several years there was war between kings Karl and Christian, and in this war Norway was also involved. In 1452 King Karl invaded Norway with an army and captured Thrandjum, but he was afterward driven back across the frontier by the commander in Bergen, Sir Olaf Nielsen. The German merchants, Hansa, Hanseatic League, who, after the war under King Eric, had returned to Bergen, had become more powerful and insolent than ever before. They drove the citizens of the town away from the wharves and continually increased their own number by importations. The commander, Olaf Nielsen, was very severe with the Germans, and made them pay heavy taxes. They complained to the king, and, as he feared that the Hansa might aid his enemy, King Karl, he removed Olaf. The latter now set out as a pirate against the Hansa towns, and captured several of their ships at sea. 
He also succeeded in capturing the Swedish fort, Elfsborg, at the mouth of the Gott River, and offered it to the king if he were reinstated as commander at Bergen. This offer was accepted, and Olaf returned to Bergen. Enraged at this, the Germans armed themselves to the number of over 2,000, intent upon killing the commander. Olaf sought refuge in the cloister of Munkalev, where his friend, Bishop Thorleif, tried in vain to appease the Germans. They burned the cloister, killed the bishop, who came out carrying the sacrament, and three other priests, besides Olaf Nielsen and his brother, with families and children, in all, sixty people. This was the 1st of September, 1455. The king, who needed the help of the Hansa towns, neither would nor could punish this great crime. But the Pope placed the murderers in the ban of the church, and compelled them to pay heavy fines for the murder of the bishop and to rebuild the cloister. Internal dissensions in Sweden, involving a struggle between the king, the bishops and the nobility, resulted in the expulsion of Karl and the acceptance of Christian as the king of Sweden. Thus the three countries again became united under one king, 1457, and the next year the state councils promised that, after the death of Christian, his son Hans was to be king of all three countries. But King Christian made himself hated by his oppression, and when he caused the imprisonment of the powerful archbishop, Jens Bengtsson Oxenscherna, the latter's nephew, Kettel Karlsson Wasa, Bishop of Linköping, swore that he would not put on his bishop's robes until his country had been rid of its oppressor, and he kept his word. Karl was recalled, and died, as King of Sweden, in 1470, after several unsuccessful attempts by Christian to regain the Swedish crown. In 1471 Christian was defeated in battle at Brunkberg, now a part of Stockholm, by King Karl's nephew, Sten Stuer, whom the Swedes had elected regent. After that King Christian made no further attempts to recover Sweden. King Christian was a reckless spendthrift, and was always financially embarrassed. The annual tribute for the Hebrides, which Scotland was to pay to the King of Norway according to the peace made with King Magnus the Lawmender, had not been paid for some time, and King Christian in vain demanded payment. In order to settle the matter peaceably it was arranged that Christian's daughter Margaret was to marry the Scotch king, James III, and her dowry was fixed at 60,000 golden. As Christian could not raise this amount, he obtained the consent of the Norwegian Council of State to pawn the Orkneys for 50,000 golden, besides remitting the tribute for the Hebrides. Not being able to pay the balance, he also, without consent, pawned the Shetland Isles. Thus these ancient dependencies were lost to Norway, for they were never redeemed, although each new king solemnly promised to do so. King Christian died May 21, 1481, at the age of 55 years, and lies buried at the Cathedral of Roskildu. Chapter 40 Hans, 1483-1513 Christian's eldest son, Hans, or Johannes, had already as a child been proclaimed as his father's successor in all three countries. But after the death of Christian neither the Norwegians or the Swedes showed any great disposition to renew the union. The Norwegian Council of State entered into a league with the Swedish regent, Sten Stuer, at Oslo, February 1, 1482 where it was agreed that hereafter Norway and Sweden were to act together and mutually support each other for the maintenance of their liberties, rights and welfare. But as Sten Stuer hesitated in openly declaring himself against Denmark, the Norwegians again turned to that country and agreed to a joint election of a king at Holmstad, January 13, 1483. Where King Hans succeeded in inducing Archbishop Gott and the other delegates to acknowledge him as King of Norway, after having promised to redress all wrongs and otherwise comply with the wishes of the people. He was crowned in Thrandjum, July 20, 1483. The king's chief efforts were now directed toward effecting the submission of Sweden. The authorized delegates of the three countries assembled at Kalmar, where the union was renewed, and the Kalmar recess was published, November, 1483. But through the influence of Sten Stuer the acknowledgement of King Hans was postponed from year to year. Finally, in 1497, Hans invaded Sweden with a strong army, defeated Sten Stuer, and was proclaimed King of Sweden. 
Thus Hans had become ruler of the three countries, and his son Christian was proclaimed his successor. This power, however, was not of long duration. In the western part of Holland there lived a people called the Dittmarshers, whom the emperor had transferred to King Christian, although they had always formerly been a free people. King Hans wished to subdue them, and, in the year 1500, he and his younger brother, Duke Frederick of Schleswig-Holstein, invaded the country with a large army. They suffered a terrible defeat, however, as the inhabitants opened the dikes and called in the ocean as their ally. The king and his brother escaped with a loss of four thousand slain or drowned, while enormous treasures were lost. No sooner did the news of this disaster reach Sweden than the Swedes took up arms. Sten Stuer was again made regent, and King Hans's own queen was made a prisoner in Stockholm. At the same time the Norwegians also revolted. The most powerful man in Norway at that time was Sir Knut Alfson, owner of Gisk and many other estates. He had long been commander at Akershus. But had had a quarrel with Henrik Krumdijk, the commander at Bahus, and the king, suspecting him of being friendly to the Swedes, had removed him. Now that the Swedes had revolted, Sir Canute joined them and defeated the Danes, after which he invaded Norway and captured the fortresses Akershus and Tunsbergus. Henrik Krumdijk proceeded with a strong army to Oslo, in order to besiege Akershus. Negotiations were open for peace, and Henrik invited Sir Canute to a conference on board his ship under safe conduct, but, on his arrival, foully murdered him and threw his body into the water. The struggle of the discontented Norwegians was continued under the leadership of Canute Alfson's widow, the brave Lady Metadyr. But when the Danes received reinforcements from Denmark the rebellion was soon suppressed, and Lady Meta was obliged to flee to Sweden. Canute Alfson's large estates were confiscated to the crown. The attempt to subdue the Swedes was not so successful, although some strong attacks were made. The able regent, Sten Stuer, died in 1503, but his successor, Svante Nielsen Stuer, who married Knut Alfson's widow, defended his country's independence with courage and ability. He died in 1512, and was succeeded by Sten Stuer the Younger. In the year 1506 King Hans sent his son Christian to Norway to rule the country in his name. Christian tried to rule as an autocratic king, and to place Norway entirely under Danish rule. He installed Danes as commanders of the fortresses, and also had Danes elected bishops. His faithful servant and chancellor, Erik Valkendorf, was made archbishop in Thrandjum. He understood that it was detrimental to the country that the Hansa towns had a monopoly of the trade, and therefore tried to restrict their privileges and to encourage the competition by the merchants from Holland. And took many steps to help the Norwegian towns. But in dealing with revolts he was very severe. An uprising by the peasants of Hedmarken, under the leadership of Herlog Hudfat, was promptly crushed, and the leaders were beheaded outside of Akershus. Some of the captured peasants were tortured until they confessed that Bishop Karl of Hamar was the real instigator of the rebellion. The bishop was captured and held in prison until his death, and Christian took possession of his estate. The Hansa towns were greatly enraged against Christian, but they hated King Hans even more, because he interfered with their trade with Sweden and encouraged the Dutch traders. It finally came to open war, and the traders of Lübeck attacked and plundered the Danish islands. King Hans, however, returned the attack with a strong fleet, defeated the Lübeckers, and compelled them to make peace and to pay 30,000 gulden in war indemnity. This was the first time that a Scandinavian king had dared to go to war with the powerful Hansa towns. King Hans died at Aalborg, February 20, 1513, 58 years old. Chapter 41 Christian II 1513 1523 After the death of King Hans, his only son, the cruel Christian, mounted the throne. But the Council of State and the nobility, while knowing that he would be a less compliant monarch than his father, sought to secure their alleged rights by a new charter, which he was compelled to sign before he was crowned. During his stay in Norway as viceroy, Christian had become acquainted with a Dutch girl in Bergen, the beautiful Divik. They first met at a ball, which he gave for the most prominent citizens in Bergen, and where they fell in love with each other. 
He afterward brought the girl and her wily mother, Sigbrit Willems, with him to Oslo and later to Copenhagen, where Sigbrit continued to wield a great influence during the whole of Christian's reign. Two years after his accession to the throne, Christian married the wealthiest princess of Europe, Isabella, a sister of Charles V, who afterward became Emperor of Germany and King of Spain. The wedding was celebrated with great pomp at Copenhagen. The young queen brought him a dower of 250,000 golden, and she was as good and lovely as she was rich. Archbishop Eric Valkendorf had brought the bride to the country, and had promised Charles V, to see that Dyvik was kept out of the way. Sigbrit Willems heard of this, and henceforth was the archbishop's bitter enemy. Neither did the king listen to the archbishop's advice. Dyvik retained the favor of the king until, a year and a half later, she suddenly died, and the king's passionate love for her now led him to a cruel and unjust act. The governor of the castle in Copenhagen, Torben Ox, had also fallen in love with Dyvik, and, as she died shortly after having eaten some cherries, it was rumored that the cherries had been poisoned, and that Torben Ox had caused her death. The king summoned Torben before the Council of State, which acquitted him. The king became enraged when he heard the decision, and said, if we had had as many friends in the council as Torben had, the judgment would have been different. But even if this ox has a neck as thick as that of a bull, he shall yet lose it. Although, according to law, a nobleman could only be tried by the council of state, the king summoned twelve peasants to retry the case. They found him guilty, and although the councillors and the nobility, the queen and the court ladies, all begged for mercy, the king was unmoved, and Torben Ox was executed. The crown of Sweden was the great object of King Christian's ambition. But it took years before he reached this goal. The Swedish regent, Sten Stuer the Younger, was very popular and had undisputed power, until he was antagonized by the newly elected archbishop at UPS, Gustav Troll, who, with many members of the old nobility, became jealous of the power enjoyed by the Stuer family and preferred to support King Christian. Sten Stuer defeated Gustav Troll, who was deprived of his see and compelled to flee from his castle. Afterward Sten Stuer was placed in the ban of the church, and the archbishop received aid from Denmark. King Christian made several expeditions to Sweden, and finally his general, Otto Krumpen, defeated Sten Stuer's army in a battle on the ice at Bojsund, where Sten Stuer was mortally wounded, February, 1520. Stuer's widow, the courageous Christina Gildenstierna, tried to hold the party together, and, for a few months, defended Stockholm, but finally had to surrender the city. The Swedes now acknowledged Christian as hereditary king, and, on the 4th of November, 1520, he was crowned by Gustav Troll in the Grand Church in Stockholm. After the coronation great festivities were held for three days. On the fourth day a number of the Swedish nobles were summoned to meet at the palace. While the king was surrounded by his court, the representatives of Gustav Troll stepped forward and demanded reparation for the wrongs committed against the archbishop. Christian, who wished to subdue the Swedish nobles, availed himself of the opportunity and followed the bad advice given him. The document by which Gustav Troll had been deposed was produced, and all who had signed it were arrested on the spot. The following day, November 8, 1520, the accused were brought before a court consisting of eleven Swedish priests and one Danish bishop. The only question asked was whether men who had raised their hands against the Pope and the Holy Church were heretics. The members of the court answering in the affirmative, the accused were declared to be heretics, and the king fixed the punishment at death. The condemned were at once conveyed to the great marketplace, where two bishops, thirteen councillors of state and knights, and many other prominent men, in all about fifty, were beheaded. This was the notorious carnage of Stockholm. After having left the conduct of the fight in Sweden in the hands of his able admiral, Sofren Norby, King Christian now returned to Denmark, where, during the next two years, he introduced several excellent laws for the improvement of commerce, industry and culture. But he also tried to establish himself as an autocratic king. He abolished several of the privileges of the nobility in the bishops, and planned the gradual extinction of the Council of State, by not appointing any successors to members who died. 
the Swedes did not long endure the rule of King Christian and the insolence of his officers. The people of the province of Dalarn, Dalakarlia, rose under the leadership of Gustavus Eriksson Wasa, a young nobleman whose father was among those beheaded in the carnage of Stockholm. They successfully fought the Danes and captured one town after another, and elected Gustavus Wasa regent of Sweden. King Christian prohibited all trade by the Hansa towns with Sweden, and let his men capture their ships. Thus he incensed the people of Lübeck, who declared war against him and helped the Swedes. King Christian then levied a new tax to cover the war expenses and summoned a meeting of nobles. But now the nobles of Jutland rose against him and offered to proclaim his uncle, Duke Frederick, king. Frederick accepted the offer, and the nobles sent Christian a letter revoking their allegiance to him. An inexplicable faint-heartedness now seized Christian, and, instead of summoning his many faithful adherents to his support, he commenced to negotiate with his enemies, and when that proved of no avail, he embarked, April 20, 1523. With his queen, his children, Lady Sigbrit and others, and sailed to Holland in order to seek the aid of his powerful brother-in-law, Emperor Charles V. Duke Frederick was now proclaimed king, but he had to divide the power with the Council of State and sign a charter which gave the nobility many improper privileges. Shortly afterward the Swedes elected Gustavus Wasa king, and thus ended the union of the three countries. Both kings were obliged to restore to the Hansa towns all trading privileges, in order to be assured that they would not help King Christian to return. Chapter 42 Frederick I, 1524-1533 Norway had taken no part in the expulsion of King Christian, and for a time remained loyal to him. The newly elected Archbishop, Olaf Engelbrechtsen, proceeded to Rome in order to obtain the recognition of the Pope. During his absence Norway was to be governed by the Council of State, which consisted of the bishops and a few noblemen. The mightiest among the latter was Nils Henriksen of Estrut, whose wife, Inger Ottstadter, was related to the old Norwegian royal house. This ambitious woman, commonly called Lady Inger of Estrut, took quite a prominent part in public affairs, three of her daughters being married to prominent Danes. King Frederick soon gained a number of influential adherents in Norway. He sent to Bergen the Danish nobleman, Vincent Lunge, who married one of the daughters of Nils Henriksen and Inger of Estrut. After the death of Nils, Vincent became a member of the Council of State and Commander at the fortress of Bergenhess. He used his influence in favor of King Frederick, but he wanted the Council of State to be as powerful in Norway as the Danish Council was in Denmark. He was supported by Archbishop Olaf, and the Council of State finally elected Frederick King of Norway but the king had to grant the council, and especially Vincent's lunge, great authority. The king issued a recess, by which he pledged himself, one, in the future not to sign himself heir to Norway, as the country was a free elective kingdom, two, to redeem the Orkneys and the Shetland Isles, which his father had illegally pawned, three, that the coronation was hereafter to take place in Thrandjum. The king did not care so much about keeping these promises as about filling the most important offices with Danish noblemen, who conducted public affairs to suit themselves. Among those who were specially favoured were, Mogens Gildenstiern, who became commandant at Akershus. Esk Bilda, who was placed in command at Bergenhess, relinquished by Vincent's Lunge in consideration of having the nunnery at Bergen, afterward called Lungegarden, deeded to him. Vincent's brother-in-law, Nils Leakey, and Henrik Krumdijk, notorious from the slaying of Canute Alfson. King Frederick was an adherent of the doctrines of Luther, which had now been commonly accepted in northern Germany, and from thence were introduced into Denmark. He compelled the Danish bishops to acknowledge him as the head of the church instead of the Pope, and took possession of a number of cloisters, which he either kept for himself or gave to the nobles. In Norway, too, he gave away some of the cloisters, which, of course, caused great dissatisfaction among the clergy. The discontent in Norway took a very definite form, when, contrary to the recess, the king sent his son Christian to Norway to be proclaimed heir to the throne. Archbishop Olaf Engelbrechtsen and a majority of the Council of State then declared that this could not be done, inasmuch as Norway was an elective kingdom, and here the king was obliged to let the matter rest. Meanwhile, the exiled King Christian, 
encouraged by messages from Norway and Sweden, thought he saw a chance to regain his lost throne. With the aid of Charles V. and some private parties, he gathered an army in a fleet in Holland, and sailed for Norway in October, 1531, with twenty-five ships and seven thousand men. On the way he suffered by great storms and lost ten of his ships, but landed in Norway with the remnants of his fleet. He gained a large number of adherents, and, proceeding to Oslo, laid siege to the fortress of Akershus. Mogens Gildenstiern, however, defended it well, and when, in the spring, 1532, reinforcements arrived, in the form of a strong army of Danes and Lubeckers, Christian made an agreement with Mogens, by which he was to proceed, under a safe conduct. To Copenhagen, in order to personally conduct peace negotiations with his uncle. Upon his arrival in Denmark, however, the agreement was shamefully broken, and the unfortunate king was thrown into prison at Sonderborg. He was placed in a cell having a small barred window high up. The entrance was closed with masonry, and the food was sent in through a hole in the wall. Here he remained for eighteen years. In 1550 he was transferred, by Frederick's successor, to a milder prison in Kallenborg Castle, where he remained until he died, in the beginning of 1559, seventy-eight years old. The Norwegians were severely punished for their alliance with Christian. The chieftains of the Danish party, Bishop Olaf in Bergen and the Danish nobleman, Esk Bilda, Vincent Lunge and Nils Leakey, held a meeting in Bergen shortly after Christian's defeat and levied a heavy tax on the whole country. The archbishop was fined 15,000 Danish marks. The Norwegians were compelled to relinquish any right, through the Council of State, to elect any other king than the one elected for Denmark. Shortly after Frederick had been again recognized by the Norwegians as their king, he died, without being missed, at the age of 62 years, April 10, 1533. During his reign the Lutheran faith was preached throughout Denmark, but only in a few towns in Norway, for instance, in Bergen. Chapter 43 Interregnum 1533-1537. At the death of Frederick I, an interregnum occurred, as the Danish estates were unable to agree upon the election of a new king. The nobles favoured the late king's oldest son, Duke Christian, but he being devoted to Protestantism, the clergy wanted his younger brother, Hans, who was only a child, and whom they hoped to win for the Catholic faith. The bourgeoisie and the peasants desired to have the imprisoned Christian too. Reinstated. Under the pretext that a new king could not be elected without the presence of the Norwegian Council of State, the clergy succeeded in having the election postponed to a joint meeting of the councils of both countries, to be held the following year. In the meantime, the so-called Count's feud broke out. The Lubeckers, who were dissatisfied on account of the trading privileges granted to the Dutch, sent an army to Denmark, under command of Christopher of Oldenburg, who desired to recover the Danish throne for his cousin, the captive king. Christian II. The Count discovered the lower estates to be such bitter enemies of the nobility, and ardent adherents of the captive king, that he found no great difficulty in taking possession of the Danish Isles and Scania. The Council of State, or a part of it, now hastened to elect Frederick's son, Duke Christian, King, July 4, 1534. An alliance was formed with the Swedish king, Gustavus Wasa, against the Lubeckers, and the fortunes of war soon turned in favor of the new king. His brave general, Johann Ransau, defeated the enemy at Alborg, crossed over to Foon, and won a complete victory over the count at Exneberg, while Gustavus Wasa helped the king's party to retake Scania. After the capture of Copenhagen, July 29, 1536, King Christian III was recognized by the whole of Denmark. While the Count's feud was going on in Denmark, there was also strife and disorder in Norway. Both parties had tried to win the support of the powerful Archbishop in Thrandjum, Olaf Engelbrechtsen, and through him the control of Norway, but, while for several reasons he could not recognize Christian III. He was for a time uncertain whom to support. It was decided to hold a meeting in Thrandjum at Christmas, 1535, for the purpose of electing a king. But the followers of Vincent's Lunge and Esk Bilda in the southern and western parts of the country held a meeting at Oslo, 
shortly before Whitsuntide, 1535, where they proclaimed Christian III. King of Norway A special embassy from the Queen Regent of Holland visited Archbishop Olaf, and, in the name of Emperor Charles V, promised him powerful support if he would persevere in his old loyalty to the captive king, Christian II. And when the agents of Christian III arrived in Thrandjum, about Christmas time, there was an uprising of the people, said to be instigated by the archbishop, and many of the Danish magnates were imprisoned and otherwise maltreated. Two of them, the councillors Vincent Lunge and Nils Leakey, who were not only public opponents, but personal enemies, of the archbishop, were murdered. The archbishop now adopted a vigorous policy, and tried to get possession of the fortresses of Bergenhus and Akershus, but his armies were defeated. When the adversity of Christian II's party in Denmark further convinced the archbishop that the cause was hopeless, he released the imprisoned agents and requested them to mediate with the king, offering allegiance to Christian III. On condition that he be allowed to retain his rank and property. The king, however, did not accept the offer, but, in the spring of 1537, sent a fleet of fourteen ships and one thousand five hundred men, under the command of Trout Ulfstand and Christopher Hvitfeld, to Thrandjum. Foreseeing the destruction of his party, Archbishop Olaf Engelbrechtsen gathered the treasures of the cathedral and fled to Holland, where this last champion of Norwegian independence died the following year. Chapter 44 Christian III 1537 to 1559 the reformation introduced at the great diet held in copenhagen in 1536 it was decided that the catholic faith should be abolished the property of the bishops and the cloisters was confiscated to the crown and the lutheran faith was introduced into denmark a new ecclesiastical law was adopted called the ordinance the king also promised the rapacious nobility of Denmark that henceforth Norway was to be, and remain, under the crown of Denmark as any other part of the country, and not to be called a separate kingdom, but a province of the Danish crown. The Norwegian Council of State was abolished, the Catholic bishops were removed, and Danish noblemen were installed at the fortresses to rule the country in the king's name. From this time the Danish Council of State exerted great influence in the government of Norway, but, in spite of all this, Norway remained a separate state, it retained its old laws, and the Chancellor was still to be the supreme judge. After the flight of the Archbishop, and the submission of Norway, the Danish Church Ordinance was also made to apply to Norway, but the new faith was little known there, and the Norwegians long clung to the old faith. When the bishops had been removed, Danish magnates were sent around in the country to take possession of, the silver, treasures and goods of the old idolatry. In performing this function the Danish magnates showed a special reformatory zeal. Thus, in Bergen, the church robber, Esk Bilda, spared neither churches nor the graves of the departed kings, while in Thrandjum Otto Stigson burned the library and archives of the cathedral chapter. And Thord Road committed havoc in the same manner in Stavanger. St. Olaf's costly shrine, which stood on the high altar in the cathedral of Thrandjum, and was ornamented with precious stones, as well as many other treasures of the church, were sent to Copenhagen. Lutheran superintendents or bishops were installed in place of the Catholic bishops. But the government could not at once remove all the Catholic priests, because there were not Lutheran ministers enough to put in their places, and, when Lutheran ministers were appointed, they were generally treated with ill will and sometimes even driven away or killed. The majority of the Lutheran ministers were Danes, and Danish became the language of the church. The ablest of the new Lutheran bishops was Jebel Peterson in Bergen, who showed great zeal in educating Lutheran ministers. Theological seminaries were established at each of the episcopal sees of Thrandjum, Bergen, Stavanger, and Oslo. The bishopric of Hamar was consolidated with that of Oslo. The Hansa towns, in making peace with Christian III, after the Count's feud, had succeeded in retaining their trading privileges in Norway, and, during the greater part of this reign, acted in their old insolent and oppressive manner. In Bergen they made themselves especially obnoxious, so that the people complained bitterly to the king. He finally appointed, as commander in Bergen, the able Danish nobleman, Christopher Wachendorf, 
who commenced to put limits to the arbitrary and violent conduct of the Germans, and subdued them in such a way that they never regained their old power. After this the Norwegian citizens of Bergen gradually asserted themselves, and soon had the control of the whole fishery trade with the northern districts. Christian III. Died on the 1st of January, 1559, at the age of 55 years. Although he reigned for 23 years, he never visited Norway as king. Chapter 45. Frederick II. 1559 to 1588. Christian III. Was succeeded by his oldest son, Frederick II, who was then 25 years old. This vain and worthless monarch commenced his reign with a successful war on the liberty loving Dittmarshers. Later he waged war on the Swedish king, Eric XIV. The causes of this disastrous war, the so called Northern Seven Years' War, 1563 1570, were apparently trivial. Both kings wanted to carry the three crowns in their coats of arms, and some Swedish messengers, who were on their way to Germany, had been arrested in Denmark. But the real reasons were the jealousy between the two kings and the desire of the Danes to again unite the three countries under a Danish king. At sea the Danes were unsuccessful, although they had very able admirals in Herluf Troll and Otto Rudd. On land they fared no better in the beginning, but, in 1565, the hero, Daniel Ransaw, won a great victory over a much larger army than his own in the Battle of Svartera in Halland. Norway, whose defences had been sadly neglected, suffered greatly, during this war, from Swedish incursions. A Swedish army of 4,000 men, under the command of the Frenchman, Claude Collet, conquered Gentiland and Herjedalen and crossed the mountains to Thrandjum. The fortress Stenvikshom was forced to surrender, and the people of Thrandjum and the surrounding districts submitted without resistance and paid homage to the Swedish king. Later, however, Claude Collet was defeated by a fleet sent against him by the governor at Bergenhus, the rich and highly esteemed Eric Rosencrans. Claude Collet took refuge in the fortress Stenvikshom. But here he was besieged, and was finally obliged to surrender. He was sent in irons to Copenhagen. Especially hard for the Norwegians was the year 1567, when the Swedes harried Hedmarken, Romerik and Solor, and captured Hamar. The cathedral of Hamar was burned, and the Swedes marched against Akershus, which was bravely defended by the commander, Christen Monk. The citizens of Oslo burned their town in order to prevent the Swedes from obtaining a foothold there. On this occasion the Swedes lay encamped on the mountainside above the town, on a plain afterward called the Swedish Plain. The Norwegians were hard-pressed. But Erik Rosencrans again sent assistance from Bergen, and the Swedes were obliged to leave the country with considerable loss. The incursions of the Swedes were, however, repeated from time to time, and, during one of them, the town of Sarpsborg was burned, January, 1570. Finally, in December, 1570, peace was concluded at Stedden, and the terms were, on the whole, favourable to Denmark. In return for relinquishing her claims to Sweden, which could never have been established, she secured an acknowledgement of her rights to Norway, Scania, Halland and Bleking. While Sweden returned the Norwegian provinces of Herjedalen and Gentiland, and paid 150,000 riksdollars for war expenses. Both countries retained the right to carry the three crowns in their coats of arms. The Seven Years' War was not the only cause of suffering in Norway during the reign of Frederick II. From 1572 Norway was given its own stadtholder or viceroy, always a Danish nobleman, who was to reside at Akershus, the fortress near Oslo. But the viceroy did not not have the power, if indeed he desired it, to prevent the prefects and other officers from subjecting the people to cruelties and extortions. They arbitrarily levied taxes, conducted illegal trading, and treated the peasants in a shameful manner. For ten years Eric Monk continued his violent rule in Nettens. At last, on complaint of the people, he was sentenced to return illegal taxes and indemnify a peasant, whose property he had taken. Later he was deprived of his office and placed in a prison, where he committed suicide. Ludwig Monk, prefect in Thrandjum, even became viceroy, although his conduct as prefect had been such as to cause a conspiracy, which cost the instigators their lives. 
The city of Frederikstad, which was built to replace the ancient Sarpsborg, was named after King Frederick. During his reign of 29 years, Frederick II was only once in Norway on a short visit, and knew little of the distress of the country. He amused himself at the palace of Copenhagen, where he led a dissolute life, shortened by drink. He died, April 4, 1588, at the age of 54 years. Chapter 46 Christian IV 1588-1648 Frederick II was succeeded by his son, Christian IV, a king who became very popular with the Norwegians. Christian was only eleven years of age at his father's death. According to the desire of the late king, his widow, Sophia of Mecklenburg, was to act as regent during Christian's minority, but the powerful council of state refused to confirm such regency, and appointed four members of their own body. Chancellor Niels Koss, Admiral Petter Munk, and the councillors Jorgen Rosenkranz and Christopher Wachendorf, as regents and guardians of the prince. Christian was given an excellent education by competent teachers. He early showed great love for the sea, and Admiral Monk caused a little frigate to be built expressly for him, and had it launched in a lake in Jutland, where he was taught by expert sailors how to navigate his ship. When he was nineteen years old, Christian assumed the government in his own name, and was crowned, with great ceremony, in Copenhagen, 1596. None of the other Danish kings have been so zealous for the welfare of Norway. He frequently visited the country, and once even, 1599, sailed along the northernmost coast into the White Sea, as he wished to acquaint himself with the circumstances of the northern boundary conflict with Sweden. On his return voyage he came to Bergen, where he witnessed a trial in court, visited the German wharf and watched the games of the Germans. He attended a jolly party at the apothecaries, where the guests smashed the windows. The king's crowned monogram was painted on the new panes. He also visited the peasants and drank toasts with them, according to their custom. King Christian listened to the complaints from Norway of the extortions of the Danish prefects, who, one after another, were deposed from office or compelled to pay heavy fines. He made the Norwegian-born nobleman, Hans Peterson Bass, or Little, Chancellor of Norway. The old Norwegian laws, which were written in the Old Norse language, and therefore now hard to understand, were abolished, and, in their stead, the king directed the learned Chancellor, Hans Peterson Bass. With the assistance of other experienced men, to elaborate a new code of laws. Hans Peterson died, November, 1602, before this work was completed, but his assistant and successor as Chancellor of Norway, Anders Green, continued it, and the new laws were published in 1604. A Norwegian ecclesiastical law, ordinance, was also given, because the Danish one was not suited for Norway. Christian IV had three wars during his long reign, two with Sweden and one with the Catholics in Germany. The First Swedish War, 1611-1613, was fought principally for Norway's sake. The Swedish king, Charles IX, called himself, at his coronation, King of the Laps, and laid claim to the Norwegian province of Finnmark. There was also a renewal of a conflict about the Three Crowns, in the coats of arms. Christian made a successful attack, destroyed the newly founded town of Gothenburg, and captured Elfsborg and the town and fortress of Kalmar. Hence this war is called the Kalmar War. During the war, the old king, Charles IX, died, and was succeeded by his son, the great Gustavus Adolphus. The war was largely conducted with foreign mercenaries, as it was not yet usual to have standing armies. Gustavus Adolphus had secured two such hired armies, which were to try to proceed across Norway in order to reach Sweden, as the Kattegat was closed with Danish ships. Colonel Munchaven landed with 800 men from Holland in Sonmor, where he plundered the country, then tried in vain to attack Thrandjum, and afterward proceeded through Stjordalen, where the people had become so frightened. On account of his depredations, that they did not dare to offer any resistance. Ravaging and plundering he made his way across the mountain ridge Kjolan into the province of Gentiland, which he conquered before joining the army in Sweden. The second foreign army was given a different reception. It consisted of 900 men, 
who came from Scotland under the command of Colonel George Sinclair. They landed at Veblungsens in Romsdal and proceeded up to Gudbrandsdal. Under the leadership of Bailiff Loritz Graham, the brave peasants of the Gudbrandsdal armed themselves as best they could. The peasants from the parishes of Lesch, Viage, Fraun, and Ringebu, gathered at the narrow mountain pass, Kringen, near the river Laugen, to await the arrival of the enemy. The advance guard was allowed to pass. But on the arrival of the main body, with Colonel Sinclair himself, the Norwegians suddenly attacked the Scotch men, who were all shot down or driven into the river. The advance guard was then overtaken and killed. Of the whole force of 900 men, not one man, it is said, escaped. At Kvam's church a grave is still pointed out as being that of Colonel Sinclair, and at Kringen there is a plain stone monument bearing this inscription, here Colonel George Sinclair was shot, August 26, 1612. After the Scotch men the Norwegians call this war the Scotch War. Peace was finally concluded at Neyarod, January 26, 1613. Gustavus Adolphus abandoned his claim to the Norwegian Finnmark, and Christian relinquished the captured fortresses upon being paid a million rix dollars. Both countries were again allowed to use the three crowns in their coats of arms. In his second war Christian IV. was not successful. This was his participation in the Thirty Years' War as the ally of the German Protestants against Emperor Ferdinand II and the Catholics, 1625-1629. After his defeat in the Battle of Lutter and Berenberg, the imperial armies, under Tilly and Wallenstein, overran Holstein, Schleswig, and Jutland, and, at the Peace of Lübeck, Christian was obliged to pledge himself not to take any further part in the war. King Christian's third war was with Sweden. The Swedish king, Gustavus Adolphus, had been fighting for the cause of the Protestants in Germany, and, after his fall in 1632, the Swedes continued the war under his able generals with much success. King Christian viewed with alarm the growing power of the Swedes, and secretly allied himself with the enemies of Sweden. The Swedes, however, anticipated his designs, and, in December, 1643, the Swedish general, Torstensen, left the scene of war in Bohemia and suddenly invaded Holstein, while another Swedish army attacked the province of Scania. A Swedish and a Dutch fleet were to convey these armies over to the Danish Isles. The Duchies and Jutland were in a very short time conquered by the Swedes, and it was only by Christian's wise and prompt proceedings that Funen and the other islands were saved from falling into the hands of the enemy. Although King Christian was then an old man of sixty-seven years, he took command of his fleet, won a battle at Listerdijk, and fought valiantly in the terrible naval battle of Kolbergide, Vermeern, July 1, 1644, where he himself was badly wounded. On account of a lack of vigilance on the part of the old Danish Admiral Galt, the Swedish fleet succeeded in escaping and uniting with the Dutch, and this combined fleet, of 64 ships, thereupon attacked the Danish one of 17 ships. Between Lolland and Falster. Unfortunately, a number of the sailors were ashore, and some of the commanders took to hasty flight. The remainder gathered around their admiral, the Norwegian, Pros Nilsson Mund, who would neither flee nor surrender, but fought to the last man against the overwhelming force of the enemy. This defeat placed Denmark in such a dangerous position that an immediate peace became an absolute necessity. The peace was concluded at Bromsebro, August 13, 1645, and King Christian was compelled to cede the Norwegian provinces of Herjedalen and Gentiland, and the island of Gotland to Sweden. In Norway, where the king had lately established a standing army, this war had been conducted with some success. It was named the Hannibal's Feud, after the viceroy, Hannibal Sayest, who, with the assistance of the brave warrior, the clergyman in Ullensaker, Kielt Stubb, not only kept the enemy out of Norway, but also collected heavy tributes from the nearest Swedish provinces. After peace had been concluded, Kielt Stubb returned to his pastorate, which he managed to his death, in 1663. Christian IV did a great deal to promote the industries and commerce of Norway. The Hanseatic office in Bergen was held in check, and Norwegian trading enterprises were encouraged. The mining industry, which had heretofore been neglected, became quite active. 
When silver had been discovered in Sandsvair, in 1623, he founded the mining town of Kongsberg. He also established the copper works at Roros, where copper was accidentally discovered by the peasant, Hans Asen, in 1640. Oslo having been destroyed by fire, King Christian requested the inhabitants to move across the bay, closer to the fortress of Akershus, where he laid out the new town, the present capital of Christiania, 1624. At the mouth of the Otter River he founded the town of Christian Sand, 1643, which afterward became the seat of the bishop instead of Stavanger. King Christian was very often in Norway. The last time was during the year following the Peace of Bromsebro. After a pleasant sojourn of seven weeks he returned to Denmark, where, shortly afterward, he died, February 28, 1648, in the seventy-first year of his life. Christian IV Was first married to Anna Katrina of Brandenburg, who died in 1612. In 1615 he entered into a morganatic marriage with Christine Monk, a lady of noble family, to whom he gave the title of Countess of Schleswig-Holstein, and with whom he lived happily many years. They had several children, among whom was the highly gifted Eleonora Christine, who was married to the Danish nobleman, Korfitz Ulfeld, and who, with her ambitious husband, exerted a great influence over the king during the latter years of his life. Chapter 47 Frederick III 1648-1670, Absolutism Introduced, 1660 after the death of Christian IV. Some months elapsed before the Council of State would agree to elect his son, Frederick III, to the throne. He was finally elected toward the end of the year 1648, after having given the nobility still greater power, by signing a more humiliating charter than any king had yet granted, but it also became the last one. The conditions were such that he could not exercise any of the powers of a king without the consent of the council. During the first nine years of Frederick's reign the country had peace. But the war which then broke out was most fatal in its result. The Swedish king, Charles X, Gustavus, was at war with Poland, and rumor had it that he had suffered serious defeats. Although the country highly needed peace, the army and navy, as well as the finances, being in a miserable condition, King Frederick believed there was an opportunity to recover the lost provinces, and war against Sweden was declared, 1657. But King Charles hastily left Poland and invaded Denmark, and, before the year was closed, he had conquered Holstein, Schleswig and Jutland. The winter being unusually severe, he could march across the ice to the islands of Langland, Lolland, and Falster, and, in February, he stood with his whole army in Zealand, Schieland, and threatened Copenhagen. King Frederick was obliged to sign the peace at Roskilde, February 26, 1658, by which he ceded to Sweden the Norwegian provinces of Bahusland and Thrandjum Stift and the Danish provinces of Scania, Halland, Bleking, and the island of Bornholm. Thus Norway was again deprived of some territory, although the Norwegians, under Iver Crab, after whom the war was called the Crab War, had repulsed the attacks of the Swedes, while General Jorgen Jelk had conquered Gentiland, which, however, had to be evacuated when peace was concluded. Having discovered the great weakness of Denmark, King Charles thought he saw a chance to place the three crowns on his head, and five months later he broke the peace, under some pretext, and again landed with a well-equipped army, with which he besieged Copenhagen. He captured the castle of Kronborg and other points of defense, and arrogantly declared, to the Danish messengers sent to him, that it could matter little whether the king of the Danes was called Charles or Frederick, and that he would explain the causes of the war after Denmark had been taken. At Copenhagen, however, King Charles met a stronger resistance than he had expected. A Dutch fleet, under Admiral Optum, succeeded in forcing its way past Kronborg and the Swedish fleet, and brought provisions and help to the starving citizens. When Charles, during the night of February 10, 1659, tried to take the city by assault, he was repulsed after a desperate conflict, leaving 2,000 dead and wounded in the hands of the Danes. Later in the year King Frederick succeeded in securing the assistance of France, England and Holland. After a conference held at The Hague, a Dutch fleet, under Admiral de Ruyter, was sent to aid the Danes, and in November, 1659, 
the Swedish army was defeated at Nyborg. King Charles, after this defeat, turned his principal attention to Norway, where his forces needed reinforcements. The able Major General Reichwein had proceeded to Thrandjum, shortly after the renewal of the war, with a force of soldiers from the southern part of Norway, and, with the aid of the inhabitants, had driven the Swedes out of Thrandjum Stift. In the south, the citizens of Halden, now Frederikshald, had especially distinguished themselves under the brave Colonel Tun Hvitfeld, the commandant at the fortress, and the merchant, Peter Olofsson Normand. Halden was twice visited by the Swedes, and both attacks were heroically repelled by the citizens. In the beginning of 1660 King Charles sent an army of 5,000 men, under Field Marshal Cag, against Halden, and a vigorous siege was commenced. For six weeks one assault after another was repulsed. About half of the able-bodied citizens had fallen, the town was partly destroyed, and the fortifications were badly damaged. But the Swedish army had also suffered great losses, and on February 23d the siege was discontinued and the army returned home, upon learning of the death of Charles X, at Gothenburg, February 13. The Swedes now desired peace, and King Frederick had no reason to wish to continue the war. He readily concluded a peace with the Queen Regent of Sweden, which was signed at Copenhagen, May 27, 1660. The Swedes relinquished Thrandjum Stift and the island of Gotland, but otherwise the terms of the Peace of Roskildu were confirmed. Denmark was in a miserable condition at the end of the war, without fleet, without money, and hopelessly in debt. In his great need the king summoned the nobles, the clergy, and the burgher class to a diet at Copenhagen. The nobles, as usual, asserted their special privilege of exemption from taxation. But the other estates joined in an appeal to the king for the curtailment of the privileges of the nobles, and proposed a disposal of the crown fiefs to the highest bidders without regard to rank. While these propositions were made, the gates of the city were closed by order of the burgomaster, Hans Nansen, and a strong guard was placed at the doors of the hall where the meeting was held. The nobles, being taken by surprise, were obliged to agree to the payment of the taxes demanded of them. Later, by similar means, the nobles were compelled to assent to an important change in the government. The charter signed by the king at the time of his election was declared void, the Council of State was abolished, and Denmark was declared henceforth to be a hereditary kingdom. Thus, by a bloodless and sudden revolution, King Frederick had become perfect master of the situation. He was authorized to draft a new constitution, which might be for the benefit of all classes, but this constitution never appeared. He prepared a charter setting forth the absolute power of the king, and this document was signed by all classes throughout Denmark. Later he published the so-called Royal Law, which confirmed the absolute power of the king. The only unconditional demands upon him were, that he must belong to the Lutheran Church, that he must reside within the country, and that he must not divide his countries. The effect of the establishment of absolutism in Norway was at first only that the country was placed under one master, the king, instead of the many who had composed the Danish Council of State. Having, since 1537, been ruled principally by Danish nobles, the country gained by having absolutism introduced, as it was placed on an equal footing with Denmark. The king now ruled with the same absolute power in both countries, and the power of the Danish nobles was abolished or greatly reduced. They were obliged to take their share of the burden of taxation, and they suffered a great loss by the abolition of the fiefs. The fiefs were changed into amps, or counties, to be administered by officers appointed and paid regular salaries by the king. The revenues of the state were increased almost fivefold. In the new government, colleges, which superseded the Council of State, citizens without rank of nobility might become members. Thus able citizens, who were not noblemen, obtained a chance to rise to power and dignity. Among those who thus rose to high positions were Peter Schumacher and Kurt Adeller. Kurt Severtsen Adeller was born in Brevik, Norway, December 26, 1622, learned seamanship in Holland under the famous Admiral Tromp and distinguished himself as a brave fighter, first in Dutch, and afterward in Venetian service, against the Turks. Where he performed great heroic deeds. Once he forced his way, with a single ship, 
through a line of 77 Turkish galleys, and another time he boarded the Turkish admiral's ship, fought single-handed with Admiral Ibrahim, and beheaded the admiral with his own sword. Several powers desired to get the experienced naval hero in their service, but Frederick III called him home and made him admiral in the Danish navy. For twelve years he labored with great zeal in establishing an efficient navy for Denmark and Norway, but died in 1675 without having had a chance to make use of it. Frederick III, who had not inherited his great father's affection for Norway, visited this country only once in great haste. He died February 9, 1670, about sixty years old. During his last years he busied himself a great deal with alchemy, and an itinerant Italian, who claimed to know the mystic art, helped him to squander a couple of millions of Danish dollars on this foolishness. The fortress of Frederiksteen and the city of Frederikshald, formerly Halden, were named after Frederick III. Frederick III was married to the proud and ambitious Sophie Amelie of Hesse Castle, who, on account of her jealousy and hatred, caused the king's half sister, Eleanor Christine Ulfeld, to be tried on some false and absurd charges. And imprisoned in Blaytarn, the Blue Tower, in Copenhagen, where she remained for twenty two years. She was liberated on the death of her enemy in 1685. King Frederick's and Sophie Amelie's children were, besides Crown Prince Christian, George, who was married to Queen Anna of England, and Sophie, who was married to John George III. Of Saxony, and became the mother of Augustus II, Ulrika Eleanor, who was married to the Swedish King Charles XI, and became the mother of the famous Charles XII. Frederick Amelie, married to Duke Christian Albrecht of Goderp, and Wilhelmina, married to Prince Charles of the Palatinate. Chapter 48 Christian V, 1670-1699 Christian V, who succeeded his father, Frederick III. In 1670, was the first Danish-Norwegian king who mounted the throne by hereditary right, and was not obliged to sign a charter, dictated by the nobles, in order to be elected. He was a brave and vigorous young man. But he early disappointed those who had placed great hopes in him, as he wasted his time and strength on hunting and other amusements, and left the government to the care of his favorites, who were often incapable and selfish men. He loved pomp and splendor, and sought to imitate the extravagant Louis XIV. Of France, spending much more money than the treasury could afford. He especially fancied everything that was German, and surrounded himself with indigent German noblemen, whom he helped to make their fortunes in Denmark. At court the language spoken was the German, the ministers preached in German, actors played in German, and the highest officers were Germans. As many of the old noble families had withdrawn from the capital, where they no longer exercised their old influence, and had retired to their estates, where they were still powerful on account of their wealth, King Christian determined to secure other support for the throne, created a new and higher nobility, and established the titles and ranks recognized in Germany. Thus he filled his court with counts and barons, and adopted the strict etiquette and ceremonies of the French court. He also established two orders of knighthood, the Order of Dannebrog and the Order of the Elephant. In Norway, the earldom, county, of Lorvik was established, 1671, for the benefit of the king's friend and half-brother, Ulrich Frederick Gildenlove, whose descendants, the counts of Danskild Lorvik, and later Olafelt Lorvik, for a long time owned this beautiful county. The old royal estate Sem, together with the deanery of Tunsberg, was made into another earldom, 1673, for the then very powerful minister of state Griffenfeld, who called himself Count of Griffenfeld and Tunsberg. After he had fallen from grace, this county was transferred to his rival, Gildenlove, who, with the permission of the king, sold a part of it, afterward called Jarlsberg, to the German-born Field Marshal of Norway, Gustav Wilhelm Waddell. The progenitor of the family of Waddell Jarlsberg. Rosendahl, the only barony in Norway, was founded, in 1678, by Ludwig Rosenkranz, a Danish nobleman, who, by marriage, had come into possession of large estates in Bergen Stift. King Christian's advisor was, for some years, the eminent Danish statesman, Peter Griffenfeld. His original name was Peter Schumacher, and he was the son of a wine cellar in Copenhagen. 
His father died in poverty, after which Bishop Brochman took him into his home. Here King Frederick saw him and had him sent abroad for six years at his expense. After his return he became librarian to the king, and occasionally assisted the king in state affairs. On his deathbed the king asked his son to take care of Peter Schumacher, saying, Make a great man of him, but not too rapidly. Christian did not exactly follow this advice, in the following year he made him Count of Tunsberg, with the name of Griffenfeld, and appointed him great chancellor of the realm. Griffenfeld became greatly renowned. The emperor made him an imperial count, and Louis XIV. called him one of the greatest statesmen in the world. But, on account of this, he soon had many jealous rivals at the court, who aroused the king's suspicions as to his loyalty. He was deposed and accused of several great crimes, although some of the acts construed as crimes were acts of statesmanship for which he had deserved the greatest praise. He was condemned to death and brought to the scaffold. But, at the last moment, a message arrived from the king, that the sentence had been commuted to imprisonment for life. This mercy is more cruel than death, exclaimed Griffenfeld. He was first imprisoned in the castle of Copenhagen, and remained there for four years. But as the king missed his able services, and his enemies feared that he might again be put in power, they caused him to be removed to the fortress of Munkholmen at Thrandjum, where he remained for eighteen years. At first he whiled away the time by reading and writing, but later they cruelly took away pen and ink. He wrote numerous apothems in the margins of his books with little bits of lead, which he tore from the window panes, or with coals on the wall. He was given his liberty in 1698, but died the following year, March 11, 1699, in Thrandjum, at the age of 64 years. As the ally of the Elector of Brandenburg, but principally in the hope of recovering the lost provinces, King Christian, against the advice of Griffenfeld, commenced war against the Swedish king, Charles XI. This war, which lasted from 1675 to 1679, was called the Scania War, because that province was the principal scene of action. The Danes captured Wismar in some places in Scania, but lost the battles of Holmstad, Lund, and Landskrona. At sea, however, the Danes were generally successful. Admiral Kort Adeller had put the navy in good condition and had a worthy successor in the naval hero, Niels Jewell, who won victories at Oland and Kalbergerheide, and especially in the great naval battle of Jojbukt, October 4, 1677. As Griffenfeld had foreseen, however, the Danes could accomplish little against the allies of France, and Christian was obliged to accede to peace proposed by Louis XIV. The peace was concluded at Lund, 1679, and all that Christian v. obtained, for his efforts during an expensive four years' war, was permission to take with him ten cannons from each of the conquered fortresses. During this war, which the Norwegians called the Gildenlove feud, after their leader, the brave Ulrich Frederick Gildenlove, the Norwegians several times defeated the Swedes. In February, 1676, Gildenlove marched into Bahus Len with 11,000 men, conquering Utavala and Wenersborg. The following year he took the fortified town of Marstrand by storm and compelled the fortress of Karlston to surrender. In order to prevent the Norwegians from making further progress, the Swedish Chancellor, Magnus de la Gardie, hastened into Bahus Len with 8,000 men, but was defeated by a much smaller Norwegian army, under Major General Hans Lovengel. At Utavala, August 28, 1677. About 1,500 Swedes were slain and 200 were captured, together with 14 pieces of artillery and all the supplies. The following year the ever-active Gildenlove attacked Bahus Castle, which, however, he was unable to capture, as it was defended with great heroism and perseverance. The war ended, on the part of Norway, with an incursion by Gildenlove into Sweden in 1679, in order to avenge a similar expedition which the Swedish general Sperre had made into the region of Thrandjum the previous year. On which occasion the copper works at Roros had been burned. The Norwegian Code of Laws, which is yet partly in force, was elaborated by direction of Christian V., dated April 15, 1687, and published April 14, 1688. He abolished Latin singing in the churches, introduced a new church ritual and a Danish hymn book. 
Christian V. visited Norway only once, 1685. On Davre Mountain he laid the foundation for a monument, with an inscription in the German language. He died August 25, 1699, leaving a debt of 1,110,000 Danish dollars, although he had tried to replenish his treasury by hiring out Norwegian and Danish soldiers as mercenaries to other countries. He was married to the gentle Charlotte Amelie of Hesse Castle. Chapter 49 Frederick IV 1699-1730 At the death of Christian V, his oldest son ascended the throne under the title of Frederick IV. His education had been sadly neglected. But, by untiring industry and energy after his accession to the throne, he gained considerable practical knowledge of the affairs of the government. He gave especial attention to the finances of the country, and, by a careful reduction of all unnecessary expenses, he succeeded in almost obliterating the great public debt. To his discredit, however, it must be admitted that this result was obtained partly with the blood of his subjects, as he secured large sums for the treasury by hiring out to the emperor 8,000, and to England and Holland 12,000. Of the soldiers of Denmark and Norway, for service in the Spanish War about the Order of Succession. These soldiers distinguished themselves and fought with honor in many battles. From his father, King Frederick had inherited certain disputes with Duke Frederick of Holstein, which led to a war. But the Duke received aid from his brother-in-law, the Swedish King, Charles XII, who invaded Zealand, Schieland, and marched against Copenhagen, and King Frederick was obliged to accept a hasty peace at Treventhal, Holstein, August 18, 1700, on unfavorable terms. After the peace at Treventhal Charles XII turned his forces against Russia and Poland, where he won victory after victory, until finally, on the 27th of June, 1709, he lost the Battle of Poltava. On account of the dangerous position in which this defeat placed the Swedish king, King Frederick thought the opportunity had come to recover the lost provinces. He renewed his old allegiance with Russia and Poland, and began the Great Northern War, 1709-1720. With 16,000 men he invaded Scania and captured several towns. But the Swedish field marshal, Magnus Stenbach, hastily gathered an army of undisciplined peasants and defeated the Danes at the Battle of Helsingborg, 1710. In this war also the Danish-Norwegian fleet rendered great service, fighting the Swedish fleet with success in the Baltic and especially in the North Sea. On October 4, 1710, it was attacked by the Swedish fleet in Kjojbukt. The Norwegian, Ivar Hvitfeld, a son of Tun Hvitfeld, who had distinguished himself at Frederikshald, commanded the ship, Danabrog, which took fire early in the fight. He might have saved himself by beaching the ship, but there was danger of thus spreading the fire to the rest of the Danish fleet and to the town. He therefore stayed where he was, drew closer to the enemy and fired volley after volley from the forward guns, until the fire reached the powder magazine. The ship was blown up, and he and his 500 men perished. In the latter part of 1715, Charles XII returned to Sweden, after an absence of 15 years, and succeeded in giving new courage to the Swedes, who were exhausted from the hardships of the long war. The winter was very severe, so that the sound was frozen over, and, in January, 1716, Charles intended to lead his army of 20,000 men across the ice and invade the Danish islands. But, just as he was ready for this exploit, a thaw suddenly set in, so that he could not effect the crossing, and, not having sufficient transports, Charles decided to direct his attacks against Norway. The defences of Norway were in a miserable condition. The trained regiments had been sent south to Denmark, so that the army consisted almost wholly of the National Guards, which were without training, poorly clothed, and without the necessary supplies. The fortresses were short of provisions, arms, and ammunition, and there was no money in the treasury. The commanding general, the old and feeble Barthold von Lutzow, had to confine his operations to garrisoning the silver works at Kongsberg and the principal passes. The natural advantages of the country and the patriotism and perseverance of the inhabitants constituted the principal defense. By three different routes the Swedes invaded Norway. 
Charles himself entered Holland in March, 1716. At the Riser farm the Swedish advance guard was attacked by 200 Norwegian dragoons under the brave Colonel Ulrich Christian Cruz, and, during the fight, the colonel himself killed 15 men and wounded Charles's brother-in-law. The Prince of Hesse After a desperate fight, and the fall of the brave Captain Michelet, Colonel Cruz, who was so severely wounded that he could not hold his sword, surrendered to King Charles with twenty men, sixty lay dead or wounded, and the remainder had escaped. The Swedes had 170 killed and wounded. Charles highly praised his brave opponent, had his own surgeon attend to his wounds, gave him a sword, and asked him if his brother, King Frederick, had many such officers. Cruz answered, Of them he has many, and I am far from being among the ablest. Charles thereupon occupied Christiania and commenced to besiege the fortress of Akershus, but could not accomplish much for lack of heavy artillery. While he lay in camp there he sent out expeditions in different directions. The Swedish colonel, Axel Lowen, was sent out with 600 dragoons to destroy Kongsberg's silver works. He was to proceed by way of Ringerijk, because the road from Drammen was blocked by the Norwegians, and, on the evening of March 28, 1716, he arrived with his force at the Norderhof parsonage, Ringerijk. The parson, the learned Jonas Ramus, was confined to his bed by sickness, but his wife, the intrepid Anna Koldjornsdatter, received the soldiers well in order to avoid plundering. Having learned, by paying close attention to her guests, that it was their intention early the next morning to surprise a number of Norwegian dragoons, who lay encamped at the Steen farm and knew nothing of the arrival of the Swedes. She asked and obtained the permission of the colonel to send her servant girl out to a neighboring farm for something that was needed for the table. Thus she was enabled to send warning to the Norwegians about the plans of the enemy. Under the leadership of Captain Sayest and Sergeant Thor Hovland the Norwegians set out at midnight, and, guided by the fires which Anna had started under pretext of warming the chilly soldiers, they surprised and overpowered the Swedish force. Colonel Lowen was captured, together with 160 men, 30 were killed, and the remainder escaped. In April a Swedish force, under Colonel Falkenberg, was attacked and defeated at Moss by the Norwegians, under the command of Major General Vincent's buddy and Colonel Hvitfeld, who took 400 prisoners and captured a large quantity of supplies. At the parsonage of Skiberg the Swedish general, Astjeberg, lay with 2,000 men and could hear the shooting at Moss. But the parson, Peter Rumor, who had intercepted the correspondence between the Swedes at the parsonage and those at Moss, gave such exaggerated accounts of the defeat of the Swedes and of large reinforcements to the Norwegians. That General Astjeberg hastily broke camp and returned to Sweden. When King Charles, some time afterward, heard of this, he became so enraged at the minister that he caused him to be captured and brought to Sweden, where he died in prison. As the roads were becoming very bad, and Charles feared that the Norwegians contemplated cutting off his retreat, he suddenly withdrew from Christiania and shortly afterward attacked the city of Frederikshald. Here the citizens had armed themselves under the brave brothers Peter and Hans Koldjornsen, nephews of Kielt Stubb, and half-brothers of Anna Koldjornsdatter, and the Swedes had to buy every step with blood. Charles captured the city on the night between the 3d and 4th of July, 1716, and the Norwegians had to retire to the fortress, Frederikstein. That the enemy might not find shelter behind the houses against the shots from the fortress, the citizens put fire to the town. Peter Koldjornsen commenced with his own house, and soon the whole city was in flames. Charles had to withdraw from Frederikstein, with a loss of 1,500 men and three generals, to his headquarters at Torpum, intending to renew the siege as soon as he could get his heavy artillery from his transport ships at Dinekylen, near Sveinsund. But in this hope he was disappointed, as the Norwegian naval hero, Peter Tordenskjold, by a daring attack shortly afterward, succeeded in capturing or destroying the whole transport fleet at Dinekylen. Peter Wessel, afterward ennobled under the name of Tordenskjold, was born November 7, 1691, in Thrandjum, where his father, Jan Wessel, was a merchant. As he showed no disposition for college studies, he was placed with a tailor as apprentice. But he ran away from his master, came to Copenhagen, where he hired out as a sailor, and made journeys to the West Indies and to India. 
Afterward he became a naval cadet, made another trip to India, and on his return came to Bergen just as the Great Northern War had broken out. He immediately proceeded overland to Christiania, where the commanding general, Waldemar Lovendal, took a fancy to him and gave him the command of a ship of four guns, Orman, the Serpent, with which he made cruises along the Swedish coast. He soon became renowned for his courage, and was given a better ship called Lovendal's Galley, a frigate of twenty guns. By his heroic deeds and brilliant bravery he rose, in the comparatively short time of ten years, from cadet to vice-admiral, and was ennobled by King Frederick IV. For your rare courage and loyalty, the king said to him, We have raised you to our nobility. Your name shall hereafter be Tordenskiold, Thundershield. Well, then, answered the young man, I will so thunder in the ears of the Swedes that they will say you have not given me the name without reason. The entrance to the harbour of Dinkylen is at most places only 400 to 450 feet wide. On a little peninsula in the inlet the Swedes had erected a battery of six twelve-pounders, and on each side of the narrow inlet four thousand infantry were stationed. On the evening of July 7, when Tordenskjold lay with two frigates, three galleys and two other vessels outside of Stromstad, he learned from some Swedish fishermen, who were brought aboard as prisoners, where the Swedish fleet lay. And also that a number of the officers had been invited to a wedding, while the admiral was to have a banquet on board for the others. He concluded that the officers, therefore, would be in poor condition for fighting, and at daybreak he weighed anchor, and cried over to the brave Lieutenant Peter Grib, who was commanding the other frigate, I am informed that the Swedish admiral is going to have a carousal on his fleet today. Would it not be advisable if we went in with our ships and became his unbidden guests? The pilot says we have favorable wind. Peter Grib was ready, and Tordenskjold at once steered into the harbor. Without firing a shot he ran his ship in through a heavy fire from all sides. It was not till he came so near that his six-pounders could be of effect, and when he had reached the widest part of the inlet where he could arrange his ships with the broadsides toward the enemy, that he commenced to fire. After three hours of uninterrupted cannonading the Swedish fire began to slacken, and at one o'clock, July 8, 1716, the Swedish flag was lowered. The Swedes had then beached as many of their ships as possible, and soldiers and sailors were trying to save themselves by flight. Tordenskjold's victory was complete, 44 ships, carrying 60 guns, were either burned or sunk. Not a single ship was saved, and the next day King Charles was on his retreat to Sweden. In September, 1718, King Charles again attacked Norway. He sent General Armfelt with 14,000 men into Thrandjum Stift, where the commanding general, W. Buddy, had to confine himself to the defense of the city of Thrandjum. King Charles himself moved against Frederick Steen with 20,000 men and began a vigorous siege. The outer redoubt was stormed and taken after a brave resistance, and the Swedish trenches were only 250 paces from the fortress when King Charles was killed in one of the trenches by a bullet from the fortress, December 11, 1718. A few days later the Swedish army withdrew and returned to Sweden. General Armfelt, on receiving this intelligence, retreated from Thrandjum and started to return to the frontier across the tidal mountains. On the mountain his army was overtaken by a fearful snowstorm, many hundreds froze to death, and many of those who escaped became cripples for life. Frederick IV. Now proceeded to Norway himself, and invaded Sweden with 15,000 men and occupied Stromstad, while Tordenskjold, by daring strategy, took possession of Marstrand and captured the fortress Karlsten. The war, which had lasted eleven years, was ended by a peace, which Charles's sister, Ulrika Eleonora, concluded at Frederiksborg Castle, 1720. By this peace Sweden was compelled to agree never to help the Duke of Holstein to recover Schleswig, to pay 600,000 rixdollars, and to relinquish its right to exemption from tolls in the Orr Sound, a right which Sweden had had since 1645. Peter Tordenskjold lived only a few months after peace had been concluded. He was allowed to make a journey abroad, and at Hanover he thrashed a gambler, Colonel Stahl, who had cheated one of his friends. For this he was challenged to a duel with the colonel, and in their encounter he was killed, November 12, 1720, 
being then a little over 29 years of age. The interests of Norway were often neglected during the reign of Frederick IV. In order to raise money the government sold all the Norwegian churches, and the lands belonging to them, to private parties, because the people, who from time immemorial had owned the churches, could not produce deeds or other documents showing title. The northern districts of Norway were especially neglected. The trade with Finnmarken had, to the great detriment of that part of the country, for a long time been leased to the citizens of Bergen. In 1720 it was sold to three citizens of Copenhagen, and the result was greatly increased distress among the people. During the reign of Frederick IV, two Norwegians distinguished themselves by missionary work. One of them was Thomas von Weston from Thrandjum, who worked with great zeal for the cause of Christianity in Finnmarken. The other was Hans Ejid, a clergyman from Vagen in Nordland, who proceeded to Greenland, where, for years, he indefatigably devoted himself to the work of promoting the spiritual and material welfare of the inhabitants. Frederick IV. Died in 1730, 59 years old. Chapter 50. Christian VI. 1730 to 1746. Christian VI, who succeeded his father, Frederick IV, in 1730, commenced his reign by discharging the most of his father's experienced advisers and friends. The very able Bartholomew Deichmann, bishop at Akershus, who was most highly esteemed during the former reign, was deposed and indicted, but died shortly after his degradation, April, 1731. The king allowed himself to be controlled by his German queen, the proud and extravagant Sophie Magdalena. The language and customs of the country were banished from the court, and a proud and haughty tone introduced. The king rarely spoke with any of his subjects unless they belonged to the higher nobility or were Germans. The queen had a mania for building, and large sums were expended on costly palaces in and about Copenhagen. The Danish-Norwegian church had also been affected by the pietistic revivalism brought about in the German Protestant church by Spener and Frank. Christian himself was a pious man, but his religion was mournful and morbid. He was, to a great extent, controlled by his pietistic court chaplain, Blum. A Sabbath ordinance was enacted, 1735, by which several preposterous rules about church-going were introduced and some antiquated laws were again put in force. Neglect of attendance at church was punished in the cities by money fines, and in the country by being placed in the stocks, which, for that purpose, were erected outside of every church door. Public amusements hitherto considered harmless, dancing, games, and festivities, were forbidden, weddings and social parties were not to be held on a holiday or the evening before. A general church inspection college was established in 1737, a kind of court of inquisition, whose duty it was to watch over the proper performance of church services. The result of this unwise zeal for religion was a general state of hypocrisy and intolerance. Unscrupulous people, who feigned holiness and imitated the pietists at court, were given offices, while those who were sincere and independent were left out. One of the beneficial results of the pietism which ruled during the reign of Christian VI was the introduction of the confirmation in the Lutheran faith. This was introduced upon the advice of court chaplain Blum, by the Ordinance of January 13, 1736. The same year in which the second centennial of the introduction of the Reformation was celebrated. The Confirmation led to an improved Christian education of the people, and indirectly compelled all classes of the people to read. Great zeal was also shown in the printing of Bibles and other religious books, and some improvement was made in the Norwegian Church Organization by an Ordinance of August 13, 1734. The Latin schools were reorganized in 1739, the teachers being given better salaries, while more suitable textbooks were introduced. Some efforts were also made to improve the trade, manufactures and navigation of Norway, but these efforts were not always well directed. The trade with Finnmarken, Iceland and Greenland was leased to companies, whose aim seemed to be the greatest possible extortion. Very unwise and harmful to the country was the king's decree forbidding the people of southern Norway to buy grain from any other country than Denmark. The navy was greatly improved under the supervision of Count Frederick Danskild Samso, Admiral Sum and Constructor Benstrup, 
but their work took large sums of money. Toward the close of this reign Norway suffered a great deal from hard times and famine, in common with the greater part of northern Europe. During the years 1720 and 1741 there died in Norway 31,346 more persons than were born. Many died of starvation, and, in many districts, the people had to make meal from bark, bones and straw. A collection amounting to about 14,000 riksdollars, Danish dollars, was made in Denmark in order to help some of the most needy. During the reign of Christian VI. Lived, the father of the Danish-Norwegian literature, the witty and very productive author, Ludwig Holberg, born in Bergen, 1684, died 1754. Also the active and eloquent Peter Hersleb, born in Thrandjum, 1689, who from 1730 to 1737 was bishop at Akershus, and from 1737, until his death in 1757, bishop of Zealand, and who may be considered the father of the public school system. Two Danish bishops of this time who are held in respectful memory by the Norwegians are Erik Pontopidan, who was bishop in Bergen from 1747 to 1755, author of Explanation of Luther's Catechism, which is still extensively used in the Norwegian schools, and Hans Brorsen, bishop in Ribe, 1694-1764, the author of many church hymns. Christian VI, during his reign of sixteen years, only visited Norway once, in the summer of 1733. He died August 6, 1746, in his forty-seventh year. In spite of the long peace, a flourishing trade, and large subsidies from foreign powers for mercenaries, which he had furnished from Norway and Denmark, he left a debt of over two million riksdollars. Chapter 51 Frederick V, 1746-1766 When Christian VI died, his eldest son, Frederick V, ascended the throne. He was a man of limited intelligence, but of a kindly disposition. By his affability and his taste for the language of the country he stood in sharp contrast with his late father, and he and his lovely young queen, Louisa, daughter of George II. Of England, soon won the hearts of the people. He abolished all the harsh ordinances against amusements, the National Theatre was opened again, and Ludwig Hallberg had the pleasure, in his old age, to again see his comedies played and received with great applause. The change was at first beneficial, especially as long as Queen Louisa lived. But, after her death, in 1751, when her place had been taken by Juliana Marie of Brunswick, the liberal tone at court often degenerated into giddiness and license, and, in an attempt to imitate the French manners. A luxury was introduced which was too expensive for the ordinary resources of the crown. The reign of Frederick V. was, like that of his father, peaceful, although a war with Russia seemed very imminent, when one of the Holstein Goddard princes, Charles Peter Ulrich, had ascended the throne of Russia, under the title of Peter III, and laid claim to a part of the Duchy of Schleswig. A Russian army was sent into Mecklenburg with orders to advance on Holstein, where an army of 70,000 Danish and Norwegian soldiers had been drawn together. The armies lay within a few miles of each other, when the conflict was suddenly averted by the news that Peter III had been deposed, and, shortly afterward, murdered by his wife, July, 1762. The Empress, Catherine II, who succeeded her husband, had always been averse to the war, and a treaty of peace was concluded with her, principally as the result of the able diplomacy of the King's advisor, Count Johann Hartwig Bernstorff. The great preparations for this threatened conflict had, however, necessitated an increase of taxation. The so-called extra tax was felt as a great burden. Every person above twelve years of age had to pay a tax of one riksdollar, about fifty-five cents, per year. This was especially felt as a burden by the common people in the districts around Bergen, where the fisheries had been a failure, and a revolt was the result. About 4,000 peasants armed themselves and made an assault upon the city, maltreated the magistrates, and plundered about 8,000 riksdollars of the public means. Quiet was soon restored, and the participants in the revolt were punished. A few years afterward that extra tax was abolished. 
A great deal was done during this reign for the promotion of science and art, trade, manufactures and agriculture. At Kongsberg a mineral school was established and 200 German experts employed as teachers. The bishop at Thrangem, Johann Gunnerus, rector Gerhard Schoening, and the Danish scholar, Peter Sum, who had married the daughter of a merchant at Thrangem, established the Royal Academy of Sciences in Thrangem. A free school of mathematics, afterward reorganized as the Norwegian Military Academy, was founded in Christiania. Frederick V., who shortened his life by all kinds of excesses, died in his 43rd year, January 14, 1766. He left a public debt of about 20 millions. By his first wife he had one son, Christian, and three daughters, his second wife became the mother of Prince Frederick. Chapter 52 Christian 7 1766-1808 At the death of Frederick V., his son Christian, who was hardly seventeen years of age, ascended the throne. And, shortly afterward, married the fifteen-year-old Caroline Mathilde, a sister of the English king, George III. Christian led a most dissipated life, eventually resulting in insanity. In 1768 the king made a journey abroad, during which his body physician, the German freethinker, Johann Frederick Struensee, became his dearest favorite, and got him completely under his influence. Upon their return the king's old counselors, including the experienced and deserving Bernstorff, were discharged and replaced by a privy council, in which the strong and ambitious Struensee soon became the real master. By the influence which he had gained over the debilitated, and at times insane, king, and the queen, he succeeded in reaching the highest positions. He was made a count and prime minister and became an almost absolute ruler, the cabinet orders being given the force of royal command simply by being signed by Struensee. His power lasted only sixteen months. But during this time he introduced many reforms, which were in themselves commendable, but, in many cases, came too abruptly and without preparation. On account of the violent changes, and his contempt for the Danish language and customs, he soon had many enemies, chief among whom was the Queen Dowager, Juliana Maria, who wished to get her son, the king's half-brother, Prince Frederick, into power. With the aid of the prince's teacher, the learned of Hogue Goldberg, she formed a conspiracy against Struensee and obtained the signature of the insane king to an order for his arrest, together with that of others. On the night of January 17, 1772, after a ball at the palace, Queen Caroline Mathilde, Struensee, Count Brandt, and others, were arrested. The Queen was imprisoned at Kronborg, and afterward at Cell, Hanover, where she died in her twenty-fourth year, 1775. The others were accused of high treason and condemned to death. Struensee was cruelly executed, April 28, 1772. During the following twelve years, 1772 to 1784, Prince Frederick's teacher, Ove Goldberg, virtually conducted the government, and this period has therefore been called the Goldberg period. A great many of Struensee's reforms were revoked, and former rules were re-established. The liberty of the press, which Struensee had granted, was curtailed and a censorship again introduced. The plan of establishing a university in Norway, which had been promised, was given up. Everything was now to be Danish, even Norway. Goldberg even wished to abolish the very name of Norwegian, and wrote, No Norwegian exists. All are citizens of the Danish state. Many of the strong men, whom Struensee had made use of, were removed, and mediocrity was again raised to dignity. In spite of the large revenues which flowed into the treasury during the flourishing commercial period, the public debt, which had been reduced to 16 millions, rose to 29 millions. Still, there are some things to the credit of the Goldberg ministry. Thus the foreign minister, Andreas Bernstorff, by his negotiations, succeeded in removing any cause for conflict with the powerful Russia, when the Russian Grand Duke, Paul, relinquished his part of Holstein to the King of Denmark. In return for Oldenborg and Delmenhorst. On February 15, 1776, the so-called Native Rite was published, an ordinance providing that hereafter only native citizens could be appointed to office under the government. 
Finally, it was ordained that the Danish language should be used both in the army and as a business language. During the long period of peace, since 1720, Norway had made great progress in commerce, shipping and population. The population, which, in 1660, was only 450,000, had reached about 723,000 in 1767, and the merchant marine had grown from 50 to 1,150 ships, many of them large and engaged in trade with distant countries. The peasant class had advanced considerably, as a consequence of the sale of the estates of the crown in order to raise revenue, the number of freeholders was now nearly double that of the tenant farmers. The officials sent their sons to be educated at the University of Copenhagen, so that the country was gradually furnished with a native class of officials, who could replace the Danish and advocate the cause of their countrymen. In 1784 Crown Prince Frederick was confirmed, and immediately took charge of the government as regent for his insane father. He had the sense to surround himself with able counsellors, and the foremost among them was Andreas Bernstorff, a nephew of the elder Bernstorff. While he was at the head of the government, 1784 to 1797, the United Countries had happy and prosperous days. He succeeded in maintaining an honorable neutrality, while the French Revolution, which commenced in 1789, shook Europe and involved nearly all the countries of Europe in war. Much was done for Norway during this period. The trade of Finmarken was made free, and the cities of Tromso, Hammerfest and Vardo were founded. In order to expedite judicial matters four superior courts were established, and, in order to avoid litigation as much as possible, courts of conciliation were introduced in all parts of the country. During Bernstorff's administration, Norway was involved in a short war with Sweden, the Swedish king, Gustavus III, having attacked Russia, whereupon the Russian empress, Catherine II, demanded, according to agreement, an attack upon Sweden by Denmark. A Norwegian army of 10,000 men, under Prince Charles of Hesse, invaded Sweden in the fall of 1788, and, after some successful encounters, marched against Gothenburg. But an armistice was concluded, which was changed into a convention, November 5, the Norwegians agreeing to retire from Sweden. England continued the war with France with great vigor, and, in order to weaken the enemy as much as possible, raised the point with neutral powers that meet, flour and grain must be considered as contraband of war, and should not, therefore, be shipped to France or any other enemy of England. In order to protect their commerce, Denmark-Norway then, in 1800, together with Russia and Sweden, renewed the so-called armed neutrality, which, through the untiring efforts of Andreas Bernstorff, had been agreed upon in 1780. Based upon the principle that, free ship carries free cargo. After an unsuccessful attempt, through negotiations, to persuade Denmark to withdraw from this alliance, England declared war against her, and sent a fleet, under the command of Admirals Parker and Nelson, to Orr Sound. On April 2, 1801, a battle was fought in the roadstead of Copenhagen. Although the Danish and Norwegian sailors defended themselves with great bravery, they finally had to yield to superior force. An armistice was concluded, which, at the death of the Russian Emperor, Paul, ended with a peace, by which Denmark consented to withdraw from the armed neutrality. The country now enjoyed peace until 1807, when a new war with England broke out. At the Peace of Tilsit, July 7, 1807, Emperor Napoleon and Alexander I, of Russia made certain arrangements of European affairs with a view to helping Napoleon in his conflict with England. Russia was to be allowed to conquer Finland from Sweden, and Napoleon was to take possession of the Danish fleet, by means of which he might dispute the dominion of England at sea. Although this agreement was to be kept strictly secret, the English government, in some way, heard of it, and decided to anticipate the action of Napoleon. A strong fleet was sent to Copenhagen, where the British commanders demanded that Denmark should surrender its fleet to England, where it was to remain until peace was concluded between England and France. The demand was answered by the Danish minister, who protested that there was no cause for it, since Denmark had no idea of letting Napoleon have the fleet. The British, however, would not listen to any assurances of Denmark's peaceful attitude. 
An army of about 38,000 men was landed and defeated the Danish force outside of Copenhagen, which, all told, hardly amounted to 10,000 men. Thereafter preparations were made for bombarding the city. The bombardment commenced on September 2d and lasted for three days. During this bombardment the cathedral and 305 other buildings were burned, and 1,200 buildings were, more or less, damaged. Valuable libraries, and collections of art and other valuable property, were destroyed by fire, 1,100 soldiers and citizens were killed and 800 wounded. The Danes had to surrender their whole fleet, which was then brought to England. The English government now gave Denmark the choice between three conditions, neutrality, an alliance, or war. In case of war Denmark was threatened with destruction of the Danish and Norwegian merchant marine, the occupation of Copenhagen by the Swedes, and, possibly, the forcible transfer of Norway to England's ally, Sweden. Crown Prince Frederick answered that, after what had taken place, peace was impossible, and so the war was continued, Denmark entering into a close alliance with France. When it became difficult to maintain communication between Norway and Denmark, the Danish government, in August, 1807, established a government commission for Norway, consisting of Prince Christian August of Augustenborg as chairman. Stiftungmand Gerhard Malka, Justice Ennevold Falsen, and Chamberlain Marcus Rosencrantz. Prince Christian August was commander of the troops in the southern part of Norway, having been appointed as such in 1805. He was greatly beloved by the Norwegians. After having performed its arduous duties for three months, the commission lost its ablest member, Ennevold Falsen, whose body was found in the bay, November 17, 1807. His health had been greatly impaired, and he had probably been driven to suicide by his sufferings. While performing his duties on the government commission, he also edited the journal, Budstikken, in which he did much to arouse and maintain the courage and perseverance of the people. He was succeeded, in January, 1808, by Count Hermann Waddell Jarlsberg, who had gained the high respect of his countrymen by the zeal and vigor which he had shown in his efforts to provide the famine-threatened country with the necessary grain by importation from Denmark, which numerous British cruisers tried to prevent. Chapter 53 Frederick VI. 1808-1814. When, on the death of his insane father, Frederick VI. changed his title of regent to that of King of Denmark, his domains were in a sad condition. They were at war with England, but had no fleet. The finances were in great disorder, which became still worse when the Danish government tried to improve the situation by issuing a large amount of paper currency. The English men-of-war blocked the navigation, and hundreds of Danish and Norwegian trading ships, together with their cargoes, were seized by the enemy. In Norway, all industries were paralyzed, there had been failures of crops, and there was a great deal of want and suffering. When the Danish government, as the ally of France and Russia, also declared war on Sweden, the situation was most desperate. The government commission was daily begged, by petition, to open the public grain magazines to relieve the distress of the people. And it taxed their judgment and firmness to the utmost to control the situation and distribute aid where the need was most pressing. In this condition Norway was attacked, in April, 1808, by a large Swedish army under the command of General Armfelt and threatened by a British army and fleet, which lay at Gothenburg. In the hour of distress and danger, however, the Norwegians had awakened to a consciousness of the fact that they had only themselves to rely upon, and, during their struggles, they showed a patriotism which shunned no sacrifice. Men like Marcus Rosencrantz, Peter Anker, Hermann Waddell, Jacob All, Severin Lovenskeld, Tegesen, John Collett, Ludwig Maribo, and many other patriots, offered their time, energy, and fortunes to the service of the country. And the popular commander, Prince Christian August, was strengthened and aided by a strong national spirit among all classes, when he made his preparations to meet the enemy. General Armfelt, on April 17, 1808, advanced toward the fortress of Kongsvinger, and a battle was fought at Lyre, near that place. The Swedes were at first repulsed, but later received reinforcements and compelled the Norwegians to retreat across the Glamen River. 
It is said that some of the Norwegian troops had to cease firing, during the battle, for want of ammunition. About the same time a Swedish force captured the Blaker Redoubt, about 25 miles to the southwest of Kongsvinger, but this position they soon afterward abandoned. Upon hearing of the approach of a Norwegian force which had been hurriedly dispatched against them by Christian August. The Norwegians proceeded beyond Blaker, and at Tavarad, in Erskog Parish, Romerike, surrounded, and, after a sharp fight, captured a Swedish force under Count Axel Morner. On April 24 a Swedish force, under Colonel Gann, crossed the frontier and marched along the left bank of the Flizen River, a tributary of the Glamen. Near Trangen, in Osney's parish, Solor, they were attacked by the Norwegians, and, after a fight of three hours and a half, the Swedes surrendered, having suffered a loss of 200 killed and wounded. About 330 men, including Colonel Gann, were taken prisoners. The Norwegians were also successful in a battle fought on June 10 at Prestback in Aningdal, in the southern part of Smailneen, near Sveinsund. The attack was made early in the morning, and, after a desperate fight, the Swedes were forced to surrender, 445 men, including 27 officers, being taken prisoners. A large amount of arms and ammunition was also taken. A few days later the Swedish force which was commanded by General Armfelt's aide de camp George Adlersbar, received large reinforcements and recaptured the lost positions in Inningdal. But, shortly afterward, the Swedish troops again retreated, the Swedish government desiring to give more attention to the war in Finland. Negotiations were now opened for an armistice. King Frederick VI. Several times requested Christian August to invade Sweden with his army but the prince, as well as his tried advisers, considered an invasion very unwise, the army being destitute of all necessary supplies. An armistice was finally entered into on December 7, 1808. A definite peace was not concluded till a year later. Great changes took place in Sweden during the following year. King Gustavus IV Adolphus had shown great incompetence in the management of the affairs of Sweden, and after the reverses in Finland, resulting in the loss of this province, the feeling against the king became very strong. Early in 1809 rumors began to circulate of the renewal of an old project, by which Napoleon and Alexander I had agreed to divide Sweden between Denmark and Russia, and great excitement was created among the leading men in Sweden. A conspiracy was formed by a number of influential men, including George Adlerspar, who marched with his army toward Stockholm. On March 13, 1809, the king was arrested and brought to the castle of Drottningholm, and a few days later to Gripsholm Castle, where finally he was induced to write and sign an unconditional abdication. He was later transported to Pomerania, and from there proceeded to Switzerland. When King Gustavus had abdicated, his aged uncle, Charles, Duke of Sodermanland, was prevailed upon to take charge of the government as regent. The Swedish Diet, which met in May, 1809, confirmed the deposition of King Gustavus and elected Charles King under the title of Charles XIII. The newly elected king being old and childless, a successor to the throne also had to be chosen, and the choice fell upon the general-in-chief of the Norwegian army, Prince Christian August. Whom the Swedes also had learned to respect during the war, and whose election, it was supposed by many, would eventually result in uniting Norway with Sweden. After peace had been concluded between Denmark and Sweden, at Jönköping, December 10, 1809, Prince Christian August accepted the election as Crown Prince of Sweden, his name being changed to Charles, or Karl, August. No royal or princely person had ever, to such a degree, won the affection of the Norwegians. He left Norway for Sweden January 4, 1810, accompanied by the blessings and well-wishes of the whole people. Only a few months later, May 28, 1810, he suddenly died during a military review. Shortly before the prince's departure from Norway, and at the suggestion of Count Waddell and other patriotic men, a society was founded in Christiania under the name of the Society for Norway's Welfare. Which did much to encourage the feeling of independence and the national spirit in the country and to advocate the wishes of the people. Thus the long-felt want of a national university was strongly set forth by Count Waddell. The government having pointed to the lack of money, 
such an amount was collected by voluntary subscriptions from the whole country, especially the cities, that King Frederick at last yielded, and, by royal decree. The Norwegian University was established September 2, 1811, and given the name of the king. This event was celebrated with great joy by the Norwegian people by a national festival, December 11, 1811. The condition of the country, however, became very serious during the next year. Failure of the crops caused a famine, and the use of bark bread became quite general throughout the country. The paper currency became more and more depreciated, and the government was finally obliged to partially default payment. The British continued to prevent all importation, and the distress was increased by the breaking out of a new war between Denmark and Sweden. During the distressing years of war, when a foreign fleet intercepted the communication with Denmark, many Norwegians had become convinced that the union with Denmark was a very unnatural one. Many able and patriotic men believed that a union or a strong defensive alliance with Sweden would be much more advantageous to the country, and no doubt many considered such a union among the future probabilities. When the beloved Prince Christian August was elected Crown Prince of Sweden, the sorrow that was felt in Norway at the sudden death of Christian August was universal. A rumor, probably unfounded, that he had been poisoned by some of his opponents in Sweden, was, for a time at least, generally believed in Norway, and extinguished, for the time being. Any desire that may have existed in Norway for a union of the two countries. In Sweden, however, the plan grew in strength, especially after the election of the new crown prince. Chapter 54 Marshal Bernadotte The election of a new successor to the Swedish throne was no easy problem. Under the conditions prevailing in Europe it was thought necessary to make a choice that would be approved by Napoleon, and it had even been suggested that it might be necessary to elect one of Napoleon's marshals. Among the different candidates considered, the most popular one was the Duke of Augustenborg, an elder brother of Prince Christian August. His election was opposed by King Frederick VI. Of Denmark, who hoped to be chosen himself, and held out as inducement a promise to give each of the three countries a constitution. King Frederick at first had the support of quite a party in the Swedish Diet. But his opponents strongly argued that to make the Danish king successor to the Swedish throne would eventually result in Sweden becoming a province of Denmark, and the Duke of Augustenborg, who was supported by King Charles XIII, was the choice of a majority in the Swedish Diet. A messenger, Baron Morner, was sent to Paris to ascertain whether such an election would have the approval of Napoleon. But upon arriving in Paris he was told that, according to the latest reports, the election of the Danish king was being seriously considered, and believing that this would be a great misfortune. The baron took upon himself to open negotiations with one of Napoleon's marshals, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, Prince of Pontecorvo, and requested him to become a candidate for the Swedish succession. After a conference with Napoleon and a consultation with the Swedish minister in Paris, Bernadotte declared himself willing to accept the election, if it were offered to him. When Baron Morner returned to Sweden and reported the result of his unauthorized step, he caused great surprise, and the king ordered his arrest. But, on second thought, the plan to elect Bernadotte was generally favorably considered by leading men in Sweden. Count Platten had a consultation with his Norwegian friend, Count Waddell, and the latter, who had made the personal acquaintance of Bernadotte, advised the Swedes to elect him in preference to the Duke of Augustenborg. The result was that in August, 1810, the Swedish Diet, with practical unanimity, elected Bernadotte Crown Prince of Sweden and King Charles XIII. Adopted him as his son, under the name of Charles John, Karl Johan. When, in September, 1810, Bernadotte was about to leave Paris for Sweden, and Napoleon asked him to promise never to wage war on France, he declined to bind himself by such a promise, but assured the emperor of his sincere friendship. Go, then, said Napoleon, and let us fulfill our several destinies. Crown Prince Charles John, on his arrival in Sweden, immediately assumed the chief control of the government, and set about the very difficult task of raising the country from the wretched and defenseless condition into which it had fallen. Sweden was at the time practically at the mercy of the great powers. Napoleon forced Sweden to declare war on England, and when, 
a year later, he found that this war was not carried on with satisfactory vigor, he sent an army into Swedish Pomerania, which he occupied. While two Swedish regiments were sent as prisoners to France, January, 1812. This caused Charles John to look around for other alliances, which would be of greater benefit to his adopted country. He once more offered Napoleon the faithful services of Sweden, on condition that Sweden was to receive Norway in compensation. But Napoleon would not listen to any proposition to take anything from his faithful ally, Denmark. Charles John immediately opened negotiations with Russia, and the result was a secret treaty, concluded at St. Petersburg, April 18, 1812, by which Russia promised to help Sweden, by negotiations or force of arms, to acquire Norway, and Russia was guaranteed the possession of Finland. While Charles John was to take an active part in the military operations in Germany against Napoleon. This agreement was confirmed at a personal meeting between the Russian Emperor Alexander and Crown Prince Charles John at ABO, Finland, August 27, 1812. The stipulation that Norway was to be united with Sweden was afterward also agreed to by the other powers at war with France. Charles John took an active part in the great campaign against Napoleon in Germany. After the complete defeat of Napoleon's army at Leipzig, October 16 to 19, 1813, Charles John marched with an army of 40,000 men into Holstein in order to compel Denmark to cede Norway. The Danish Norwegian army in Holstein and Schleswig made a brave defense, but the resistance against the overwhelming force of the enemy could not last long, and Frederick VI was compelled to conclude peace at Kiel, January 14, 1814 where Norway was ceded to Sweden. The Norwegian dependencies, Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and Greenland, were not included in the session. Four days later King Frederick VI, for himself and his successors, relinquished all his rights to the Kingdom of Norway to the Swedish King, Charles XIII, and his successors. In his proclamation to the Norwegians, King Frederick released them from their oath of allegiance, and requested them to peaceably and quietly transfer their allegiance to the Swedish king. Thus ended the union between Denmark and Norway, which had lasted for more than 400 years. Chapter 55 Norway declares her independence. Prince Christian Frederick, a cousin of King Frederick VI, an heir presumptive to the Danish Norwegian throne, had, in May, 1813, been sent up to Norway as viceroy, stadtholder, and had become very popular with the Norwegians. When, on January 24, 1814, he received the message from the king, informing him of the Treaty of Kiel and commanding him to transfer the forts and the public offices to the Swedes and return to Denmark. Christian Frederick became highly indignant and resolved not to obey the commands. In his diary the prince wrote, that the king could believe that the Norwegian people will voluntarily surrender, and that he could believe me base enough to desert them now, indeed, I do not understand it. People would be justified in throwing stones after me, if ever I were able to deceive a nation which loves me and places its trust in me. I should leave it now without so much as trying to defend it, never in the world, while I live. On a journey, which the prince made north to Thrandjum, he found that the people all wished to defend the independence of Norway. And on the 16th and 17th of February he held a conference with notables at Eidsvold in order to discuss the needs of the hour. It was at first the idea of the prince that, since the king had relinquished the throne, he, as the legal heir, might ascend the throne of Norway as absolute monarch. But the members of the meeting at Eidsvold, especially Professor George Sverdrup, convinced him that, as King Frederick, contrary to law, had relinquished Norway, the sovereignty had now reverted to the Norwegian people, who thus recovered their natural right to adopt their own constitution and choose their executive. According to his diary the prince said at the meeting, I have heard with great pleasure a speech made to me at a private audience by Professor Sverdrup, in which he conjured me not to place the crown on my head in a manner which was contrary to the views of the most enlightened men of the nation. The rights which Frederick VI has relinquished revert to the people, and it is from their hands that you must receive a crown which will be far more glorious when you owe it to the love of the people. The result was that Christian Frederick took temporary charge of the government as regent, 
and issued a call for a constitutional convention or diet, consisting of representatives of the people from all parts of the country. In all his efforts, by the aid of the great powers and by force of arms against Denmark, to secure Norway for the King of Sweden, Charles John had never taken the will or desire of the Norwegians themselves into consideration. While Count Waddell, who considered a union with Sweden desirable or necessary, had emphatically declared that Norway would never consent to a union attempted by force. Crown Prince Charles John said that a people which for centuries had tolerated the supremacy of a foreign power without a murmur would not seriously resist a change of masters. The Swedish king issued a proclamation to the Norwegians, in which he promised to give them a constitution, and he appointed a viceroy for Norway, but his offers were rejected. The Swedish army being occupied in Germany, with the war against Napoleon, there was no force available with which to enforce the Swedish demands, and this gave the Norwegians time to arrange their own affairs. But there was considerable suffering in the country, because the British, upon learning that the Norwegians would not accept the Treaty of Kiel, sent their fleet to prevent the importation of grain to Norway. The Diet, which met at Eidsvold, April 10, 1814, consisted of 112 representatives. There were 33 army officers, 14 clergymen, 26 other officials, 23 farmers, 12 merchants, and 4 mine owners and landed proprietors. There were two parties in the convention. The most numerous one was the so-called Party of Independence, whose principal leaders were Judge Christian Magnus Falsen, Professor George Sverdrup, Judge Christie, and Captain Motzfeldt. The other party, which numbered about 30 members, favored a union with Sweden, and was called the Swedish Party, although hardly any of them advocated their policy from any love for the Swedes, but rather from what they considered a necessity. Believing that Norway would not, under the circumstances, be able single-handed to maintain her independence. The prominent men of this party were Count Waddell Jarlsberg, Chamberlain Peter Anker, mine owner Jacob All, Ampmand, Prefect, Lovenskeld, and the Reverend Nikolai Wurgeland. But all members agreed in the demand that Norway must henceforth have a liberal constitution. The following were agreed upon as the fundamental principles of the constitution. 1. Norway shall be a limited, hereditary monarchy. It shall be a free, independent and indivisible kingdom, and the ruler shall have the title of king. 2. The people shall exercise the legislative power through their representatives. 3. The people shall alone have the right to levy taxes through their representatives. 4. The right to declare war and to make peace rests with the king. 5. The king shall have the right of pardon. 6. The judicial power shall be separate from the legislative and executive power. 7. There shall be liberty of the press. 8. The evangelical Lutheran religion shall remain the religion of the state and of the king. 9. Personal or mixed hereditary privileges shall not be granted to anybody in the future. 10. All citizens, irrespective of station, birth, or property, shall be required to render military service for a certain length of time. Upon the basis of these principles the Constitution was drawn and finally adopted on the 17th day of May, 1814. On the same day Christian Frederick was elected King of Norway. He accepted the election and solemnly made oath to the Constitution, May 19, whereupon the members of the Diet swore allegiance to the Constitution and to the new King. They held their last meeting on May 20, in order to sign the record of the proceedings. That done, they formed a circular chain, each person giving his right hand to his neighbor on the left, and his left hand to his neighbor on the right, and standing thus, hand in hand, they all exclaimed in chorus, United and True. Until Davra, Mountain, Falls. Chapter 56 War with Sweden, Union of November 4, 1814 After the final defeat of Napoleon, the Allied powers, Russia, Prussia, Austria, and England, granted the request of Charles John and promised to urge Norway to accept the supremacy of Sweden. The special envoys of the powers arrived in Christiania, June 30, 1814, bringing with them, besides their instructions from their respective governments, a letter from the Danish king to Christian Frederick, in which the latter was again commanded. 
under pain of being disinherited and otherwise punished, to abdicate and return to Denmark. The day after their arrival the commissioners had an audience with King Christian Frederick and acquainted him with the intention of the powers to demand the acceptance of the provisions in the Treaty of Kiel. The king declared himself willing to convene the Storting, Parliament, in extra session, in order to open negotiations for a peaceable union, if, in the meantime, the powers would guarantee an armistice and allow the free importation of breadstuffs. But when the commissioners demanded that the Norwegians should surrender to the mercy of the Swedish king, and allow the forts to be occupied by Swedish soldiers, the king declined to accept their propositions, and war commenced. The Norwegian army, which stood along the frontier, was poorly equipped and ill-provided with clothing and provisions. The king himself was no great soldier, and the information that all the foreign powers were against Norway had considerably lessened his courage. The Swedish fleet, under the personal command of Charles XIII, took up a position outside of Frederikstad, which was insufficiently defended and was compelled to surrender, August 4. About the same time, the main Swedish army, under Charles John, crossed the frontier south of Frederikshald. One division of it laid siege to the fortress of Frederikstein, which was bravely defended by General Ohm. The Norwegian army was eager for a general action. But the king, who thought this would be unwise, ordered a retreat across the Glamen River. North in Solor, where Lieutenant Colonel Krebs had the command, the Norwegian forces were much more successful. A Swedish force, under General Gann, crossed the frontier and marched in the direction of Kongsvinger, but was defeated by the Norwegians at Lyre, August 2. The Norwegians, under Colonel Krebs, afterward attacked the Swedes at Matrand and drove them back across the frontier, August 5. The battle at Matrand was the most bloody encounter during this war. General Gann's loss, in killed, wounded, or captured, was 16 officers, 7 non-commissioned officers and 312 men. The Norwegian loss, in killed, wounded or captured, was 5 officers, 4 non-commissioned officers and 130 men. The number of dead was about equal on both sides, about 50 men. Of the wounded there was 64 on the Norwegian, and 126 on the Swedish side. On August 5, Charles John took steps to communicate with the Norwegians with a view to the arrangement of an armistice, offering to recognize the Norwegian constitution of May 17, if Norway would agree to a union with Sweden. The result of these negotiations was the convention signed at Moss, August 14, by which Christian Frederick promised to call an extra session at the Storting to negotiate with the Swedish king through commissioners appointed by him. He also solemnly agreed to surrender the executive power entrusted to him into the hands of the nation, in the meantime the country east of the river Glamen and the fortress of Frederikstein were to be occupied by Swedish troops. According to a secret agreement Christian Frederick was, under some pretext, to immediately transfer the executive power to the ministers who were to conduct the necessary functions of the government until the Storting had definitely decided upon the future form of government. This ended the war, which had not been a very bloody one. The loss, in killed, wounded, and captured, was about equal on both sides, namely, about 400 dead and wounded and 300 prisoners. On the 16th day of August Christian Frederick issued a proclamation ordering elections to an extraordinary Storting to be opened at Christiania, October 7, and on August 19 he ordered the cabinet to take charge of the executive power. Signing all executive acts, by high command. The storting met at the time designated, the number of representatives being 80, of whom about 20 had been members of the Diet at Eidsvold. The storting was solemnly opened by the oldest minister in the name of King Christian Frederick. Two days later a committee of the storting, at the request of the king, had an audience with him at his residence on Bigdo, when he surrendered the Norwegian crown into the hands of the people. And for himself and his descendants relinquished all rights to the country. On the same day he went on board a ship and sailed from Norway. 14 The Storting now, under the presidency of Judge Christie, began negotiations with the commissioners of the Swedish king, and on the 20th day of October it was decided, by 72 votes in the affirmative to 5 in the negative. 
that Norway as an independent state, upon certain conditions, was to be united with Sweden under the same king. The changes in the constitution made necessary by reason of the union with Sweden were then made and finally ratified, November 4, 1814, and, on the same day, Charles XIII. was unanimously elected King of Norway. A committee of the Storting, headed by Count Waddell Jarlsberg, was sent to crown Prince Charles John at Frederikshald, to inform him of the action of the Storting. Whereupon Charles John and his son, Prince Oscar, proceeded to Christiania and delivered to the Storting the King's written oath to the Constitution. As soon as the report of the action of the Norwegian Storting had reached Stockholm, the Swedish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lars Vaughan and Gestrum, dispatched a circular to each of the Swedish representatives at the foreign courts, informing them of the union of Norway and Sweden. In this circular the minister said, The Norwegian Storting having, of its own accord and by a free election, chosen His Swedish Majesty as King of Norway, it is plain that it is not to the provisions of the Treaty of Kiel, but to the confidence of the Norwegian people, that we owe the union of Norway with Sweden. Chapter 57 the Union with Sweden. The first Storting, Parliament, after the Union had been accomplished, remained in session a year, and together with the Swedish Diet adopted the Act of Union, or Riggs Act, 1815. Based upon the Norwegian Constitution in defining the terms of the Union. At the same time, the Supreme Court of Norway was established in Christiania. The Bank of Norway was established at Thrandjum in 1816. At the death of Charles XIII, in 1818, Charles John ascended the throne of both countries as Charles XIV. John. On several occasions there was friction between the king and the Norwegian Storting. At the Treaty of Kiel, Charles John had promised that Norway would assume a part of the Norwegian-Danish public debt. But as the Norwegians had never acknowledged this treaty, they held that it was not their duty to pay any part of the debt, and declared besides that Norway was not able to do so. But as the powers had agreed to help Denmark to enforce her claims, a compromise was effected in 1821, by which the Storting agreed to pay $3 million, the king relinquishing his civil list for a certain number of years. The same Storting adopted the law abolishing the nobility in Norway. This step was also strongly opposed by Charles John, but as it had been adopted by three successive Stortings, the act under the constitution became a law in spite of any veto. It was believed by many that the maneuvers of Norwegian and Swedish troops and the Swedish fleet, which was collected at Christiania at the time that these matters were under consideration, had been called together by the king in order to intimidate the Storting. For a number of years there existed a want of confidence between the king and the Norwegian people. The king did not like the democratic spirit of the Norwegians, and the reactionary tendencies of his European allies had quite an influence upon his actions. In 1821 he proposed ten amendments to the constitution, looking to an increase of the royal power, among which was one giving the king an absolute instead of a suspensive veto. Another giving him the right to appoint the presidents of the Storting, and a third authorizing him to dissolve the Storting at any time. But these amendments met the most ardent opposition in the Storting, especially from the former cabinet minister, Christian Crow, and were unanimously rejected by the Storting in 1824. The king renewed these propositions before several successive Stortings, but they were each time rejected. When the Norwegians commenced to celebrate the anniversary of the adoption of the constitution, May 17, the king thought he saw in this a sign of a disloyal spirit, because they did not rather celebrate the union with Sweden. And he forbade the public celebration of the day. The result of this was that, Independence Day, was celebrated with so much greater eagerness. The students at the university especially took an active part under the leadership of that champion of liberty, the poet Henrik Wergeland, born 1808, died 1845. The unwise prohibition was the cause of the marketplace battle, in Christiania, May 17, 1829, when the troops were called out, and General Waddell dispersed the crowds that had assembled in the marketplace. There was also dissatisfaction in Norway, because a Swedish viceroy, Stadtholder, was placed at the head of the government, and because their ships had to sail under the Swedish flag. The French July Revolution of 1830, 
which started the liberal movement throughout Europe, also had its influence in Norway. Liberal newspapers were established at the capital, and the democratic character of the storting became more pronounced, especially after 1833, when the farmers commenced to take an active part in the elections. Prominent among them was old Gabriel Uland. The king was so displeased with the majority in the storting of 1836 that he suddenly dissolved it. But the storting answered this action by impeaching the Minister of State, Lovenskield, for not having dissuaded the king from taking such a step. Lovenskield was sentenced to pay a fine. The king then yielded and reconvened the storting. He also took a step toward conciliating the Norwegians by appointing their countryman, Count Waddell Jarlsberg, as viceroy. This action was much appreciated in Norway. During the last years of this reign there existed the best of understanding between the king and the people. Charles John's great benevolence tended to increase the affection of the people, and he was sincerely mourned at his death, March 8, 1844, Charles XIV. John being then eighty years old. Charles John was succeeded by his son, Oscar I. Who very soon won the love of the Norwegians. One of his first acts was to give Norway her own commercial flag and other outward signs of her equality with Sweden. His father had always signed himself King of Sweden and Norway. But King Oscar adopted the rule to sign all documents pertaining to the government of Norway as King of Norway and Sweden. During the war between Germany and Denmark, King Oscar gathered a Swedish Norwegian army in Scania, and he succeeded in arranging the Armistice of Malmo in 1848. The war broke out anew, however, the following year, and he then occupied northern Schleswig with Norwegian and Swedish troops, pending the negotiations for peace between Germany and Denmark. During the Crimean War, King Oscar made a treaty with England and France, 1855, by which the latter powers promised to help Sweden and Norway in case of any attack from Russia. General contentment prevailed during the happy reign of King Oscar, and the prosperity, commerce and population of the country increased steadily. These satisfactory conditions did not, however, result in any weakening of the national feeling, and the Storting, in 1857, declined to promote a plan, prepared by a joint Swedish and Norwegian commission, looking to a strengthening of the Union. After a sickness of two years, during which his eldest son, Crown Prince Charles, had charge of the government as Prince Regent, King Oscar I, died in July, 1859, at the age of sixty years. He was married to Josephine of Luchtenberg, daughter of Napoleon's stepson, Jean Beauharnais. Charles XV was thirty-three years old when he ascended the throne. The progress in the material welfare of the country was continued during his reign, and, like his father, he was very popular. Numerous roads and railways were started, all parts of the country were connected by telegraph, and the merchant marine grew to be one of the largest in the world. In 1869 a law was passed providing for annual sessions of the storting instead of triennial as heretofore. The first storting under Charles XV, with only two negative votes, resolved to abolish the right of the king to appoint a viceroy, stadtholder, for Norway. This action of the storting enraged the ruling party in the Swedish Diet, who claimed a right to be consulted in this matter, in which they considered that Sweden had an interest, and they demanded a revision of the terms of the Union. A serious conflict was avoided for the time being, the king vetoing the resolution of the storting. Not till 1865 were negotiations opened for a revision. A joint committee was appointed to prepare a plan. But the question was not solved for the Storting, in 1870, rejected the plan proposed by the committee. Charles XV died September 18, 1872, and, having no sons, was succeeded by his younger brother, Oscar II. The King and the Storting at first showed themselves mutually accommodating. The Storting appropriated the necessary funds for the expense of the coronation at Thrandjum, July 18, 1873, while the king sanctioned the bill abolishing the office of stadtholder. But in 1880 the difference between the Storting and the ministry had brought on a sharp conflict. The liberal majority of the Storting, in order to introduce parliamentarism, 
had three times adopted an amendment to the Constitution admitting the cabinet ministers to participation in the debates of the storting. And each time the measure had been vetoed by the king. The king, supported by the Conservative Party and by the opinion of the Faculty of Law of the University, claimed that the Constitution was a contract between the people and the royal house, and could not, therefore, be changed without the sanction of the king, who thus had an absolute veto in the matter of amendments to the Constitution. The Liberal Party claimed that in constitutional amendments, as well as in the matter of ordinary laws, the king had only a suspensive veto. And on the 9th of June, 1880, the Storting adopted a resolution declaring that the amendment providing for the attendance of the cabinet ministers at the meetings of the Storting was law in spite of the veto. The conflict steadily grew sharper, and in 1883 the members of the ministry, headed by Minister of State Selmer, were impeached for failure to promulgate the resolution of June 9, 1880. The ministers were found guilty and removed from office in the spring of 1884. The king once more tried a ministry which was not in accord with the majority of the Storting, the so-called April Ministry, headed by Schwiegard. But the latter soon resigned, and in June, 1884, the king finally called upon Johann Sverdrup, the acknowledged leader of the liberal majority, the left, to form a ministry. The king now signed the constitutional amendment, and Sverdrup and his colleagues took their seats in the Storting. For a time the legislative and the executive power worked in harmony, and several liberal reforms were introduced. A reorganization of the army in accordance with the views of the majority was brought about, the suffrage was extended, and trial by jury was introduced. In 1887, however, when the government introduced a bill for a new church law, a division in the party of the left had taken place, and Sverdrup found himself without a majority in the storting. He retained office until after the elections of 1888, which resulted in three legislative parties, the left, the moderate, and the conservative, or right. Neither of them had a majority in the storting. Sverdrup resigned, July, 1889, and the conservative leader, Emil Stang, formed a new ministry. At the elections in 1891, the pure left, having made a separate consular service independent of Sweden the main issue of the campaign, again obtained a majority, and their leader, Rector Steen, became the chief of the new ministry. The principal occasion of this movement was the rapid increase in Norwegian commercial interests, which, as was claimed, were imperfectly protected by a joint consular service. The Steen ministry resigned in May, 1893, and a ministry from the minority was formed by Stang. On June 7, 1895, the Storting adopted a resolution declaring that, with a ministry possessing the confidence of the Storting, it would be willing to negotiate with Sweden for a peaceable settlement of the matters in dispute. A coalition ministry, consisting of members from each of the three political groups and headed by Hagerup, was appointed in October, 1895, and a joint Swedish and Norwegian Union committee was chosen to adjust disputed points. This committee, having failed to reach any agreement, was discharged in 1897. At the elections of 1897 the left obtained an increased majority in the Storting, and, in February, 1898, the Hagerup ministry resigned, and Steen was again placed at the head of a ministry. The Storting of 1898-99 adopted a constitutional amendment extending the suffrage to all male citizens who have attained the age of 25 years. A bill was also passed, for the third time, removing from the Norwegian merchant flag the Union Jack, the symbol of the Union with Sweden. This bill was twice vetoed by the King. But, after its third passage, was promulgated, having been passed, according to the Constitution, over the royal veto. The secession movement was largely in abeyance during the years 1900-1902, owing to the popular fear of a Russian invasion. However, in 1903, the anti-Union sentiment again came strongly to the front, reaching an acute stage in March, 1905, when a new cabinet, headed by Peter Christian Michelson, was formed. A bill demanding separate consular service was again passed by the Storting, only to be vetoed by the Swedish Crown. Compromise measures were proposed and rejected. In June the cabinet offered its resignation, which was refused by the king on the ground that a new ministry could not be formed in the existing state of feeling in Norway. 
the cabinet, thereupon, delegated its powers to the Storting. Which immediately passed a resolution declaring the dissolution of union between Sweden and Norway on the ground of the king's inability to conduct the government and his constructive relinquishment of authority. At the same time, a letter was addressed to the King of Sweden expressing Norway's desire for the continuation of peaceful relations, and asking that a prince of the royal house of Sweden be designated as King of Norway. The latter request was refused, but other matters were adjusted by a joint commission. The crown was finally offered to Charles, Crown Prince of Denmark, and son-in-law of King Edward of England, who was elected by a popular majority of 259,563 against 69,264, and assumed the throne November 20 under the name Haakon VII. Chapter 58 Norwegian Literature The people who emigrated from Norway and settled in Iceland, after Harald the Fair-haired had subdued the many independent chiefs and established the monarchy, 872, for the most part belonged to the flower of the nation. And Iceland naturally became the home of the Old Norse literature. Among the oldest poetical works of this literature is the so-called Elder Edda, also called Seamund's Edda, because for a long time it was believed to be the work of the Icelander Seamund. The Younger Edda, also called Snor's Edda, because it is supposed to have been written by Snor Sturluson, born 1178, died 1241, contains a synopsis of the Old Norse religion and a treatise on the art of poetry. Fully as important as the numerous poetical works of that period was the Old Norse saga literature. Fifteen The most prominent work in this field is Snor Sturluson's Heimskringla, which gives the sagas of the kings of Norway from the beginning down to 1177. A continuation of the Heimskringla, to which several authors have contributed, among them Snor Sturluson's relative, Stulla Thordson, contains the history of the later kings down to Magnus Lawmender. The literary development above referred to ceased almost entirely toward the end of the 14th century, and later, during the union with Denmark, the Danish language gradually took the place of the Old Norse as a book language. And the literature became essentially Danish. Copenhagen, with its court and its university, was the literary and educational center, where the young men of Norway went to study, and authors born in Norway became, to all intents and purposes, Danish writers. But Norway furnished some valuable contributors to this common literature. One of the very first names on the records of the Danish literature, Petter Clausen, 1545-1614, is that of a Norwegian, and the list further includes such illustrious names as Hallberg, Tullen, Wessel, Steffens, etc. One of the most original writers whom Norway produced and kept at home during the period of the union with Denmark was the preacher and poet, Petter Das, 1647-1708. The best known among his secular songs is Nordland's Trumpet, a beautiful and patriotic description of the northern part of Norway. Ludwig Hallberg was born in Bergen, Norway, December 3, 1684. His father, Colonel Hallberg, had risen from the ranks and distinguished himself, in 1660, at Halden. Shortly after his death the property of the family was destroyed by fire, and at the age of ten years Ludwig lost his mother. It was now decided to have him educated for the military service, but he showed a great dislike for military life, and, at his earnest request, was sent to the Bergen Latin School. In 1702 he entered the University of Copenhagen. Being destitute of means, he took a position as private tutor. As soon as he had saved a small sum he went abroad. He was first in Holland, and afterwards studied for a couple of years at Oxford, where he supported himself by giving instruction in languages and music. Upon his return to Copenhagen he again took a position as private tutor and had an opportunity to travel as teacher for a young nobleman. In 1714 he received a stipend from the king, which enabled him to go abroad for several years, which he spent principally in France and Italy. In 1718 he became a regular professor at the Copenhagen University. Among Hallberg's many works the following are the most prominent, Petter Pars, a great comical heroic poem, containing sharp attacks on many of the follies of his time. About thirty comedies in Molière style, and a large number of historical works. Hallberg, who was ennobled in 1747, died in January 29, 1754, 
and was buried in Sorrow Church. His influence on the literature and on the whole intellectual life of Denmark was very great. He is often called the creator of the Danish literature. Christian Bauman Tullen, 1728-1765, a genuine poetical genius, who has been called the father of Danish lyrical verse, was born in Christiania, and his poetry, which was mainly written in his native city, breathes a national spirit. From his day, for about thirty years, Denmark obtained the majority of her poets from Norway. The manager of the Danish National Theatre, in 1771, was a Norwegian, Niels Krog Bredel, 1733-1778, who was the first to write lyrical dramas in Danish. A Norwegian, Johan Nordal Brunn, 1745-1816, a gifted poet, wrote tragedy in the conventional French taste of the day. It was a Norwegian, Johann Hermann Wessel, 1742-1785, who, by his great parody, Gerlide Juden Stromper, Love Without Stockings, laughed this taste out of fashion. Among the writers of this period are also Claus Frimen, 1746-1829, Peter Harbo Frimen, 1752-1839, Claus Fasting, 1746-1791, Johann Weib, 1748-1782, Edward Storm, 1749-1794, C.H. Pram, 1756-1821, Jonas Rain, 1760-1821, and Jens Zetlitz, 1761-1821, all of them Norwegians by birth. Two notable events led to the foundation of an independent Norwegian literature, the one was the establishment of a Norwegian university at Christiania in 1811, and the other was the separation of Norway from Denmark in 1814. At first the independent Norwegian literature appeared as immature as the conditions surrounding it. The majority of the writers had received their education in Copenhagen, and were inclined to follow in the beaten track of the old literature, although trying to introduce a more national spirit. All were greatly influenced by the political feeling of the hour. There was a period when all poetry had for its subject the beauties and strength of Norway and its people, and, the rocks of Norway, the lion of Norway, etc., sounded everywhere. Three poets, called the Trefoil, were the prominent writers of this period. Of these, Conrad Nikolai Schwach, 1793-1860, was the least remarkable. Henrik A. Jergard, 1792-1842, was the author of The Crown National Song and of a lyric drama, Fjeldeventerit, The Adventure in the Mountains. The third member of the Trefoil, Moritz C. H. R. Hansen, 1794-1842, wrote a large number of novels and national stories, which were quite popular in their time. His poems were among the earliest publications of independent Norway. The time about the year 1830 is reckoned as the beginning of the new Norwegian literature, and Henrik Wergeland is called its creator. Henrik Arnold Wergeland was born in 1808. His father, Nikolai Wergeland, a clergyman, was a member of the Constitutional Convention at Eidsvold. Henrik studied theology, but did not care to become a clergyman. In 1827, and the following years, he wrote a number of satirical farces under the signature, Seafal Safada. In 1830 appeared his lyric dramatic poem, Skabelsen, Menesket O.G. Meshes, The Creation, Man and Messiah, a voluminous piece of work, in which he attempted to explain the historical life of the human race. As a political writer he was editorial assistant on the Folkbladet, 1831-1833, and edited the opposition paper, Statsborgeren, 1835-1837. He worked with great zeal for the education of the laboring class, and from 1839 until his death edited a paper in the interest of the laborer. The prominent features of his earliest efforts in literature are an unbounded enthusiasm and a complete disregard of the laws of poetry. At an early age he had become a power in literature, and a political power as well. From 1831 to 1835 he was subjected to severe satirical attacks by the author Wellhaven and others, and later his style became improved in every respect. His popularity however decreased as his poetry improved, and in 1840 he had become a great poet but had no political influence. 
Among his works may be named Hasselnader, Joden, the Jew, Jodinden, the Jewess, Jan van Heysem's Blomstersteik, Jan van Heysem's Flower Piece, Den Engels Glads, The English Pilot, and a great number of lyric poems. The poems of his last five years are as popular today as ever. Wurgeland died in 1845. The enthusiastic nationalism of Henrik Wurgeland and his young following brought on a conflict with the conservative element, which was not ready to accept everything as good simply because it was Norwegian. This conservative element maintained that art and culture must be developed on the basis of the old association with Denmark, which had connected Norway with the great movement of civilization throughout Europe. As the poetical leader of this intelligence party, as it was called, appeared J. S. Wellhaven. Johann Sebastian Kammermeyer Wellhaven was born in Bergen in 1807, entered the university in 1825, became a lector in 1840, and afterward professor of philosophy. His refined aesthetic nature, says Fr. Winklehorn, had been early developed, and when the war broke out between him and Wurgeland he had reached a high point of intellectual culture, and thus was in every way a match for his opponent. The fight was inaugurated by a preliminary literary skirmish, which was, at the outset, limited to the university students, but it gradually assumed an increasingly bitter character, both parties growing more and more exasperated. Wellhaven published a pamphlet, O. M. Henrik Wurgeland's Dictekunst O. G. Poesy, in which he mercilessly exposed the weak sides of his adversary's poetry. Thereby the minds became still more excited. The Intelligence Party withdrew from the Students' Union, founded a paper of their own, and thus the movement began to assume wider dimensions. In 1834 appeared Wellhaven's celebrated poem, Norge's Demring, a series of sonnets, distinguished for their beauty of style. In them the poet scourges, without mercy, the one-sided, narrow-minded patriotism of his time, and exposes, in striking and unmistakable words, the hollowness and shortcomings of the Wurgeland party. Wellhaven points out, with emphasis, that he is not only going to espouse the cause of good taste, which his adversary has outraged, but that he is also about to discuss problems of general interest. He urges that a Norwegian culture and literature cannot be created out of nothing. That to promote their development it is absolutely necessary to continue the associations which have hitherto been common to both Norway and Denmark, and thus to keep in rapport with the general literature of Europe. When a solid foundation has in this manner been laid, the necessary materials for a literature would surely not be wanting, for they are found in abundance, both in the antiquities and in the popular life of Norway. Wellhaven continued his effective work as a poet and a critic. Through a series of lyrical and romantic poems, rich in contents and highly finished in style, he developed a poetical life, which had an important influence in the young Norwegian literary circles. He died in 1873. Andreas Munch, 1811-1884, an able and industrious poetical writer, took no part in the controversy between Wurgeland and Wellhaven, but followed his Danish models independently of either. His poems, Old and New, published in 1848, were quite popular. His best work is probably, Congedatron's Brudfart, The Bridal Tour of the King's Daughter, 1861. In the period of about a dozen years following the death of Wurgeland, the life, manners and characteristics of the Norwegian people were given the especial attention of the literary writers. Prominent in this period was Peter Christian Ask Jornsson, 1812-1885, who, partly alone and partly in conjunction with Bishop Jürgen Moe, 1813-1882, published some valuable collections of Norwegian folk tales and fairy tales. Moe also published three little volumes of graceful and attractive poems. Among other writers of this period may be named Hans H. Schulze, Fra Lofoten O. G. Solar, N. Ostgard, N. Fjeldbegt, Harold Meltzer, Smabelder A. F. Folklivet, M. B. Landstad, Hymns, and the Linguist Sophus Bug. The efforts to bring out the national life and characteristics of the people in the literature also led to an attempt to nationalize the language in which the literature was written. The movement was the so-called Malstreve, and had in view the introduction of a pure Norwegian book language, based upon the peasant dialects. 
The most prominent supporter of this movement was Ivar Asin, 1813-1898, the author of an excellent dictionary of the Norwegian language. A prominent poetical representative of this school was Osmund Olofsson Vinge, 1818-1870, while Christopher Jansen, born 1841, has also written a number of stories and poems in the Lansmål, country tongue. A new and grand period in the Norwegian literature commenced about 1857, and the two most conspicuous names in this period, and in the whole Norwegian literature, are those of Henrik Ibsen and Bjornstjern Bjornsson. Henrik Ibsen was born in Sheyen in 1828. He has written many beautiful poems, but his special field is the drama, where he is a master. His first works were nearly all historical romantic dramas. His first work, Catalina, printed in 1850, was scarcely noticed until years afterward, when he had become famous. In 1856 appeared the romantic drama, Gildet pa Salhog, The Feast at Salhog, followed by Fruinger till Estrit, 1857, and Hermandine pa Helgeland, The Warriors on Helgeland, 1858. In 1863 he wrote the historical tragedy Consumnern, The Pretenders, in which the author showed his great literary power. Before this play was published, he had been drawn into a new channel. In 1862 he began a series of satirical and philosophical dramas with Kjerligeden's comedy, Love's Comedy, which was succeeded by two masterpieces of a similar kind, Brand, in 1866, and Pier Gint, in 1867. These works were written in verse. But in De Ungs Forbund, the Young Men's League, 1869, a political satire, he abandoned verse, and all his subsequent dramas have been written in prose. In 1873 came Kaiser O.G. Galilei, Emperor and Galilean. Since then he has published a number of social dramas which have attracted worldwide attention. We mention, Sanfandet Stadter, the Pillars of Society, Edidukajem, A Doll's House, Jengangir, Ghosts, and Folkfiend, An Enemy of the People, Rosmerholm, Fruin Frahavit, The Lady from the Sea, Little Eyolf. By Mester Solnes, Master Builder Solnes, John Gabriel Borkman. Jornstjern Bjornsson, born in Osterdalen in 1832, is the more popular of the two giants in the Norwegian literature of today. His works are more national in tone. It has been said that to mention his name is to raise the Norwegian flag. His first successes were made in the field of the novel, and the first two, Sinov Solbakken, 1857, and Arne, 1858, made his name famous. These, and his other peasant stories, will always retain their popularity. He soon, however, entered the dramatic field, and has since published a great number of dramas and novels. Halt Hulda, 1858, Melam Slajin, 1859, Kong Svera, 1861, Sigurd Slemb, 1862, Maria Stewart, 1863. The Nygift, The Newly Married Couple, 1865, Kongen, 1877, Leonarda, 1879, Det New York System, 1879, Over Earn, 1883, N. Fallot, Det Flager, etc., and many others. In the field of Bell's Lettre there is, at the present time, a number of other talented authors. Jonas Lai, born 1833, has produced a number of excellent novels. Then there are Alexander Keelland, born 1849, Magdalene Thorison, born 1819, Arne Garborg, Gunnar Heiberg, and a number of young authors. In the field of science, also, modern Norway has a rich literature with many prominent names, such as the historians Peter Andreas Munch, 1810-1863, Rudolf Kaiser, 1803-1864, Johann Ernst Sars, born 1835, and O. A. Overland. Chapter 59. The Constitution of Norway. The following is the constitution adopted at the convention at Eidsvold on the 17th day of May, 1814, and amended and ratified by the Storting on the 4th day of November, 1814. With all the subsequent amendments incorporated. A. Religion and Form of Government. Article 1. The Kingdom of Norway is a free, independent, 
indivisible and inalienable state, united with Sweden under one king. Its form of government is a limited, hereditary monarchy. Article 2. The Evangelical Lutheran religion shall continue the established religion of the state. Such inhabitants as profess the same shall educate their children therein. Jesuits shall be excluded. b. The executive power, the king, and the royal family. Article 3. The executive power shall be vested in the king. Article 4. The king shall constantly profess, maintain and defend the evangelical Lutheran religion. Article 5. The king's person is sacred, he shall neither be censured nor impeached. His ministry shall, however, be accountable. Article 6. The succession shall be lineal and agnatic as prescribed in the Ordinance of Succession of September 26, 1810, adopted by the Legislative Assembly of Sweden and accepted by the King, a translation of which is attached to this Constitution. A posthumous child shall be deemed in the line of succession, and shall take his appropriate place therein as soon as born. When a prince, who is heir to the United Crowns of Norway and Sweden, is born, his name and time of birth shall be reported to the next starting in session and entered in its journal. Article 7. If no prince, heir to the crowns, be living, the king may propose a successor to the storting of Norway, at the same time as to the Legislative Assembly of Sweden. And, as soon as the king has made his nomination, the legislative bodies of both nations shall appoint a committee from their midst, with power to choose a successor. In case the nominee of the king is not confirmed by a majority in each legislative body, the number of members of this committee, which must be equal from each kingdom, and the manner in which the choice shall be made, shall be determined by a law. Simultaneously proposed by the king to the next storting and to the legislative assembly of Sweden. One member shall withdraw, by lot, from the assembled committee. Article 8. The age of majority of the king shall be prescribed by a law, to be enacted pursuant to an agreement between the storting of Norway and the Legislative Assembly of Sweden, or, in case they cannot agree concerning the same. By a committee appointed by the legislative bodies of both kingdoms, conformable to the provisions of the preceding Article 7. The king shall publicly proclaim himself of age as soon as he has attained his majority. Article 9. As soon as the king, on coming of age, assumes the government, he shall take the following oath before the storting, I promise and depose that I will govern the kingdom of Norway conformable to its constitution and laws. So help me God and his holy writ. If no storting is then in session, the oath shall be deposited in writing with the ministry, and shall solemnly be renewed by the king at the next storting, either orally or in writing through his representative. Article 10. The king shall be crowned and anointed, when he is of age, in Thrandjum's cathedral, at such time and with such ceremonies as he himself may prescribe. Article 11. The king shall reside in Norway a part of each year, if not prevented by serious obstacles. Article 12. The king shall appoint a ministry of Norwegian citizens, who shall not be less than thirty years of age. The ministry shall consist of two ministers of state, and not less than seven secretaries of state. The king shall apportion the public business among the members of the ministry in such manner as he deems best. The king, or, in his absence, the minister of state, in conjunction with the secretaries of state, may, on extraordinary occasions, in addition to the regular members of the ministry, summon other Norwegian citizens, not members of the storting, to a seat in the ministry. Father and son, or two brothers, shall not have a seat in the ministry at the same time. Article 13. The king shall commit, during his absence, the administration of the domestic affairs of the realm, in such cases as he may prescribe, to one of the ministers of state, and not less than five of the secretaries of state. Who shall carry on the government in the name, and on behalf, of the king. They shall sacredly conform as well to the provisions of this constitution as to the several instructions in harmony therewith, prescribed to them by the king. They shall present to the king a respectful application concerning the affairs they resolve upon. Their transactions shall be determined by vote, and in case of an equal division the minister of state, or, 
in his absence, the senior Secretary of State, shall have two votes. Article 14. Repealed. Article 15. One of the Ministers of State, and two of the Secretaries of State, the latter to be changed yearly, shall constantly remain with the King while he resides in Sweden. They shall be subject to the same obligations and to the same constitutional accountability as the governing ministry, named in Article 13, existing in Norway, and only in their presence shall Norwegian affairs be disposed of by the king. All applications from Norwegian citizens to the king shall first be presented to the governing ministry in Norway, and supplemented with their opinion, before passed upon. As a rule, except where serious obstacles prevent, no Norwegian affairs shall be disposed of without obtaining the advice of the governing ministry in Norway. The Minister of State shall move the consideration of public business, and shall be responsible for the due expedition of all resolutions taken. Article 16. The King shall prescribe rules for all public religious and church service, and for all meetings and conventions relating to religious affairs, and he shall take care that the public instructors of religion adhere to the standards prescribed them. Article 17. The King may enact and repeal ordinances relating to commerce, customs, industrial pursuits and public order, not, however, in conflict with the Constitution or the laws of the Storting, passed pursuant to the provisions of Article 77. 78 and 79 of this Constitution. Such acts of the King shall remain provisionally in force until the next Storting. Article 18. The King shall, ordinarily, cause the taxes and imposts, levied by the Storting, to be collected. The Norwegian treasury shall remain in Norway, and its revenue shall be devoted to the requirements of Norway alone. Article 19. The king shall take care that the estates and regalia of the state be used and managed in the manner prescribed by the storting, and for the greatest advantage of the public. Article 20. The king shall have power, in council, to pardon offenders after conviction. The offender shall, however, have the option to accept the pardon of the king or to suffer the punishment adjudged. No pardon or reprieve, except the remission of the death penalty, shall be granted in cases prosecuted by the Odelsthing in the Court of Impeachment. Article 21. The king, after hearing his ministry in Norway, shall appoint and induct all civil, ecclesiastical and military officials, who shall take an oath of obedience and fealty to the constitution and the king, or who, if relieved by law from such an oath, shall solemnly declare their fealty to the same. Royal princes shall hold no civil office. Article 22. The king may, after taking the advice of the ministry, without the warrant of judicial decree, remove from office the ministers and secretaries of state, together with officials in the bureaus of the ministry, ambassadors and consuls. The chief civil and ecclesiastical officials, and the chiefs of fortifications and ships of war. Whether pensions shall be granted to officials thus removed shall be determined by the next storting, but, in the meantime, they shall continue to receive two-thirds of their former salary. Other officials are only liable to suspension by the king, and, when suspended, shall at once be proceeded against in the courts, and shall not, without judgment, be removed, nor transferred without their consent. Article 23 the king, at his pleasure, may confer orders of merit, in recognition of distinguished services, to be publicly announced, but no other rank or title than that conferred by an office occupied. Such orders shall relieve no one from the duties and burdens common to all citizens, nor shall they confer any preference in securing admission to the public service. Officials, honorably discharged, shall retain the title and rank of the office they occupied. No personal or mixed hereditary prerogatives shall hereafter be conferred on any one. Article 24. The king may, at pleasure, select and dismiss the employees and officers of his royal household. Article 25. The king shall be commander-in-chief of the land and naval forces of the realm. These forces shall neither be increased nor diminished without the consent of the storting. They shall not be placed in the service of foreign powers, nor shall the military forces of any foreign powers, except auxiliary troops to repel hostile attack, be brought within the realm without the consent of the storting. 
In times of peace, none but Norwegian troops shall be stationed in Norway, and no Norwegian troops shall be stationed in Sweden. The king, however, may retain in Sweden a Norwegian guard of volunteers, and he may, for a short time not exceeding six weeks in any year, assemble for maneuvers, within the limits of either country, the nearest troops of the armies of both realms. But in no case, in times of peace, shall more than three thousand soldiers, of all arms combined, of the military force of one country, be brought within the limits of the other country. Norway's troops and coast flotilla shall not be employed in offensive war without the consent of the storting. The Norwegian fleet shall have its dockyards, and in times of peace its stations or havens in Norway. The ships of war of one country shall not be manned with sailors of the other country, except by voluntary enlistment. The Home Guard and the other Norwegian troops, not classed as troops of the line, shall never be employed outside of the boundaries of Norway. Article 26. The king shall have power to call out the troops, to commence war and make peace, to enter into treaties, and to abrogate the same, and to send and receive diplomatic representatives. When the king intends to commence war, he shall communicate his purpose to the governing ministry in Norway, and obtain their judgment concerning the same, together with a full report upon the condition of the country in respect to its finances, means of defense, and other matters. When these steps have been taken, the king shall convene the Norwegian Minister of State and the Norwegian Secretaries of State stationed in Sweden, together with the members of the Swedish Ministry, in an extraordinary cabinet council, and shall present to them the grounds and circumstances which should in such cases be taken into consideration, and shall also place before them the report of the Norwegian Ministry concerning the condition of that country, and a like report concerning the condition of Sweden. The king shall thereupon demand their judgment in the premises, which each of them for himself shall give and have entered in the journal of the proceedings, to be accountable for as provided in the constitution. When this has been done, the king shall have the power to take and execute such resolution as he deems for the best interest of the country. Article 27. All members of the ministry, without valid excuse, shall attend the cabinet councils, and no action shall be taken when not more than half of the members are present. No action shall be taken in those Norwegian affairs, disposed of in Sweden, pursuant to Article 15, unless the Norwegian Minister of State and one of the Norwegian Secretaries of State, or both of the Secretaries, be present. Article 28. Communications concerning appointments to office and other matters of importance, except diplomatic affairs and military commands, shall be presented for consideration to the ministry by the member thereof in whose department the business belongs. And he shall dispose of the same conformable to the resolve of the ministry. Article 29. In case a member of the ministry is unable, for valid cause, to attend and present for consideration the matters pertaining to his department, the same shall be presented by another member of the ministry, appointed for that purpose by the king. If present, or, in his absence, by the presiding member of the ministry, in conjunction with the other members of the ministry. If, for valid cause, so many are absent that not more than half of the regular members are in attendance, then other officials shall be appointed, in the mode aforesaid, to sit in the ministry. In which case a report thereof shall at once be made to the king, who shall determine whether the officials thus appointed shall continue to serve. Article 30. The ministry shall keep a record of all business transacted. It shall be the duty of every person who has a seat in the ministry to express his opinion fearlessly, to which the king shall listen, but he may resolve according to his own judgment. In case any member of the ministry finds that the resolve of the king is in conflict with the form of government or the laws of the realm, or is manifestly detrimental to the country, then it is his duty to vigorously protest against the same. And to enter his objections in the record. He who does not thus protest, shall be deemed to have concurred with the king, and shall be accountable therefore, as subsequently determined, and may be impeached by the odals thing in the court of impeachment. Article 31. All decrees issued by the king himself, except military commands, shall be countersigned by one of the ministers of state. Article 32. Resolutions taken by the ministry in Norway, during the absence of the king, shall be issued in his name, and attested by the ministry. Article 33. 
all communications relative to Norwegian affairs, as well as the expedition of the same, shall be in the Norwegian language. Article 34. The heir apparent, if son of the reigning king, shall bear the title of crown prince. The other royal heirs shall be known as princes, and the royal daughters as princesses. Article 35. As soon as the heir apparent has filled his eighteenth year, he shall be entitled to take his seat in the ministry, but without vote or accountability. Article 36. No prince of the blood shall marry without the consent of the king. If he violates this rule he shall forfeit his right to the crown of Norway. Article 37. The royal princes and princesses shall personally only be answerable to the king, or to such judge as he may ordain for them. Article 38. The Norwegian Minister of State, as well as the two Norwegian Secretaries of State, remaining with the king, shall have a seat and deliberative voice in the Swedish ministry when matters affecting both kingdoms are there considered. The views of the ministry in Norway shall also be obtained, in such cases, unless the urgency for immediate action is so great that there is no time therefore. Article 39. If the king dies and his successor is still under age, the Norwegian and Swedish ministries shall immediately assemble, and jointly issue a call convening the Storting in Norway and the Riksdag in Sweden. Article 40. Until the legislative bodies of both realms are convened and have provided for the government during the minority of the king, the administration of the kingdoms, conformable to their respective constitutions shall be conducted by a ministry composed of an equal number of Norwegian and Swedish members. The Norwegian and Swedish ministers of state, having a seat in this ministry, shall determine, by lot, who shall preside. Article 41. The provisions of Articles 39 and 40, aforesaid, shall also be complied with in all those cases in which, under the Constitution of Sweden, the Swedish ministry, as such, is entitled to conduct the government. When, however, the king, by reason of travels abroad or sickness, is unable to conduct the administration, the prince, entitled to the succession, if of age, shall conduct the administration as the temporary representative of the king. With the same power as belongs to an ad interim government. Article 42. The king shall submit to the next storting in Norway and the next Riksdag in Sweden a bill, based on the principles of perfect equality between both kingdoms, to carry out the provisions of Articles 39, 40 and 41, aforesaid. Article 43. The election of a regency, to conduct the administration for the king during his minority, shall take place according to the same rules and in the same manner prescribed in Article 7, aforesaid, for the election of a successor to the crown. Article 44. The Norwegian members of the joint ministry, to conduct the administration in the cases provided for in Articles 40 and 41, aforesaid, shall take the following oath before the storting. I promise and depose that I will conduct the administration of the government conformable to the Constitution and the laws, so help me God and His Holy Writ. And the Swedish members shall take an oath before the Legislative Assembly of Sweden. If the Storting or Riksdag is not at that time in session, the oath shall be deposited, with the ministry, in writing, and shall be renewed before the next Storting or Riksdag. Article 45. As soon as the administration of the joint ministry shall cease, they shall render an account of the same to the king and the Storting. Article 46. If those, on whom it is incumbent, pursuant to Articles 39 and 41, fail to immediately convene the Storting, it shall be the peremptory duty of the Supreme Court, after a lapse of four weeks, to convene the same. Article 47. The management of the education of the king, under age, shall, if his father has left no written directions concerning the same, be provided for in the manner prescribed in Articles 7 and 43. It shall be the invariable rule to give the king, during his minority, ample instructions in the Norwegian language. Article 48. If the royal male line be extinct, and no successor has been selected, a new line of kings shall be chosen in the manner prescribed in Article 7, and in the meantime provision shall be made for the executive power as prescribed in Article 43, 40. c. Citizenship and the lawmaking power. Article 49. The people shall exercise the legislative power through a storting, 
composed of two bodies, a lag thing and an odels thing. Article 50. All Norwegian citizens, dwelling within the realm, who have attained the age of 25 years, and have been residents of the country for five years, shall be qualified voters. Article 51. All qualified voters shall be registered, in every city by the magistrate, and in every rural parish by the parson and tax collector. Changes that in the course of time may occur shall immediately be noted in the registry. Every voter shall, before he is registered, publicly in court, take an oath of fealty to the Constitution. Article 52. The right of suffrage shall be suspended by a. Indictment for an offense subject to the punishment described in Article 53. By b. Being placed under guardianship. By c. Assignment or bankruptcy, not caused by loss of fire or other evident misfortune, until the debtor, through full liquidation or composition, shall again regain control over his estate. And by d. Being supported, or having during the year immediately preceding the election been supported, as a public pauper. Article 53. The right of suffrage shall be forfeited by a. Having been sentenced to hard labor, removal from office, or imprisonment for an offense described in any of the chapters of the criminal code, relating to perjury, larceny, robbery or fraud. By b. Entering the service of a foreign power, without the consent of the government. By c. Acquiring citizenship in a foreign country. And by d. Being convicted of buying votes, or selling one's own vote, or of voting in more than one election precinct. Article 54. Elections and electoral meetings shall be held every third year. They shall be concluded before the end of the month of December. Article 55. Elections shall be held, at the chief church of the parish, in the rural districts, and at a church, the town hall, or other suitable place, in the towns. The parish priest and his vestrymen shall be the judges of election in the rural districts, the magistrate and selectmen in the towns. The vote shall be taken in the order the names appear on the registry. Controversies about the right to vote shall be determined by the judges of election, whose decision may be appealed from to the storting. Article 56. The Constitution shall be audibly read, in the towns by the chief magistrate, and in the rural districts by the priest, before the polls are opened. Article 57. In the towns, one elector shall be chosen for every fifty inhabitants qualified to vote. Within eight days after their election, the electors shall assemble at the place designated therefore by the magistracy, and shall elect, either from their own number or from the other qualified voters in their electoral district. 38 representatives, to meet and sit in the storting. Of this number, unless otherwise constitutionally provided, one shall be elected from Olesen and Mould combined, one from Arendel and Grimstead combined, four from Bergen, one from Brevig, four from Christiania, Honifas and Kongsvinger combined. Two from Christian Sand, one from Christian Sund, two from Drammen, one from Flekefjord, one from Frederikshald, one from Frederikstad, one from Hammerfest, Vardo and Vatso combined, one from Holmstrand, one from Kongsberg, one from Krajero. One from Lorvig and Sandefjord combined, one from Lillehammer, Hamer and Jovik combined, one from Moss and Drobak combined, one from Porsgrund, one from Sarpsborg, one from Sheyen, two from Stavanger and Hagesund combined, one from Tromso. Four from Thrandjem and Lavanger combined, one from Tunsberg, and one from Osterizer. When a town, not herein named, shall have fifty or more inhabitants, who are qualified voters, it shall be attached to the nearest town electoral district. The same rule shall apply to towns that may hereafter be founded. A town attached to a town electoral district shall choose one elector, even though the number of inhabitants qualified to vote shall become less than fifty. In no case shall less than three electors be chosen in a town which, by itself alone, constitutes one representative district. Article 58. In every parish in the rural districts, the inhabitants qualified to vote shall choose, in proportion to their numbers, electors as follows, 100 or less shall choose 1, from 100 to 200, 2, from 200 to 300, 3, and so on in the same proportion. 
The electors shall, within a month after their election, assemble at a place designated therefore by the high sheriff of the county, and shall then elect, either from their own number or from the other qualified voters in their county. 76 representatives, to meet and sit in the storting, of whom five shall be chosen from the county of Agershus, five from the county of Nordre Bergenhes, five from the county of Sondre Bergenhes, five from the county of Christians. Two from the county of Finmarken, five from the county of Hedmarken, five from the county of Nordland, five from the county of Romsdalen, five from the county of Stavanger, two from the county of Tromso, and four from each of the other eight counties of the kingdom. Ex-ministers or ex-secretaries of state shall be eligible for representatives in any electoral district, if, barring residence, they are qualified voters and have not already been elected in some other district. But no district shall elect more than one non-resident representative. Article 59. Repealed. Article 60. Qualified voters, being within the country, who, by reason of sickness, military service, or other valid excuse, are unable to attend the polls, may, in writing, transmit their votes to the judges of election before the polls are closed. Article 61. No one shall be elected representative unless he is thirty years of age and has resided ten years within the realm. Article 62. Members of the ministry, the officials employed in its bureaus, and the officials and pensionaries of the court, are all ineligible for representatives. Article 63. Whoever is elected representative, except ex-members of the ministry elected under the last clause in Article 58, shall be required to accept the office, unless prevented by an excuse deemed valid by the electors. Whose decision may be reviewed by the storting. Whoever has served as a representative in three regular sessions of the storting succeeding the same election, shall not be bound to accept election to the next storting. If a representative is prevented by valid excuse from attending the storting, the person receiving the next highest vote shall take his place, unless an alternate was elected at the district electoral meeting. In which case he shall take the place of the representative. Article 64. Immediately after their election, the representative shall be furnished with certificates of election, subscribed in the rural districts by the magistracy, in the towns by the chief magistrate, and in both cases by several electors. As evidence that they have been elected in the manner prescribed in the Constitution. The validity of these credentials shall be passed upon by the storting. Article 65. Each representative shall be entitled to compensation, from the state treasury, for expenses of travel to and from the storting, and for subsistence during attendance. Article 66. Representatives shall, except when apprehended in public offenses, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the storting, and in going to and returning from the same. And they shall not be answerable, outside of the sessions of the storting, for the expression of their views therein, but every representative shall conform to the established rules of procedure. Article 67. The representatives, elected in the manner aforesaid, shall constitute the storting of the Kingdom of Norway. Article 68. The storting shall, as a rule, convene on the first weekday in the month of February in each year, at the capital of the kingdom, except when the king, on account of extraordinary circumstances, such as hostile invasion or contagious disease, shall designate another town in the realm therefore. Timely notice of such designation shall, in such case, be published. Article 89. The king may, on extraordinary occasions, convene the storting at other than the usual time. In such case the king shall issue a proclamation, which shall be read in all the churches of the episcopal towns at least fourteen days before the members of the storting shall assemble at the place prescribed. Article 70. Such special storting may be adjourned by the king at his pleasure. Article 71. The members of the storting shall serve as such for three successive years, as well at all special, as at all regular, sessions that may in the meantime be held. Article 72. If a special storting be in session at the time a regular storting convenes, the former shall adjourn before the latter assembles. Article 73. The storting shall select from its members one-fourth who shall constitute the lag thing. The other three-fourths shall constitute the odalsthing. 
the selection shall be made at the first regular storting which convenes after an election, and thereafter the lag thing shall remain unchanged in all stortings assembled after the same election, except in cases of vacancy, which shall be filled by special election. Each thing shall hold its session separately, and appoint its own president and secretary. Neither thing shall be in session unless two-thirds of its members are present. Article 74. As soon as the storting has organized, the king, or whoever he may appoint therefore, shall open its proceedings with a speech from the throne. Wherein he shall give information touching the condition of the kingdom and the matters to which he especially desires to direct the storting's attention. No deliberation shall take place in the presence of the king. After the session of the storting has been opened, the minister of state and the secretaries of state shall be entitled to sit in the storting and both branches thereof, and to participate in its proceedings, without the right to vote. In open session on a footing of equality with the members, and in secret session only to the extent permitted by the thing. Article 75. The storting shall have power. A to enact and repeal laws, to levy taxes, imposts, duties, and other public assessments, but such levy shall not remain in force beyond the first day of July in the year in which the next regular storting convenes, unless expressly revived by the latter. b. To borrow money on the credit of the kingdom. c. To regulate the currency of the kingdom. d. To appropriate the money necessary for the expenditures of the government e. To determine the amount which shall yearly be paid the king for the maintenance of his royal household, and to settle the uppunage of the royal family, which shall not, however, consist of landed estates. f. To cause to be laid before them the journal of the ministry in Norway and all official reports and documents, not pertaining to exclusive military commands, then on file, together with verified copies and extracts of the journals. On file with the king, kept by the Norwegian Minister of State and the two Norwegian Secretaries of State remaining in Sweden, as well as the public documents on file with them. g. To cause to be communicated to them the alliances and treaties, which the King, on behalf of the State, has entered into with foreign powers, except secret articles, which must not, however, conflict with those that are public. h. To require any person to appear before them, in state affairs, except the king and royal family, but this exception shall not apply to royal princes holding office. i. To revise temporary salary and pension lists, and to make such changes therein as they find necessary. k. To appoint five auditors who shall yearly audit the accounts of the state and publish printed extracts of the same. And for this purpose the accounts shall be submitted to the auditors within six months from the expiration of the year for which the appropriations of the storting has been made, and L. To naturalize foreigners. Article 76. Every bill shall first be introduced in the Odelsting, either by a member thereof or by the ministry, through one of its members. If the bill is there passed, it shall be sent to the lag thing, which may concur in or reject it. In the latter case it shall be returned with objections appended, and the same shall be considered by the Odal's thing, which may either indefinitely postpone the bill or return it to the lag thing with or without amendment. When a bill, from the Odal's thing, has been twice presented to the lag thing and has been returned a second time rejected, the entire storting shall assemble in one body, and, by a two-thirds vote, dispose of the bill. At least three days must intervene between every such distinct consideration of the bill. Article 77. When a measure, passed by the Odelsting, has been concurred in by the lag thing or the united storting, it shall be sent by a committee of both bodies of the storting to the king, if he is present, or if not present, to the Norwegian ministry. With the request for the sanction of the king. Article 78. If the king approve the measure, he shall affix his signature thereto, whereby it becomes a law. If he disapprove the same, he shall return it to the Odal's thing with the statement that, for the time being, he does not find it expedient to sanction the same. Article 79. If a measure has been passed without amendment, by three regular stortings, convened after three separate and successive elections, and separated from each other by not less than two intervening regular stortings. And no measure in conflict therewith having, in the meantime, from the first to the last passage, 
been passed by any storting. And the measure is then presented to the king with the request that his majesty will not refuse his sanction to a measure which the storting, after the most mature consideration, deem beneficial, it shall become a law. Notwithstanding the king fails to sanction the same before the adjournment of the storting. Article 80. The storting may remain in session so long as it deems necessary, not, however, over two months, without the permission of the king. When, after having finished its proceedings, or after having been in session the time limited, it is adjourned by the king, he shall communicate to it his action upon the measures passed, by approving or rejecting the same. All measures not expressly approved by him shall be deemed rejected. Article 81. All laws shall be promulgated in the Norwegian language, and, except those passed pursuant to Article 79, in the name of the king, and under the seal of the Kingdom of Norway, in the following words. We, N. N. Make known that there has been presented to us an act of the storting of the following tenor, here follows the act, which we have accepted and approved and hereby accept and approve, as law, under our hand and the seal of the realm. Article 82. The sanction of the king shall not be required for those resolutions of the storting whereby a. It declares itself convened as storting pursuant to the Constitution. b. It determines its own rules of procedure. c. It approves or rejects the credentials of the members present. d. It affirms or reverses decisions in election controversies. e. It naturalizes foreigners. f. And finally, not for the resolution whereby the Odelsting shall impeach members of the ministry, or others. Article 83. The Storting shall have the right to procure the opinion of the Supreme Court upon judicial subjects. Article 84. The Storting shall sit in open session and its proceedings shall be printed and published, except in cases where otherwise determined by a majority vote. Article 85. Whoever shall obey a command, the purpose of which is to interfere with the freedom and safety of the storting, is guilty of treason against the fatherland. d. The judicial power. Article 86. The members of the lag thing, together with the Supreme Court, shall constitute the court of impeachment, which shall try, without appeal, cases instituted by the Odelsting. Against members of the ministry and members of the Supreme Court for malfeasance in office, and against members of the storting for offenses committed by them in their official capacity. The president of the lag thing shall preside in the court of impeachment. Article 87. The accused may, without cause, challenge as many as one-third of the members of the court of impeachment, but not so many, however, as to leave the court with less than fifteen members. Article 88. The Supreme Court shall be the tribunal of last resort. It shall consist of not less than one chief justice and six associate judges. This article shall not prohibit the final disposal of criminal cases, pursuant to law, without appeal to the Supreme Court. Article 89. In times of peace, the Supreme Court, together with two high military officers to be appointed by the King, shall constitute a court of appeal and a final resort in all court-martial cases, involving life, honor or loss of liberty for a longer period than three months. Article 90. The decisions of the Supreme Court shall in no case be appealed or reviewed. Article 91. No one shall be appointed a member of the Supreme Court before he is thirty years of age. e. General Provisions. Article 92. Public offices shall be filled only by Norwegian citizens who speak the language of the country and a who are born within the realm of parents who are citizens of the country. Or. B. Who are born in foreign countries of Norwegian parents, not citizens of another nation. Or. C. Who shall hereafter reside ten years within the realm. Or. D. Who shall be naturalized by the storting. But persons without these qualifications may be appointed physicians, instructors in the university and grammar schools, and consuls in foreign places. No one shall be appointed a high magistrate before he is thirty years of age, nor an inferior judge, magistrate, or tax collector before he is twenty-five years of age. 
No one shall be a member of the ministry unless he professes the established religion of the state, and the same rule shall apply to the other offices of the state, until otherwise provided by law. Article 93. Norway shall not be liable for any other than its own national debt. Article 94. Measures shall be taken to enact, at the next regular storting, or, if this is not possible, at the following one, a new general civil and criminal code. In the meantime the existing laws of the state shall remain in force so far as they are not in conflict with this constitution or temporary ordinances meanwhile issued. Permanent taxes now existing shall continue as laid until the next storting. Article 95. No dispensations, writs of protection, or letters of respite or reparation, shall be granted after the new general code takes effect. Article 96. No one shall be tried except pursuant to law, nor punished except pursuant to judgment. Examination, by means of torture, is prohibited. Article 97. No law shall be given retroactive effect. Article 98. Fees paid to officials of courts of justice shall not be subject to any state tax. Article 99. No one shall be arrested except in the case and manner prescribed by law. Whoever causes an unauthorized arrest or unlawful detention shall be answerable therefore to the person confined. The government shall have no right to employ military force against the citizens otherwise than pursuant to law. Except in the case of an assembly disturbing the public peace and not immediately dispersing after the civil magistrate has thrice audibly read to them the articles in the public code relating to riot. Article 100. The liberty of the press shall remain inviolate. No one shall be punished for any writing, printed or published, irrespective of its context, unless he has intentionally and clearly manifested, or urged others to manifest, disobedience to the laws, contempt for religion, morality, and the constitutional authorities, or resistance to the commands of the same, or has made false and defamatory charges against any person. Every person shall be permitted to express freely his opinion upon the administration of public affairs, or on any other subject whatsoever. Article 101. New and permanent special privileges in industrial pursuits shall not be granted to anyone hereafter. Article 102. Domiciliary visits shall not be permitted except in criminal cases. Article 103. No sanctuary shall be allowed to persons who hereafter become insolvent. Article 104. Estates of inheritance, or distributive shares, shall in no case be subject to confiscation. Article 105. If public necessity requires any person to relinquish his real or personal property for public use, he shall receive full compensation therefore from the state treasury. Article 106. The proceeds, as well as the income, of church estates, shall be devoted exclusively to the benefit of the church and the promotion of education. The property of charitable institutions shall be devoted exclusively to their use. Article 107. Allodial tenure and statutory entailment shall not be abolished, but the conditions under which, for the good of the state and the advantages of the people, the same shall continue, shall be prescribed by the next or the following storting. Article 108. No earldoms, baronies, or entailed manorial estates, shall hereafter be established. Article 109. Every citizen, without regard to birth or fortune, shall, without exception, render military service to his country for a limited time. The application of this rule, the limitations to be placed on it, and whether it will be for the good of the country that liability to such service shall terminate with the twenty-fifth year shall be left to the determination of the next regular storting, after a committee has obtained full information on the subject. And in the meantime all existing provisions in the premises shall remain in force. Article 110. Norway shall have its own bank and its own currency and coinage, to be established by law. Article 111. Norway shall be entitled to have its own merchant flag. Its naval ensign shall be a union flag. Article 112. If experience demonstrates that any part of this constitution of the Kingdom of Norway requires amendment, 
the proposition therefore shall be presented at a regular starting first succeeding an election. And notice thereof shall be given by publication. But no action shall be taken thereon until at one of the regular startings succeeding the next election. Such amendment shall not contravene the principles of this Constitution, and shall only relate to such modifications in single provisions as will not change the spirit of this Constitution, and shall be concurred in by two-thirds of the starting. The End